What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Tuesday, November 14th, 2023, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours talking plenty of football, sports, life, pop culture, and so much more on today's show. What did Steve Sarkeesian have to say at his Monday press conference yesterday? Odds to replace Jimbo Fisher in Aggieland. The college football playoff rankings come out again tonight. Where will the Longhorns fall? Some news out of the world of baseball. Is there a front runner for Shohei Otani? And uh, another airplane story that we yes, yes. To get into. Not one that we have to get into, but one that we get to get into today. We are locked. We are loaded. We are ready to roll for the next couple of hours. What's up, Buck? How are you doing this morning, BK? Oh, I'm doing all right. I've been better. Got a little bit of the crud, but uh, be okay. Oh, yeah. You you were down here floating the river, joining the COVID gathering over the weekend. So there's no telling what you got inside of you. Yeah, it was a definite super spreader event. <laughs> there you go. I love those events, man. Love those. Those are everywhere. I don't miss out on one of those super spreader events. I get to no. go to one. I can go to Costco and just join that group. Although, I'm <laughs> seeing, although lately I'm seeing a lot of folks with masks on again. You know, really? it makes me want to get my jock strap out. Oh, not, not the same thing. Might as well. God, we ended yesterday's show talking about how you used your old high school jock strap as a COVID mask one time during 2020. And now you're talking about bringing it back out here in November 2023. Why not, man? I'm seeing folks bringing it back out. It's getting towards that season again, getting no. towards winter season. You're bring not out. seeing folks bring their high school jock straps out. Well, no one's kept those besides you, number one. And number two, no one would even consider – Putting that on their face. It covers up the whole face just right below the eyes, man. It gets the, the chin. Plus, you put that nut holder right there as your chin piece. It, it's great. As your chin piece. The <laughs> nut holder as the chin piece. That well, is... I, I would suggest that you get one that wasn't used in the 70s because that has a little bit of sag to it, if you know what I mean. You know they just give out those free COVID masks like everywhere, right? You don't have to go deep into your attic and find a 50-year-old jock strap to put on your dome. I'm trying to prevent it. I'm not using those things that the air comes to the side. That jock, you know, you that baby, that thing fits me like a glove around the face. So God, is that where you wore it back in the day? Did you know you were supposed to wear it somewhere else? No, I've never I just thought, you know, during COVID, you know, I was with the at that old place that kicked me out without my shoes on and stuff. I I just, we were doing shows at different places, so I didn't want to infect anybody. So I said, you know what? Why don't I put this thing on? Let's see how it worked. It fit just perfect. It had like a little headband. The waistband was like a headband. The nut holder just fit right underneath my chin. You know what I'm saying? Dude, no, I don't know what you're saying because I've never even thought about doing that. This is great. You go find one. Go buy one. Hey, when we're at Academy on Thursday, pick up one <laughs> and put it on a brand new and see how that baby fits you. Oh my God! Yeah, that'd be a little better than putting a fifty-year-old one on. But yeah, that one's mine's is kind of saggy. Opens up on the sides where the nuts fall out. I mean, it's just awful. Good morning to the soldiers at Fort Cabasas, Texas. The soldiers in the state of Texas and all those that fight for us each and every day. Thank you so very much to you and your families. Please be safe out there, and thank you. Oh man, yeah. I don't know if the soldiers like getting saying hello to after that right there what a start to today's show my goodness we are off the rails already here on a tuesday we appreciate y'all spending so more all of your tuesday morning with us uh, we'll be live from eight to five all day long right here on texas sports unfiltered as the buck mentioned this thursday we will be broadcasting live from the academy out in huddo the grand opening of the newest academy sports and outdoors 250 alliance boulevard that's the address we'll tweet about it We'll post about it. We'll continue to let y'all know from now until Thursday. But we hope to see all of you on Thursday. Texas Sports Unfiltered will be broadcasting from 8 to 1. So the that giveaway, we there. got giveaways. We got giveaways as well. A couple of Academy gift cards will be given some of you people. Maybe some Texas Sports Unfiltered swag. Maybe a last stand hat or two. Uh, we hope to see you people 
out there this Thursday. Yep, the Buck and I will be there from 8 to 10. Chaos Theory with Rodney and Wags will be out there. Jeff Howe will be there. It'll be uh, all sorts of fun at the brand new Academy Sports and Outdoors up there in Hutto. Hope to see all of you there. Should be some fun. Yeah, uh, we'll be missing Doc Trey because he'll be picking up his winning ticket or cashing in his winning ticket. Yep, he is uh, on his way to Vegas right now, and he'll be out for the next few days. But, uh, yeah, I don't think he gets back until Thursday night. So He'll be he spending be- that money there. I'm, I hope his, I hope he sends his wife a check or something, PayPal or, or my buddy or whatever they use to pay money these days. <laughs> my buddy. Now, his wife is going with him to Vegas. So oh, she oh. knows. Yeah. What about those rugrats? They get to stay with grandma somewhere? Yeah, I don't think the little kids are uh, making their way to Sin City this they time. They've got school. That's right. Yep, they've got to stay back. But uh, no, Trey and his wife are headed out to Vegas. And yes, Trey will be cashing that uh, Rangers World Series bet ticket. If you're new to this, Trey had me place a $100 bet on the Texas Rangers to win the World Series before the MLB season started. The Rangers were plus 7,000 to win it all going into the year. And, of course, the Rangers got the job done a couple of weeks ago. So Trey is uh, $7,000 wow. richer. And I got to ask you this, Buck. You know, I haven't asked Trey this because I'm trying to be nice here because I always try to be nice. You oh, know good, good deal. Way to go. Yeah, I'm one of the best people in the history of the world. Also the most humble people in the history of the world, too. Absolutely. Everybody knows that. Um should I get some of that money? It's like a finder's fee or like as a better's fee. Cause I was the guy who placed the bet and I was the guy who reached out to Trey when I was in Vegas. It's not like Trey's like, Oh, you're going to Vegas place this bet for me. It was, I was in Vegas. I reached out to a couple of buddies and I'm like, Hey, do you want me to put a futures bet on anything while I'm out here? And Trey responded with the, yeah, throw a hundred bucks on the Rangers. So I started this. I I placed the actual bet. Now, my question to you is, should I get a cut of Trey's winnings here? 200. 200 bucks? Yeah, that's it. Finder's fee? Agent's fee? fee. Yeah, I I saw something where a lady found her her boss, as she's the cleaning lady, she found the winning lottery ticket in in a uh, in a vase or a vase that the dude had up on the mantle. I mean, he just kind of chucked it in there, forgot all about it. She found it and he won, I don't know. 10 million or some weird number amount of money. He didn't realize that was the winning ticket. He just had thrown it in, you know, and, and if a year goes by and you don't cash that ticket in, you got problems. You can't, that's not yours any longer. It goes back yeah. into the lottery. So and people were asking, what would you give the lady who found that? And, and I mean, she's a house cleaner. I said, I'd give her no less than 25,000. She found the ticket. Yeah. She gave it back she, to the boss. She should get all the money. No, she shouldn't get all the money. You're the boss. You bought the ticket. It's your property. It's your house. But She's just cleaning the house. Mm, okay. You know what I mean? She doesn't know. She she said, is this, you know, kind of brought this out. Is this yours? Dude said, oh, yeah, that's a ticket that I, you know. You know, dudes, if you get the lottery, you put these dogman tickets anywhere, yeah. you know, except for not in your pants because my wife then washes my pants and the ticket's no good. And, I mean, every time she does that, I said, that's the one that has won all the money. She goes, well, maybe you should try taking it out of your pocket then. But oh. I, someone was, I, I think it may have been Craig Wade said, how much would you give a, a, a housekeeper or something that found that ticket and reminded you, you know, and it was just a couple of months before that thing had expired. So I said, mm-hmm. I would, I said for $10 million, I would, I mean, I would probably give up, I don't know, 25, 30,000, 40,000. Million. I'd, give her, I'd give her way more than that, man. Would you give her a million? Mm, I don't yes. know about that. I, I'd, I'd probably give her one Half. to five hundred thousand dollars. Half a million, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I just won ten million, but I was I probably wasn't going to win that money if she didn't. No, because you were going to forget ticket. about that ticket. It was going to be sitting on that mantle, you know, yeah. two years from now. Yes, you, you got to give her at least six figures, man. I mean, twenty five k is insulting. Like I know that's a lot of money, but considering how much she made you by finding that ticket. Like she saved you, man. She could have saved you from jumping off a building. And that's the type of stuff that caused people to go to the side of a bridge. You know, it's like, oh, shoot, I won the lottery, but I never cashed out my ticket because I put it in some vase somewhere. Yeah, I give her 500 G's. 
Yeah, I think that's. I think or that's maybe you can I give would. her a million because you know, out of that ten million, you're not getting ten. Right. Well, that's that's why you don't give her a million because the government's taking half of it. So I'm, I don't know if I'm giving her a twenty percent finder's fee, but I'm giving her some money for sure. Damn, I hadn't heard that story. That's nice of her because it didn't have the guy's name on it, right? Like she no, could have no, just no. taken it to the gas station herself and been like, "Oh." Well, obviously, here. she's seen tickets before that her boss has just placed in places. That probably wasn't the first spot that that dude is. So I bet she's found tickets in other spots and just reminded that dude, "Is this yours? Have you checked to see if this is a winner?" Uh, well, the one in the vase was a winner. Wow, that's awesome. That is like awesome. To step into that. So what about for me? You know, because I always have get to get you two hundred. Get you two hundred bucks. Okay, I'm not going to ask Trey for it. Like that's that, that's not me. I just I wonder. Well, you tell if, the people. The people will ask. It, it's I just wonder now. if I should be expecting something. You know, like is it the right thing for him to do to give me a little bit of a cut of this ticket? I don't oh, know. I, I mean, I think it's. I, I think the fact that you let him know that where you were and hey, you you know you didn't place a bet of a hundred dollars because you didn't believe the Rangers would win. Obviously, right. I don't think he did either. <laughs> He's just taking a flyer. Yeah. It worked out for him. So why can't he give you 200 bucks out of 7,000? By the way, for our, our folks out there who go to Vegas and stuff, will he be taxed on the $7,000? I believe so. Because mm. I believe if you go, I've, I've won money at the racetrack. You know me, because I'm a winner when I go to the racetrack. When I go to the horses, I win. Never lost. Well, I've lost, but I've also won a lot. <laughs> that's right. That's where I do my damage at the yeah. at the ponies. And I I remember hitting a a on a two dollar ticket, like three thousand dollars. And I, Uncle Sam needed to have his. I had to fill out a deal at the racetrack. So it's still anything over six hundred bucks. So that's a lot. He's gonna have to pay a pretty good percentage, but he'll still have enough to give you two hundred bucks for doing that. I would believe. We'll see. He's talking like his wife has already spent all the money, right? She bought a bunch of shit, and then she knows that there's seven k coming, so that they'll be able to pay it back. So I don't know if there's going to be a cut for me left. Might already be spent. And Listen, out remember, you, for the you, next write out, you write the checks out for us, so maybe he ought to think about that a little bit. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that should be that should be on his mind. Yeah, that's true. That's he, true. That should, be, that should be on his mind right there. I would think. I mean. Hell, if he, if he said a hundred bucks, you're taking it. So, I mean, it's just the thought of doing it. You you went and did that for him. I mean, I don't, yeah. I, I don't see that as being unreasonable mm -hmm. expectations. But you're not going to mention it to him. But now somebody else is going to mention it to to oh, him because that's how that works. That's how you set that up. You did a fine job of setting that up to get your two hundred bucks. You think that's why I did that? Oh, I don't know if that's I, I sorta, but. Somebody along the way that's listening to you guys from noon to one will say to him, or it's going to come up on the screen on the uh, text line, on the code of text line, hey, Trey, did you offer BK any money? Because he was crying about it with Bucky in the morning. <laughs> and then he's going to have to come. He's going to have a whole – he's going to have a pocket full of hundies. You know he will. He'll probably have $1,000 in, in hundies and say, yeah, here, ha have one. And you'll okay. accept it. You won't, sure. you won't say no, no I, thanks. I'm not expecting anything, right? I'm not asking for anything. I'm not expecting anything. I'm just wondering if the right thing to do would be to give me a little bit of a cut from his I winnings. Would say, I would say $200 is not out of the question for doing it. That would be a nice offering. He doesn't have to pay anybody else. He doesn't have to pay those little beggars that live with him. They're living yeah. rent-free, eating all this food and everything else. We are talking about a guy who has RDF, though. Remember that resting dick face. So <laughs> it might be tough to uh, to get anything out of him. All right. So Trey will be with us later this week. We'll take your thoughts. Hit us up on the Coda text line 512-222-9328. If you're tuned in on the app, good morning. We appreciate that. Of course, we are live on YouTube as well. Hit us up on the YouTube comments line. Appreciate uh, all of you people spending some time with us this morning buck speaking of vegas how about some vegas odds for who is going to replace jimbo fisher at texas a and m i'm going to share my screen so you can see these okay. but also we'll just kind of go down the list and debate who makes sense if any of these candidates make sense so the current favorite to replace jimbo in aggieland is 
Ole Miss head coach Lane Kiffin. That's he a no. Five to one. That's a no for, for Lane or for AM? For AM, no, that's a no. Why is that? He will wear on those people so quick, plus he won't win the big games. He sucks. No, well, that's a no. He'll fit in perfectly at AM if he doesn't win the big games. Yeah. They're, that's what they're looking to try to get away from. Yeah, that's true. Lane Kiffin, you know, Ole Miss was in the top 10. The new CFP rankings come out tonight. Ole Miss got boat raced by Georgia, so you assume the Rebels will fall out of the top 10, but they're still having a good year. I think they're 8-2 and two this season in the SEC West. Uh, Lane Kiffin has reportedly flirted with other jobs. There were rumors last year that he was about to take the Auburn job before uh, Ole Miss maybe sweetened the pot a little bit to keep him in Oxford. But Lane Kiffin is your favorite at 5-1. to one. Up next, right behind him at 6-1, to one, Dan Lanning, the current head coach at the University of Oregon. Buck, what say you on that? Good choice if, if that were to happen, but Phil Knight will outbid the Aggies on that. He won't let him, get, he won't let him go. Yeah, I saw a, a report this morning when I woke up that said Dan Lanning had already shot down any rumors of him leaving. He said, quote, zero chance, end that, quote. That, that means add leaving. a couple more zeros to his – his account there. Thank you, Phil. And I appreciate that, Nike man. Yeah. I mean, AM can outspend Oregon, right? Can AM outspend Phil Knight? Really? <sighs> yeah, because, you know, Phil Knight's just one. AM's got like, I don't want to say a hundred. Don't, don't think of him as just one. Think of him as almost a political party himself. Right, right. I mean, he, he might be richer than all yes. AM individuals. I'm not even so sure that's the case, but there are a lot of rich Aggies. I don't know how many rich Oregon Duck alumni are out there. There are a lot rich of rich A&M alumni out there, right? Yes, and a lot of rich Nike people that have, you know, have stock in Nike that work for Phil Knight that just are, are close to his kind of cash too, that are okay. on board with him that will pay to keep that guy there. Yeah, I, I, Dan Lanning's done a tremendous, tremendous job. At Oregon, it's only his second year up there. Um, I I do wonder what Oregon becomes after Bo Nix leaves, right? Like, you know, I'll, I'll give Dan Landing credit for helping to get Bo Nix to Oregon, but you know, they got a pretty established quarterback who was coming over from an SEC school who already had a ton of success like that. It was kind of built for early success yes. out there in Eugene. A and M, they've been in such a rut recently. At uh, you know, I don't know. Like Oregon's coach didn't get fired. Mario Cristobal went and took the Miami job. So yeah, I mean, they've got the most ridiculous probably NIL deals of all time where they are up in Oregon. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to say that Dan Lanning's not a good coach. I mean, he's he's doing great work in Eugene, but it's uh, a different situation that he would be walking into in Aggieland versus the one that he walked into in Eugene. Uh, We've got a two-way tie for third place here. Uh, Mike Elko, the former Aggie defensive coordinator, who's now the head coach at Duke. And Mike Norvell, the current Florida State head coach, there's no way the Aggies would go back to Florida State, right? No, they wouldn't do that. Mike Norvell is feeling pretty good about himself at Florida State right now and his recruiting and what he can do in the state of Florida. Oh, you know, he I, can, I think Norvell would leave because I think AM could money whip him, but sure. I, I just I don't think the Aggies would go down do that. that road. I think Elko would take that job in a second. I think he'd be a good choice too. Yeah, I think that's a hire that makes sense, right? Like the Aggie defense was great with Mike Elko there. Uh, we've seen the turnaround that Duke has gone through. I mean, this team started the year 5-0. and They were ranked in the top 20. Uh, does that Duke mean hosted- Bobby Petrino doesn't have a job now? He doesn't, does he? Duke hosted college game day this year. Uh, Petrino right now has a job. Like he's still on staff at a and But, you know, once they bring in a new head coach, yeah, no, Petrino's probably not going to get the stick around there. Wow, one um, year. Get him on a motorcycle, man. That's too bad. Hard to believe that didn't work. Uh, who saw that coming? Between those two, they just yeah. couldn't get it done. You know, AM needed to modernize its offense, so they hired a 60 year old to help do that. Way to go, Jim. They just, you know, and, and when you look at it, you look at that team, it's just they still they think they have a quarterback. They thought they had a quarterback. They still don't have the guy at quarterback. They just don't. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I like Connor Wegman was good before he got hurt. It's just good. I mean, they, yeah, I mean, he's not Johnny Manziel or anything, but he looked like he had some juice to him. I, I'm not ready to close the book on him just yet. I think he has potential to be really good, but yeah, he's not as good as he's not as good as Bo Nix, right? 
Right, right, right. But Bo Nix is in like year 18 in college that's, football. That's true. He should be in the NFL somewhere. Yeah, and Connor Wegman was uh, in his first year as a starter at AM. So I don't know. I mean, maybe the Aggies will hit the portal to try to bring somebody in, but um, I, I feel like Connor Wegman is probably the most likely starter for them at quarterback in 2024. Uh, by the way, random local tie in here. If Dan Landon gets the job, maybe that means former Lake Travis offensive coordinator Will Stein is going to Aggieland because he's the OC at Oregon right now. Remember that. Well, maybe Oregon would hire him as their head coach. Maybe. That'd be something right there. All right. Uh, 10 to 1. We've got Jeff Trailer, former Texas assistant, a very successful high school coach in the state of Texas for a number of years. He, of course, is now the head coach at UTSA. Also, Kalen DeBoer, the Washington head coach. Those guys are both tied at 10 to 1 to be AM's next head man. I can, I can see Jeff Trailer DeBoer. I, I just think once you get into that area or Seattle where that beautiful cut where that college is, it's beautiful there. It's probably a great place to to live. And and once you got to College Station, you'd be like, damn. You know what else is beautiful, Buck? That money. $10 million a year. Wow. Yeah. You talk about money whipping. I mean, Washington doesn't have the funds that a and M does. Yeah, I don't know. Like Jeff Trailer's a name that's been linked to AM for a while. Uh, you know, Jeff Trailer was linked to Texas Tech for a little bit before they decided to hire Joey McGuire. Uh, Jeff Trailer has a ton of connections throughout the state of Texas from his high school coaching career. Well liked, well respected. Uh, he's done a great job at UTSA in his few years in San Antonio. I just maybe that'd be a smart hire for AM. But it's not a splash hire for them. Yeah, and maybe that's what AM needs to do because Jimbo was the ultimate splash hire, right? Like he had already yes. won a national championship. He had had a ton of success. They were able to get him away from another, you know, big time program in college football. Like yeah, you need a, you need a lifer there. You need a guy who you have to run out of town eventually. Even after he wins and wins a bunch, eventually he'll get stale, and you have to run him out after like fifteen, like a Mac Brown, where mm -hmm. you just have to say, you know what, it's time to go. But you've won some big games. You've done some nice things. Jeff Trailer could be that guy. Plus, with his high school coach stuff here in the state, you don't lose out in recruiting. I think you only gain an advantage there. It's just, yeah, Jeff Trailer would run from UTSA to get to Texas A&M. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, I mean, they'll come up by meal. So, <laughs> and, they, and they wouldn't have to – I don't think they'd have to break crazy, crazy money for him, you know. But no. he also knows that they give away crazy money there. Yeah, if they are worried about expenses, which you wouldn't think that they are, considering they just paid a coach almost $77 million to leave, uh, then Jeff Trailer would make sense. Because, yeah, you wouldn't have to pay him as much as you would have to pay a Dan Lanning or a Lane Kiffin or a Mike Norvell or some of the other teams on this just list. simple stuff like moving costs. Like, you know, they pay for all the coaches to move and stuff. Mm -hmm. Hell, those guys from San Antonio to College Station – You'd save a buck. Hell, the alums could come and move them themselves. I mean, right, 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 right. Yeah, I think trailer would make some sense. I just, I'm with you. I don't know if it's a big enough name to appease the Aggie fan base right now. Like, you know, that, that might be what they need once again, but I just don't think they're going to end up doing it. I don't know. Kalen DeBoer is an interesting one. That guy's, that guy's done a great job at Washington. I mean, it, I don't I, see, Tom, I'm looking for Tom Herman. Uh, no. Yeah. I don't see Tom Herman on this list either. There's about 20 to 25 coaches on these Vegas odds right now. And, uh, no Florida Atlantic head coach, Turkey, Tom Herman is not one of them. No, I, I, I don't see much of any, except for Dan Campbell. Yeah. Dan I mean, Campbell, you brought him up yesterday. He is uh 14 to one tied with Dan Quinn, the current Cowboys defensive coordinator and also Cliff Kingsbury, former AM offensive coordinator, former Texas Tech head coach. Of course, uh, Kingsbury was the OC when Johnny Football was in Aggieland. Yeah, you can get him for about a half a dozen bucks. Yeah, Kingsbury to get back. And, but, you don't don't want, that, but you don't want to spend $12, $12 on him. Now, some other believe. interesting names on this list James Franklin, 12 to 1. I don't know if the Aggies want him. Penn State would like to be out of that. <laughs> I think you're right. If they State, got rid of Yersich, they got rid of Yersich, his offensive coordinator, but they didn't get rid of him. And I think Penn State would pay uh, for Franklin's flight down to Texas A&M. Uh, Sonny Dykes and Chris Kleiman, a couple of Big 12 coaches, the last two coaches that the Longhorns have gone up against. Of course, Sonny at TCU and Chris Kleiman at K-State. 
I could see Chris Kleiman le- leaving. If, if offered that job at Texas A&M, hell yeah. That would worry me a little bit. That would worry. It should, yes. Yeah. That guy That guy coming to Texas A&M would be a worry. Dan Campbell is still on my mind. How do you talk him? I mean, you know, he's a native of Texas, he and his wife. You know, I mean, and that's, and that's your alma mater. They come calling for some ridiculous money. I mean, Detroit probably pays him well, but they wouldn't pay him like they would at Texas A&M if he said, I'm coming. That guy would be coaching there forever. Yep. Yep. I, you're right. I mean, the Aggies can open up the uh, pocketbooks and pay oh my goodness. anybody how, they want. How crazy would that be, that guy, with yeah. those folks? Yeah, I don't uh, I don't think Dan Campbell's leaving because of what he's helped build with the Detroit Lions. But you never know. You never nothing know. Like building it, nothing like building it at your alma mater. And, and you can make more money than you make where you are. Mm-hmm. That's a that's that's uh, he and his wife will look at that because mama will have something to say about that deal. Yeah. Hey, if I'm home. if if I'm AM, I'm calling. Oh, for sure. I'm at least seeing if uh, Dan Campbell's interested and uh maybe Dan Quinn, Dan Quinn, no, that guy's an NFL guy. He's just waiting for his job to come open. I mean, Dan Quinn might be the next head coach of the Dallas right. Cowboys. Like you don't you don't leave that for Texas no. AM. And if Quinn's not the head coach of the Cowboys, you'd think he'd get some sort of NFL job. And yes. not too distant future, considering what he's done with the Dallas that defense. He's been turning down jobs in the NFL. He has been, absolutely. A couple more names that uh, I think are worth bringing up. Coach Prime, Deion Sanders, 20 to 1. Any chance? I don't know. Even the Aggies may have some humility, you know? Dude, I would love to see this happen because I think Deion would shit on AM fans and their weird traditions so much, and it'd be hilarious. And that's why they wouldn't do it because they they they're not they won't buy into that. It doesn't feel like a great culture fit there, right? No, like, no, it's just, no, it's just a different kind of culture out there. And uh, look, Dion's done a good job at Colorado. I know they've they've fallen off a little bit as of late, but um, feels well, I like. See, that. But I can see them messing with Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh's at fifty to one. I, I, I could see why, them. Why would Harbaugh leave Michigan for any other college job, let alone AM? That's, yeah, a, that's I'm just, a downgrade, not even a lateral movement. That's a huge step back. Why would he but do I could that? See him, I could see him thinking that he could change the culture at a place like AM and still recruit the state of Texas and have the best of the best. Mm-hmm. I think he I think he would feel like he like you know, it took him a couple of years to get it cranked at Michigan, but I think he could feel like I I'll have the talent and I can get the talent and I don't know. I'll cheat here eventually, but by yeah. that time, I'll be. I'll have enough money in my pockets. I'll be done. I mean, I see him as the next coach of the Chargers. So, hmm. yeah, I think uh, putting money on Jim Harbaugh to the Aggies is a waste. Honestly, I, I think there's a zero percent chance that happens. Uh, what about Urban Meyer? He's on this list at twenty to one. You talk about making a splash higher. Uh, he would be that. He's one of the most successful college football coaches in history. It would be like them to hire that dude. Yeah, I mean, we almost hired that dude a few years ago. Yeah, well, something happened along something happened along the way. Somebody got some pixie dust in him and felt good that we can't hire that guy here. So I think, yeah, or he might have said no and wanted to try his hand in the NFL. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that'd, that'd be a big name hire. That would scare me a little bit. Urban Meyer's a bad human being. And we know what happens to the programs that he's in charge of, but they win. They do win on the field. They don't win much off the field. They do win on the field. So that one would worry me a little bit. Is AM that desperate to where they would uh, go down the Urban Meyer well? I got to believe they're putting their, their, I think I got to believe they're putting their, they've heard it for years themselves. They got to be putting their money into Jeff Trailer. Hmm. Why the hell is Bill Belichick on this list? Because <laughs> they're just saying he'll be looking for a job after this. That's <laughs> what they're just trying to say. Well, how, how bizarre would that be? Oh, my God. Can you imagine that guy coaching, coaching college football? No, 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 no. Not anywhere. Definitely not at A&M, but, uh, yeah, not anywhere. So there you go. That's your uh, your current list. Vegas odds for who will be the next full-time head coach at Texas A&M. Yeah, I feel like Mike Elko and yes. Jeff Trailer are in the mix. Um, but I just don't know if either of those are big enough names. And and CB said it. 
And I tend to agree, like the Aggies need someone who can coach. They don't need flash. They just need someone who can actually build a program. And I think Mike Elko at Duke has shown that he can do that. And I think Jeff Trailer has shown yeah. that he can do that as well. I just, I don't know if the Aggies are going to be smart here. And this is a huge, huge hire for them, obviously. Uh, I just, I feel like they're going to try to go big game hunting and they're going to end up with somebody else. Well, if they're going big game hunting, then they're going to hire, hire Urban Meyer. You'll take that chance. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's you'll, you'll probably the that, biggest yeah, move. You'll take that chance if that's what if that's what you have to do in the SEC because that is just I, I see all the other guys as having to build up programs. That program that program just needs to. It, it's not like they have to look for talent. They have enough talented players. They just got to find a quarterback and a coach that can, you know, not have guys smoking weed behind the bus and stuff like that. I mean, they just need somebody to organize. With what they've got in stock, they've got plenty of talent. I yep. believe they yeah. just need a guy who can, you know, form the program. Just a no nonsense guy, not taking any shit from players. I don't care about your NIL deals. Get out here and play football. Let's go. You know, guys that he can help get to the that they can help get to the next level. You know, can can Jeff Trailer help you get to the next level? Because that's all the kids think about once they get there. Anyway, mm-hmm. are you going to get me to the next level? I mean, you coach at UTSA. I'm not going to school school there. I mean, this is. I mean, that's what people are thinking. That, that's how the players think now. Well, they'll still they, be they, able to recruit. They think about their NIL deals, but those dudes, that's a part of it. But they also, a part of it is, are you going to get me to the next level? Am I, you know, I'm a five-star guy. I should be playing in the NFL in three years. Can you, are you the coach that can get me there? Or are we going to be, you know, worried about what, what kid is doing this and that in the program? Who's running the program? Is the players running the program or is the coaches running the program? I don't know. Jeff Trailer seems like that kind of guy. They can bring all that stuff together. Yeah. And for not a lot of money, I don't think you'd have to break the bank to bring them in. No, I don't think you would either. And you're right. Talent's not an issue at Texas A&M. No. I mean, hell, they're two years removed from bringing in the best recruiting class in the history of recruiting classes, right? That's and right. They, they were recruiting at an elite level. And, you know, A&M's like Texas, I think, at this point when it comes to recruiting. You know, they're, they're always going to have top 10 to 15 classes just because of all that they have to offer. And, you know, NIL, obviously a big part of that now with Texas A&M. Like, they've got plenty of money to spend, clearly. They just paid, once again, $77 million for a coach to leave. Yes. So they'll, uh, they'll be able to uh, to get some guys via NIL. You get to play in the SEC. You get to play in the state of Texas. And we know how much talent's here in the Lone Star State. And there are plenty of things that will always uh, help A&M recruit at a pretty high level. They just need a coach who can actually run a program and develop that talent. Right. right. It's, it's the same problem that Texas had for a long time. They, the recruiting was never that much of an issue with Mac or Charlie or Tom. It was just talent being developed and it wasn't being developed here. Now talent's finally getting developed and you see Texas back in the national picture. Uh, that's what AM needs. They need somebody to, uh, to actually make sure once these guys get on campus that they're actually getting better. Uh, and that just hasn't happened under Jumbo Fisher. No, it's, it's, it, and as, as I said, they, you know, places like Oregon, you know, they've got Phil Knight's NIL money behind. I mean, they're, they've got the deal of a lifetime there. And Oregon spends an awful lot of time in the state of Texas. There's a lot of players on that team from the state of Texas. So that, that, and their coach is not going anywhere. He makes too much money at Oregon. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's a nice part of the country. He's got family. He's not getting up and leaving to come to Texas. He, when he can come and recruit players out of Texas to come to Oregon. And you just, the, the money, the money, the money, the money. Like you, you, you're thinking too much of, uh, I mean, what are, they, what are the Aggies going to, what are they going to do? Are they going to, their next coach, are they, they're going to let somebody walk again with $80 million, $90 million? I mean, if you've done it once, that's the going rate. I mean, so I, I, I the next coach there is not going to say, well, I'm not going to make less than that guy. Right. Yeah, no, if they're, if they're trying to hire a guy like Dan Lanning, then, yeah, they're going to have to offer, I don't know, $9, $10 million a year. But I don't think you have to do that with Jeff Trailer. Jeff Trailer yeah. will take the chance and say, I'll build the program there. You can you pay me now or you're going to pay me later. Once I get to winning at that place, you're gonna that next contract is going to be massive. Yep. But I don't think he comes in there trying to break their bank. He just would love that opportunity. No. I mean, look, Texas got Sark on the cheap. Yeah. Like, Sark is what? another chance. He's what the thirtieth high, thirtieth uh, highest paid coach in college football right now. He was looking for a chance. I mean, yeah. for all the things that had gone on in his life, this was just an opportunity for him. Right. And, and if, if he wins, he'll they're get paid. pay him too. Right. Yeah. I mean, if Texas wins the Big Twelve this year, Sark's probably getting an extension. 
Absolutely. Race this offseason, and, and he'll have earned it. Uh, he will have earned it. So that dude's getting an extension if he wins. If he wins 10 or 11 games, he's going to get an extension. That's going to happen no matter if he gets to the to the Big 12 championship or not. He's already going to get an extension, I believe. If he wins 10, he's going to get an extension. Oh, man. You think if Texas comes up short of the Big 12 title, he gets an extension? Yes. I don't. Yes. Oh, yeah. A, a two-year extension, yes. I, I don't think so. But I, I expect Texas to get to the Big 12 championship game. So I, I do ultimately expect Sark to get one. But – uh, if Texas like loses these last two games, think about it. They could lose these last two games. Knock on wood. God forbid. Finish the regular season nine and three, and then win a bowl game and get the ten wins. You think that would get yes. Sark a new contract? Oh, I think man. ten wins is going to get him a contract, God, uh, an I'd, extension. I'd be I'd be a little bit upset if if that happened. And everybody on his staff is getting one too. Hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I'd hope you're wrong, but I, I hope that's not a, a discussion we actually have to have because I know Texas wins these next two and they win the Big 12 and everyone's happy about Sark getting a, his old contract ripped up and a new one placed in front of him to sign. Yeah, you can, you can give him a new one. If he, gets, if he gets to the championship game, give him one. If he plays in that championship game because that's what we thought he would do. Now, during the course of thinking he was going to get to the championship game, there were a bunch of people that said, no, win the championship game. I thought, just get me there and let me play for it and let the chips fall where they made from that point on. As I said, anything happens in a single game in a championship is a monster game. And I don't care what conference you're getting ready to go to, you know, to leave this conference in this particular year where the teams aren't that great. Well, wait a minute. The teams are pretty damn good. Some of these teams that he's had to beat are pretty good. They beat a lot of teams in this nation and a bunch of conferences. So if, if he gets to that championship game, I think he's going to get an extension. I still think he gets one at 10, but if he gets to the game and doesn't win the game, something happens, loses with a field goal, something odd happens in the game, I think they still give him an extension. Yep, I could see that one happening. But uh, you got to get there. Of course. Well, okay, yeah, that's well, that's different. You, did you just change your mind? Well, I, no, I, I know. I, I'm just saying I think here's what Texas, the people at Texas and Chris Del Conde will do. They'll give him, they'll give him an extension on 10 wins. Uh-huh. My deal is, just get to the just get to the championship game. I've never been from the beginning. I never said win it. I said anything can happen in a championship game. Just anything could happen. Just get me there so I'm playing in it. So maybe the things that happen in that game happen for the good for me. But you can't have anything good or bad happen to you if you don't get there. Your season's over. You go home. Right. You don't, you don't get to do anything else. Just get to. I thought in the beginning of the season, just get to the championship game, and no matter. The weirdest things, you lose your running back, you've lost your quarterback for a couple of games, it's still in your hands. Yep, still in your hands. And yep. you got two more games you got to win in the regular season to get there. We'll hear from Steve Sarkeesian in a moment. He, of course, met with the media yesterday, as he does on every Monday during football season. But before we do that, let's give some love to some of our fantastic sponsors. Buck. Mike, relax the back. You know, the comfort that I needed, I get from relax the back. You know, I had – thoracic back surgery about 20 years ago. And there were folks that told me, the doctor saying, dude, you're not playing golf anymore. And I said, not so fast, doctor. I am going to play golf. There is no way that this is going to happen. And I'm going to do everything I need to do in order to make that happen for me is to continue to play my golf game and play at a high level that I play at. And so I went over to relax the back and Jason, the guys that relax the back, found me the, the chair that I needed. Whether I was going to be sitting in this chair watching TV or sitting in a chair doing work like we're doing this morning. I found a comfortable chair that really helps out my thoracic back, my lumbar area, and even my neck and shoulders, thanks to the folks that relax the back. And you can do the same. Find out, live health, live healthier, live happier. Find out about the tempur sales that they have on the mattresses. I do not have a tempur mattress yet. I still got my old mattress that I love, so I haven't made that move yet. But if you're having problems, Look at the tempur mattresses that they have and the wonderful sales that they have at Relax the Back. Two great locations, of course, at the Hill Country Gallery across from the Whole Foods and in Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store. Live pain-free like the buck with Relax the Back. Hmm, you told your doctor this. Not so fast, midget. Not so fast. <laughs> I'm like, that dude said, dude, when we do this surgery and we, we reconstruct your thoracic back, there's a good chance that the game of golf will not. I'm like, oh, no. That's not happening, dude. I'm playing golf. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not running the marathon, and I never did. But I will be playing golf. So, thank you, Doc. Did a good enough job for me to at least do that and relax the back. It's continuing to help that on. Hey, Doc. 
there's a good chance you can F off, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that was basically what I was saying. <laughs> oh, that is great. That is great. Shout out to our friends at Relax the Back. Shout out to our man Tom McKay and AV Consultations. How about a word from the man, the myth, the legend himself? Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audiovisual Consultations. Scientific data proves it. Size does matter. The bigger and wider your television is, the better. Football season is here, and the time is now to get your entire audio video experience tuned up and ready. New flat screens, projection video, Dolby True HD surround, all the goodies at great prices and followed up with great service. So call us at 255-8678. That's 255-8678 or on the web at avconsultations.com. Oh, yeah. Uh, BK, by the way, a, a quick uh, tip for the kids in the car line brought to our good friends over there at Relax the Back. Never underestimate the difference you make. Never underestimate the difference you make, kids. There you go. By I'm your sorry words, about that, by, Buck. I yeah, forgot, about, your, it. I forgot oh, about your tip for kids today. Don't worry about it. By your, by, your, by your actions, by your words, by your deeds, just don't underestimate the difference that you can make in some other kid's life. So think about that. We're coming in. And, and for me, for the folks that uh, hit us on that text line, that code of text line, 512-222-9328. If I can make a difference for you, if you're struggling from some addictions and I have, you know, I, I, I'm an alcoholic. If you need some, somebody to talk to, just hit us on the text line, get, get me, get me a number. I'll give you a call, talk to you a little bit about, you know, what I've had to do on a daily basis to survive my addiction. If I can help you out, I definitely will. Now I don't know about drugs, but I do know about alcohol addiction. And if I can help you or anybody out there that has a son or a daughter that they're worried about, in high school, because we can go as low as that when it comes to alcohol and drug addiction. So yeah. if I can help out your family, and it's getting towards those holidays, and it's getting towards the sticky time for people with addictions, they start to go in the tank right now. They start thinking that holidays mean drink, eat, and drink, and drink a lot. So be careful out there if you're struggling with with any addiction. But I am here. If I can help you, just hit us on, the spec, on this uh, text line, this coded text line. And I'll find you. I'll give you a call. Believe me. That's awesome, man. Appreciate you doing that. That's uh, awfully kind of you. Yeah, the code of text line, 512-222-9328. Uh, it'll, it'll be anonymous. It will be anonymous. We'll Absolutely. pass the number along to the buck, and he will uh, reach out and give you a holler. But uh, that's, uh, I did that's feel, awesome. I, I, you know, over the last couple of years when I was doing radio, BK, there were, there were people who, who hadn't gotten in touch with relatives, and have had trouble getting in touch, you know, they, you know, may have not been on speaking terms they, or they just haven't spoke to their relatives. They sent me the numbers of their relatives and I'd call them up that week before Christmas and, you know, just to say hello, you know, and, and how you doing and what's going on. And, you know, such and such hadn't talked to you in a while. He wanted me to say hello. I don't know why he can't call or she can't call, but no matter what's happened between you, I just wanted to say hello, see how you're doing. And I mean, I got that, that felt so good. That was the best, you know, Talking yeah. to somebody's talking to somebody's relative that I mean there are some separate there are some separations in families that you just people would just wouldn't believe that they have they have family members they haven't talked to in years. Man, you know, just years. That's the saddest thing ever to me. You know? I know. Like I, I couldn't imagine ever turning my back or having to turn my back on a family member, you know, and, and it's, uh, I got, I'm so close to my family and I'm, I'm so grateful for them. And just the thought of not being able to see them or talk to them or just losing one of them is the, the worst thing ever. So you're right. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a, that's a real thing that's out there, man. And it sucks. I don't speak to mine on the, on the daily, you know, but I hear from my daughters, I hear from my kids and, you know, my sisters, you know, I've lost a brother and I, I mean, I hear from, I hear from my sisters all the time. They listen, they listen to us in the morning and get a chance to see and tell me how skinny I look and mm. you need to eat some more. And hey, are you are you trying to be a transient amnesia guy? What's the deal? How you yeah, doing? drink your water and drink, drink. your oval teen, okay? Yes, all that stuff. So I mean, family's important. I mean, and and as we go on and we're losing we're 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 seeing people displaced from their families all over this world. It is. It is sad. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen to you if you can prevent it from happening. That's that just makes sense, you know. Yep. And 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 you know there are times you that you just have to suck it up. You be the one to forgive and forget. I, I've done that. I did that with my father a long time ago, and you know I I wish I, I would say that I'm. I wish that it, I I wish that it would never have happened, but it did, and I was kind of displaced mentally. The whole works for my dad. 
And there is, there's no, no kid should be without a dad. It just, mm-hmm. it shouldn't happen. And it's especially if they're around. So somebody has to give in. I never gave in. And that's my fault. That's mm-hmm. not, that was not my father's fault. That was me. That was my stubbornness and saying that I could never forgive. And I never did. I mean, I just, I didn't, but my brothers and sisters understood how important family was and they still, they are still together and they still, you know, still talk to each other. They still have their little picnics and things like that. But my sisters and them are always in contact with me, which I love it. So if I could help anybody else out, please let me have that ability to do that. That would be a favor to me, not to you. That's awesome. Thanks for that, Buck. Really, really cool stuff right there. Really, really cool stuff. All right, uh, let's uh, let's talk some Texas Longhorn football here, Buck. Steve Sarkeesian met with the media yesterday. And, well, he – I don't want to say he broke the news because we all found out the news over the weekend that Jonathan Brooks had torn his ACL and was going to miss the remainder of the 2023 season. Here is Sark, part of his opening statement yesterday, talking about the loss – Jonathan Brooks losing Jonathan uh, for the season is a, is a tough blow for us. Um, you know, I've, I've said this about a couple other backs that were here before him, but you know, I think the one thing that that probably stings most for us as a team is the teammate that Jonathan Brooks is. Now, he's a better person than he is football player, and he is a heck of a football player. He's a great runner. Uh, he can pass protect. He can, he's a weapon out of the backfield catching the ball. Um, so naturally, uh, that creates a void, uh, but that also creates opportunity. And so he'll be missed. Um, he'll be with us, and we're going to support the heck out of him um, like, like we have in his entire time here, and he, I think he understands that. And I know those other backs are going to need his support, and that's where, where our culture has got to shine through. Uh, but obviously it creates opportunities, obviously, for, for C.J. Baxter, uh, Jaden Blue, Keelan Robinson, Savion Red, um, and those guys are more than than capable of, of doing a great job. So systematically, uh, things will not will not change for us on that front, um, and we've got a lot of faith in those guys that they're going to perform at a high level. Well, that's just simply the way they have to do. They have to perform. They have to take a, a, another step up. And you know, you know, you had your young running back that you thought was the best best back that you had who started for three games. His level of play has to be his level of play has to pick up now. He's got to do some things that he hadn't we haven't seen him do yet. And that's that's difficult when you when you're still kind of feeling your way around as a freshman. But if you're good enough, you're old enough. And you know what I'm saying? And it has it just has to be that way now for him. He has to do some things that we haven't seen him do. I mean, in between the tackles, he's got to make some guys miss in there. We know he has the speed. You know, we know how we know he has the power, the power, he's now got to, he's now got to break, he's got to break tackles and still throughout that still contain that, maintain the same, the kind of speed that he has because he's got legitimate speed yeah. right? and he's a big sucker and he can move a pile, but now he's got to dish out punishment. Those four yard runs have to be incredible, but we're, our expectations are we're going to see the 20, 25 yard run too. I mean, but they're going to miss this guy. This is uh, you don't lose a back. One of the best backs in the nation. And just say, you know, the other guys, you know, this is a, it is an opportunity for him, but you're truly going to miss him and you're going to miss his leadership because the way he ran and the way he played was leadership enough on that football field. Now, I mean, I don't know much about him as a kid. Sounds like he's a great kid, but I know what he does on the field. I don't get to see him every day. I don't see him at practice. I don't see him walking around campus or the way he teaches other kids. But I just know that when he's on that field, he leads by example. He's their best offensive player. So far yep. this year, he has yep. been. He's been their best and most consistent offensive yes. player. So he, without a doubt, is a big loss for this Texas football team. But I'm putting it team. on the coaches that make make these other guys good. I like Jaden Blue. Mm-hmm. I think he's. I think he's got some wiggle to him. I think he's got more strength than you think. He just doesn't have the experience. And but it's not like once again, it's not like he just got there. To me, as at running back, once you get to be a sophomore and you're around a program for two years, you're a, you should be a natural. If you got to a place like Texas, you're a natural. And yep. it's not about the scheme, the system. It's about your natural ability. You know, you should be able to – if you're a runner, you can run. You can understand what you've been doing for a long, long time. It's not like a quarterback where it may take you a couple years. You know what I'm saying? Runners are runners, no matter what the system is. You know, that you, you should see them stand out. C.J. Baxter was the number one runner in America two years ago. So – I mean, and, and is he good as a freshman? Yeah, he's adequate as as a freshman. You know, you you see you see some things out of him, but you see a lot of things like 
out of him that I see in a lot of freshman backs all over the country. Mm-hmm. He has to step his game up now, BK. You know what I'm saying? Yes. He has to step up from what we've seen now. In order yep. for him to get to that championship game and win that, hell, in order for them to win the next two games, he's got to be a, a, a difference maker. Oh, well, it's the old cliche, next man up. And yes. that's what it is for Texas, right? I mean, you've got some talented dudes. You said it, C.J. Baxter was – at one point, the number one running back recruit in the country yes. in the class of 2023. Um, Jaden Blue was at one point the number one running back in the state of Texas. Yes. He's been a part of this program for a couple of years. Keelan Robinson was good enough to get a scholarship at Alabama. Obviously transferred over from there when Steve Sarkeesian took the job at the University of Texas. Savion Red was only a three-star, but hey, you're, you're pretty damn good if you get a scholarship from UT. So there's some talent in this running back room right now. Just not a lot of experience, right? Like we haven't seen a lot from these guys in games. Some of them have been here for a while. Hell, we've seen a lot of Keelan Robinson, but we haven't seen a lot of him running the ball, right? He's been more of a special teams guy, a returner. Occasionally he's had a couple of carries and a couple of catches out of the backfield, but most of what he's done at Texas has been on special teams. Savion Red hasn't been much of a traditional runner, right? We've seen the Red Cat, the Wild Cat, the Code Red, whatever you want to call it. But, yeah, you just don't have a large sample size of any of these guys like being bell cow type of running backs at this level. So it it will be different for Texas, and you hope all of them step up, but at least one of them is going to have to step up to fill the void that Jay Brooks is leaving. Yeah, I'm going to look at Keelan Robinson because I'm looking at him because he's played at Alabama. He's been to Texas. He's he's been – he's not like a a sophomore or or freshman out of high school coming to this level. He's been in, in, in the thick of things at a major college level. And the same that, that we saw from Jonathan Brooks uh, last year when, uh, you know, when they had the outstanding kid here last year, the, 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 the great player, Eric B. John Robinson, when, when Brooks got into games, he still looked really good at mm-hmm. the end of games where he's came in and still had 100-yard games. Keelan Robinson should be, should be at that point right now that it's his turn to get in there and do some special things because we saw him last year, you know, explode at times, too, when he got in games where he had long runs. Well, now he needs to be in there on a consistent basis and have those same type of runs. Why not? Why can't he do it? You know, I know he's not a big guy, but, I mean, we've seen him take off and outrun everybody. We've seen him make people miss. We've seen him break tackles at this level before. It wouldn't be – it wouldn't surprise you to see him take off and go and break a couple tackles because we've seen him do it before at this level. Let's hear more from Steve Sarkeesian talking about the running backs, right? He kind of elaborated on all four of those guys and what he's seen from them and what they can bring to the table to replace Jonathan Brooks. I I think that's fair. You know, I think that we have, you know, uh, a a little sample size on those guys from in-game. We've got a much bigger sample size from them from a practice perspective. You know, I think one thing where we're fortunate, you know, timing is is, is pretty incredible in that CJ's, really 100% healthy again and you know I'd feel really uncomfortable if this would have happened a month ago um, because Cedric was was really struggling with his foot Uh, for for him to be healthy I'm very confident in that I think we've naturally seen over the last couple weeks you know we've been you know kind of injecting Jaden Blue a little bit more into the offense. So I think his comfort level of playing, and he's had some carries. He had the long touchdown run versus BYU, um, where I think his comfort level will be there. And obviously he's playing a ton on special teams. I think obviously with Savion Red, you know, we've we've incorporated him into our short yardage offense in the Wildcat stuff. So he's carried the ball at some critical moments of some games, and we've asked a lot of him. So I don't think the moment will be too big for him. And naturally the experience of Keelan – of just the player that that he's been over time and so um you know we feel comfortable that we have those four guys that core of guys um you know it's obviously it's monday and we're still working through the game plan of exactly how it all roll out but we're comfortable with those guys going in the game and playing i'll just say this about Sabian red he has something that he does pretty well that's that red package or whatever leave him there don't i don't see him as being a give me the ball 15 times 15 times a game guy i just I mean, he's just – isn't he just learning that position, the running back? What was he before? He was a wide receiver, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't see it as a natural. I see him still learning how to be a running back. And he's, got, and he's got a – you know, he's got a system that he runs right now, and he's still learning how to do that, figure out where the, hole, where the holes are. I can't see him in a series as a, as a runner. I'm like, wow, don't you have two other guys that are better than that right now that have played that position that understand that? Leave him in the package that he's at. 
it's nice to say his name to make him feel warm and fuzzy all over, but shit, I would hate to see him in there for two series in a row. I'd be like, really? Yeah, I'm with you. I think the only time we see Savion Red carry the ball is if we see the code red package again. And I think a lot of Texas fans are ready to retire that formation because over the last couple of weeks, it hasn't been very good. Now, earlier in the year, it was maybe Texas's most successful short yardage play, but uh, didn't work against K-State and didn't work last week against TCU. And then Savion Red had that penalty, that unsportsmanlike conduct penalty when he was, was on the silly, side. That line. was a silly one, which they didn't need to – they didn't need even, even need to call that anyway. That's well, just a bunch of guys talking crap. I mean, it's just I, – I know they tried to control the game. I didn't think it was really necessary. I just think it was one of those deals, hey, Mr. Official, talk to the kid. He's not throwing punches. He's just talking shit over there. Why don't you just talk to him? Why do you try not to inject yourself into a 15-yard penalty in a tight game like that unless you're working for your mark? Are you working for him? Of well, course you are. Well, Savion Red bumped into a guy like when he shouldn't have. And also, Texas probably could have been flagged for a late hit on that same play, and they weren't. Like the TV announcers were like, there should have been 30 yards of penalties on this play because those would be two separate calls, right? The late hit out of bounds and then an unsportsmanlike conduct yeah. penalty. So um, I, I I think Texas maybe got I off guess the hook. I one out of that. two ain't bad. One out yeah, of two yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I don't know exactly what Savion Red said, and he barely bumped the guy. So you could argue that that was a little bit soft. But I uh, I won't I won't get mad. I actually, at the thought, I actually thought yeah. I, I mean I I saw the whole incident. I I thought it was I I, I guess yeah. It was a late. He was out of bounds. It wasn't yep. much of a hit, but it was out of bounds. And then the the little confrontation. I was I was thinking. Oh, hell, now they're going to have to call something. They missed the out-of-bounds one, so let's just call the little bump and talk right there. But, yeah, he's, he's got to be more mature than that. But No, yeah. leave, him in, leave him in his Wildcat package. Get the other two guys. Blue is the guy. Blue is the guy right now for me that still – I know they, 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 tend to, they tend to worry about – you know, they always give you the old, well, I don't know if he can pass protect. Well, if he can't pass protect, then you need another running back coach. I mean, by this time in his career, he's a sophomore. He can't stick his body in front of somebody and take a blow and get knocked on his own ass. So what? Mm -hmm. I mean, stick your face in there. Don't don't whiff. You know, uh, Cedric Baxter got away with one last week where he where he cut a guy. He made a he made the block so the ball could be thrown. But you don't want to see guys cutting guys because they fall towards the quarterback when you cut a guy. They don't you don't cut them and they they flip over backwards and go the other way towards the defense and then they've. They generally come flying in. They go straight over, and they land at the quarterback's legs. So he's got to start to – he's got to bow himself up because he's big enough and strong enough. As I said, he's the guy. He's been in the games now. I mean, he's going to get a blow here or there by Jaden Blue, but he's got to be the bell guy, the, the guy for the, rest, for the rest of the season throughout. Yep. And he's got to be special. There's a uh, another one of Bucky's tips for kids in the car line. Stick your face in there and don't whiff. Yeah, do, do not – you can't miss. You can't totally miss, guys. Now, if Jaden Blue just totally misses, guys, then that's – Oh, that's what you meant by don't whiff. You didn't mean yeah. don't – No, no, whiff. no. Stick don't, your face no, in there and no, don't, don't whiff. Your, no, no, you don't have to take a whiff. No, no, no. Uh, not, not underneath the armpit. None of that. Don't sit uh, your face near for a whiff. Just don't miss a guy. Right. You know? Just yeah. be a sacrificial lamb. C.J. Baxter did – pick up a big block on the third and 12th, the big pass to A.D. Mitchell that iced right. the game for Texas on that final drive. Uh, TCU brought, I think, a safety blitz, and C.J. Baxter picked it up, and it gave Quinn Ewers the time to find Adonai Mitchell down the field for Texas to convert that third and long to win the game. So Yeah, the thing about picking up blitzes, and, and especially linebackers inside where they outweigh you by 15, 20 pounds, is you got to get – when you know that's your man and he starts coming, he's really coming, B.K., you can't wait for him. You have to meet him where all the madness is inside because that way he doesn't, he doesn't have many go many two or three way goes when you get him inside with the tackles and the guards and all the other shit that's in there, legs and everything else. It's when the running back waits in the backfield and the guy breaks through the line of scrimmage and then he tries to take on the linebacker and a, and a running back ends up in the lap of the quarterback a lot of times that way. My guys used to meet you in the line of scrimmage. When we, when we knew you were coming – okay, we're going to catch you in the crap in there where you can't get away. If you come at us this way, if you fall sideways, you're going to fall into the legs or the shoulders of somebody else. But when those guys have a full head of steam, then you're about to get your ass knocked out. Hmm. 
running back. You're, you're taking the blow then. Hey, that stuff is always important. It's paramount right now because oh, yes. your starting quarterback is dealing with an air conditioner injury. That absolutely, you're absolutely right. You can't be back there catching blows now. So, and if and if if the uh, if if that's what the problem is with Jaden Blue, you got to coach him up that you got to go on the attack. And yeah. I mean that guy, that guy is that guy can run. He runs a ball with a lot of velocity. You know, he takes on stuff. He spins. He does all those other things. I don't know what kind of inside runner we haven't seen much of that. I know if he gets you on the edge, you got some problems if he gets out on the perimeter. And he may be the jet sweep guy. I mean, you're just going to have to use him in ways that 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 are going to work for him. Don't mm-hmm. put him in situations that he can't succeed in, you know? Right, right, right. Well, Texas, I don't think, gave up a sack against TCU. I don't think Quinn Ewers got hit in the game against TCU. So most of that obviously has to do with the offensive line. But yes. uh, you're going to need your running back to help pick up some blitzes this weekend because you know Iowa State's going to try to bring the house – uh, to get to Quinn, also to confuse these Texas running backs a little bit. So, uh, yeah, you got to keep Quinn upright this weekend, and the running backs have a lot to do with that. And obviously, you got to be able to run the football. I mean, Jonathan right. Brooks went for more than 100 yards in six of the last eight games, and he was in the 90s in the two games that he didn't break the century mark. So, uh, he was and really good, defense, and he was defense, really consistent. And your defense needs to understand that. Sorry, guys. There are going to be some three and outs with this offensive group now without this running back. Your level of football has got to be championship level football from this point on. For four quarters, please. Yes, yes, for four not quarters. Just, not just for a half because the last no. two weeks, hell, really, the last two weeks for three quarters, the Texas defense has been playing pretty damn well. And then things have just fallen apart in the fourth quarter. Uh, please keep it together for all four quarters, defense. Yes, and, and this offense will get in a rhythm. I mean, it's not going to be totally put on the running back to get it done. They'll get in a rhythm where you get a couple nice runs. The defense is going to have to look out a little bit, too. They're going to understand, well, that, by the way, the backup running back is a pretty good running back. Let's not, you know, let's not, let's not, let's make sure that we, we understand that that guy can hurt us. But we need to really understand that those guys out there at the wide out position and this quarterback can kill us. So, yeah. Well, you got to remember Iowa State runs that 3 3 5 defense. Sure. Another one, which is, kind of designed to protect against the pass. Like Iowa State wants teams to run the football against Sure they them. do. They don't want to give up big plays over the top. And so, when you don't have an experienced runner, that really sucks. And I think Iowa State's got the best pass defense in the conference right now. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. When you don't have your number one running back, it's it's a little bit scarier because well, the team you know tries to prevent you from being able to pass the football. So normally, oh, the starting running back's out. Well, let's just utilize the quarterback a little bit more and let's try to win this game with our passing game. Well, Iowa yeah. State's defense is designed to neutralize that. So well, Texas is going to have spend, to. The, the team, and, and Sark can't spend them time going, woe is me, about Jonathan Brooks. That's just football. That could happen. That could have happened in the first game. That could have happened at practice during the course of the week. So you can't do it. You just got to find out what do you do? What do you do best? Who's your next best option? But I know that that guy will be missed. It's this offense will not be the same. No, no, it it's be. just not going to be the same. Hey, I mean, they, they thought highly enough of CJ Baxter. That's going right. The season where they named him the starter. So there, there's no doubt about it. I'll always fall back on the fact that they thought he was that good, that, yeah. that he wasn't, he was better than the guy who, who was, you know, one of the Doak Walker candidates and one of the best running backs in the nation. So if they thought that highly of him, then coach him up. Let's get that. Let's get what you can get out of him. Yep. And here in Sark, yeah, excuse me, Buck. And hearing Sark say that uh, C.J. Baxter is the healthiest he's been in more than a month, that's also great news because yes, I mean, we, we talked about that. That guy got hurt in the first game of the year, and it feels like he's been dealing with something every week since the season started. So hopefully and he's not- got something. There's some stuff that we haven't seen from him, BK. You know what I mean? Because he hadn't played enough. Right, right. So we, we need to see all that that stuff that they thought that he was that good. If it's if it's there, they've seen it. So let us all see it now and, and and make sure you can get him in spots where he can show his talents. I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. All right, before we uh, hear more from Steve Sarkeesian, and we'll talk about the CFP rankings that uh, will come out again tonight. We'll also talk some Monday Night Football. We've got some baseball news to get into as the Houston Astros have hired themselves a new manager and there's a potential front runner for Shohei Otani already. We got all of that to get into, plus a funny airplane video that we need to talk about. But before all of that, Buck, some love to some sponsors. How about Dr. Eckert? How about Dr. Greg Eckert, the all-star group of professionals that do everything from general dentistry to the most advanced work? And the advanced work is 
getting chiclets like these beauties right here. See these veneers? Only in two visits. That's all it took to get those veneers put in. And folks, if you think you're a candidate for, how about this, dental implants, if you're wanting to go into an office and then come out with a smile in just one day, not, I mean, I waited a little bit. I had to have temporaries put in. I waited a couple of weeks. But if you want to smile in a day, Dr. Eckerton can do that for you too. Find out if you're a candidate for dental implants by calling him today at 512-345-3166. In general dentistry, teeth cleaning, teeth widening, tooth loss solution extractions, Dr. Eckert does that also. Over 1,500 cases of restoring teeth, over 28 years of business in Central Texas. You're going to love this guy. And if you've got dental anxiety, like a lot of folks do, that's just probably the primary reason why people won't go to the dentist is they have the dental anxiety. They're just so nervous to sit in a chair. Dr. Ecker uses gloves. Everything's good with him. His staff, they're absolutely wonderful. They're not going in there barehanded like back in the old days. They will make you feel comfortable. And if they have to IV sedate you, then they will in order to get your dental health done the correct way. And if you got dental insurance, this is the time. We're starting to get towards that time where these appointments will fill up. And so don't let that happen to you. Don't lose your dental insurance because you're trying to wait, because you'll have to wait all the way until the new year. Don't do that and find out uh, that you're not going to get your dental uh, care taken care of. Dr. Ecker will get that done. They take most insurances. So give them a call to find out. Let them know what your insurance is and get in there and get your chiclets done the right way. And they will do it the right way. Believe me, I've been there. I feel very, very comfortable when I'm at Dr. Eckert's office. I'm comfortable with his staff, and you will be too. 512-345-3166. He's our dentist. should be your dentist also. Amen, amen, amen. Shout out to Doc. You and shout out to our guy Steve over at Pest Wranglers. We'll let you hear from them right now. Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. What are you doing? I'm making a silly commercial like other companies so people will remember our name. But we're not like other companies. Anyone could see that from our five-star reviews. But how will people remember Pest Wranglers? Well, once they try us, they'll never forget that we are the most effective, reliable, and affordable pest control company. I guess you're right. Pest Wranglers is the best at pest control, wildlife management, termite pest control. Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. What are you doing? Hey, it couldn't hurt. Pest Wranglers, 512-670-7808 or find us on the web at pestwranglers.com. Oh, yeah. Shout out Pest Wranglers. And I've got a bone to pick with the people out there, Buck. Oh, no. You're after those people? Those people. You people. Them people. Them people. He, him people. I he, saw, her I saw people. that the other day. I saw somebody at Starbucks because I always learn about saying, hey, thank you, ma'am, or thank you, sir, because I actually did call a, a dude a dude. He says, I'm not a dude. And I said, well, you got some bad makeup on then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, so, you didn't. I did. Oh, I bust. I busted this. This. I. At maybe one time he was a dude, but he just I said, I said, uh, no, no, it was the other way around. I'm sorry. I said, thank you, young lady. And he said, uh, I'm a I'm a dude. That's what he said. I'm a dude. And that's when I said, "Ooh, that makeup job, man. Wow. And and so I went on. And then. When you, when you make that mistake, then you try to go into the small talk, like what high school did you go to and all that stuff. When you know you've already screwed it up. I mean, you've effed it up already oh. by saying, hey, young lady. And so, I'm, I mean, I, I, call, I call older women. I said, hi, young lady. Thank you. Can I open up the door for a young lady? And this, this, this young lady said, not a lady. I'm a oh. dude. And I'm like, okay. So you say that. So yeah, you I say guess. you are. You mean so you like, say that I, they, they are what they say they are, right? Yeah, they no, that's right. Yeah. But somebody said, "Don't say young lady, don't say young man, don't say anything." I'm like, "I'm that's just my greeting. That's I'll take that chance. I'll take that chance. If I see these big old boobies, I'm probably going to say young lady. You know what mm. I'm saying? I'm not. I'm not going to the, any of the other stuff. I'm not playing the other games. So wow. you said but, young lady to a man, huh? But I, yeah, I'm a dude. I'm a dude. And it's just, it's hard because somebody, it's like the them, they, I'm not, I'm not calling somebody them or they, I'm not, I'm I, sorry. I'm uh, not doing it. I'm, I'm probably not going to do that. But somebody said, don't be so personal with people. I'm like, wait a minute. That's just my nature. I mean, that's, I'm not going to not be personal with somebody, you know, I'm not uh, asking about surgery or anything else about what, what are you trying to do? But I, I mean, I have small talk. And if I say young lady and I think it's a young lady and I make the mistake, my mistake, 
because I, I never, I, I, but I know the one I never, ever make, ever, ever, and I, I've never made it. Uh, like, when is the baby due? <laughs> I've never, <laughs> ever, ever made that. I, 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 I've never made that, ever made that. that? Thing. I don't, I just, I just, I don't even take that chance. So oh. is the summertime, is it hot when you're getting ready to deliver here in a couple months? I don't do that. You've I don't, never done it. I've never done it. I've oh. never done, I've never been in that position to make that mistake. I think I'm, I don't know who taught me that. It may have been my sisters or somebody like, don't even, don't go there. Don't even try to go there. Yeah. If they bring up the fact that they're having a baby, then you can ask about it, but don't ask about it unless they talk about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one they have to bring it up to me. They want to have, they have to strike up that conversation with me. I don't, I'm, I won't, I won't, I won't do that. That's the one I just, I won't do, mm. you know, Yeah. between um, that one and tell somebody about their kid in a store you know, there's certain things I've learned along the way, you know, in, a, in an HEB where this lady was almost about to take her little kid's arm out of the socket. And I said to her, I said, how would you like for me to, how would you like for me to pull your arm out of the socket like that? And the lady said, how would you like to not, how would you like to mind your own fucking business? She said to me, I'm like, oh, oh yikes. Oh. And so that's, that was like, you know what? She's kind of right. That's not my business. That's her child. Yeah. Now, Which, parents don't like being told how to parent. Yeah, but it was it was it was abusive. It was like abusive, and I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't I couldn't take it to see that that kid was holding the arm and like it was like, you know, the mom was jerking that arm around. And I said, Ben, how would you like somebody to jerk your arm around like that? She's mm -hmm. like, how would you like to mind your effing business? And I'm like, was it, was it Adrian Peterson's wife by chance? But it was, you know, at that moment it hit me and it's like, you know, that's not my business, but. It kind of is my business, you know? Uh, I don't know, man. I feel like I'm going to have to spend money on uh, sensitivity training with Texas Sports Unfiltered after hearing some of those stories right there. Well, that wasn't a bad – that's not a bad one with the with the jerk and the kid. You can't see it. Man, that kid was like two. No, that one's not the problem. It's the – Oh, oh, hi there. Hi. Hey there, not, young lady. I'm not a lady. I'm a dude. He mm. said I'm like, oh, yeah, but that's a bad makeup job then. Yikes, 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 yikes. Well, I'm mad at the people because I went to Walmart yesterday and there was no more Olipop. What? They sold out. I'm sure they're going to restock, but that didn't help me yesterday. You were really. probably at the same Walmart I was at. Off of Bar yeah. Yeah, I was there yesterday for a little bit. Yeah, I was yeah. doing the grandpa, let's get the gifts before Thanksgiving deal going. There you go. Because I like to get my Christmas shopping in before Thanksgiving. Uh, you're buying stuff at Walmart? No, oh, there's some stuff. There's some Spider-Man stuff that my grandson likes. He's a oh, Spider-Man guy. Yeah, they got the little toys for the kids. Yeah, and smart. the pajamas and all the little bed sheets. Hell, my son, AJ, had Superman bed sheets that I kept for him. After he was like in college, I kept the, the twin bed sheets. Did you the, give it to the grandkids now? No, no, no. I tried to give it back to AJ. 20 five 30 year old bed sheets to... i tried to give it to the trash and you know i still have those remember those supermans that you loved that you had to have i tried to tell him i still have those he goes you kept those i said of course i kept that i'm a hoarder like that yeah. and he's like i said so would you like to have those back maybe for your kid if you get married or not get married and just have a kid he's like no dad there's some other there'll be some other new power ranger or mortal combat hero that my kid would probably want. I don't think he wants the Superman mm. used, probably peed on sheets. That I have. Used sheets. You can't get ass out of jeans and you can't get <laughs> ass out of sheets. Those are the rules, man. I don't want no uh, used sheets. What are you doing for your Olipop now? So I got to go to Target. I'm sure they'll restock it at Walmart, but hey, that's that's good news. That means Olipop is selling and it should there be selling. Go. It's great stuff. If you haven't tried it yet, you are missing out. Clearly, it's not just me talking about Olipop. It's uh, the people. They have spoken. With their actions, with their wallets. They it's love Olipop. Beautiful. Great tasting soda that's actually good for you. Only two to five grams of sugar in every can. You've got nine grams of fiber in every can. And of course, the great soda taste. Yeah, it tastes just like the stuff that you grew up sipping. You get all of the enjoyment of drinking a soda, but all of the health benefits of drinking Olipop. It really is the best of both worlds. Pick it up. Walmart, Target, HEB, Costco, Sam's Club. They usually have it. They were sold out for me. But uh, odds are they're going to have it for you, and I'm sure they'll have it for me next time I hit the store as well.
Um, okay, are you are you are, are how do I mean are you feeling? I know it's early. It's just Tuesday. Uh, the loss of Jonathan Brooks. I I'm having a I'm probably having a harder time because watching that kid play. If this team over the next two weeks, how it turns out, this team is still good enough to beat the two teams that they're playing. Sure. I mean, and it and it shouldn't be one of these dire straights where they get out 20 and then all of a sudden there's a comeback in the fourth quarter. I think both games will be dog fights. One's on the road, one's at home. Um, this one will be this one will be a hard game this week. Yeah. Um, look, Texas has struggled against Iowa State, right? They've lost three of their last four games against Iowa State, and I think they've lost three of their last four games in Ames yeah. as well. So, uh, yeah, Jack Tri Stadium has been a little bit of a house of horrors for Texas over the last 10, 15 years. Now, a lot of places have been. Hell, DKR at times has been a house of horrors for this Texas team. This team has just lost way too much in the last decade or so. So uh, Iowa State's a good team. They've got one of the best defenses in the conference this year. Their offense is starting to come around a little bit. It was horrible at the start of the year, uh, but they figured some things out. They put up 45 against BYU in Provo last week. So Iowa State's, I think, better than a lot of people thought, especially considering you know, the whole gambling scandal that happened late in the offseason and how many players that they lost because of that uh, and just the way that they started the year. Look, Ohio's good. Ohio's probably going to win the MAC, but still, Iowa State lost ten to seven at home to Ohio. Like that—that that was an ugly start to the year, and everyone was thinking that yeah, Iowa State's probably not going to make a bowl game, and they might be one of the worst teams in the conference this year. They're obviously not that. Uh, hell, they're a game back of Texas right now in the Big Twelve. They're tied for second place. They still have a shot to make it to Arlington when this thing is all said and done. So they've got a lot to play for. They're going to be amped up. It's the last time they get to play Texas. Uh, and yeah, Texas has struggled up there against Iowa State. So plenty of yeah. reasons, even if Jonathan Brooks were healthy, plenty of reasons to be a little bit nervous about this game. I think I feel better about this than most Texas fans do. I just gave a million reasons why maybe people are feeling a little bit uh, cautious about this one. I just, I don't know. Like I, I saw Kansas go in there and beat Iowa State uh, last week. And Texas, I think, is better than Kansas. So um, I just, like Iowa State's fine. I just, what they do offensively doesn't scare me a whole lot. I feel like this Texas defense, even though the fourth quarters the last two weeks haven't been great, I feel like this defense has played a lot better since that Houston game went down the way that it did. And I think this game will be a little lower scoring, and I don't think it's going to be easy by any stretch. I think it's going to be a slugfest, and it'll be a little ugly at times. But uh, you're asking me how I feel on a Tuesday. Uh, I feel like this is a 10-point win for Texas right now. Yeah, and 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 the the throws that Quinn Ewers has, he's got to make them this week. He's got to. They have to go. They if if he's got one over the top, it can't be underthrown. It has to be thrown on the money, and they've got to score when they have opportunities, whether it's in the scoring zone or outside the scoring zone. When you've got guys that you've been able to beat, and Ad Mitchell is seems like the guy who can find ways to get open, you're going to have to get them the ball. I I don't think they're going to have the success. In the run game, I, I I just don't think they're going to, you know. I think there's I think that's going to be a little bit like pulling teeth, but you're going to have to keep doing it. You you can't just stop doing it. You can't throw yeah. on every down. So you're going to have to try whether it's screen or not. They're going to they they'll lull, they'll lull you in thinking you can drop some screens off because they're not they shouldn't get that much pressure with a three man rush with the three up front. They I, I don't see them getting a lot of pressure until they start bringing those three linebackers or two of the three and start crossing and doing things like that, trying to confuse not only the quarterback, but, you know, a new running back in there that maybe this is, is that my blitz guy? Is that my guy to do some different things? But I, I, I just know you can't give up on the run, right? You, you really can't, you can't get yeah. to, to that point where Sark will get, well, he'll get frustrated. You know, if he runs two in a row and it gets stuffed and all of a sudden he goes, Oh, the next couple of series, I'm just passing the ball. Got to be very, very careful with that. Yeah, once again, Iowa State's got the best secondary in the Big 12, at yes. least statistically right now, right? They're giving up the fewest passing yards per game. They're also number one in pass defense efficiency. Hell, they are no, number one in total defense in this conference. So it's not like they're getting gashed by the run week in and week out. They're pretty right. damn stout uh, against the run, too. Uh, but you'd but, feel uh, pretty confident that that other guy was running with the ball with his offensive line. Yeah, yeah. I, obviously, I'd feel better about Texas's chances if uh, Jonathan Brooks was playing. I'd, I'd probably have this as a 14 to 17 point win mm -hmm. for the Longhorns if if uh, Jay Brooks was healthy. Uh, but I, you know, I, I'm I'm less nervous about this than I was the TCU game 
like last week with Trey, I didn't do pregame with you, but on Friday, my prediction for the TCU game was 31 27. Like, I think out of all of us, and really, I think most Texas fans, I, I thought that game was going to be closer than just about anybody. And I had it as a four point win. It ended up being as a three point win. So even I was a little bit too confident. You and I were on the same page as a four point win last week. Did you have it as a four point win too? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry for not giving you uh, the credit that you deserve. Well, I know my stuff, so it's I, I don't need the credit. From it's not a big deal. <laughs> I yeah, give it to myself. I pat myself on the back enough. Yes. Mm, yeah, you do. Uh, you do a good job of that. Yes, I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I like. Uh, once again, I mean, it's. I'm not going to sit here and guarantee a Texas victory on Saturday, but I, I don't know what it is. I just I feel better about Texas against Iowa State than I do about these. Yeah, I just think I think the Texas defense will will come to play for four quarters. They'll understand, you know, that they're without their best offensive player for the next two games. I think you'll see two unbelievable defensive uh, games by this football team that will make the other team turn the ball over. They'll give the offense the ball in great field position. And I, I, I still don't see the offense running and hiding from anywhere, anybody over the next two, over the next three games, even when you get to the championship, this group right now is not running and hiding from anybody. Now they have the ability to score through the air and score pretty quickly, but this defense is going to have to stuff people and stone them and really make them turn the ball over and give the, give the offense good field position. And they're going to have to make things happen in the special teams. You know, special teams has just been kind of okay lately. It's just like, Let's just win the football game. Let's not, we don't have to do anything special on special teams, but they're going to have to do some things to help out the offensive side of this football team here over the yeah. next two weeks. So it's a you, similar, it's a similar conversation to what we had when Quinn Ewers went down, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so who else is, gonna, else who else is this, coming to play? Yeah. Sure. sure. And I, I feel like the defense and special teams uh, stepped up, uh, especially at BYU, right? Uh, and for a lot of the game against Kansas State, too, I thought uh, those guys played some pretty good football, and obviously the defense was able to get the goal line stand in overtime to preserve the win. So Your coach uh, is going to have to understand that some of these fourth and go for it, if you can kick a field goal, okay. it's going to be they're going to be close battles. Take your points. Let's get to the championship game, and, and then you can take all the chances you want then when you get to the championship game. But these next two games, if you got an opportunity for a, you know a 40-yarder, and you're thinking about fourth and two, go ahead and take your points on the road for sure. I'm with you. I'm with you there. Bert Auburn's been hot too. He's made 11 yes. straight field goals for the Longhorns. Uh, hit a big 49 yarder last week. And when your team wins by three, it yes. just goes to show you how important those points can be. Uh, yeah, Bert Auburn's been hot. He's been a weapon lately. Use him if you need to use him. Okay, before we uh, have some fun, how about uh, a word for our friends at Covert BK, Buck? Yeah, I love the folks out there at Covert BK. You know, I think we do we have one more gig out there? Yes, we'll be there this Saturday for our pregame show. Absolutely. No, no more pregame luncheons, though, because the last home game is on a Friday, so we can't have a Friday luncheon. Uh, but we'll be out there this Saturday previewing Texas and Iowa State. And thank you to the, the entire Covert family for what they've done for us this season. And they've been doing it since 1909, selling cars, trucks, and SUVs to Central Texas. And, folks, they've got Covert Ford and Chevy out in Hutto, of course, and they've got Covert Lincoln Ford in Austin. Now, when you get out to beautiful BK, they've got 42 unbelievable acres of seven brands of cars and trucks, Buicks, GMCs, Cadillacs, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, of course. And for more information, go to CovertBeeCave.com and find out about the great sales that they have. I mean, the holidays are coming up. Hey, sons or daughters will be in a new new car. Bucky will be needing a new car. Think about the buck as you're thinking about your sons and daughters. I'll just be like an old uncle for sure. So go to covertbcave.com, find out in, uh, information. The inventory is packed out there, believe us. When you, do, when you do go out there, do say hello to Dan Covert. Of course, he'll sell a car to you himself. I mean, seriously, the boss will sell you a car. He won't call a salesperson over. He will bring you into his office, sit you down, and sell you a Ram, one of those Ram trucks for sure. The Sierra's out there, the GMC Sierra's available for you out there. Inventory is packed. Dan, Mike, Stacy, Jerome, the whole gang out there. And, folks, nobody beats a covert deal. Not now, not ever. No, no, nobody does. Dan Covert, hit him up, 512-993-7628. That's a cell number? That is the cell number. Give it to Dan. me again. I need to have that cell number right next to me. 512. Yeah. 993-7628. I mean, I can call him at any time. If I needed to call him at 7 o'clock at night, 
it, oh, I don't know about that. I guess you could. <laughs> I don't know if he's going to answer. <laughs> you could pick up the phone and call him anytime. That's but, right. There you go. I don't know about you that. Your answer. There you go. Somebody named Varna stops by. Uh, we've been talking plenty of football. Oh, maybe they're looking for soccer talk. Maybe maybe that's the football that uh, Varna is looking oh, for. Oh, sorry about that, Varna. Sorry you're stuck with uh, American football. Sorry about that. Uh, sh- shout out to uh, Great Blue Heron Furniture as well. If you're looking for new furniture, speaking of holiday gifts, how about a gift yourself and your family's going to love this too. A new couch, a new recliner, a new chair, new ottoman, new bar stools, just something to make your house look better. Also something to make your house a little bit more comfortable for the people coming by for the holiday season. A custom piece from Great Blue heronfurniture.com. They're a custom leather furniture company that's been around since 1991. They build the highest quality furniture that you can find. It's a Longhorn-owned company. Most of the manufacturing is done right here in the state of Texas. The lead manufacturer is actually a great friend of mine. Uh, His two kids are two of my best friends in the world. I I, I die for this company, man. I swear by these guys. They're the best at what they do. I'm telling you, you cannot and you will not find more stylish furniture more comfortable furniture more well-built furniture anywhere in the world than you will at greatblueheronfurniture.com don't forget to use that promo code hook them when you check out you're going to get 15 percent off your purchase that's right 15 percent off all you have to do is type in the promo code hook them at greatblueheronfurniture.com now BK, right, i watched uh, i watched some of the monday night football game last night with the bills and I'll just say this. I know people will think I'm crazy. I know a lot of people will think I'm crazy. I will take Dak Prescott right now over Josh Allen. Josh Allen is a turnover machine. And, yeah. he, and, and you know, he had that, that point of his career where he was turning the ball over. He got a little bit better. But now he's back to just throwing it to the other guys. I mean, his thought, thought process last night in that football game, I was trying to figure out what the hell is he trying to do? I mean, the interception before half, was just like, why don't you just walk over and hand it to the guy with like 40 seconds to go before half? Why would you even take that chance on a long out like that? It's just, I mean, he's really careless with the football. You know, the people talk about Dak Prescott being careless. Oh, I'd rather have Josh Allen. Not right now, I wouldn't. Josh Allen leads the NFL in interceptions, and he leads the NFL in turnovers right now. Uh, and Buffalo is a very disappointing 5-5. Five and five. I mean, this was... Uh, one of the favorites to win the Super Bowl. They've obviously been close to getting there in the last few seasons, and there was no reason to think that they weren't going to be contenders again in the AFC. Uh, but they are just 500 right now. And, yeah, Josh Allen not being able to protect the football is a uh, a huge, huge part of that. Yeah, and the Broncos ran ran the ball all over them last night too. And the Bills almost had that game. I mean, Josh Allen did lead what looked to be a go-ahead well, it was a go-ahead. It looked to be a game-winning touchdown drive in the final couple of minutes, but the Broncos got back in a field goal range. They missed their first attempt, but the Bills had too many men on the field. Come on, man. Five-yard penalty. It gave the Broncos another chance, and then Will Lutz, their kicker, uh, buried the retry. So, uh, yeah. They may, no, be, they, they may be looking. If they don't get to the playoffs, because they're they're on the outside kind of looking in, or they're just they're tied with a bunch of teams. In that conference with that record, five and five, I got to believe. Yeah. There's a bunch uh, of four and fives and five and fours and all that stuff in that conference right now. Yeah. I mean, if the season ended today, Buffalo would not be in the playoffs. They're currently the 10th seed in the AFC and obviously only seven get in. So, uh, yeah, you've got a lot of six and threes. You've got a couple of five and fours, including the Houston Texans. And then you've got three teams that are five and five in the AFC. Boy, Buffalo is tied with Indianapolis, who's been playing with a backup quarterback since like week three. And Vegas, who's already fired its coach and is also playing with a backup quarterback. Yeah, I think they may be looking for a new guy, too. I know they talk about how much they like this guy. Yeah. But he is not managing that team very well right now. No, yeah, McDermott's gone if the Bills miss the playoffs. And I don't know how much of it's his fault. But, uh, uh, look, I think some Bills fans have already wanted a change just because of the lack of playoff success right. Buffalo has had. But if they don't even make the playoffs this year, uh, heads are going to roll. I don't think they'll get rid of Josh Allen. They've already paid him no. a crap ton of money. Uh, but he's he's got to figure it out, and the team has to figure it out too. And with that AFC East, everyone thought that'd be the best division in football this year. You currently have one team with the winning record. That's Miami at 6-3. and three. Buffalo's bad. The Jets, you know, Aaron Rodgers being hurt doesn't help, but they're bad. And then New England's the worst team in the freaking conference right now. So 
Uh, yeah, that division has not been very good. And Buffalo, a very disappointing five and five. And you're right. I mean, Dak Prescott's been a lot better than Josh Allen this year. So. Yeah, we'll get our power rankings in here before the end of the week and and get to see what we, what we think of the Dallas Cowboys and some of these teams now. But or they've got to be one of the favorites right now. I, I love the way San Francisco bounced back. You know, once – well, we all knew once they got healthy, even with Debo back, they were going to be they were going to be good again offensively. Yeah. But to have Chase Young on the other side, that is – that's too scary right now. Yeah, it's a that's good That's scary team. for the whole NFL. It's a damn good team. Like you said, they lost three in a row. They were scuffling going into their bye week, but they got a bunch of guys back. They added Chase Young. And, yeah, I don't think anybody really gave up on San Francisco. If you did, you're silly. Uh, yeah. They're still very much a Super Bowl contender this year. That roster is loaded with talent. Shanahan's still a great coach. Uh, they know what they're doing. They'll be fine. They will be fine. All right. Uh, we've got an airplane story we have to talk about, Buck. All right. Now, it's not, you know, as risque or raunchy as some of the other airplane stories we've talked about. But it has spurned some debate on the interwebs over the last couple of days. We've got some video here, not the whole thing. We'll play about a minute of what was going on. There was a woman by the name of Bobby Storm, who is a singer, and apparently she is a Grammy-nominated singer. And she was on a plane trying to sing to some of the passengers around her, and the flight attendant, who is a man, by the way. Oh, manservant. Had a little, as you like to call them had uh, some problems with Bobby Storm trying to sing on this airplane. So we'll uh, we'll show you some of the video first, and then we'll uh, get into a discussion about whether or not he was in the wrong or she was in the wrong or anybody was in the wrong here. Check it out. I'm, I'm starting right now. I'm on the billboard. I can sit down and I'll sit on the I'll sit down. I'll sit down. The seatbelt signs off. Signs off. It's not a disturbance. I was like, you know, I, I haven't done this in a while. I've gotten to the next status, so. Are you able to be quiet? But they're enjoying it. So while we're sitting here, could I please? I'm not enjoying it. So I'm asking you, can you be quiet? Okay, well, that's I a find yes, that up. That's a yes or no uh, answer, please. Am I going to go to jail if I don't? Can you please answer my question? Are you willing and able to be quiet right now? I'm doing what the Lord is telling me to do. I'm asking you a question, yes or no. I'm your flight leader. I need you to follow my instruction. Okay. My instruction for you to answer my question. Are you able to be quiet What right do you now? guys think? I'm asking you, ma'am. I'm asking you guys. What do you guys okay. think? Okay. If you're not able to, be, to follow my instruction, yeah. you will not be taking this flight. Ah, uh, okay. Are so you able to be asking. quiet? If that's the case, then that's fine. Oh, she's following the Lord. The Lord is what's telling her to sing. The Lord is yeah. telling her to sing. So I think and she was like going up to the front to try to sing to the whole plane. And then the guy's like, go sit down. And then she tried, she went back to her seat and then she started singing at her seat. And then you see the flight attendant and hear the flight attendant come back and say, hey, can you be quiet? And then she's like, but they're enjoying it. And he says, but I'm not enjoying it. Yes. And he and said, he's the leader. The I'm flight like, leader. Who the hell made him flight leader? What the hell is that? Hey, hey, you're not the captain. That's what I'd say. Hey, I want the captain. That's who mm -hmm. I want to come back here. Generally, the captain makes some of these decisions. Not you, flight leader. <laughs> what scout is leader. a flight leader? A, a scout exactly. leader. I don't think so. No, <laughs> lady, be quiet. Nobody wants to hear you sing. Okay, so are you mad at her or are you mad at him? I'm mad at her. I don't want her singing. I don't want to hear. I don't get on. I don't pay my money. I don't, I mean, it's not Whitney Houston. I don't pay my money to, to hear somebody sing on a, you know, it's like going to the concert. When I went to see Andre Bucelli, when the dude behind me starts singing, trying to be an opera singer, and I turn around and saying, hey, I paid to see this guy. I didn't pay to hear you. I'm paying to get on this flight to go. I, if I needed your entertainment, I would say, hey, lady, you look like you've got a nice voice. Hey, sing to us, please. Mm -hmm. I don't want somebody breaking out and going Whitney on me. But right. I'm on the flight. And like you said, if it was Whitney Houston, which would be a miracle, I guess, in 2023. Yeah, but if it was, well, you know, someone anybody's ever heard of, like if it was Lady Gaga, for some reason, sitting coach on a plane with me and she's like, I'm going to start singing. I'd be like, sweet. Go Lady ahead. Gaga concert. Hell yeah. Like she's incredibly talented. Some great music. Sign me up. I'm in. I don't think too many people are going to complain about that. 
I don't want to hear soccer mom go at it. Some rando Bobby Storm. I, I didn't even look up. She was actually Grammy nominated. She claims that she's been nominated for a Grammy, but I don't know who the hell that is, and I don't care to know who the hell that is. So I don't yeah, want to hear. She was overcome by the Lord on the plane to start yeah. singing to the God's fans. God's telling me to sing. No. Yeah. And you know what? The, the, the right. man servant didn't say, I am your God here. <laughs> I am the leader. flight leader, so yeah, I I'm am God leader. on this plane. God ain't here with you right now. <laughs> I am your God. And I I'm am your leader. You I'm your telling flight you leader. Shut your trap. <laughs> I for sure. I would have been like, no, lady. I would have been the one beside her and go, I've been listening to this all morning. No, I don't want you to sing anymore. That lady would have started pounding me, but no, I don't I don't pay to get on the flight to hear Bobby Joe McAllister jump <laughs> off the Tallahatchie Bridge. I'm not there for that. I'm there to get to my destination. It's like the one shitting down the aisles of Delta. We're not turning this around. I'm going to Spain. Let's go. Come uh, on. I don't need to sing. I don't need to sing along on the plane. She would have started pounding you. Because <laughs> oh, I would have said to her, uh, ma'am, I don't really want to hear you sing either. Billy yeah. Joe. Yeah. Well, she really put the people around her in a tough spot, right? I know. Like, what do y'all think? Yeah. And everyone well, was just kind of quiet. Like, it's like, uh, most people were probably thinking that, hey, w- we agree with the guy here. We want you to shut up and not sing, please. We, we're on a we flight. Agree we're with, we to... agree with the scout leader. Yeah. But who no made himself said. scout leader there. No one said anything. What would you have said in that spot if uh, Bobby Storm was next to you and she turns to you and she's like, well, what do you think? Do you want me to sing? What would you have said? First of all, hey, Bobby, I've been trying to sleep for two hours on this freaking plane and having to hear you try to be Whitney Houston. And I and I don't feel like I, the Lord isn't giving it to me. The Lord's giving you all this power. Wait till you get off this plane. You can sing out there in the corridors, but inside this plane, shut the hell up so we can get to where we need to get to. Yeah, don't be singing on planes, please. No, and you, manservant, you take your ass back down here and get me some peanuts or something. <laughs> <laughs> The manservant is the reason she stopped singing. He's the uh, hero here, isn't he? Oh, no. Yeah, no, he no. is. Because if he didn't uh, say anything, who knows? Get a flight he... attendant, and you guys take the manservant down there and get some peanuts, please. Oh, well, they I don't mean, serve I... peanuts on planes anymore. You know that, right? Are they've given that up now, too? Yeah, too many people are allergic. They don't take any chances. They're allergic they give, to they these give... nuts? Yeah, they're allergic to these nuts. They give out some snacks, but uh, no, I think they stopped – Giving out nuts, babitas or babettas or whatever the hell those little cookies are. Oh yeah, the little biscuit cookies or whatever. I'm good with those with my coffee. Sure. I don't know if they're giving out Velveeta cheese. And then I pull out my. Then I have to pull out my Subway, eat fresh, and start munching it down with everybody with the Subway falling all over the seat. Well, you bring a whole foot long on. No, the- dude. Somebody did that at a movie theater I, a couple of years ago. It was so hot. I went to the theater. And I, I think this was my venture to see a movie called Hellboy 2 or something like that. Because I had seen the first one. I thought it was kind of witty and funny and cute. So I went to see Hellboy 2. And when Hellboy 2 starts having babies, I'm like, that's gross. No thanks. And so this guy pulls out this subway with chips. And all of a sudden, I hear all this crunching and shit. And he's <laughs> rummaging around the bag. And the stuff's falling out. He's got an Italian sub. It's smelling like I'm in Italy. I mean, the, the sub is... It's falling all over the place. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then he's crunching the chips. I'm like, how the hell did you get this thing in here? <laughs> I was on a flight? No, this was at the this no, it was at no, it was at actually at the theater. Oh, you went to a theater to watch Hellboy 2? Yes. <laughs> Which means he went to a theater to watch Hellboy 1? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, man? Dude, I was highly entertained by Hellboy 1. But Ugh. 2, so I thought, let's give 2 a chance. It's the middle of the afternoon. Yeah, I don't. I'm that's not, tough. You got to sneak that in your shirt because if you're on a flight, you could sneak food on a flight. Like you don't yes. even have to sneak it, right? You can just bring it on your carry on, or obviously you can buy something at the airport and take it with you on the flight. But this guy was at a movie theater with a whole foot long and chips. Yeah. yeah, I thought it's cool. You know, you can sneak your candies, your Twizzlers in at a movie theater, but bring out the whole sandwich. I mean, this big thing. This was a large, and he's rumbling around, and you're, you're trying to hear the hear the movie. And I want to know what Hellboy is up to. I'm here. This guy, he's like two seats beside me. I look around and this guy's got his foot long in there oh. <laughs> and the chips and he's crunching the chips and the bag is making all kinds of noise. My God, no, I don't want to hear anybody sing. She's not doing me a favor. No, no I didn't no. pay for this. I didn't pay 
like I said, I didn't pay for Whitney Houston to sing on the flight. No, thanks. I, I want to get to my destination. I don't need all these accessories when I fly. I just don't. I don't need to hold somebody's baby. You know, I don't, I don't need to have, I know it's, it's natural. I don't need mom's baby breastfeeding right beside me. Take oh. that, to the, take that to the bathroom. You don't you know, want to see I, that? No, I don't want to see that. Why not? What, what for? I don't want to see that. That's, you know what? I'm get a, a little child action here. for free. No, dude. then you got to ask mom if you can have some. <laughs> no, no, take that to the bathroom. Take your singing to the bathroom. Take your shitting to the bathroom, not down the aisles. And you, scout leader, take yourself up there and find me a bag of peanuts. Really? <laughs> I mean, quit coming back here and disturbing us all scout by throwing, leader. Your, throwing your powers in there. You know, I am the leader. No, right. you're not the leader. The captain's the leader. The guy who made himself captain. Until he comes back, you're a flight attendant, a dude flight attendant, manservant. Get away from us all. Well, did the pilot's flying the plane. He can't come back there. Well, they got a co-pilot. Remember, remember, they got co-guys mm -hmm. and stuff. He can take he can take control for a couple minutes till the guy who made himself captain rolls back there and says, "I'm sorry, Whitney, no more singing." Here's what Bobby Storm. Uh, if she turned to me, if I was like in a row next to her or a row behind her and she asked me what I thought, like, do you guys want me to keep singing? I would have been like, no. And I would have you know, turned around like, who said, who said that? that? Who, who said was that? that? How could you be so mean? Who would oh say something goodness. like that to her? Yes, that, let that be a tip for you kids. Don't get on planes and start going crazy and acting up and singing. Oh. <sighs> Yeah, that's not an it, audition. You're not auditioning here on this flight. No, and don't put that on God, too. I mean, God I deals know. with enough. Don't don't blame God for you trying to do that. Uh, Lord, the, the Lord wanted me to sing. No, the Lord didn't want you to sing here. You know what the, the Lord's Lord telling me right now? He's telling me to tell you to shut the hell up. <laughs> Quit singing. <laughs> Quit oh singing my out God. there. Bobby Storm. God. Never heard of her. Never uh, heard of her. No, uh, never would have. If, I love uh, the way you said that if Lady Gaga was here, you're like, come on, let's have a concert here. Let's sure. Go. Oh, there's plenty of like plenty of famous people, plenty of great singers. If like, yeah, they're on a plane and they're starting to sing, sweet, free concert. You got to know pay. what that lady expected. It's like that dude that was on that plane to start messing with Mike Tyson, start messing with his ear and digging around with him. And Ew. when he got off the plane, he finally punched, he reached back and grabbed that guy by the throat. I'm like, what were you expecting? You're messing with Mike Tyson. The guy's just trying to fly. You want him to take pictures and stick your hand between the seats. You're lucky you didn't break your arm off in that plane. You didn't bite your ear off on that no plane. No kidding. So who would you rather be on the plane with? You've got a couple of options here. You've got Bobby Storm. Here's your second choice. I'm telling you, I'm getting the f*** off, and there's a reason why I'm getting the f*** off, and everyone can either believe it or they cannot believe it. I don't give two f but I am telling you right now. I think I could have reasoned with Bobby Storm because I could have told her, hey, I'm a scout leader, too. I was once a scout leader for the Cub Scouts. I think I could reason with her. That one right there, she's getting tackled. Mm -hmm. But when she comes by, she's getting that sharp elbow where she has kidney problems for me because I'm not letting her remain. She's got to get – yeah, she's getting off that plane, and I'm helping her with okay. her bags. Oh, yeah, that crazy one. I'm, helping, I'm throwing her bags right out of the plane where she has to go get them. Bobby Storm, I think I could have a conversation with. Yeah. Just let her know that you're a scout leader and everything should be just fine. She's a scout leader? I thought the flight attendant was no, a scout, scout leader. No, just tell her that you, as a as a passenger, once was a scout leader. Mm. You, you, you're in charge now. So can she please shut the hell up? So you'd rather be on the plane with Bobby Storm yes. over one crazy airplane lady. What about this one? Call me a again. <laughs> Call me a again. Yeah, you guys did nothing wrong. I said shut up. No, you shut the you shut the up in here. Goodbye. You shut the film me. I'm Instagram famous. Bum. You mean Trojan lady? Trojan girl? <laughs> wearing her Trojan on the plane? The condom wearer. <laughs> you would want to be on that plane with her. You wouldn't mind being on that plane with her. No, I'd want to be getting off the plane with her. <laughs> She's getting She's kicked off. I'm going too. Trojan woman now. 
she, I, I, I think I could handle that. She, she just, she just wanted to show her powers that she's Instagram famous, but she's all right. You can handle her. Mm. She was already getting kicked off or something else. Uh, telling people to shut the f up, probably. Yeah. Why yeah. on the flights? Why do people have to dis? Why do they have to behave like this on planes? Why can't they? I mean, do they do this in Ubers? I mean, do the I want Uber riders drivers say do people do kind of crazy shit like this on in an Uber ride and stuff? Oh, sure. I mean, you got a bunch of drunk people going in Ubers. Like there, there are some drunk people on flights, of course, but. I mean, if you Uber's coming home from the bars at midnight, 1, 2 a.m., like you get all sorts of stuff happening in those things. Well, we, need more video. we need more video from Uber drivers. That's what we need. Okay, I'll work on that. Forget, Forget it with get... the planes. Forget it with the planes. These people are out of their minds now. Yeah, don't, don't be I've never been. Like... I've never been on a scene on a plane. I mean, all the, you know, I got stuck in Atlanta, and that's just because Delta sucks. But <laughs> other than that, I've never had anybody – you know, make a scene. I mean, there's always been that the crying baby or something like that, the breastfeeding, overzealous breastfeeder. I don't get the breastfeeding. I just get the crying baby. You don't get the breastfeeder? Not to smack that baby upside the head. Or... <laughs> no. Hey, let me, punt, let me punt this baby here, all right? <laughs> oh, my God. The punting baby? Yeah, quit no, flying man. with babies. You know, huh? tell, tell grandma or grandpa to fly to you. Keep the babies off the plane. I'm like that, except for I had four babies, I, and I they were they were wonderful flyers. They just they no, they were no very entertaining. They were very entertaining. That pressure we always had some kind of little candy or a bottle they could suck on, so the pressure didn't drive them nuts. I mean, it's the it's the newly parents that don't know much about that experience of bringing their babies on the plane. They just think, oh, we're going to grandma's house. We'll just put the baby on the plane with no entertainment. You know what I mean? Can we get the baby in the cargo department? No, you can't put the baby down there with the with all this the gifts and stuff. Why not? You no, you can't put it in a cage like a dog, like an animal. No. I see kids on a leash like an animal. Why can't we put the kids in the cage? Yeah, that always bothered me too. Really? You gotta no. You gotta control the kid, the, the, the kid on the leash. You gotta control your singers. You gotta you can't have the supreme singing on the plant on the plane. Well, hold on. If Diana Ross was there, then I'm in. Yeah. That's another one of those. I'm not telling her to be quiet, but if it's Bobby Joe or whatever, named Billy yeah, Joe McAllister, the... she's jumping off that Tallahatchie Bridge now. Porn okay. star Bobby Storm, then I'm out on that deal. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So there you go. There's your uh, random airplane story of the week. It does too many like... of those. I'm telling you, man. I am telling you, airplane etiquette is uh, non existent in the year of our Lord 2023. Uh, we'll wrap up with some sports conversation, but a few more sponsors to give some love to, Buck. How about our good friends at Texas Orthopedic? If you're seeking that specialized patient-focused orthopedic care, please contact Texas Orthopedic. Their physicians offer surgical and non-surgical orthopedic care for children and adults, spinal care, sports medicine, trauma care, joint uh, replacement, of course, rheumatology, and even more. Now, their doctors are dedicated orthopedic surgeons, and their goal is to get you right back into good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. For, for more information, please go to TXOrtho.com. That's TXOrtho.com. And 7-Eleven is the largest Slurpee distributor in the state of Texas. <laughs> there you go. In the so world. Get you one. Or if you're on your way to work, get you some coffee. They've got the snacks. They've got the drinks. They've got gas for your car, too. Uh, they've got everything you need to fuel up at 7-Eleven. 11 all over central texas all over the metroplex all over houston there's a 7-eleven near you make sure you download the 7-eleven app to cash in on the seven rewards program you're going to get some free stuff thanks to our friends at 7-eleven shout out to them shout out to centextickets.com as well if you're looking for some basketball tickets hey the longhorns back in action on wednesday night at the moody center they've got you there nba tickets nfl college football whatever they've got all your tickets on site all year long at CentexTickets.com. want to give them some love. And thank and you to our good friend Jack Allen at Jack Allen's Kitchen, too. They are wonderful folks. I'm about to have a, a quick uh, bite before I play golf today. And, man, I love that place. I just – I love all the Jack Allens. I love the Salt Traders. I need to go to Salt Traders more because, you know, I need to have a little more fish in me. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I haven't, I haven't had enough fish over the last couple of weeks. And Salt Traders, they've got some great dishes there, great fish dishes and – 
believe me, I, I am going. And I, and I love what Jack Gilmore and his staff has done. They've got the, the Jack Allen stores all over our city. So, and I, everything they have is fantastic. I mean, just from regular burgers to their, you know, their quesadillas. Are, and, you know, of course, they've been doing some of the Cajun stuff. And if you don't like it too sp spicy, I know there are a lot of folks that like their stuff nice and spicy. I do not. They'll do it just right, just the way you like it. Mm, you're missing out then, Buck. You like spicy. You like it real spicy, huh? Big fan of spicy. Is that the, is that the way you like your Taco Bell too? You get that that extra hot sauce. Yeah. Really? You put that yeah. all over stuff? Yeah, the fire sauce, the Diablo sauce. I had some Taco Bell yesterday. Probably spent fifteen bucks there, man. Inflation is bullshit. <laughs> way to get after there, Gringo. You like that hot stuff, huh? Yeah, I'm not feeling too well. Whenever I'm like a little bit under the weather, I got to get some Taco Bell. You know. Usually resets my equilibrium, gets me back yeah, on track. It sure does. Yeah, soup and Taco Bell. That's what I eat when I'm sick. That's what most doctors recommend, I think. And Altstad beer. Maybe that's what I actually need to drink. They've got it at Jack Allen's. They don't have it at Taco Bell. I need to work on that. But Altstad <laughs> beer is the best beer that you can find. My fridge is stocked with it for football season, basketball season, every season here in Central Texas. And the good news is you don't have to be in Central Texas. You can be in Dallas and Houston and San Antonio. I guess that is Central Texas, but they've got it all over the state. It's brewed in Fredericksburg, right in the heart of the Central Texas Hill Country, but available at HEB, Specs, Total Wine, Twin Liquors, wherever you go to get your beer, you can find Altstad Beer. They've got a number of different brews, something for every beer drinker out there. It's uh, the only beer I drink these days, guys, and I'm telling you, one sip and you won't go back to the other beers that you have been drinking in the past. It is the official beer of BK. It should be the official beer of you as well. It's all stat beer. No impurities, no regrets. BK, I was thinking about the AM situation and Jeff Trailer. I mean, it just makes too much sense for them. It, it, ju it just does. I mean, it's not like he hadn't put in his time. You know what I mean? He's been the leader of a program. He's done really well down in San Antonio. I mean, he he knows all these coaches in the area. It's about, it's about, you know, the people that you know. It's about recruitment. It's about knowing the high school coaches. I mean, it's just not flashy. I don't know uh -huh. why. Why flashy? They thought Jimbo was going to be the, the flashy guy, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And at the time, it was considered a flashy hire. Um, I don't have too many arguments against Jeff Trailer. Like I, I'm with you. I think he would make some sense there. And he's proven that he can build a program. He's proven that he can, you know, win in the state of Texas. Obviously, most of his winning was done at the high school level, but he's done a pretty good job at, at UTSA. I think they have won the league in back-to-back -back years. So that's like pretty much as good as you can do uh, at a place like that. Um, and I think they're either one loss or undefeated in conference play this year. So they're, they're doing well. And yeah, you know, he can recruit. He's got connections all over the state of Texas. It would make sense, but I just don't know if that's a big enough splash for AM. and they need more substance than style right now. And I think yes. Taylor has some substance to him. But I just – I don't know if, like, that's going to excite a whole lot of people. You just fired a guy and paid him $76.8 million to leave, and you're going to take the coach from UTSA? Really? Like, I yeah, just – I don't know if that's going to work over there, you know? No, I, I think I, I think the majority of Aggies would be disappointed if they did that. I mean, first of all, it just makes too much sense. So Yeah, I think the it, smart Aggie fans would be like, yeah, no, let's give this thing a chance because it can work and – uh, this is the opposite of Jimbo, which is probably what we should be trying, considering how much Jimbo blew up in our face. But uh, I think, yeah, it's, you know, there were, there were Texas fans like uh, Jeff Trailer was talked about when Sark got hired and there were Texas fans, kind of the same conversation. I mean, uh, Trailer didn't have as many years under his belt at UTSA, but there are some Texas fans who were like, oh, this guy was an assistant here. He's won a lot at the high school level of the state. Maybe let's bring him in. But most people were like, no, nah, that's just not that's not a big enough name. I could easily see that uh, type of conversation going on in Aguilar sure. right now too. Yeah, I mean they, I mean, I mean, in all honesty, if they if they could ever get a guy like Dan Campbell to leave Detroit and come back home to coach, you know, with he and his family and and everybody and his family being from Texas, you know, I, I mean, I could see that they'd have to pay him an awful lot of money. They would have to they would right. have to be doing the Jimbo Fisher type of things in order to get that guy from the Detroit Lions where he's building an NFL. You know, but he hasn't done it yet. But at Texas A&M, I mean, when you when they when you're asked to come back to your alma mater and they're they're going to pay you and you're from that state, boy, that's hard to turn down. 
because it's not just any school. It's not like somebody say, Buck, come to Boston. You're talking about Texas A&M. You're talking about, you know, you're talking about being in the SEC. And if you and if you get it cranked up at your alma mater, that money doesn't stop flowing then. Nope. And you're in, your, in the state. I mean, there's there's all kinds of great things that can happen to you if you come back and successful where where you where you, where you went to school. But if you're if you're looking for the ultimate, he's at the ultimate right now. He's in the NFL and taking a downtrodden program and starting to bring it back to life again in Detroit. So, but he has to bring it back to life. It can't be oh we're getting closer, we're getting closer, we're getting closer because eventually they start getting rid of those dudes. Yeah, I don't think they paid him, if they really paid him a massive amount. That guy could see that dude staying being an Aggie. I, I mean, recruited. I recruited that dude, Dan Campbell. Yeah, to go to Texas. How was he in high school? He was wonderful. What a wonderful young man, and what a wonderful family. Yeah, they sent me on the recruiting trail out to FM Farm Road six twenty nine up there towards Dallas area. I shouldn't have been the one recruiting him. That was not my cup of tea for where he lived mm. out there. He was country now. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. didn't have anyone more country than you on the staff back then. That was my area. They didn't switch that. They didn't flip that at that time. I was recruiting Dallas Carter and places like that, and Kimball and all that stuff. That and I it just sense. happened to be in the area, and I went and I went to dinner at his house. His family were just wonderful. Nice. Yeah, and just wonderful people and everything else. But they they probably saw me coming in there, and they were going, "That dude, they're they're sending that dude to recruit my son to play tight end at Texas." No, I think we're going to Texas A and M. Yeah, yeah, they had some old uh, white hick come through the house for me. Well, it was just it just wasn't a, a smart recruiting ploy by us at the time, you know. Yeah, I guess he didn't want him that bad. No, not you personally, Mac. No, no, I, I didn't, no, I didn't I, I wanted him. He was fantastic. Yeah, uh, a couple of final thoughts here before we hand it off to Chaos Theory, Rodney and Wags coming up from ten to eleven. By the way, uh, a lot going on on this channel today. Uh, Jeff Howe will be with Rodney from 11 to noon and CJ Vogel from the football brainiacs will be co-hosting with Kevin this afternoon from three to five. So Trey's awesome. in Vegas for the next couple of days, happy to get CJ on. He was a guest with fire the cannon a couple of weeks ago. CJ does a great job covering the Longhorns for TFB. He will uh, be on the channel once again, this afternoon with KD from three to five. So uh, some new faces, but uh, a lot of great content coming your way right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Don't go anywhere. Make sure you keep the app open and uh, keep us open on YouTube as well. How are we doing with the randomizer for the Cabo Babo? Uh, tomorrow, we're going to give away the Ooh. $150 Cabo Bob's Catering Gift Certificate. So uh, if you need more reason to tune in, yeah, if you uh, watch or listen on the app during tomorrow morning's program, you will have a chance to win a $150 Cabo Bob's Catering Gift Certificate. Very nice. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, Shohei Otani, Buck. Of course, the MLB offseason is here. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Who won the World Series this year? The Rangers. Oh, it's the best. I went and watched some highlights last night and sports cried again. I'm not even kidding. Uh, Shohei Otani, there was a report from John Morosi, an MLB insider. Apparently, Shohei is intrigued by the possibility of playing for the, the Astros, the Atlanta. Braves. Oh, come on, man. 2021 World Champs, the team that had the best record in baseball last year. They flamed out in the playoffs, but uh, they've been really good, and they have a lot of talent, a lot of young talent on that team. It feels like they're built to contend for a while. Reports out there saying Shohei Otani is intrigued by the possibility of playing in the ATL. Don't worry. Don't do that, Shohei. They always get beat by, that's right, the city of brotherly love from which I was born. Why does he come to Philly? Can you imagine Shohei in Philly? Oh, no. I no. can't. <laughs> He's too nice of a guy, man. That guy will go 0 for 4 one day, and they'll boo him. Oh. And they'll, they'll, they'll try to send him back to Japan. Tear his car apart. Yeah. Really? So no. There's that report. And then Jeff Passan saying the Dodgers, the Red Sox, and the Rangers all expected to be in on the Shohei Otani sweepstakes, but the uh, – presumptive line of thinking right now is that he's going to end up with the Dodgers. That's, that's still my favorite. I think that should be everybody's favorite. Uh, Shohei would get to stay in LA, but he'd actually get to play for a team that's half decent with the Dodgers. That, that to me makes the most sense right now. Yeah. Don't, don't, I, I can't see him. I, I can't see, I don't see the, the Atlanta deal, but I do see the Dodger deal working out. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd see why the Red won. Sox away. Oh, got money. We'll go to Boston. 
Come to New York. Don't make me call up Jeter. Jeter, stay in the drawer. Stay in the drawer, <laughs> Captain. Stay in there. He said, uh, he's saying, why not us? He's like tapping on a deal, talking about why not us. Because you, you, right you guys suck. <laughs> Joe Hay wants to play for a contender, and the Yankees are not that right now. That guy's making everybody a contender no matter where he goes. Yeah, no kidding. He is that good. But he wants to win, so he won't go to the Yankees. He'll no. go to the Rangers instead. That'd be awesome. All right, 10 o'clock, let's bring on the fellas of Chaos Theory. It's Rodney, and it's Wags. Gentlemen, how we doing? Doing all right, man. A little, uh, little under. You keep saying you're under the weather, too, man. I've been under the weather for about a week, dude. I just can't get this funk out of here, man. I, like a, a lingering headache. Um, I don't know, man. It's just, uh, just like the crud almost, it feels like. Mm. Yeah, I can hear it. You got some of that in your voice, too. It's wax. Yeah, well, terrible. I also just ripped like three massive bong hits before I got on. Here. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. Well, I was going to say, Wags, you and I were talking about uh, uh, Marine's birthday. You said a 48 hour bender. That we did. Yeah, I didn't make it to 48 hours. I, I only lasted about 12, as a matter of fact. Oh. I didn't even, yeah, yeah it got halfway in there, but also had to go to a damn dinner party, too. So. Oh. And that kind of threw quirks and everything. I didn't really get to unload the way that I wanted to unload, and I had to be unload. I had to Whoa. be civil, had to be polite. Unload. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like to like to let it loose, let it fly, let all kinds of fluids go everywhere. That's what have she a, said. Have a That's circus with myself, said. but uh, yeah, nothing, nothing. Hey, this. BK, I'm going to send you a video because I, I know of a video that we can attribute to Bucky trying to recruit one of those good old boys out in the country. Yeah, I'm going to send that to you oh, no. and, um, and, and we can play that. Cause that, I did a that fantastic is... job trying to get Dan Campbell to, yeah. to come to Texas instead of Texas A&M, but it wasn't the smartest. I wasn't the, I wasn't the guy. I wasn't the right guy. If you know what I mean, to go out there to <laughs> FM sure. F farm road, six, 19, 37, 42. What are you talking yeah. about? Elaborate a little bit. What do you mean? Well, I recruited Dan Campbell, the, the, the head coach of, of the Detroit Lions. I know, but why, why weren't you the right guy? You I just well, it just didn't it didn't make any sense. There are certain things that make sense and certain things that don't. Me going out to that that area of Texas does, didn't make any sense when we had others that it made more sense. Right. No, who, who had the Texas flavor? Yeah. They had just yeah. rolled in. I just rolled in from Boston College and University of Illinois. So I was I was not into the whole Texas yeah. vibe yet. Yeah. So they sent my half city slicker ass in there when I was in Dallas Carter and Kimball and places. I'm like, why am I going out here? This doesn't make any sense. Where's Bobby Jack or Billy Joe or yeah. somebody? You yeah, know? Buck, Buck, Bucky goes rolling up there and they're like, uh, the tool sheds out back, sir. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was, they were wonderful folks. I had a great dinner with them, but I knew, yeah. I knew when I left that house, he ain't coming to Texas y'all. Yeah, no, y'all did a those are mistakes in recruiting that you don't make, and we made it. So, yeah, I got there, um, smash boys. There smash, is. man. There are some there are some things that Rodney can say on this show, and there are some things that I just cannot say. Uh, Rodney can get away with some with saying things that I just can't say. That's for sure, one hundred percent. Welcome to Chaos Theory, yeah. my guys. It is Wags and Double R. Uh, you are invited again to another crazy ass show on Texas Sports Unfiltered uh, for the next hour until we have what? It's only an hour. That's uh, that's what follows up behind yeah. us now. Is that official? Is that the official? I'm rollout? not sure. I'm not sure what that what exactly is going on right there. Um, I think it's going to be Jeff, but I mean, I know Jeff's schedule, you know, kind of right. varies. Well, well, I mean, yeah. he's. He's like Chip. I mean, all these writers, they got to be everywhere yeah. on the 40 acres from time to time to cover all these sports, too. So we got to make sure that uh, that our own, you know, 24-7 guys are, you know, out there in, in the fray as well, man. But, yeah, man, looking like the lineup is changing, shifting a little bit. Jeff Howe moving to the midday, man, for only an hour is what we're going with, it looks like. Rodney being on there yesterday and today as well, I believe. Right, my partner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good thing about uh, having a flexible schedule is that um, I happen to be, you know, I'm flex. I'm flex Luger. Uh, I'm able to. <laughs> I love it. Flex Luger, like baby. That. 
I'm kind of able to dive in there and, and kind of help out as needed. And, and again, uh, I am going to send that video to uh, to uh, BK because it, it it's hilarious and it kind of ties in right there. And I did not mean that in a bad way about that with Bucky. No, I mean, it's, we're kids. it's Rodney. I was kidding. No, okay. no, I'm not you. I, I saw that uh, right here. Come on, man. Take a joke. Let it be. Let it be, man. Let it be. Um, but yes, um, we're diving in here. Wags, Monday night football, my brother. How about that? How about the stinker we saw there, huh? Uh, did we tell you that the Buffalo Bills window was closed? Has it officially yeah, yeah. closed yet, or is it still closing? Is it reducing as we speak? I mean, the Broncos, are you serious? Did we Did we really? The look on Josh Allen's face when that clock struck zero yeah. pretty much told you everything that you needed to know about uh about what's going on in that bill's locker room and their organization right it feels like discombobulation it feels like disarray and it feels just like everything's crumbling apart for the buffalo bills it feels like the it feels like the wagons are being circled around the buffalo bills as chris berman used to like to say as a matter of fact man it doesn't look good they need to write the ship soon man i, I just don't know how they do it yeah that that's they a tough part right there they need a running game yeah, and you know the funny thing is, I mean, yeah, when right? You, it, it feels like uh, like a running game is a big part of football. Yeah, man. I mean, isn't it funny how that thing tends to help? Um, and when I watch Josh Allen right now, it's like it kind of feels to me like Dak Prescott last year uh, with the interceptions, the turnovers. I mean, all of that. Uh, and and again, that's from a lack of a supporting cast. And you know, all well, the I mean, pressure all, in, in, the like all they got Cook Rodney. You know what I mean? Like yeah. now, of course. They were able to. They were able to run the ball a little bit last night, but I mean, you knew it was. You knew everything that was coming. It almost looked preempt or uh, premeditated and scripted, dude. Um, again, when when Josh, when you start to 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 rely on Allen dropping back and 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 having to to throw, you know, forty or so, or or thirty or forty times because they can't run the ball, it's not a good recipe for success. It just sounds like. It, it just sounds like. Um, it, it sounds like James Cook last night was able to get busy and get going. It just wasn't enough. Uh, wasn't enough of the um, what enough of, of the spectacular aerial assault from from Josh Allen last night. Morning and, six. No, nah, man. Are you, nah, you gotta stop pulling that shit. Distracts me when you pull that up, bro. Oh, so, oh I'm sorry. No, uh, well, and the other part of this, the other part of this is, I mean, you look at this and and quietly. The Denver Broncos have won three games in a row. So, I mean, actually, after, looking we, after up, we've considered them gone and out. We thought they out. were long gone, my brother. And the thing is, I mean, even watching Russ last night, I mean, th this kind of looked, I mean, it wasn't vintage Russell Wilson that we saw in Seattle, but this looked like him. This looked like Russell Wilson wanted to play football, where but at one point I was really wondering if he still wanted to play football. When he scrambles, it still looks like he doesn't I know. He, he I know. can't find the hole or he can't find the the Ooh. way the way to get out of the damn the damn pocket, right? It feels like no matter where he scrambles to, he's scrambling back into pursuit or he's scrambling into somebody that's gonna sack him. He made three or three or four moves last night where he you know alleviated the the pursuit, but then almost you know got right back into the grasp of uh, the Buffalo Bills. He was sacked a few times last night. He a little bit of progress for Russell Wilson, but the Russell Wilson that the Broncos gambled on and getting him <laughs> from Seattle is gone. That that prototype is never going to happen again. That's that's long sailed away. Yeah, you know, Russell Wilson, I mean, look at the stat line. Uh 20 24 29. That's great. 24 29. That's great efficiency. 193 yards. Mm -hmm. Two touchdowns. Enough to get the job done. They uh, enough. did enough to, to get the job done, but it was again Buddy we talked about nine times for thirty yards, nine times for thirty yards. So, so that's kind of that that's kind of Russ that, that that we think about. Yeah, uh, yeah, but also there was complimentary football with Russell Wilson too, right? There was uh, yeah. you know a lot of good running the ball in Seattle up there, um, and then also you know what Me Metcalf and and uh, and Lockett, you know, being able mm -hmm. to blow the blow the doors off the defense there when you're able to stretch vertically usually it was Lockett that was able to get the vertical uh you know the vertical big plays Judy needs to be able to come alive here for um uh for Russ here in Denver I don't see that I don't really see the rapport or the clicking happening between the receivers and Russell Wilson um I, again there's just not too many of the good pieces that were in Seattle and it's funny to say that right because you think that Denver had a better organization or, or better toys in a toy chest for Russell Wilson yeah. to play with 
Um, but after the move and coming over, it looks actually it looks like Seattle's got uh, more of the pieces still left over than Denver. Those, regardless of you know a, a, a Sertan or Judy or you know that other the other wide receivers that are in that locker room, you'd think that they'd be able to put it all together, but it just hasn't yet, especially with Sean Payton. It, and the thing is, you know, I, I kind of find it odd, you know, last night. Uh, I mean, when you have Judy with three receptions, so did Samaj P. Ryan, our man from Pflugerville Hendrickson. It's like, um, okay, I mean, if you're going to spread the ball around, uh, I mean, obviously you, you've got Cortland Sutton. I mean, that's going to, that was the leading uh, pass catcher there for, for Denver. But it's like Judy and P. Ryan, it's like, I, I think that I would maybe spread that a little more around to, to Judy. But I, I hey, again, I, I, Dude, back to back to winning football games. Yeah. They won. <laughs> That's all that matters. If you're, if you're Buffalo, Rodney, what do you do here um, to to try and right the ship to get back on the, the to get back on the success train here? Because you're in a one hell of a division. Hell, you you thought that you might have had a chance with the Patriots being down and out, but look, here come the fish. The fish are are you know swimming with the best of them here, leading the damn NFL. Yeah, and, and like we talk about with the Cowboys and the Eagles, uh, I mean, the, the Bills are two games back. The Bills are two games back at this point in that uh, in that division, and the Jets are right there with them. And we had put the Jets to bed as well. Uh, I mean, if you're what? Buffalo, I mean, uh, your, your time is running out, and, and I don't, like you said, the running game is lacking, that defense is susceptible, and that's just not a good prescription moving forward because we're, well, dude, we're get, barely halfway through pieces, at this point. How do you get pieces like Diggs? How do you get them the ball? How do you get him, you know, involved again? You got uh, Knox, who's banged up in a little bit. He, you got to get him back onto the damn field. But other than, than Diggs, I mean, Shakur's kind of been – um, you know, being able to rise a little bit above here, but uh, you know, what uh David, I mean Gabriel Davis, you know, there's just so many pieces that Buffalo's got to get put together to help, you know, complement, you know, a, a wide receiver like Stefan Diggs. If you can, if you can establish like Cook had a pretty decent game last night that should have been able to unlock the wide receivers like i'm not understanding why the connection or there's a disconnect now between josh allen and his receiving room you'd like to think with you know the speed and the type of talent level that you get from stefan diggs that it would open up a lot of other receivers but hell man they're finding difficulty getting separation man i don't know what if if allen's just missing his wide receivers coming out of the breaks or not but it's just not there it's not clicking if you're the buffalo bills i'd say continue to try and find a little bit more success running the ball and try and get the offense to open up that way because what you were doing with the run and shoot is just not working yeah i mean it, it's really not and and it does come down to i mean you know cook 109 yards i mean that's that's Good. Yeah, but that's an anomaly. Good. That's not been that hasn't been there all you know, know week in and week out. If you can sit, if you can get that consistently and build off of that and then throw from that, you'd have mm. a lot more success. But Rodney, they're just not doing it. That that's the whole thing. Um, when you look at Buffalo, it's total inconsistency is what you're seeing from this group. And you know, like you and I talked about, and you you mentioned it right there at the beginning of the program is what we are watching right here. We're watching that hourglass just continue to tick on the Buffalo Bills. I mean, th their time is running out because, like you talked about, the fish. I mean, shit, the Texans. I mean, the Jacksonville. I mean, this AFC. You know, obviously Kansas City still sitting right there. The Browns appear to be on the on the upswing. Who knows? What what you're going to get with the Bengals. It's kind of like Texas weather. They're hot and cold. I mean, there, there are so many contenders in the AFC and Buffalo is just kind of sitting here and you're waiting, but yeah, Wags, th this is kind of, this is one of those things. This is the same franchise that lost four straight Super Bowls. It's, it's a situation to where Buffalo, I, I yeah. think, yeah, you're just, um, it's one of those things to where like Minnesota, you know, losing all those Super Bowls, you know, back in the day. It's like, man, what what do they have to do to to make and and the frustrating part for this to me? I'm not a Buffalo fan. One of my best buddies is a Buffalo fan, and the dude's reaching out to me all the time, and he's like, dude, I, I just don't get it. I, I just don't understand what needs to happen differently. I'm like, man, I have no idea. Everything's in place. Everything's in place right there. You just can't get over the hump. I don't want to say that it's it's not play calling because I I'd like to think that. Bills have been pretty decent and aggressive over the past couple of years at being able to establish potent offenses. I, I, th 
it's the quarterback play. I mean, there's no other way to say it, man. It's the quarterback play of Josh Allen. Like when he when he's up there, he's one of the best in the damn league. But he he's he's missing on all almost all facets of the damn uh, game right now, Rodney. And you can if you watch the damn ball game, you can see it, man. I'm not a quarterback expert. I'm not a guru here, but I do know when I'm seeing bad quarterback play, and that's what I'm seeing from Josh Allen right now. It really is, man. I don't know exactly what has happened right there, but uh, I mean, it's just not there. It's just not there, and it, and everything is going to be driven by the quarterback and and that's where I go back to because like like what Jake is saying right here I'll pull it up one more time I mean the, the talent but the turnover machine this year and that and that's where I go back to Dak Prescott last year because that's the one thing that we saw last year I mean a lot of that was extenuating circumstances around him with the injury and then you know whatever the case may have been but but I mean to me Josh Allen really is this year's Dak Prescott because Prescott's oh, gotten his shit back on track. That is, uh, that's that's a bold, it's a bold statement, man. If 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 he leads the league, if Josh Allen leads the league in in interceptions at the NFL, I'd be shocked. I mean, I think he'll be able to clean it up just a little bit here. Uh, but yeah, got it. Got to right the ship somehow, and it comes down to to QB play. The Broncos uh, get to host a very hot Minnesota Viking team coming in. We talked about how the Broncos were hot, you know, off their last three here. Well, they got the Minnesota Vikings to come up and and uh, try and, I guess, cool these Vikings out or stall these Vikings out a little bit. Of course, they'll be doing yeah. that in the Mile High City here. Um, but, I mean, if you ask me right now, if I'm looking at that game, it's going to be a little bit sexy. Of course, we'll break that down as the week progresses here. But right now, I'm liking the Vikings so far, even on the road right now, as well as the Broncos have played over the past few weeks. I would argue that Minnesota is one of the hottest teams in the NFL right now. I agree. And and I, I, I think that this matchup that we're going to watch between Denver and Minnesota is so intriguing because these are two teams that we thought were done. Yeah, you know, when when Kirk Cousins, uh, when all of that happens, and and we, like you said earlier, we had already put Denver to bed, you know, just with the fact that they couldn't get their shit in one sock, and you know, maybe this Sean Payton thing isn't working. Maybe this Russell Wilson thing was was a mistake. Maybe that was a Jimbo Fisher hire. Maybe we're gonna have to get to pay this dude to get rid of him. Um, but here we are. Here we, we are. Any, uh, we got any breaking news yet? Is is the news that have the Aggies done a knee jerk reaction? Have they made their hire yet? Not yet. Not yet. I know there are a lot of folks in the running. I do want to ask you about this, Wags, because I know we didn't really get to touch on this yesterday. And this is Texas Sports Unfiltered. But when we start talking about the Texas Aggies, and again, you know, now that we're going to be rejoining them or they will be rejoining us or whatever you want to call it in the SEC, with, with that move right there, I happen to think if you're the Texas Aggies, that was a, a very nicely calculated move to pay this dude, get him out of here during the season. I, I'm not the biggest fan of of, of coaching um, changes in the middle of the season, but if you are going to do this, and, and, and Lord knows, I mean, they're looking forward. I mean, being back in the SEC, playing Texas again, being back in that fold again, you know that's a, a part of this. I don't care what anybody says. I was looking at Horns 247 this morning. That's part of this, but if I'm them, Get that dude out of here and figure out what the hell you're going to do next. Well, I mean, you, you, if you're the Aggies, you kind of got to right the ship, right? Like, it looks like you you went with a big name, and it didn't really work out for you. And, I, I mean, it, it feels like everybody these days are just kind of in love with hiring the big name instead of hiring – uh, who's going to be, you know, make the big splash for your program, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's not about the big name. Sometimes it's just about finding, you know, who's right for you and what fits for your program. I would like to think that you'd, you'd want to get somebody from from Texas or at least from East Texas, you know, some somebody that has, you know, good ties to your program or good ties to Texas that can kind of make this transition a little bit easier, give you a little bit of ease of access here. Uh, get an old, you know, get a football coach, uh from from get a high school coach from from texas or whatnot um that that is up in in coming or maybe one that's that's ready to to take on the mantle here um i think that would help you reestablish a better connection than what you brought in with jimbo fisher um we saw the writing on the wall at florida state when it came in i thought it was a, a terrible hire for the aggies and i knew it would 
I don't want to sound like I got you know the number one crystal ball of all crystal balls, but I feel like Fisher has a track record, right? Or maybe now mm-hmm. he does, at least to this point. You know, being with Florida State and being with that, being with the Aggies, I feel like yeah. usually angst and I don't want to say turmoil, but usually you know the program isn't exactly in, in the best state. It's almost in disarray when Jimbo Fisher leaves. Florida State is yeah. finally starting to catch back up after. Uh, you know, the aftermath of Jimbo Fisher, how long will it take for Texas A&M? That's the question. I think you can kind of minimize your or minimize your damage if you try and find somebody that's local. That's that's just my take. Now, I don't know who the right guy is for the Aggies right now. So, um, I, you know, you can come back for my take maybe tomorrow or in two days for that. Hopefully they got somebody already, um, you know, solidified and, it, and it, some dude that's just terrible. You know, because actually, I, I take that back. As bad as I hate to say this, man, um, football's just better for us in general when the Aggies are winning too. That way, uh, I, I hate picking on little brother. I'm not, I was never that guy that kind of picks on people when they're down, anyways. Um, I root for them to get back up so we can beat the shit out of them when they're at their best. That's that's yeah, how I, I I am totally with you. I am a fan of of just uh, these. Two. At their best. I don't want to beat somebody when they're down, dude. No, exactly. And and the whole and 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 we do you know need why? to. We you we, know why? Because I want to leave no stone unturned. I want to leave no uh, doubt in their minds that we were better. That's all. Well, and the other part of this is we can laugh at as Texas fans. We can laugh at them all we all we want. We've been there. <laughs> we we have been there look at our recent track record um we've had to pay people to get the fuck out of town so uh, i mean not nearly what they're paying but you know no, this I is the that, biggest buyout in all of history my guy and it's not the even biggest close, buy, and it's the biggest buyout in all of history just pay the man his bag dude 10 this, years this this was almost worse than was this worse than the Gruden deal with the Raiders, Jimbo's contract. I th- I think that this is Chad, which seriously. which had which had a worse deal, Jimbo's deal or Gruden's deal. Please put put a put a one. Actually, just say Gruden or uh, Jimbo Fisher in the chat. Well, Please let us let, know. Let me give you on. these numbers. Let, let me give you these numbers. So Jimbo Fisher, uh, seventy seven point six million dollars to to go do something different. Uh, the brand new all time record, Gus Malzahn at Auburn. 21.4 million. Um, that's a drop in the bucket, but uh, not quite. How much was Herman's? What was Herman's? Um, I don't have him here on my list. Uh, Sumlin's was 9.9 9, uh, to get out of AM. So so there there you go. That's, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, 80, 90 some odd million. Uh, Herman, 15.4 million to get out of Austin. So, uh, I mean, you have that there, but, uh, you know, Charlie Weiss, 18.9 at, at Notre Dame, Willie Taggart at Florida state, 18 million. Um, Will Muschamp, 12.9. So, I mean, these are massive numbers and A&M has just totally blown this away, but Will look, Muschamp, Jesus, he, I've got. He, he, here's my thought for, for Texas A&M is, you know, I, I've seen the Lance Leipold. I've seen the Mike Elko. I, I've seen all of this, but look, and my man, Bobby Chaffee, I had this discussion with him last night, but if I am the Aggies man, go get your Jeff trailer. I mean, that it's not going to be the splash. The, I mean, that's the name. Trailer's the name, right? That's a Texas guy, a uh, football yeah. coach. I mean, that's kind of what everybody's a uh, high school, you know, Texas high school football coach. That's kind of like everybody. That's the name that I've been hearing over the past day or, or 48 hours or so. Rodney has been trailer. So, I mean, it's just, is it big? Like I, I heard, BK and Bucky talking a little bit about this when I was coming back in the room here. Is it mm-hmm. is it big enough? Is it enough for the is it enough to woo the Texas Aggie fan base? Right? Is it enough for all for all those crazy people out east or out uh out in the Eastlands there of Texas to to kind of be like okay f- you know we got our guy finally we got our guy. I don't think it is. Um, I think he could. I think he's the right guy for the job. I just don't think the Aggies do. Yeah, well, you know, Kalen DeBoer. Actually, Mike I'm not. Moore. I'm not. Actually, I'm not sure who the right guy is the job yet at this time. Well, I, I think trailer. I think trailer is probably the one of the better candidates for the job, though, for sure. It, it, and and it really is in a sense where where I dial this back and 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 again, I have relationships with so many high school coaches, and that's where I can look at this from a different manner. Is that the respect that people have for Jeff Trailer? And and honestly, I mean, if you're if you're 
a part of the A&M administration, if, if you think that it's not a big splash, um, one thing, you're going to get him cheaper than you're going to get any of those other people. No doubt. But no then he, doubt. here's the other part of it. You don't I, mean, have, you, I mean, I know you got a purse, but you're still paying a big penny right now to somebody that ain't right. even at your damn program. You damn right. You got to look at that balance sheet at some point and be like, okay, here's Sumlin. Here's the guy we just got rid of. I mean, let's, let's, yeah, we're still of, in the red. We're still yeah, in the let, red, let, man. Let's figure this thing out. But, but seriously, with Jeff Trailer, I mean, here's where if you're AM, it's like, okay, I mean, that, that's a Texas guy. He was on the Texas staff at one point and he has really done a good job. I mean, look at the UTSA program. I mean, seriously, they, it is, it is one of those things to where he has gone in there and built this thing really quick. I mean, does he, want, I I mean, does he want to leave though? That's the thing. Of course, Aggie land would be tremendous for him, right? That's a huge step. But I mean, you talk about success. Sometimes it's just, sometimes the hardest thing in life is saying no. Right. And yeah. sometimes yeah. just because the Aggies are offering something to you right now might. And, and if the Aggies offer trailer uh, a head coaching vacancy. Right. Sometimes mm -hmm. that might not be the best move. Like the, you could argue that the Aggies might not be the best time or the Aggies program might not be the best time to go in there right now and try and fix it. You might want to be the next guy after this person. Right. To try and clean up Jimbo Fisher's mess. Right. You, you look at what look at what happened with, with someone. Right. Jimbo Fisher was supposed to fix that mess, too. Something institutionally is going wrong at right. Texas A&M. Right. I'm not blaming it all on the organization there because I do think that Jimbo Fisher is kind of I, – I, I know Jimbo Fisher was the wrong hire. I just do. Like, uh, I, I didn't like him at Florida State. I still don't like him now, and you're starting to see the aftermath of what happened at Texas A&M because of Jimbo well, Fisher. And Jimbo comes in – I mean, Jimbo comes into A&M, and, and seriously, he does a really good job of pissing off Texas high school football coaches. That's what he and does. It, and that is a very important relationship to have culture. culture. Uh, you need culture. You have to have somebody that has Texas culture, Rodney. Yes. I mean, like, like we were just joking about right there with Bucky or I was, uh, I'll own that one. Look, when you, when you send somebody to go, I mean, dude, you got to win the parents. That's the number one thing. And when you send, when you send a dude that has won state championships in the state of Texas, because there are still a lot of great Texas high school football players that get out of this state. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know with what's happened here, you know, with Texas recruiting, I mean, we're in top 10, top five recruiting classes. A&M has been, A&M, A&M had the, had the, had the, had the catch of the litter a couple of years ago. And what, what did that get them? Seven and five? I mean, something's not working. I, I mean, that, that, the, the chemistry is not there. You have to have culture. I, I, I really think if you go back and dial this back, I mean, go get you up. Here, here's an, here's a crazy thought, Wags. Go get you a fucking football coach, man. <laughs> go, go get you a recruiter and and let this dude go build your program. I love what Bucky said. Hire a dude that you're going to put him in place and you got to run him out of here. Let him have a 15, 16 year old run uh, or 16 year run. And then you have to get him out because his time has passed, but he has gotten you national championships and conference championships. And, and, and I think Magic the whole man, thing is, we ain't bringing Jimbo to Texas. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Is that what you're saying, Magic Man? I don't think so. Yeah, but but I mean, look at this. You know, and and, and I can I could sit here and throw stats out. Twenty nine and eight for 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 Jeff Trailer in San Antonio. That's great. But I always tell Bobby that I'm talking about. I'm like, you ain't playing nobody. But I can tell you one damn thing. That program has culture. That program has chemistry. And those people believe in him. And he can bring that coaching staff with him to College Station. I agree. I agree. We got some baseball news real quick before we get into our Longhorn talk. Shohei Otani in the news right now. The lines have come out. Where do you think Shohei Otani will end up next year? Man, I, I East Coast or West Coast? Probably going to be with the Dodgers. You think um, so? I think there's a lot of interest. Um, I think from from Otani's side on Atlanta. There are but, there. Bing, bing, bing. Ring your bell. I'm glad you said yeah. that. There are. You must have seen the damn article that I read too, huh? There are reports no, no. that show wow, Otani yeah. does want to yeah. be a Bravo right now, but there is. I mean, he's like we were just talking about, like you alluded to the Dodgers. He's still in L.A. He's probably going to stay in L.A. But would you pay money to see Shohei? In Atlanta, in hot Atlanta, Rodney. You know, um, 
when you go back and you look at this year, I mean, with what Atlanta did, I mean, I, I seriously thought as, as you know, we're getting towards the end of the season that Atlanta was going to be the team that, that was not only going to take care of, of the NL, but also, you know, vault themselves into the world series and, 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 and boom, best team you know, in they, they, they were the best team in the American in, in the regular absolutely. season. Absolutely. All the home runs. I mean, everything they did. I, I mean, just a record year of, of hitting home runs and all that. You only add to that. Um, Atlanta for him, uh, I mean, may, maybe a good fit in the sense that it's that it's not Los Angeles, that it's not the 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 the, the limelight and all of that. Great, great winning tradition there. Uh, I mean, maybe not winning World Series, but uh, whatever in Atlanta. But man, you only bolster everything going there. But I, I don't know, dude. I, I just have a feeling. I just have a feeling Dodgers are going to win this thing out. If he goes to Atlanta. They would have, it's not even arguably, it's not even arguably, they would have the best two players in baseball. Oh, absolutely. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, that's not a hyperbolic state. No. Um, Acuna Jr. and Shohei Otani on the same damn club. Uh, get me to Vegas. Get me to, you can't get me to Vegas fast enough, baby, because I will, I will, I almost want to, Put the mortgage down on that damn ticket. However, I mean, you're probably not going to get that great of a return. I mean, yeah, I would do it now before he ends up on the Bravos, but you just throw a flyer out there. But yeah, man, that is our baseball talk for today. We got like we got a baseball video though. Um, we talk a lot of shit, literally, on this on this show, right? We talk a lot. Atlanta don't got the money. No, you're right. They don't have the money. I, I, but is Shohei looking for the money right now, or is he looking for the championship? That's what I I mean. And how I mean, with the baseball the way it is, how locked in does he, or how long of a contract does he need to stay there? I, I look at Shohei as being one of the most coveted pieces in baseball. If I'm Shohei Otani, I don't think that long term contracts are in my best interest. I maybe take two or three year contracts, maybe two or three year stints in different cities to do like a little tour in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's be real here. I would love for him to think that he wants to have a championship ring. Um, I don't think he needs the money. Sure, everybody wants the money, but I think Shohei is going to be a tour, like basically oh. a damn the best player in baseball tour, right? Yeah. Like if I was if yeah. I was Shohei, I would treat himself like he's LeBron. Like what is the best piece that i need to go to to help them win now of course you don't have any loyalty that way but he's coming over from uh you know he, he didn't grow up in 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 america i, I wouldn't think that he has you know a, a loyal fan base that he's he's trying to to be with anyways right like yeah yeah somebody yeah, that grows yeah. up somebody that grows up in baltimore might think oh i can't wait to grow up you know come back and play for the orioles one day i don't know if that's yeah even a notion in his mind, right? Like well, I would think that Shohei just wants to tour and, and be in the best spot that he could potentially be in. And and that's kind of the messed up part to me, you know, like you and I have talked about with mid market teams and, and so forth. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, obviously I want him to play for my team, but I, I don't think that's going to be an option, gonna but um, you know, for him to play for Baltimore, for him to play for Milwaukee, for him to play for St. Louis. I mean, None of I, I know clubs. it's None not going to happen. It's not going to happen, and that's Yankees the or Dodgers. Part. I mean, that's a sad, that's a sad. It it will be the Yankees or Dodgers. I would love to see the Bravos, but it 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 won't happen. It will be the Yankees or the Dodgers. If he stays in L.A., he's going to be with the Dodgers. If he moves anywhere else, it'll be to the Yankees. That's for sure. Yeah, um, no but yeah, we got a video here. Uh, we talk shit a lot, and we're talking <laughs> baseball here. Now, this video it's 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 about. It's almost three minutes long, but it's it is hilarious. It's a conversation with George Brett. All right, it's George Brett at batting practice, or you know, back in the day when the Royals were having BP or whatnot, and he's telling a story about him having to take a shit in Vegas. I'd like to play this for you. Please give me a little, just three minutes of your time so you can hear this. I swear to God, if you've seen this video, you know how funny it is. If you haven't, you're in for a show. Here we go. So left side. I shit my pants last night. <laughs> I did. Went out and had a great meal, just a great fucking meal. And I had to go to the bathroom so bad in the car. I'm going, travel, hurry up, man. I got a shit. Well, I had fucking shit in my pants. I went and I'm good uh, twice a year for that. 
When was the last time you shit your pants? Yeah. Been a while? I was in Vegas a couple years ago. Just an honest to God true story. Staying at the Bellagio. I went over to the Mirage for dinner, met some friends of mine over there. Went to Kokomo, it's a great little steakhouse. The guy brings out some fresh crab legs. He just came in, I gotta give them to you guys. Brings them. So I'm eating them. Then we go play gamble a little bit. Hey, let's I have tea time early in the morning. So I said, look, I gotta get going. I'm walking back to the hotel. I get three quarters of the way out of the lobby and all of a sudden I go, oh fuck. And I'm standing here like this. I got my butt pinched so fucking, I'm, I'm fucked, I can't move. All of a sudden, you know, felt all right. I went just like this. <laughs> Water. I had the, some food poisoning from the crabs. Take off my leather jacket, tied it around my waist, and I'm just standing there, and it's just running down my leg. I got jeans on, black bucks, no socks, and uh, I just start fucking walking. Every time I'm walking, something's coming out. It's water. Straight fucking water. Then, to show you how sick I was, I'll tell you how sick I was, and then I'm standing outside, and I got on my cell phone, and I call the guy. I said, Larry, you won't believe it. All right, all right, that's that's you get the gist of it. But anyways, yeah. he ends up finding his dude to finally come get him a, a fresh set of clothes that was three sizes bigger than George Brett, or two sizes yeah. bigger than yeah. George Brett. So George Brett is basically just holding essentially a, a damn clown outfit around his waist, walking through Vegas, just nothing but puddles of shit going down into his black box with no shoes like that's the worst like that's <laughs> when i'm when i'm thinking about all this aftermath right i'm thinking about the shit running down his legs and then going into making a puddle into his feet that is the to me and just sloshing around all there oh my fucking god man you want to talk about being in a shit sandwich that's a shit sandwich man we talk about some crappy places all the time that is probably one of the worst shit stories i've ever heard in my life well, tell I tell you the what, plane the plane was pretty bad, but that was pretty damn bad too. That's that's one of those things to where I, I've been, you know, in, in a public environment and and you know, you fart and it's like, man, did I shart? And, and it's like and, and you're walking around and, and you feel and, and it's like, okay, something feels uh, you know, I, I don't know. And and then it's like you're kind of waiting for the smell. And that's oh. what I go back to with the, with that right there. It's like, God bless America. How does uh, I mean how do you not yeah. smell that? And he's he was talking about like he couldn't go in the elevator because it was midnight, right? And you're in you're in a, a casino in Vegas. Oh. So much traffic is coming through those elevators at night, right? And he, all he could do was just stand outside because of the the air, just the smell. And you know yeah. that desert air, it's taking that smell and going every which way, right? You'd like, or at least you'd like to think that awful. Just I mean. George Brett, one of the best to do it, that's for sure, man. But one hell of a story. I mean, he can tell a shit story better than anybody. That, uh, of course. But yeah, man, um, that is probably one of the hardest, the hardest places to be in when you're trying to to take a dump and you really don't know if you can walk or not. Like hell, that's I base my morning on if I have to take a dump or not. You know what I mean? Like how much time do I have left in my day? It's it's based off of how much uh you know how much time do I have to poop, Rodney. I don't know of any more uncomfortable situations than that when you're trying to leak one out and you don't know if you have you you want to try and you want to try and push but you don't know if you have the safe space to push. You know what I mean? So. That, that, that's a whole thing, man. To try to to try to be able to hold that thing in. I mean, it's kind of the same thing when when you really when, when you park, gotta... you don't know if it's going to leak. You say yeah, you're right. waiting for the smell, man. I'm waiting to see if it's going to be wet or not. That's what right. I'm talking about. And and wags when when you got to piss really bad. I mean, it's kind of the same thing, man. You're on the road and you're like, "God dang it. I got to find a gas station. I got to find a porta john." It's like, "Man, I've been guilty in the past to where you're you're cruising down the road, you get into road construction and there's a porta john for the for the folks doing all that hard work. I'll pull my ass over and take a leak in there." Uh, I mean, I don't care. Oh, I I'll, I'll just take a leak in nature, man. But if I if I see a porter shitter and I got a shit, I'm taking it. Yeah, that, you know that's it. kind of one of my things. I mean, I, I I can tell you with a lot of my with a lot of my race travels. I mean, I mean, I go out to places that are my goodness. I mean, there are racetracks out in the middle of nowhere, and I'm sitting out there. And whether it's been you know that I'm drinking a bunch of Gatorade, or maybe I stopped and had a steak and had a couple Ooh. of beers or whatever, I'm getting down the road, and man, I got to pee so bad. And you pull over, and it's like you get out of the car and you're running, and it's like. God, man, I hope none of that leaked on my clothes because, oh, man, man, I got to wear this shit all night long. 
you just talking about peeing, man. I get I get myself one of those uh what 44 ounce cups or whatever, and I just hold it down there and just go, man, and then dump it, throw it out the window. I don't th- I don't throw the cup. I don't not throw the cup, the but I dump it. I dump the piss, that's not, for sure. Not out the window. Don't don't litter. Don't I don't litter. throw the, I don't throw the trash out. I just throw my urine out there. Dogs yeah. do it all the time, anyways. But, hey man, before we get into some Texas sports, let's uh let's hear from our friends over there at Covert and all over the place, Rodney. Let's hear what we got. Boy, I'm sure they're excited to follow that dude. I mean, they're they're sitting here watching. Dan Covert is sitting here watching this, and he's like, um, okay. Can you talk about me later? No, I'm going to talk about you now, Dan. Covert B Cave, uh, that's our great folks, uh, great supporters of Texas Sports Unfiltered. And that is a beautiful dealership out there uh, in, in B Cave. Three state-of-the-art dealerships, seven different brands of those vehicles, new and pre-owned. Uh, don't worry. I mean, I know a lot of folks hear about, well, you know, inventory shortage and all this. Well, not with the Covert family because they have been doing this since 1909. There are dealerships uh, that are spread out across Central Texas. Covert B Cave carrying the Buick the GMCs, the Cadillacs, Chrysler's Dodge, Jeeps, and Rams. And of course, if you're looking for the uh, for the Fords and the Chevrolets, they're over in Hutto. By the way, speaking of Hutto, coming up on Thursday from 8 to 1, you will find uh, Wags, myself, BK, Bucky, my man Jeff Howe. We're all going to be out there at the brand new Academy Sports and Outdoors in Hutto live live come on out and see us giving away some gift cards all of that cool stuff out there in hutto but that's where the buicks and chevrolets are um and make it a twofer stop out there and get you a brand new pre or or, or uh new um chevrolet or hutto oh i got a phone ringing hold on it's dan covert i think <laughs> <laughs> it's Dan Covert saying, hey, uh, don't be doing that. Uh, Covert BK, they also service all makes and models of your vehicles. 86 service bays are going to take care of you. CovertBK.com. They will set you up um, with that new or pre-owned vehicle. Be sure and check them out. Stop by, hit them up online, and uh, great supporters right here of Covert BK, uh, Covert BK of Texas Sports Unfiltered. Remember, nobody beats a Covert deal, not now, and sure as hell, not ever. And it is the best time in the year for sports. We all know that is NHL time, NBA time, college football time, and NFL football. You guys know the drill. We got some friends across the pond, too, that does the football over there as well. Uh, all your Premier League stuff you can do with audiovisual consultations. 512-255-8670. That's adconsultations.com. For the past 35 years, they've been setting the standard in audiovisual automations in the Central Texas area. Make sure you're giving them a call, 512-255-8670, or go to their website at abconsultations.com to see the gallery of projects that they've done over those past 35 years to give you an idea. Maybe you don't have one. You'll get one if you look at the gallery of projects. 512-255-8678. That's abconsultations.com. All right, Rodney, we got some Longhorn talk to get into before we get out of here and turn it over to only an hour with Jeff Howe. Um, make sure you guys are subscribing. Uh, smash that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Make sure you're giving us a like. Like the video, too, so you can qualify for all our special giveaways and prizes and stuff. And make sure you're following us on that code of text line, 512-222-9328. We'll be checking in from time to time to make sure that we're getting your text from the mobile line as well. All right, let's talk about it, man. Um, going up to Ames this week. You feeling a little good about it? Uh, if you had to be a betting man, if you were a betting man, Rodney, what would you place? Um, mm -hmm. what's the line now? I haven't even seven and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, I, Longhorn very, good for ten. Longhorn, yeah, good for 10? I, I think so. I'm feeling kind of twelve to fourteen, honestly. Rodney, I, I said mean, I was feeling a little. I was feeling like twenty three the other day, and it looked like it was coming back to bite us in the ass, man. So uh, we yeah. got to be able to finish ball games, man. Well, they were up by twenty. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say they'd be up by twenty. I said that they would finish by at least you know a score of twenty three and a half. Yeah, it's it's that whole uh, that's what she said thing. Got to finish. Um, you know, looking at this right here, I mean, I, I really think that it is. I mean, the challenges are there. I mean, that this defense is is going to be this is a good defense. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a pretty good defense that you're dealing with right here. But just everything everything that I feel right now, Wags, is that you know, like like I was talking about, we watched Malik Murphy come in and and lead this team. Now, obviously, with JV out, I mean that that's a huge loss 
I mean, no offense, Quinn Ewers, but the JV loss is even bigger, I, I think, in my opinion. But I think the pieces are in place right now. I, I think that Baxter finally is um, at, he's healthy now. And, and look, like we were talking about yesterday, Jeff and I were talking about this yesterday. For some reason, C.J. Baxter was supposed to be the starting running back. And I think it's time for him to show that. And and I think we see that on Saturday. Yeah, I think environment, it, but man, he he's I think ready. It didn't really work out for CJ Backer being the first the uh, the first string running back just because of how well Jonathan Brooks was running at, in the latter facets of the game, right? I think it just it fit Sarkeesian's philosophy. I think his his attack philosophy. I think to kind of wear the defense down with um, you know high tempo offense, and then you know kind of impose the will of Jonathan Brooks. You're still going to be able to do that in the in the later. Uh, the later stages of the game with Baxter, I just no. think you got to do it in different, in different time segments instead of just how instead of just kind of laying on and imposing the will in the second half. I think you got to sprinkle a little bit more with Baxter and Blue just a little bit differently than you did with Brooks, right? Just because he's just they're those two running backs are different style runners than Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan Brooks is. Uh, we'll hear from Sarkeesian on uh, the the Longhorn backfield as well, but we also need to get his overall thoughts on um, Iowa State and you know how difficult the game could be up there in Ames. Iowa, you know, Iowa State plays a three three five, which I think is going to bode well for trying to get a good rhythm for these two running backs right like of course if you got a three-man front you'd want to attack it by rushing the ball i mean that's yeah. kind of just you know your natural thought of progression in terms of of wanting to attack a three three five is kind of you know hit them on the ground and not throw into their strengths right i mean they got five they got a sub package in there already as it is why try and, and you know throw into the pockets of there hopefully if they come out in man we can cross them up and light them up but uh, we'll see how Campbell implements this defense. So the three, three, the three, three, five. Um, we'll also hear from Sarkeesian on how he intends to attack the three, three, the three, three, five as well. Uh, but to me, Rodney, initial statements, initial thoughts. I really think that this is a game that you can go in here and if you're the Longhorns, we talked about establishing the run the past three weeks. Now, um, yeah. I think it's going to be a little bit more of a difficult hill to climb without Jonathan Brooks. But you carve up this Iowa state defense with Baxter and blue and you should be able to walk out of Ames with a dominant victory in hand and there's no reason why the Longhorns can't do that you know I totally agree and if this if this were a situation to where to where you were going in with Malik and and again this is not a slight at Malik and 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 you know I, I want Malik I want this game to get to a situation to where Texas has a comfortable lead however they're doing it. I mean, whether it's, you know, with the dual attack there with blue and backs or whatever the case is, I want Malik to get back into this ball game and be able to get more reps because I think, you know, I've, I've kind of gone back over some of the, you know, whether it be on some of the, on the forums or different places where folks are still saying, um, man, I'm glad we are not having to rely on Malik. Well, you know what? Uh, I mean, give the dude a chance. I mean, we go back to this. He got two games in and he got you two and oh, that's the bottom line. But what what I mean with all of that is I think that that you go into this contest and and it's so funny for me the Dallas Cowboy fan in me is coming out in this ball game because this is a game where where I really feel that I should be concerned because of of not having you know Brooks in the ball game. But I think that it's going to kind of turn on me to where I'm not concerned because I think Texas is going to come out cuz this is where you think this could be a close game. I seriously think Texas is going to come out and just handle this and play four quarters that we have been looking for for the last We're, month. We've been talking really good about our defensive line. Um, we, we, you know, we mentioned Jonathan Banks, uh, in be or excuse me, um, Brooks, yeah, uh, Jonathan Brooks, uh, in the beginning of the show, right? Um, but without the without banks and you know the the rest of the offensive line none of these running backs can actually get this thing or hell you know Quinn Ewers don't even have a day man I think we have one of the best offensive line units in the big 12 as well why not be able to like we say all the time go out there and and show dominance and win the win in the trenches and make it a little bit easier on your quarterback that way by uh you know throwing you know predicated off the run 
Of course, that's not Sarkeesian style. We know that, man. It's high tempo, high tempo, high tempo. Um, and if, and that's kind of why I believe. I mean, Iowa State usually rolls out the three three five, anyways, man. But it's going to suit them a little bit better going up against this high tempo offense. I think you got to. I think the best thing to do is kind of break tendency here and zig a little bit when you should be za- when you shouldn't be zagging going throwing into that offense. I think we're gonna. I don't think we'll struggle that much um, throwing into that offense. I just think we would have a lot more success uh, running the ball. Yeah, I point. agree. I agree. And and I see what Daryl is saying right here. And, and I mean, I totally get it. I mean, I get the one and three. I mean, I, I totally understand that. I mean, it's just a I, tough place to play regardless, man. It's almost it like is. you're going into the Bermuda Triangle of football. It is. And, and, and Jake says it as well. It, it's going to be cold. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But look, man, um, honestly, none of that matters. None of that matters. The last the, the one and three. I mean, this is this is a whole different ball game right here. And, and I think that Texas is finding ways to win ball games. And, and, you know, if Texas comes out and wins this game by three, by four, by two, by one, I don't give a shit what they win it by. If you come out and you win, that's what you need to be doing right now. Your resume is predicated on winning football games. And we can sit here, and I know there's been a lot of conversation, Alabama's doing this, and Oregon's doing this, and, you know, the the, the rankings are coming out again tonight. I totally expect – Texas to be in the same place, even though yesterday I thought maybe Alabama would would jump Texas, but you know what? You just keep winning. That it doesn't. I mean, it takes care of itself. It'll take care of itself. You just got to. You, you just got to win. And yeah. I think that this team is programmed to go and win because here, here's the other part of this, Wags. When you talk about cold and when you talk about you know lack of success in the last four years against a particular program, dude, this team is is. <laughs> I don't want to say they're getting comfortable winning ugly, but shit, they're finding ways to win ugly. And I would say surviving. I, I wouldn't yeah. say they're finding ways to win ugly. I would say that they're surviving. surviving. Yeah, games that's great. That yeah. they're, I'll take that. That they're I'll playing take that. ugly. Um, I, I don't like to say the. I mean, of course, it is a win, but they're surviving. Um, I I want to do more than just breathe. You know, what I mean, I, I, I want to live. You know, um, go out there and establish dominance in Ames. Let's hear from Sarkeesian on his opening thoughts on uh, ISU. Uh, like we've been saying all along, as far as this week's ball game, this is another Big 12 championship game for us. Um, we've been, you know, we, we put ourselves in this position over a month ago, and we've we've uh, accepted the challenge, and I think our guys have responded to that. Um, we understand we're gonna we're gonna go into another hostile environment, you know, Saturday night, um, and it's gonna take it's gonna take all 70 players that we bring in, coaches, you know, to play as one. Uh, and to uh, to go play a good football team who has gotten better as the year has gone on. Uh, obviously a very well-coached team. Um, you know, these guys do a great job of taking care of the ball on offense, creating turnovers on defense. I think they have 15 interceptions on the year, so the ball uh, is going to play a big factor in this game. We, we, it's gotta, we've got to find a way to get it off of them. We've got to take care of it on our end. Uh, and then we need to be efficient offensively um, with the number of possessions that could come out of this game. So uh, a lot of work to do. Uh, on a Monday, but uh, again, a lot of respect for Iowa State, and um, we know it's going to take uh, it's going to take a great effort from us to to try to come get a win. Now they they struggled against Kansas, but Kansas has shown that they're a formidable foe in the Big Twelve this this year, right? Or in this campaign, they dominated BYU. Uh, they beat Cincinnati. They beat Baylor. Um, they handled TCU. You could say that they handled TCU. Um, it was a two score victory. So, and like uh, what DJ says, you know, don't let, don't be sleeping on the the schedule of of Iowa State, man. It's they might look like they're, you know, a, a program of mediocrity, um, but they can get up and bite you in the ass, especially in names, man. Campbell gets his boys to fight. Campbell knows how to make his his boys fight, man. Matt Campbell's one of the best uh, best coaches in the Big Twelve. Uh, that's not just a hyperbolic statement, man. Uh, stats back that up, um, and he gets his defense ready, man. Um, it's usually the the type of style and type of fight that you see from the Iowa State Cyclones really is yeah. a testament to the type of of character that that Matt Campbell is, man. Usually these these people or this team just fights claws until the the end of the game, man, and um you're you're always going to get a fight regardless of what club is out there. Yeah, team teams take the identity of the head coach. I know that's another right. coaching cliche, and, and but it's it true really, they, they do. I mean, it's absolutely holds true. I mean, look look around; it's good and bad. 
And this is very much uh, in a good sense where Matt Campbell has just done an amazing job at Iowa State. And, 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 you know, like Sark is talking about right there, this is a team that has gotten better, you know, as the year has gone on. Well, most of them have. If you go back and you look at, um, you know, the last few Sark pressers on, on Monday, that's probably a recurring theme is that everyone has gotten better as the year has gone on. And, and that's that's not anything new. But I love what, what Sam is talking about right here uh, on, the, on the YouTube line. And again, don't forget the code of text line is there, 222-9328. If you're going up against 335, you should be making a statement. You should be throwing you should be throwing mass around. You just really should. You should be dominating the line of scrimmage and, and being able to establish uh, a, a excellent running attack, Rodney. Yeah, I mean that's the bottom line. I mean just go just go out there, handle your business in the trenches, and make this easy. I mean establish a run, let the other stuff come in, uh, you, you, you know dictate itself, and let that become a part of the game plan as well. I mean it, and I mean you know you know what we're going to see. You're going to see that first 15 scripted plays, and it's going right. to look unbelievable. It's how you react from that point. Oh, and the other the, the other part of it is Wags. Hot damn it. I mean, when you get when you get to the third quarter, if you've got 14, 20 points, whatever the advantage is here, man, don't let up. Just go. Yeah, Just keep doing what keep doing what you were doing to get yourself that lead, right? Why? Yeah. I mean, why don't try new plays? You know what I mean? Just no. continue to continue to do what's giving you success. Um, let's hear from Sarkeesian on Blue and Baxter. Uh, I think that's fair. You know, I think that we have, you know, uh, uh, a, a little sample size on those guys from in-game. We've got a much bigger sample size from them from a practice perspective. You know, I think one thing where we're fortunate, you know, timing is in, is is pretty incredible in that CJ's really 100% healthy again. And, you know, I'd feel really uncomfortable if this would have happened a month ago um, because Cedric was, was really struggling with his foot. Uh, for, for him to be healthy, I'm very confident in that. I think we've naturally seen over the last couple of weeks, you know, we've been, you know, kind of injecting Jaden Blue a little bit more into the offense. So I think his comfort level of playing, and he's had some carries. He had the long touchdown run versus BYU, um, where I think his comfort level will be there. And obviously he's playing a ton on special teams. I think obviously with Savion Red, you know, we've we've incorporated him into our short yardage offense and the Wildcat stuff. So he's carried the ball at some critical moments of some games, and we've asked a lot of him. So I don't think the moment will be too big for him. And naturally the experience of Keelan – of just the player that that he's been over time and so um you know we feel comfortable that we have those four guys that core of guys um you know it's obviously it's monday and we're still working through the game plan of exactly how it'll all roll out but we're comfortable with those guys going in the game and playing so you you and jeff Howell talked about it yesterday right for some reason or or you know uh what or another um cj baxter was supposed to be the starting running back um Brooks ended up winning out that position. Uh, but I also do think it is because Baxter was banged up a little bit, nicked up a little bit um, mm -hmm. in preseason and week one and two, right? We saw that Baxter almost wanted to be the showcase, or it felt like Sarkeesian wanted to showcase Baxter as the featured running back for the Longhorns. But injuries kept nicking him up. He couldn't stay on the field. You heard Bucky and BK talking about that in week one and week two. And then all of a sudden, just Jonathan Brooks emerged as our bell cow running back. Yeah. Now, going back on what Sarkeesian said there in that in that sounder, if this would have happened a month or two ago, or maybe you know six weeks ago, with with Baxter being a little bit banged up, we would not be able to kind of transition seemingly into this uh, into this type of spellback uh, portion of of the season with Baxter and Blue coming in for Brooks because Baxter wasn't exactly healthy to put everything on Blue probably isn't exactly going to be the best recipe for success coming out of that backfield to help out Quinn Ewers and Malik Murphy, right? So now, you know, with a good one-two, you know, punch with these two running backs coming out of there, I think the Longhorns are going to be okay. I think with Baxter being, uh, hopefully he is 100% healthy, like Sarkeesian said, you'll be able to see the good change of pace with these two running backs. Yeah, and like Jake says here, with a three-man front, if you're not getting five yards of pop, there is something wrong, man. Even yeah. if they're blitz, if they're coming off as a three-man front and they're blitzing, you know, uh, four or five off of uh, off the rip, you should still be able to have that blocked out and schemed accordingly and be able to get three or four yards of pop. They're giving yeah. you, they're giving you gap hole. They're giving you huge holes already, man. Yeah, and you're exactly right on that, and 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 the message is exactly right on that. I mean, you look at you look at the other night. You had uh, JB had 21 carries. 
averaged five yards a carry. You had uh, Cedric Baxter had 18 carries, and he averaged 3.4. So, uh, so I mean, there it is right there. You have the difference there in the carries, and, and, and it's not a, uh, a huge difference right there in the amount of carries that the two guys had. But, I mean, you have to think that when you magnify the carries that C.J. Baxter is going to have on Saturday or should have on Saturday – Oh, the and roles, he's going to be averaging be up around five yards a carry. Yeah, yeah, the roles will be different. Like Baxter is going to move into Brooks's role. Well, he be he'll be you know the the bell cow where he's just wearing people down, and then you know Blue's going to go in there and, and change up the pace and then get the explosive plays, right? The explosive running uh, running plays mm-hmm. that that CJ Baxter used to get, right? Going around the edge and getting the edge. That'll be Blue's job now, right? Baxter's yeah. going to get those hard yards in between the tackles. There, the thing about Baxter is that he also has that explosive. Uh, explosive playability coming out of the backfield. I I would love, my goodness, I would love to see a check down and hit Baxter a little bit five yard dump of Baxter out of the backfield and then have him turn into a forty yard scamper. My goodness, call it fruition, Rodney. I think it could happen. Yeah, I, I mean, no, no doubt about it. And look, I have total faith in Tashar Choice and what he's doing here with this running back room. I mean, this is a guy right here to where I mean, he's sitting here developing these guys, and and it really is. I mean, next guy in line, it just happens to be now Cedric Baxter. He's going to be the one that that you're going to put him in situations to where I mean, is he going to fill the void? And and this is where I really like this in a sense. I mean, yes, I wish Jonathan Brooks was in here uh, playing Saturday, but look. Look, it's it's not the same. It, it's going to be a little bit of a different feel. Um, yeah. it, it's going to be a little bit of a different vibe right here that you get with 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 Baxter. And and I mean, are you I, concerned? I think, are any concerns that that Baxter can stay prone to injury? Are, are you concerned that uh, oh, that you know with with the amount of totes that he's going to because he's going to get um, you know a heavier payload? Man, do you think maybe there's a potential chance that he could? kind of have a, a mishap and kind of break a little bit got to yeah, you, you know that's that's kind of one of those things to where i even go back and think about this you know with yours like we were talking about yesterday it's like you know some of the stuff that yours was doing it's like oh my goodness please don't let him go down on that shoulder or we don't want anything to, to happen right there i mean i think the whole thing I is with, fantastic i was worried oh, about man, you I, coming back i thought, I thought he was great fantastic. I, I, I thought he was great and and you know I, I saw folks saying well he was floating footballs or doing whatever i happened to like the way those footballs were floating and um it, it, i thought the ball looked great coming out of his hand, especially coming back from an AC separation. I didn't did. think that the AC separation was on his throwing shoulder, though. I thought it was on his left shoulder. Uh, you may be right. You may I be could right. Be right. It. Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, yeah. man, is, we are out of time. Uh, Chaos Theory is over, as I like to say. It's uh, time for you to get on with the rest of your damn day and not listen to our sorry asses. It is <laughs> Jeff Paul coming on for only an hour. Is that it's Jeff? only an hour. It's only, only an hour. hour. Right. Okay. Well, thank you guys, everybody, for uh, tuning in the Chaos Theory, man. It is time for the man, the myth, the legend, Jeff Howe, to take you for your afternoon ride. For Rodney, Double R, and myself, I'm out of here, guys. Rodney, you're staying on, right? I'm staying on with Jeff for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Wags. And we'll see you all tomorrow. I'm hearing Rodney talking about floating balls while I'm coming on, so life sounds good. Hey, Jeff, (laughs) I I said it. I I said it on, on Saturday night, man. I'm like, look, I happen to like the way Quinn's balls look. And um, I said it out loud. My wife was like, I'm going to bed. It's a man who's very secure with himself, folks. Yeah. You watch, you watch your game. You watch your game. I, Jeff, I had a problem. I had a problem with some people saying, like, oh, well, yeah, uh AD Mitchell had to make a hell of a catch. No, if you look at that, it's third and 12. Quinn put that ball where either his guy's gonna make an adjustment or nobody's gonna get it. He did that wasn't a 50-50 ball. That was AD Mitchell's catching this or it's incomplete. Yeah, I, I exactly. didn't have a problem with it. No, by the way, no. Rodney, um, I was a, I was a hair, I was a hair late coming on, um, mm-hmm. because it's award season in college football, mm-hmm. and I had to vote for two awards that I'm a I'm a voter for. Ah, nice. For, for some reason, and mm-hmm. I don't know why, but I appreciate the fact that they give me a vote. I'm a voter for the Lou Groza Award that goes mm. to the top collegiate kicker. So any award named after Lou yeah. Groza is a damn good award, the way I see it. And I'm guessing it's because I have covered two two-time winners of the Ray Guy Award, Daniel Sepulveda at Baylor, Michael Dixon at Texas. I am an, I am a voter for the Ray Guy Award also. Dude, that's cool. That's I, take, cool. I take my votes as seriously as Chip Brown takes his Heisman vote when I'm voting. Let, for me, those awards. let me tell you something, Jeff. I know a lot of people like to laugh at kickers and, you know, make – 
talk shit about punters and all this, but I'm like, you go try that. I mean, you, you go do that. Um, that's, you know, it's kind of one of those, like when I watch baseball and you get a reliever that comes in or you get the closer that comes in and it's like, okay, uh, no pressure. I mean, talk about being a kicker, man, that, that right there, that's high pressure shit. Hey man, uh, Bert Auburn's helped Texas win some football games this year. Ryan Sanborn's helped Texas win some football games. Rodney, I watched Michael Dixon be the MVP of a bowl game. Mm. Even though his head coach refused to say his name, I watched Michael Dixon basically win a bowl game for Texas with his foot. Mm-hmm. So yeah. punters and kickers are people too. And like I said, any any award named after Lou the Toe Groza, I'm more than happy to. Well, to win that. and let me tell you something. Anything named after Ray Guy, I mean that. I mean Ray was the guy. That's hey, how man, stupid. When you're a, when 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 you're a Al Davis and John Madden deem you the X factor as a punter, you're that that says all you need. Ray guy, we you we overuse the uh, overstate the term goat, Rodney. We we do. Mm-hmm. But when you talk about punters, man, Ray Ray guy, Ray guy is the goat without question. Ray guy. Ray guy was a bad son of a gun. Well, we'll I mean, get to we'll get to Texas football, Rodney. But I I I got down this rabbit hole, and I remember one of the first conversations you and I had. Uh, on Texas Sports Unfiltered revolved around ranking Cowboys quarterbacks yeah. and, and kind of the love affair that is revisionist history. How Cowboys fans, there's now a, a generation of Cowboys fans that just think Tony Romo was the greatest ever and, yep. and Dak Prescott is garbage. And and I started thinking about that this morning because I, I saw the news as I was brushing my teeth and you know getting on with my day. Uh, I saw the news that Ken Dorsey had been fired by the Buffalo Bills today as their offensive coordinator. And then mm-hmm. I'm a I'm a big I'm a big guy that values a championship window, right? I think you've only got which is why like what Nick Saban's done in Alabama is remarkable in the day and age when you're not supposed to do that in college football. Right. I'm a big I'm a big advocate of looking at championship windows and saying, okay, is that thing open? How open is it going to be? Is it starting to close? I think it's starting to close for the Buffalo Bills and. I'm like, well, you know, what what Cowboys championship windows do I remember? And and the reason why I hold Tony Romo, Romo in lower esteem than some Cowboys quarterbacks is to me yeah. that 2007 team should have won a Super Bowl. Uh, that team was built by Bill Parcells. Wade Phillips was their caretaker that year. But Bill Parcells and Stephen Jones built that roster into a Super Bowl yeah. contender. Rodney, I, I, so I started thinking, I was like, man, how many playoff games? Because everybody's like, well, Dax only won two playoff games. Yep. And... I'm like, man, how many playoff games did Tony Romo win? It wasn't that many. But did you know, I just started, I just, so I decided to look it up. Tony Romo and Dak Prescott have both played in exactly six playoff games. Their record in playoff games is an identical two and four. Mm. Dak's yeah. completion percentage is a hair higher, 63.4 to 61.6. Dak's thrown for more yards, uh, higher average yards per pass attempt, more yards per game, more touchdown passes a higher touchdown percentage, does have three more interceptions. He's been sacked 11 fewer times. So Cowboys fans, before you before you go discarding Dak, and I know there's a lot of people this week trying to jump back on, on the Dak bandwagon. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's, yeah. No, there's no room at the end for any of y'all. Y'all, y'all wanted to jump off. That's fine. I, I've stayed on. Before you want to discard Dak Prescott and think that Tony Romo was just the greatest quarterback ever, put it in perspective. And keep it in perspective of, man, think about what the quarterback position with the Cowboys has been and where this franchise would be right now without Dak Prescott. Yeah, and that's really a great point. And a lot of my, I think a lot of my appreciation for Tony Romo is the fact that um, when all of that went down, you know, when, when Romo comes in, he pops in it, a funny story. When Romo pops in and takes over for, for Bledsoe there on that Monday night football game, <laughs> my wife and I, we're on our honeymoon in, in, uh, Puerto Rico. And it's like, Oh, what the hell's going on here? And you know, it's one of those things to where I think where I feel a lot of that, uh, maybe the little heart thing that the kids say for Tony <laughs> Romo is, is the fact that as this thing was built, I mean, it was built to where it was going to be something that was going to be hoove and finally and finally help Tony Romo achieve what he was supposed to achieve. Yeah. And and again, it's not Dak Prescott's fault. The fact that Tony Romo just couldn't finish his career. Um, and I mean, a lot of it is, you know, and, and honestly, Jeff. Dak, Dak Prescott is one bad son of a gun. Let me tell you. I mean, this dude, what he's doing right now. 
I was I was getting a lot of stuff on Sunday from folks who's like, well, you know, he didn't beat Philadelphia. I'm like, well, shit, did you see his stats against Philadelphia? It's like, man, discount that yeah. shit. He wasn't the reason they lost that game. Right, right. And the thing is, I think what, what Dak has done a really good job of that Tony Romo wasn't able to do is that he has taken them to the next level. This team is a lot more consistent. Dak, Dak, you're not with Romo. As much as I like Romo, you're waiting for that. Whatever's going to happen, you're waiting for forty. You're waiting for forty-four to nine the week that it's win or get in. Exactly, <laughs> you're you're waiting for that. Where with Dak Prescott, and it's one of those things, Jeff, to where I always with with Romo, it's like, okay, this is a Cowboy game that that you should let. Let's say that this week you're playing the Panthers. This is a game. If Tony Romo was a quarterback, you should steamroll these guys. Yeah. But yet over here on the other side of my brain, I'm like, but at the same time, this is one that Romo's going to lose 20 to 17. Yeah. I, th I think though, Rodney, we have a, as Cowboys fans, we have a tendency to do that in the moment. Like I was not a huge Romo fan because 07 is just always going to stick with me. It's just one of those years. It's like, it's like the bad year of school that you have. Like some people mm -hmm. are like, oh man, sixth grade was terrible. You couldn't pay me enough to go back to sixth grade. You, you couldn't pay me enough to go back to January of 2008 and relive that division and loss to the Giants. I just, there's no way I could do it, but there's a, there's a generation before me, Rodney, and maybe I'm overusing the term generation, but there's a, there's a, a group of Cowboys fans that I don't know what y'all did to Danny white to piss him off so bad no. and, uh, and to crap on his legacy. But I look at it. And I'm like, man, Danny white was pretty good. Why don't y'all hold him in very high regard? Well, he only got him to NFC championship games. Like, dude, I'd give, <clears throat> I speak, we started this show talking about Quinn Ewers balls. I, I might give one of mine to for the Cowboys to get to an NFC championship. I've already I've already got a kid, Rodney. We're one and done, so it's not it's not like I yeah. need them anyway. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I'd give right. one up for the Cowboys to get to an NFC championship game. But but just just keep it all in perspective when you're talking about Dak. And that's that's kind of the only thing I, I wanted to talk about relating to the Cowboys today is just championship windows. I, I feel like as long as you've got a competent a competent Dak Prescott, you're going to have a chance. Uh, and I don't, I don't know that there's been, maybe this is just me being jaded Cowboys fan, Rodney. I don't know if there's been like a, a window open. Cause I, even like you look at 2016 when they were the number one seed going into the playoffs, that was all, it, it almost felt like you were playing with house money at that point, just because when Romo got hurt in Seattle, by the way, isn't it weird that the Tony Romo roller coaster, the first dip was in Seattle, Seattle. on a bobbled field goal in yeah that yeah. thing parked right when you know he's he slid and and hurt his back and we never saw Tony Romo again mm -hmm. but uh, you know you felt like you were playing with house money that 07 team you know i it, it's not as big a what if if what if Jimmy and Jerry had gotten along but i i always do think man what if what if bill parcells had just decided you know what i i can do this i can i can give this one more year mm -hmm. i can give this one more year to see this thing through to me there's no doubt that 07 team was good enough to go win a super bowl it, no, I mean, it, re no doubt it really was, Jeff. I mean, it really was. Uh, Bill Purcell, in the words <laughs> of uh, Jerry Jones. But, relative, and, relative to. <laughs> how much of this for you? And again, we'll get to the Texas stuff, but now we're down this rabbit hole here about, about the Cowboys. I mean, how, how much of this to me is, I mean, I look at this a lot of times and I'm like, okay, the Jones family, they, they obviously, you've got the number one. I mean, argue with me all you want. You've got the most popular franchise, popular even in the sense that people hate it so much uh, in sports with the yeah. Dallas Cowboys. But it's like, man, they, they are very confident in selling stadium tours, in selling the brand and doing the great things that they do lord knows they do so many great things for y'all y'all try to go to at t stadium and pay for parking and some to eat you need to take out a loan <laughs> no shit and, and it's like you know i had a buddy i had a buddy we would always it was so funny jeff we we went to the final game at texas stadium and we told our wives we're like look we're going to this game we're going to pay whatever it costs to get tickets because we will never be able to go to the new place because it's going to be so expensive mm -hmm. well the year turns around they play the giants and we're at the first damn game right there and and you go walking into this taj mahal it, it's just an art gallery of whatever but yeah. it's like i just think that so much of the cowboys uh, you know, you want to call it systematic or whatever, organizational. It's like, man, can we put winning Super Bowls, winning conference championships? Let's make that like the top goal again. It just seems like that's kind of gotten away a little See, bit. See, here, here's the thing. It, it, it's your, your talent. You're more talented than the team I'm going to mention, but it, it got a, this this team was on the cusp of the Super Bowl and it got away from them. 
with Jerry, you're venturing into like later years Al Davis, where mm -hmm. there might have been people in the org, and I do think that there are smart people in that Cowboys organization, like Stephen Jones. Say what you want about Stephen Jones, but he has grown up understanding whether it's been Jimmy Johnson or Bill Parcells or the other coaches that he's worked for. What's up, CB? Uh, he's been around long enough to understand how the dynamics of salary cap and managing the cap and the draft Stephen Jones unders he, he's come up in that so he knows what that's all about Will McClay great in terms of player personnel and then you get into Chris Hall and everybody on the college on the scouting side and and dealing with college stuff that uh, there are people in that organization that value it but the the gargantuan but in the room is the buck ultimately stops with the man who's still in charge and exactly. if he if he shoots something down, doesn't really matter what everybody else thinks. I mean, it's it, it, you saw it with Al Davis with the Raiders. It, it's you know George Steinbrenner with the Yankees. Hell, I'll even go a step further, man. Like you see it, you know. I'm a big pro wrestling fan, and for the last few years, you've heard you know WWE. hey this you know Triple H has this great idea for creative, and this person understands where it's going to go right. But you can have the best idea in the world, but if Vince McMahon says it's no, it's yeah. no. And that's the same thing with the Cowboys, man. If Jerry, if Jerry Green lights it, then you're good. If he says no, then you just wasted all that time doing it. You know, I got, I laugh at the story of what it's turned to, where like, you know, Stephen had to, you know, Indian leg wrestle Jerry to get him away from the phone on draft night when he was going to draft Johnny Manziel instead of Zach Martin. But whatever, Jeez. that story's taking on a life of its own. But at this point, um, you know, I believe it. And and it's funny now to, to go back and retroactively hear stuff like when they signed Deion Sanders in that 95 season after Kevin Smith blows his Achilles on mm -hmm. opening night. You know, Steven was like, we need to do this smart. You know, we got to manage the salary cap. We, we got to do this. And they apparently ended up coming to blows over the Dion contract because Jerry said, whatever it takes. And Steven said, whatever it takes is going to get us into salary cap hell. And lo and behold. <laughs> look where the Cowboys ended up. So I, I definitely see your point, Rodney. I do think there are people in that organization that value winning, but mm -hmm. it's it, the final call, whatever direction is being made. And that's what you're charging for parking all the way up to who's going to be your first round draft pick. If the boss man says no, then it's no. That's right. And, and you know, it, it's so funny because I, I, I kind of compare this to for a lot of years, Jeff. I mean, a lot of years I worked for a family owned company and it was it was a shit show. I mean, very successful company. I mean, did a lot of really good things in, in that industry, but it was always, well, I think if we could do this, you know, we could take the next step. But it was always yeah. no. Mm -hmm. There was a, there was always a veto. And, and then and then, you know, at whatever point, you know, the 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 the. Um, anchors of the company they move on they pass away whatever the hell happens here the rest of the family takes over out of business five years and you know that 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 really is the thing right there to where uh as long as the old dude as long as old uh rubber face is making those decisions um you're going to continue to just be america's team <laughs> just yeah. be america's team It'll it'll be it'll be Steven and Charlotte's and Jerry Jr.'s here before too long, and we'll see we'll see if things change at that point. Rodney, let's talk Texas. Let's talk a little sure. bit of Longhorn football. Were you the line has come down a little bit? Uh, were were you surprised to see Texas open? I think Caesars open with this thing at like nine and a half. Yeah, is what it opened as. I think we're down to. I haven't checked it this morning, but as of last night, some of those books had gone down to like seven and a half, eight. Were you surprised? Are you surprised it's still this high? Because I am. I, I've got a sinking feeling, just a, a a nasty gut feeling, and that's not the the stuffed bell pepper I ate last night. I've just got a bad gut feeling about this Iowa State game. I don't know if it's Ames, if it's Matt Campbell. I, I don't know if it's no Jonathan Brooks. I just I don't like the way I feel about this game on Saturday, Rodney. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things to where I, I was talking to Wags about this to where kind of the Cowboy fan in me is coming out a little bit about this game to where I am a little apprehensive of, of all of that, everything that you're talking about right there, Jeff. But at the same time, there's a part of me that thinks like you do sometimes with the Cowboys to where, okay, after what I've watched the last couple of weeks in Texas, finding a way to let these things get, you know, into nail biters that they shouldn't be, maybe this is the game where Texas comes in and, and they put the throttle down and, and, and they just play four quarters of football ball and just control the line of scrimmage and the defense dominate but 
like you're talking about, I mean, being in Ames, it's going to be cold. That's going to be a raucous crowd. Those people, you know, I heard, I heard Sark talking in his opening, you know, statement yesterday. You covered that uh, great job at uh, horns two, four, seven, by the way. And I, I'm reading a bunch of cool stuff. We can talk about some of the commits that I'm seeing that are starting yeah. to happen. If you want to go down that road as well, sure. but it, it's like, I mean, he, here's the opportunity right here to silence some of that uh, question about what's happening. So, um, I don't know. I'm still surprised the line is that high, though, honestly, looking at everything that you're mentioning. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'll i say this. You know, I, I say a lot of the best times to get coaches uh, and get their reactions is immediate the, the immediate post-game press conference because mm -hmm. it's just raw. You know, some guys just don't process properly. You get you get the best of Steve Sarkeesian on Mondays, though, and, and you get honest Sark on Monday. And mm -hmm. I, I, I like that he was honest about the pass defense. Yeah, he, you know, keeping your mental intensity, your mental focus, that's stuff that he's always talked about. But, hey, they played softer coverage in the second half for whatever reason. And a team that, you know, the way that that veer and shoot offense works, that Kendall Bryles runs, you know, it, it was his dad's offense that he created at Stephenville. Mm -hmm. The big thing about that offense is if you let them get into a rhythm and they get a couple first downs, now they're in what they would call, you know, kind of their green tempo, which means they're going and the quarterback gets comfortable. That thing gets really hard to stop. And it got really hard for them to stop on Saturday on top of the fact that, I mean, they just didn't tackle well. And no. we could see that in the game, but you could tell Sark was disgusted. He he went about as far as close up to the line as he could say without just throwing guys under the bus where you know, he talked about that, that play that Savion Williams ripped off down the sideline, you know, an eight yard curl route against our defense should never turn into a 40 plus yard game. Exactly. Should never happen. So exactly. I, I like the fact that we got honesty from Sark. If there's anything that gives me confidence, Rodney, is that Iowa State doesn't have the kind of offense that TCU does. Where we've seen TCU, you know, you look at going into that game, they were leading the Big 12 in plays from scrimmage of at least 10 yards. Now yeah. they were the, the problem was. I think in 20 plus yard games, they were like eighth, ninth in the conference. Then from 30 plus, they were going in that game anyway. They were 13th out of 14th, and they were dead last in plays of 40 plus. So they they weren't getting the big chunk, huge chunk yards that they were last year. They just been kind of trying to chip away at it. And that's why TCU's been in a lot of tight ball games. They haven't gotten those chunk yardage plays that allow them to put teams away. But uh overall, uh, you know. Iowa State's not that same kind of offense. Rocco Beck has gotten better as a quarterback. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Matt Campbell. I, I don't know what Matt Campbell and Nathan Shieldhouse and that staff have done to identify running backs, but they yeah. always seem to recruit or identify or evaluate or develop a top-notch running back. So they've got some nice pieces, but that's kind of – it could be more of a – of a 20 to 17 type game than a game that gets, you know, close up into the 30s on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Let's take a listen to Sark uh, talking his opening statement about Iowa State coming up on Saturday. Uh, like we've been saying all along, as far as this week's ball game, this is another Big 12 championship game for us. Um, we've been, you know, we, we put ourselves in this position over a month ago, and we've, we've uh, accepted the challenge, and I think our guys have responded to that. Um, we understand we're going we're gonna to go into another hostile environment, you know, Saturday night. Um, and it's going to take it's going to take all 70 players that we bring in coaches, you know, to play as one uh, and to uh, to go play a good football team who has gotten better as the year has gone on. Uh, obviously, a very well coached team. Um, you know, these guys do a great job of taking care of the ball on offense, creating turnovers on defense. I think they have 15 interceptions on the year. So the ball uh, is going to play a big factor in this game. We, we, it's got to, we've got to find a way to get it off of them. We've got to take care of it on our end. Uh, and then we need to be efficient offensively um, with the number of possessions that could come out of this game. So uh, a lot of work to do uh, on a Monday. But, uh, again, a lot of respect for Iowa State. And um, we know it's going to take uh, it's going to take a great effort from us to to try to come get a win. That's the big thing, mm -hmm. Rodney. That you know, a game like TCU, you play a tempo team, you're going to get more possessions. A team like Iowa State that wants to control the football, shorten the game, which now with the clock rules, you can do that a little bit better. Uh, you know, you can't afford to waste possessions. That's why, like TCU teams that run tempo, that's why I think they're bad matchups sometimes for a Steve Sarkeesian team because I think Sark can. 
let the, the offensive coordinator in Sark can kind of creep in a little bit. Sam, I appreciate you. Uh, yeah, we're very happy to be here on Texas Sports Unfiltered uh, compared to previous stops. And that wasn't anything. Love Craig, love Cameron, not anything either one of those guys did. It was people above them, but that's drama for another day. Um, anyway, you know, you play a team like TCU. I think Sark sometimes, Rodney, I think that offensive coordinator side of him can kind of get, well, you know, maybe we can tinker a little bit with this position because we'll get it back. Yeah. I, I do wonder, and I hope anyway, that I, I said this during the, the, the Quinn Ewers injury, and, and I think to some extent we saw it. I know the turnovers can kind of muddy some of the stuff up during the two Malik Murphy games, but I, I said at that time, I hope I hope that brought out the best in Sark, and I felt like at times it did. We saw the best of Steve Sarkeesian. I hope that's what we see on Saturday because I think that's what you're going to need to get. I think you're going to need to see – an opening script and a plan without Jonathan Brooks that somehow gets you into third and manageable situations where more of the playbook is open and you can keep moving the chains and sustain drives because you can't afford to waste possessions. The one possession you waste in a game like this could be the, the possession that costs you. And it really is Jeff. And, and that's the one thing where, you know, I'll, I'll say it. I mean, it's so important to get ahead of the chains. Uh, I mean, you have to do that. You have to do that each and every time that you have the football. But but it really is. I mean, the one thing that that I know Wags and I talk about a lot is, man, that opening script is great. I mean, you sit here and you watch that. And, it you know, we kind of saw it more with Malik. And, and again, not a slight at Malik at all. But it was like when you get outside of that opening script, that's, that's when things kind of fell off the rails a little bit. Maybe some of the uncertainty, whatever you, you want to call it right there, whether it's a coaching staff, whether whatever it was. That's really when you started to see things uh, – I kind of fall apart a little bit. And I mean, I just think it's imperative that, that, that you establish a game plan, obviously the open and script, and then you just keep doing whatever's going to be successful. I think the in game adjustments are, are what you have to do in a situation like this. And it just seems like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I would love your thoughts on this because you, you are so in depth in this. It seems like the in game adjustments from time to time that they're, they're just lacking and, and, and you go away from things that are really working at whatever point and, and you're allowing these teams to get back in, in the ball games when they really shouldn't be. I think here's what, to me, what it boils down to is and, and you can, I don't need Sark to confirm or deny it. You can tell. And then this is why I actually like sometimes, like I did on Saturday, watching the game from the house rather mm -hmm. than being in the press box, because you get those camera shots of the sideline. And when you see Sark crouch down, just staring at the call sheet, I, I think sometimes he can get too tunnel visioned yeah. that you can lose the idea. Complimentary football is a great thing to talk about. But I think sometimes he can get so tunnel vision uh, being the you know being the play caller on offense that you know you kind of tend to take the the concept of complimentary football and fire it into the sun. The yeah. fake field goal try against Houston's a yeah. perfect example of that. Like if you yeah. wanted to go for it on fourth and six in that part of the field, man, just keep the offense on the field. You know, there's no there was no need to do that. And that's that's one start decision I'll probably never get over. But you know, that to me is where so and, and I I was kind of hoping Joe D. Camillus would be this guy for him, but or, or Paul Chris, but I, I, maybe I don't know. I'm not in the headsets on game day. Nobody is, so I don't know what mm -hmm. that's like. But Sart needs somebody just to be in his ear to remind him of situations of the clock of you know the other team's timeouts. Remind him, hey. You know, they're going to get the ball at halftime, so we don't, you know, we need to try to avoid the two for one right yeah. here. We need to extend this drive. Yeah. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but it, it sometimes seems like either it's not happening or Sark isn't very receptive to it. And he gets so focused on, no, I want to go. People accuse Sark of not having the killer instinct, not putting teams away. I think it's the exact opposite. I think sometimes he's too aggressive. And, and, and coaches that are naturally aggressive, you straddle, you you walk right up to that line where aggressiveness bumps into recklessness. Yeah. And sometimes you can step over it. I think, again, I'll go back to the fake field going against Houston. I think those are times where you can step over that line and aggressiveness becomes recklessness and you're doing yep. something thinking you're being aggressive, but it's really done to your detriment. I mean, Rodney, as good as the Texas defense has been this year, where have they really struggled? Where have we seen them really struggle? Mm -hmm. Two minute situations. They've yep. been terrible in two-minute situations yep. for whatever reason. I don't know if it's just moving too fast or whatever. 
But why would you do something that's potentially going to put your defense on the field in a sudden change situation in the last two minutes of the half? Yeah. You'd be insane to do that. Every, yeah. every fiber of your being, all the data you have should tell you avoid putting your defense in a two minute situation where they, the offense can match. Now the other night was the exact opposite because the defense got the turnover. You went and got the touchdown. Now there was what a minute one left or whatever yeah. it was, yeah. or yeah, you got the ball. I think you got the ball with a minute one left. You scored, you completely eliminated the two for one. So even if TCU had managed to throw a hail Mary or whatever and score, okay, you're still going to be up by 10 going in the half. Yeah. So that to me is what it amounts to. I think Sark needs somebody. And again, I was, I was hoping it would be Joe D. Camillus, or maybe Joe D. Camillus is, and Sark's just ignoring him. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> to help him, to help him manage the game and better understand situations. Because when Sark does, when they do play that complimentary football, we see the end result, man. Absolutely. Texas, Texas can roll with just about anybody in the country. But now you're gonna do it. Yeah, now you're without Jonathan Brooks. You're going on the road where typically your run game is something that should travel, uh, but you you don't have your you don't have your your workhorse running back with you. I just think Sark needs, just needs to be more cognizant of situation and, and, and call accordingly. Steve Sarkeesian doesn't get dumb, Rodney, in, in in within the within the flow of a game. And yeah, yeah, sometimes he does fail to make adjustments, but I think it's again at the risk of repeating myself. I think it's getting in those games where he feels like. Okay, we're not we're not going to be short on possessions. We're not going to be limited on possessions. Let's just let's just tinker with something right here and figure it out. Yeah. And then and then what you do though, you shrink your margin for error. And if you have a special teams gaffe or the defense gives up a chunk yardage play or you turn the ball over, whatever it is, now not only have you wasted a possession, now you put the other two phases of your defense in a hole. Yeah, or one yeah. of the other two phases in a hole. It and I love what you're saying there, Jeff, because it, it really does seem like there needs to be somebody that does get in his ear. And it's like, Steve, hold on. I, I, I mean, it, it's kind of one of those things when, when, when you get, I mean, it's like, calm your ass down. Here's let's look at this situation. Let, let's figure yeah. out how we need to get into complimentary football because it, it, it really is. And I totally agree with you. And it is, man. When I see him in that crotch position, I'm like, <laughs> okay, he's pissed. He, he's sitting here thinking, what am I going to do next? Uh, what am I going to do next? You know, high volume, whatever the case is going to be. And yeah. a lot of times when you see that, Jeff, um, that's when you start seeing some of the shit not working out right when you see him in that pose. There was a sequence the other night <laughs> where – I'm, I'm sure you caught it. He was crouched down. He's staring at the call sheet and it's almost like somebody's telling, telling him something and you can see him scream. What doesn't look up from the call sheet. It's almost like he's screaming. I got it. Or I hear you, whatever it is. So I don't know. Hey, Rodney, can you put this up by Daryl in the chat? Daryl G. Uh, Cause I think this is kind of what we're talking about. And I, and I, I do have a take on this. So I've been saying Sark needs a true OC to call plays so he can manage the whole game. I'm against that because offensive minded coaches, especially coaches that call their own plays. Yeah, I go back to something Mac Brown was very fond of saying, man, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You know, it's either you either are yeah. or you aren't. I don't think a guy like Sark would benefit if he's at a point in his career where he's not ready to give up play calling, then don't do it. Yeah. You know, now he's not in a situation like Jimbo was where on top of the offense, not working, you're losing more games than you should. And you're at the risk of getting fired. And that decision was probably in part made for you. That's a totally different deal, but you can't do like what Tom Herman did and say, okay, yeah, Tim Beck or Mike Yersich is going to be my offensive coordinator. And then, well, I want to take over play calling for this game, or I want to do it for this series. Or, you can't do that. You either, no. you either got to have it or not. That's why like, you know, I, I I would imagine there's some USC fans probably saying the same thing about Lincoln Riley. Like Lincoln Riley needs to do a better job of managing the team, manage this sorry defense, and turn play calling over to somebody else. But man, if Lincoln Riley isn't doing that, you're taking the thing away from your coach yeah. that made him the attractive option to you. Yeah. So if Sark, it's like Sark is building the game plan. That would be like Rodney. If I say Rodney, I need you to restore this Corvette for me. You know, the six the sixties Corvette or you know, mm -hmm. one of one of my favorite cars. Give me like an old El Camino. I need you to I need you to need you to restore it for me. And Rodney puts all this work in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll talk about it. I'll I'll let you borrow, whatever. Rodney does a great job, restores this car, gives it back to me, looks brand new, like it just came off the showroom floor in 1974. And I say, Thanks, Rodney. And Rodney never sees the car again. 
Well, damn, yeah. you put all the work in. Why does somebody else get that? Th- why are you going to let Sar? Why would you let Sark or Lincoln Riley or one of these guys build the game plan, be that involved in it, and then tell them on game day, why don't you just take a back seat and let the let somebody else call these plays? Can't do that. Yeah. yeah. It, especially if Sark isn't ready to let go. It's going to do more harm than good, I think. And that's the whole thing. I mean, I think with that, you know, you know kind of like what you're talking about, too, because I've heard about that, too, where it's like maybe this series, somebody else needs to. I mean, that that's like a two quarterback system to me. And again, I'm not the <laughs> if biggest. I, if I hear collaborative play calling at another yes. point in my life, I might vomit. Yeah, forget that shit. I mean, th- that right there, that is that is a that is a blueprint for failure. When you start doing that shit right there, I, I mean, you were putting yourself in just a horrible spot. And it is the whole thing, like you're saying right there, Jeff. I, I mean, if, if it's Sark that is putting this play, th- th- putting this game plan together, why do you take him away from this? I, I mean, it, it is. I, I think that that you hit the nail on the head right there, and that is that is going to be the thing that I take out of this thing is that you got to get somebody in there. You got to get a handler in there. Yeah. And I love the Joe, Joe DiCamillis thing right there because that's a dude, calm his ass down, reel him back in, reel him back in and remind him of the situation. Now, get over some of that stubbornness because I've heard that a lot to where it's like, Sark is a stubborn play caller. He wants to make the red cat work until whatever. He wants to put those <laughs> defensive guys, he wants the defensive fullbacks in there until it works. Well, you know what? You do need somebody in there to kind of calm his ass down and, and remind him of what's happening right now. That's why right he now. hired that's why he hired Jody, because Jody did that for Sean McVay. Because Sean McVay is the same, it's the same kind of deal. Like, you know, Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDonald in Miami, like these guys, uh, Mike McDaniel, in Miami, like these guys that are, are their own play caller like you can't you can't take that away from them if especially if they're not ready to give that up you can't you can't ask them to give that up hey we need to get this uh this the the thing by dj actually oh, rodney for it right uh, there the lord has come the mcrib is back dude cb cb got me onto this today he told me because apparently did you know rodney there's a, a website called the mcrib locator that tells uh, you yes. where the mcrib is being offered i have seen that Okay, I have so the McRib that. is back, and uh, it's going to be a really good holiday oh, season yeah. with the McRib. I, back. I'm going to go chase those. I mean, <laughs> I hope that they do. I mean, I know a couple of years ago before it went away or whatever the thing was, you could go. I, I mean, I remember I'd go to my to, right here on 620 and 35. I'd, I'd roll up into my McDonald's, get my McRib meal, and they're like, hey, for a dollar extra, do you want to? I'm like, uh, does a cat have an ass? <laughs> you damn right. Hope crap in the woods, yeah. Yeah. uh dude i uh man i'm i'm gonna <laughs> my brother this was years ago when they brought it so it went away for a, a while and then oh, they yeah. brought it back i get a call from my brother <laughs> my brother's a, a heating and ac guy and i get a call from him in the middle of the day and you, you just one of those deals rotten if you're if your brother calls you in the middle of the day it's usually never good it's, you, yeah, you're it's worried it might be an emergency so i'm like hey what's up he goes man i already killed two this morning i'm like i know he's not deer hunting i'm like killed what he's like <laughs> like two mcribs already like i'm almost at my bag limit for the day <laughs> it's like, and instead man. of being like why'd you call me i'm like dude mcrib is back i'm in the car like going to, <laughs> going to the dude, nearest mcdonald's see if i, can I McRib. love the mcrib and it, you know I, I get a lot of folks like man what's wrong with you that's processed i don't give a damn what it dude. it looks like a rib it looks like a rib to me and uh it's goodness yeah. is what it is i you know what Rodney? you know how good the mcrib is i hate raw onions like i, I hate mm. raw onions Except when it's on the McRib, because it's just the the texture and then the pickles, you get a little snap, and it's the McRib yeah. is so perfect. So, so Jeff, what, what's what's the go to fountain drink with it? Uh, I mean, the Dr Pepper is um you know a mainstay right there. Kind of kind of works well with the palate will, with the uh, McRib. I'm I'm a Coke Zero guy, mm. but what I've started to do is it's not quite the same but it's it's so much better i can't i don't really like regular dr pepper because it to me it tastes like i'm drinking pancake syrup Mm -hmm. so what i'll do is i'll have i'll get a cup of ice and pour my dr pepper zero into the cup it's kind of the best of both worlds right there nice mcdonald's is an underrated stop for tea as well i'll say that that. Yeah, I like that sweet tea. I'm turning uh, more to my dad though, Rodney. Every day, I get I got to get the half and half. Get the half sweet, half unsweet. Oh uh, yeah. Or yeah. my wife has noticed this too, and my brother said, "Do you really are turning to dad?" I I will take like uh, if I'm at a restaurant where they have a fountain, I will get like half a sweet tea and just do water with the other half. Mm-hmm. Just cut it in half that way. Yeah. Well, and now we may have to try the Olipop 
We'll try the Olipop with the McRib, possibly. Yeah. Uh, that that could be a good combination. But of course, now I haven't been inside a McDonald's. Uh, I guess in in a month and a half or so. I think they got rid of the drink machines. Which, um, if that indeed is the case, that'll hopefully kind of clear some of the clusterfuck that happened in there. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm here to tell you, dude, it, it's like it's like self serve drink machines and Texas Lotto. I mean that that kills a uh, convenience store. For me, because it's like this is supposed to be convenient, but the lotto thing is causing confusion, and the drink machine is causing a line. So it's like a this is this is why I love uh, I love places that can kind of put some space in between. Like you have the tea and the coffee over here, and then you got the fountain sodas over here. Because mm-hmm. if you're trying to get a cup of coffee, but the dude getting his Dr Pepper is is holding you up, now you don't have to worry about that. You know where you don't have to worry about that, Rodney, is our good friends at Seven Eleven. Seven Eleven, I know keeps the dr pepper zero stocked and i have not yet come across a 7-eleven we're talking about junk food stuff that isn't good for you but that is very delicious i have not yet come across a 7-eleven that has failed to keep the little debbie double decker oatmeal cream pies in stock man i've got them my wife buys them for me on the on the grocery order <laughs> i've got them stocked in the pantry and and that's so as a matter of fact so when we're at academy because you'll be at Academy on Thursday. Uh, yeah. You'll be at Academy on Thursday. I'm taking you, he, and I, one of those. And we're going to oh, have man. us a little toast. We're, we're, you, we're gonna have little Debbie's. You, little know what Debbie's. Out, you know what's out right now, though? The Little Debbie Christmas Tree Cakes, Ooh. which I was looking for something unrelated. I was looking for olive oil. And I opened the pantry, and my wife didn't tell me she had bought it. But there's a brand new – see, CB knows what's up. There's a box, an unopened box of Christmas tree cakes. It was like – you know, like the deal in Pulp Fiction when they open the, the briefcase, they open Marcelo's mm-hmm. Wallace's briefcase and the gold lights just shining in their face. That's what yeah. that that's what that pantry was like when I saw those Christmas tree cakes. What did, did we ever find out what was in there? Did Quentin Tarantino ever say what was in there? I, I never heard what was in there. I never See, heard I, what I heard a conspiracy theory that apparently Marcellus Wallace had sold his soul to the devil, and that was Marcellus's soul that was in the briefcase because uh-huh. the combination to open the lock was six six six. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, I think our man, Jake, uh, Jake likes ding dongs. Jake, don't say that too loud in public, dude. Yeah. That, um... Rodney can talk about Quinn Ewer's balls because he's secure. You need to make sure you're secure right. and, and what you got going on, Jake. That, that, that's right. V- very secure. Hey, speaking of secure, do want to tell you friends about uh, Covert Bee Cave. Um, great uh, supporters right here of Texas Sports Unfiltered. Um, I talk about it every morning on, on Chaos Theory. Three state-of-the-art dealerships, seven different brands right there. Uh, 42 acres nestled out there in beautiful bee caves. CovertBeeCave.com. Be sure and check them out. All of your new and pre-owned specials, all of that maintenance and stuff don't sit there try to change your own oil don't and for one thing don't go in there and try to change your cabin air filter i did that one time and i broke the entire glove box trying to change that stupid thing go out there and let uh let the fine folks at covert b cave take care of that for you 86 service bays they're going to take care of you speaking of huddo the Fords and Chevrolets, you're going to fly right by Hop 'em, Hop 'em Hippos on the way out there to see us at Academy from uh, 8 to 1 on Thursday. The Fords and Lincolns, you got those in Austin as well. CovertBeeCave.com, latest specials, everything right there online. Stop by, say hello to Dan Covert and all the great folks out there. Since 1909, the Covert family serving Central Texans and beyond. Nobody beats Covert deal. Not now, not ever. Jeff, uh, what else is on your mind, dude? Like I was saying, I, I was following along yesterday uh, on Horns 247. And, uh, man, I, I was looking at, uh, man, we, we got some commitment things happening right here. We, we got some shakeups happening here. Yeah, uh, Texas had been trying for a while. You know, Wardell Mack is a corner out of the state of Louisiana who committed to Florida. And you know, there was a thought for a long time that he was a Texas lean and ended mm-hmm. up not working out. But, you know, he flipped his commitment from Florida to Texas on Sunday. You know, speaking of we we're talking about talking about Ken Dorsey getting let go by the Bills, man, and, and these knee jerk reactions of some athletic departments in college, kind of the shelf life of coaches shrinking. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know that Billy Napier at Florida, right? He's going to be long for this world, but Wardell Mack flipped and uh, my man mike roach who uh was formerly at horse 24 7 now is a national recruiting analyst for 24 7 sports he laid out for multiple reasons why that flip of wardell mac was so important i think it's worth mentioning too you know when you look at texas it's not a bad thing to keep infusing your secondary with yeah. as much talent as possible and just let competition play it out and that's also kind of, Roddy. that's also where i am with quarterback 
You know, I know everybody's talking about, is Quinn going to come back next year? Is he not? Uh, you know, how, whatever you want to buy into or believe on that. Here, Here's my thing with that. When you start, start, I'm convinced that nobody knows. Sark is a quarterback guru, and he's one of the best. But I'm convinced that nobody 100% knows what they're doing as far as quarterbacks go. Because everybody gets it wrong at some point in time. And the, the example I use, the late, great Bill Walsh maybe the greatest, brightest offensive mind that ever walked the sidelines. Bill Walsh once said he had seen the next Joe Montana, and his name was Rick Meyer. So even Bill Walsh could get it wrong. Bill Walsh drafted Giovanni Carmazzi instead of Tom Brady. So again, even Bill, the, the late, great Bill Walsh could get it wrong. But when you stockpile positions with as much talent as possible, whether Quinn Ewers comes back, whether he goes in the draft, whether Arch Manning were to transfer, and I haven't heard anything that leads me to believe that's going to happen or is even being considered. The Manning family did this having a plan. This is a family that once like held the NFL draft hostage. You don't think they would know exactly what they yeah. were getting into when they did this? Or whether Malik, the Colts. <laughs> yeah, or, or whether Malik Murphy hits the portal or whatever the case is. You're dealing with first world problems at quarterback. And when I talk about stockpiling talent and first world problems at quarterback, I go back to when you can look at really when Mac Brown got Texas on a true legitimate trajectory for a national championship. It's coming off of that 2001 season in the 2002 where you know, Texas, we're talking about Florida a second ago, Florida loses a game they shouldn't to Tennessee. All of a sudden, Texas is getting ready to play Colorado for the Big 12 title at Texas Stadium. And they realize, oh, man, Florida just lost. If we win this game, we're playing Miami and Pasadena for the national championship. Yeah. But coming off of that season where you didn't, you didn't win, you didn't beat Colorado, and you know, you you come off that 01 season going into 02, you sign that 2002 recruiting class with Vince Young, Casey Stutter, Lyle Senline, Justin Blaylock, Rod Wright, Selvin Young, the, the David Thomas, the backbone of your national championship team was that 2002 recruiting class. Brian Robinson was in that class too. Yep. That's when Mac was just stockpiling talent. And, you know, two guys that I use an example of, there's going to be some Texas fans that this goes over their heads, but there's been years recently where Texas had a recruiting class and you had two guys like a Dorian McCullough, who was a really, really talented defensive back out of Garland, and Robert Timmons, who was a, an uber-talented wide receiver out of Flower Mound. Neither one of those guys panned out. And there have been times at Texas recently, Rodney, where you say, man, a five-star DB and a five-star wide receiver not panning out, that's going to doom you. It was a blip on the radar back yeah, then because you, exactly. you had you had so much talent stockpiled in a quarterback think about this was your quarterback room in 2002 you had chris sims as a starter the entrenched starter as a senior you had chance mock as the backup who was a parade all-american you had matt nordgren as the number three who was the top quarterback in the state of texas when he came out and your number four running the scout team was a true freshman who redshirted that year was still going by vincent young yeah. So that that's how deep you were at quarterback. So Sark is getting this roster. When you talk, whether you talk about the quarterback room or adding Wardell Mack, and then they still got some guys that they're looking at in the secondary, Kobe Black and Wake O'Connelly among them. Now you're looking at a situation where, man, it, is Texas? They're all you can see it. Kind of how Kirby Smart got it at Georgia, where Saban's had it at Alabama, Ohio yep. State, Michigan. Texas is just shaping up to have that kind of roster where, man, you just you you just got so much talent that you can afford some attrition and with the portal it makes attrition more palatable now oh, yeah. on top on top yeah. of the fact that the ncaa has eliminated initial counter rules so doing that math of okay we had x amount of early enrollees we can roll so many scholarships back man as long as by the time everybody's on campus you're at 85 it doesn't matter how you get there that's so it's yeah. it's a it's it's really sark is in a position to get this roster to the point where you can go into the sec ready to compete right off the bat. Absolutely. And Jeff, how big do you think it is? I mean, with, with everything going on at A&M, and, and I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these young kids right now, I mean, maybe it comes down to A&M in Texas, Texas a and I, I mean, whatever, however you want to look at that, but with the insecurity there, with the change yeah. right there, with, with what's happening right there, how, how I mean, realistically, I, I think that it leverages Texas a lot better to to pull some of those Texas kids in that may be going back and forth or, or across the country, or whatever. But d does it is that the case, or does it depend on what A and M does next? Uh, here's my thing with A and M, and 
I I actually want to want to. This is hilarious, Rodney. I I, I I pulled this up the the other day. Um, I just went back and tried to find a news report of when Jackie Sherrill was hired, mm. and A&M broke the bank for Jackie Sherrill. He was making sixty thousand dollars a year as the head coach at Pitt, where he had had back to back eleven and one seasons. Dan Marino, Jimbo Cover. I mean, they had he had a Hall of Fame level players. You know, some of the greatest players in college history were on his pit teams. And AM paid him 95000 a year. So basically, they bid against themselves to get a top notch coach that they felt like could come in and win. And then Tom Wilson, who was the fired head coach while he was packing in this news report, said that all the regents that AM were doing was jacking up pay, quote, for all the other coaches in the country. Basically, they were resetting the coaching market back right. in 1982. Uh, and they're doing the same, trying to do the same thing now. But in my lifetime, so Jackie Sherrill was hired the year before I was born. So in my lifetime, let's look at the AM coaching changes. All right. So Jackie Sherrill, Jackie Sherrill resigns. That whole thing implodes. RC takes the job. And RC, RC you know, AM had some really good teams in the early 90s. They did. Dude, RC. I mean, that's a whole thing when I'm looking at this with all, all of this that you're about to go through. I mean, RC is the one where I'm like, okay, okay try to meet that standard. Yeah, to be, that's what he did there. When they were they were doing what they should have done with the amount of talent they had at the time, they were they were slapping around everybody in the Southwest Conference. And the Southwest Conference was a shell of what it once was at that point. But they were doing what they should have done. You know, the only the only crimes A and M had back then was they couldn't beat you know if they're playing for a national title on New Year's Day, they couldn't yeah. beat Notre Dame or they couldn't yeah. beat Florida State or whoever they yeah. needed to beat. But the Aggies had some good teams. So mm-hmm. then, you know, we see our RC's decline starts with Matt coming back. OU hires Bob Stoops. LSU hires Nick Saban. So basically, AM's decline under RC started at the time when all these other schools that had been kind of dormant and trying to get their stuff together started to get it together. And from there, you look, okay, they hired Dennis Francione, who had done a really good job at Alabama, but, you know, recruiting started taking a hit. And they knew, you know, they were what like four and seven, four and eight that first yeah. year under Fran and mm-hmm. Fran, all the hype around Fran. And they gave Fran a lot of money and he was going to take recruiting back and, and it never really happened. So they fired Fran and they hired Mike Sherman. Oh, we got a coach with NFL coaching experience and knows about the lines of scrimmage and we're going to get tougher and get back to real football. And Mike Sherman had a, you know, Fran had a nine win season at one point. Yeah. And Mike, Mike Sherman had a 10 win season, but then. You saw the decline, and they're like, okay, we're going to do that. Let's go get the best. You know, the, who's the hot name in coaching right now? Kevin Sumlin. He's right down the road at the University of Houston, man. Let's go get Kevin Sumlin. And you know what? We're going to show people also how progressive we are. We're going to hire a, we're going to hire a black head coach at Texas A&M, and, and recruiting is going to change, and we're going to the SEC, and we're building our identity on this. And Kevin Sumlin kind of had you. You know, they, you won a lot of games that first year. We were 12, yep. 11 that first year with Johnny Manziel. And then yep. what were you after that? You're at eight. You're at nine, kind of where AM is going. I'll, I'll yep. get to that in just a second. And then you hire, you say, man, someone didn't get it done. You know, we need to hire a coach with, let's go hire the best we possibly can. Well, you hired Jimbo Fisher, who did have a national championship, but you made it a situation. What is Jimbo Fisher's motivation at that point? And Florida State, it sounded like sour grapes, but Florida State people even told you, man, something, something ain't right here. Yeah. You know, Jimbo left. Jimbo left that program in shambles. What Texas A&M needs to do, Rodney, my point is in saying all that, I will never worry about Texas A&M getting a higher right until they do, just like I will never worry about Oklahoma getting a higher wrong until they do. Mm-hmm. You know, We've seen Venable start to turn things around this year, and then they're, you know, they're probably going to end up being a double-digit win team this year. And, and, and they are recruiting at a pretty high level. But, you know, A&M, they haven't hired the right guy yet. Do they have the gumption to hire? the? Do they know who the right guy is that they need to hire? And that's the thing. Like, you hired Jackie Sherrill in 1982. I can honestly probably say that was the last good outside hire Texas A&M has made because you promoted RC from within. That was the last good hire that you made. And, you know, we kind of saw Texas go through it. And, And you look at the Texas coaches that were hired, you know, Fred Akers had a really good run. You know, they hired David McWilliams, whether it was Charlie Strong or Tom Herman. Those guys had pretty short track records, pretty short resumes at previous stops. And in a lot of ways, they had to learn on the job. The difference with Fred Akers was he inherited Earl Campbell and, and he recruited like a mother. 
mean, go, yeah. look, go look at the college football hall of famers and the all pros that Fred Akers recruited. And granted, yeah. recruiting was a different, yeah. different ball game back then. Oh, absolutely. The, pre, pre 85 scholarships. But you know, yeah, David Williams and Charlie Strong and Tom Herman, they all kind of had to learn on the job, but Texas, Credit them with where this program is now. Sark's kind of had that linear rise, five wins to eight wins, the nine plus now. And Texas Rodney, they would have never hired a coordinator. No. That would have been like, that's, that's beneath us. But you know what? Credit Kevin L. Tyfe, Jay Hartzell, and CDC for saying, you know what? This is the best Sark, dude for Sark, the job. Sark is yeah. the guy. Yeah. If, if, if Nick's, if, 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 all, if all our sources are correct, and this is a guy that Nick Saban was getting ready to hand it to. It's worth us taking the gamble to where mm-hmm. maybe, you know, maybe you found, maybe you found your Bob Stoops, you know, your guy that was a great coordinator that all of a sudden now is going to be a great head coach. And I think w- I get caught up in this too, referencing, you know, some of Sark's win loss stuff, especially like versus AP top 25 teams or whatever, looking back at when he was at Washington and USC, I think we can all agree. Sark is a different coach. He's a different person. Than he was when he was at Washington. Absolutely. When he was at SC, it's almost a yep. different type guy. It's almost it's an it's almost an apples and pomegranates comparison. It's not an apples to apples comparison. Yeah. So I, I say that to say this, Rodney A and M has to take a good long look in the mirror for for me to think this is going to factor and impact Texas in recruiting in any way. It's Texas A and M. You're always going to get your share of kids from the state of Texas, no matter what. They're just it, it's going to be one of the top two options you've got in the state. Yeah. But until they figure out outside of just wanting to be apart from Texas and wanting to be different from Texas until they figure out, man, who do we really want to be? What do we, what do we want our identity as a football program to be? That's it. And who is the head coach that we can hire who fit best fits that identity. Now, maybe you can go have some success. I've said it before. I'll say it again. And Aggie fans, uh, there's a lot of you that, you know, said all kinds of stuff to me before, but I think now I've got more agreeing with me than not. Texas A&M, Rodney, in my lifetime, is the most underachieving program in college football. Yes. When you look at the resource, I mean, at least Texas has a national championship in my lifetime. Yeah. But when you you look at the resources, the recruiting base, you know, your, your fan base. I mean, Ross Bjork said it during the press conference the other day, and I think he said it without saying it. Your football team is not very good right now, and you just put 103,000 people in the stadium against Mississippi State. That's not a marquee opponent. You're not very good. Aggies and nothing else, man, they're loyal. They're, they're going give to show up. Give and give and give and give and give. You, you, they, they, <laughs> you'll not find a more loyal fan they, in college sports will, than an Aggie. They will show up. I, I went I went to a, I went to an A&M game with a buddy of mine, the UTS, uh, UTSA alum. Speaking of that, I think Jeff Trailer would be a good fit there. I had that discussion in the other hour. I think yeah. that that would be something. Uh, doesn't have to be a splash, but it really is to me with A&M, Jeff. Uh, you know, with them, that, that Wayland, uh, what is it, Lukenbach, Texas, uh, they've been so busy trying to keep up with the Jones. Um, and that, and that's been the problem with them. And there's no, there's nothing on the field. You had the win against Alabama, but I totally agree with CB right here. You, you had the Manziel game when you beat Alabama and everything right there, but that, that championship game where you beat Kansas state. I mean, when you go back and look at that for AM, to me, that's been their national championship game. And as long as I've been watching them. Yeah. That 1998 game, you know, with Sir Parker and, and and everything that happens right there, that's the biggest win that I can think of for them. Uh, I mean, even bigger than the Alabama win with Johnny Menzel. Yeah, Jake brings up a good point, and and this is this is kind of the the knock you hear on A and M. I mean, A and M's problem is not infrastructure or resources, but this is. Do you realize, Rodney? I, actually, Rodney, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a chance to answer this. Texas A&M's last 12 years as a member of the Big 12. Can you guess how many top 25? I'm not even talking top five, top 10. In the last 12 years, A&M was a member of the Big 12. How many top 25 finishes they had? Mm, Maybe two. Maybe two. One. One. Wow. One. In, In 2010. That team with Von Miller that went and I, mm-hmm. I apologize. Mike Sherman didn't have a ten win season. They were nine and four. Uh, yeah. They finished nineteenth in the country. But this wow. is, the, I'm just going to go. So CB mentioned A and M. The last time they won a conference championship was 1998. 98. Yep. Okay. This is A and records since that year. You ready? Just tell me if you notice the theme: eight and four, seven and five, 
eight and four, six and six, four and eight, seven and five, five and six, nine and four, seven and six, four and eight, six and seven, nine and four, seven and six, eleven and two, the Manziel year, then nine and four, eight and five, eight and five, eight and five, seven and six, nine and four, eight and five, nine and one under, under Jimbo during the COVID year, eight and four, five and seven, and they're six and four. That's, average. They're it's average, average, but it's not because it's not for lack of resources, it's not yeah. for lack of support. You yeah. just haven't hired the right guy. But until you really take stock of where you are as a program, where you want to be, who you want to be, and who the guy is that you feel can best help you get there, you're going to keep spinning your wheels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And 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 I do think, I mean, I, I do think that that trailer is a guy that, that, that can, I mean, look, like we're saying, not the splash. I mean, not these guys. I mean, get yourself a football guy in there. I mean, yeah. get somebody that has that has that relationship with Texas high school coaches, a guy that has won state championships. That's the stuff that's going to help you. I mean, I hope they don't get him because I think it'll be a good thing. And I, I just think it's ironic, Jeff, that that as you go into this, here's Texas coming into the, into the SEC. A&M made that move to get away from Texas. Here we are. A&M's coming in chasing their ass, and Texas is coming in with a hell of a lot of momentum. And to me, it, you look forward at this, and it's like, I'll be damned. It's funny how things work out. You know, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of a guy. Now, this guy, I think, is 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 out of that age bracket. I, I do think a P5 school needs to hire him at some point. Willie Fritz. That's mm. who I am. Like Willie Fritz is just a good, he's a damn good football coach. And you look at, you know, obviously he was really good at Sam Houston State. Four years at Sam, he won 40 games in four years at Sam Houston. Goes to Georgia Southern, nine and three, and then eight and four. And yeah, Tulane, he started out four and eight and five and seven, and he's got a a two and 10 in 2021, but seven wins, seven wins, six wins, 12 wins last year, nine wins and counting this year. I mean, Willie Fritz is just a damn good football coach. Like, you know who I think would actually be? like the perfect hire for Texas A&M, because I just think they just need a football coach hmm. that understands how to coach the game, how to coach winning football, how to recruit talent, develop it. Like a guy like Lance Leipold, I think would do really well at Texas A&M. Yep. Just a good football coach. I thought you were going to say Jerry Jones. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> just speaking, of, speaking of Jerry Jones, Jerry's about to probably get hit up for some more money because if the Sam Pittman thing keeps going the way it sounds like it's going at Arkansas. This guy. Uh, but a and just a and just needs to figure out, man, who who do we want to be, and just go hire yeah. the best football. Have your own coaches. identity. Have your own identity. Quit, yeah, don't quit. don't attach your identity to we need to you know we need to be better than Texas or separate ourselves from Texas or we're you know butt hurt because we're not the only yeah, yeah. Yeah. we're not the only Texas school in the SEC anymore. Okay, but you're still Texas A and M. You still have right. something to sell. You have That's something right. unique to sell. And people you know what? People people might might mock college station as bk joins people might mock college station as a college town but there are plenty of high school kids rodney and, and you've called games from some of these parts you know there are parts of east texas southeast texas mm-hmm. even parts of central texas where man, kids from even kids from bigger cities they just like college station because like you know what i, I just like the small college town kind of vibe but there's still forty thousand yeah. students here it's yeah. gonna appeal to some kids but you you know, you look, you look at what Jimbo did. You expanded the national recruiting footprint. You kind of alienated high school coaches in the state of Texas, which is something that if you're if you're at Texas or Texas A&M, you may not like it. You may not you get it, that. but you, you can't, can't do, do that. that. So no. I just nope. until A&M hires the figures out who they want to be separate from Texas and hires the right guy. I'm not going to worry about who A&M hires and how that's it right. Texas. BK, that's right. you agree with me like Oklahoma more. You know, I, I'll be shocked when Oklahoma gets a hire wrong. I'll be shocked when AM gets one right. Because in my lifetime, they have not made an external hire that's been good. That's been the right hire. Hey, don't take Lance Leipold from me. All right. Kansas I mean, finally has itself a half decent football coach. <laughs> and now we're trying to take him away. Come what on. Do you, man. What do you agree with me? Like that's that's the kind of move AM would no. never think, oh, we're not gonna hire the Kansas football coach. Dude, Lance Leipold's a damn good coach. No, yeah. I'm with you. Who can I mean, coach I, some football? They want to make a splash. They're going to want to make a splash, and and that's that's the whole and that's their problem. Great for them. I hope they keep doing it. Yeah, I think three of the best hires A and M could make right now: Jeff Trailer, Mike Elko, Lance Leipold. Yep. I don't think they're going to hire any of them because of what nope. Rodney said. Because they're just not big enough names. Now, they're, look, if A and M's yeah. smart, they'll do the opposite of what they did, right, guys? Like Jimbo was the biggest splash that they could have made, and it didn't work. So if they're smart, hey, you learn from your mistakes, you do something different, and hope that that turns things around for you. But I just I don't know if that 
And maybe a and been thinking like this now, Jeff, but I don't know if that's exciting enough to pay $77 million for a guy to leave and then end up with one of those three dudes. I don't know if people are going to be uh, chomping at the bit to donate their money to the program if that's what happens. You know what? Uh, like the high, you know, like the kind of hire I can see AM making. I can see them hiring Cliff Kingsbury before I can see them hiring any of those other guys. But does it, but when you say it, doesn't that sound like something AM would do yes. based on their track record? It mm-hmm. does. It does. Like, oh man, I've got a guy with NFL. Yeah, you got a guy that was fired at Texas Tech for being. Average to below average in the Big Twelve, but he beat Texas one time, and and he he was on staff during that one Johnny Manziel year that you had. Yeah. Like, dude, yeah. just and as Bucky fun. says, he smells good. So there you go. <laughs> I'll take I'll take Bucky's word on that. But yeah, but Rodney, to answer the question you asked me like forty five minutes ago, Jeff Trailer, I think would make a lot of sense for A and M from a recruiting standpoint. I mean, they would they would get their share of kids in the state of Texas. But I'm with BK the. Take whatever you think would be the logical hire that would make sense and expect them to do the opposite because that's typically yep. what they do. Like, mm-hmm. honestly, like go back to when they hired Mike Sherman in 2008. I know I've got to run, but I, I'm fascinated by this, uh, by this AM conversation. Go back to when they hired Mike Sherman in 2008. And granted, without knowing what we know now, this you might have a different answer. What if AM had hired Art Bryles in 2008 instead of Mike Sherman? How different of a place would AM football be right now? Mm. Again, knowing well, what we know happened to Baylor eventually. Yeah, yeah how do you do that? But <laughs> you know, it's, you're not telling me the Aggies would have yeah. said, yeah, we'll trade, we'll trade that for two conference championships. Yeah. Oh, but but that's the Jeff, Jeff Trailer thing. I mean, that's the Texas high school coaches thing. I mean, that, that's all those relationships and what you're saying right there, Jeff. They would have won conference championships and, and who knows what else because they would have had that foothold. And like you said, people want to go to College Station. Yeah. And they, they just have to got to get the right guy in place. And Grant, yes, for, to, your, to answer your question, I do think A&M will have, they will have a coach hired before the signing period they they wouldn't have fired jimbo when they did if that that wasn't the plan they'll have a they'll have a coach hired here in the uh, next few weeks they yeah. should go to florida state for their next head coach i hear that works really well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get mike norvell to college station huh uh on the yeah. actually yeah. bk you need me to you need me to hang around for a bit or it, it's up to you man yeah i, I uh all right you Rob, got it you've been, you've been rolling for two hours brother go go uh, go get you a nap or something yeah yeah, I got to roll. I got to go make some phone calls, boys. Y'all hook them. Y'all, uh, y'all keep at it, brother. All right, man. Thank Thanks, you, Rodney. Rodney. Appreciate you. Uh, yeah, man, it's it's fascinating. Um, speaking of our Bryles, th- th- there's no chance a m goes after our Bryles, right? No, but do, have you uh, have you seen the, the the texts that have come out today? I've seen the story. I haven't had a chance to read it yet because I want to really sit down and, and have a chance to read these texts. But it sounds like par for the course for what we could have expected. Yeah, yeah. I, I went and scrolled through some of the text in the story. It was a lot of words, and I'm not good at reading good, so I didn't read the whole thing. Uh, I'm also a millennial, so like if it's if it's more than like 280 characters, then I'm gonna have a Top, tough bottom time. left to right. Put words <laughs> yeah. together in a sentence. That's hard for me, but uh, Tyler no, offer any headaches, might offer any cramps. No kidding. Yeah, it was pretty damning. I mean, not unexpected with what we had known about Art Bryles and McCall and the whole situation at Baylor, but uh, yeah, no, it's not good. I mean, you've got Bryles in there, you've got Phil Bennett in there, you've got McCall in there, you've got a couple of other higher ups at Baylor in there. And it's just, uh, yeah, what you would expect. Just uh, a lot of damning text, basically showing that Baylor did not give a damn about these victims. They just wanted to do whatever they possibly could to keep their football team intact and keep winning games. I still think Gen Pop would view this situation. Trey and I talked about this a few weeks ago. Gen Pop would view this situation completely different. Not completely different, but uh, there wouldn't be the, the blackballing of Art Bryles that we've seen. If he had just come out and said, you know what, this is a horrible thing that happened. Uh, whether I knew about it or not is irrelevant. I'm the head football coach. This is my program, and this shouldn't have happened. And I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. How how different would his would Art Brow's life be and would life be for guys on that staff if he had just said that? You're right. No, nah, he wouldn't have had to coach in Canada and Italy and Mount Vernon High School and Every other random job that he's taken since uh, he got let go there. Yeah, somebody else 
would have given him another chance. You see it all the time. You see it with players. You see it with coaches. Guys get second chances in yeah. sports. Uh, but there are certain, you know, unforgivable crimes that you can commit. And Art Briles allowing that, basically enabling that at Baylor for as long as he did, that's pretty unforgivable. And that's why he hasn't gotten the opportunity to get any high major job since then. You know, like, and as we've seen some of his assistant coaches that have been able to get jobs, but we heard Sark talking about this yesterday. You know, when, when there's a coaching change, everybody looks at the head coach and the buyout money. Nobody really thinks about, you know, the guy in the recruiting department making, and Sark didn't say this, but this is what he's talking about. You're not thinking about the guy in the recruiting department making 35 grand a year that's got a wife and two kids and now suddenly doesn't know where the next paycheck's coming from. Mm. You know, the, some of those assistant coaches on that Brow staff are fine, but I, I talked to one guy who was a, a lower level staffer, you know, kind of your GA, QA analyst type level who tried to get a college job after that. And he's like, dude, I work for Baylor. He's like, nobody will touch me. Wow. And he had to go back to coaching high school. He had to go coach high school sports and hasn't gotten back into the college game because yeah. of that stigma attached to him with the Baylor thing. Like that's, that's the kind of stuff you don't, you don't take into account, but man, just there's been the lack of accountability BK as much as, as much as what happened itself is a tragedy and it's awful and it's horrible and something like that should never happen, nor should it be condoned in any way. The lack of accountability is every bit as disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And the fact that uh, a lot of the people involved have daughters of their own and just didn't care about that at all. Right. I mean, wives, daughters, mothers, sisters, just women in their lives uh, who you would think mean a lot to them. Uh, the fact that it was just now nah, to hell with them. We got to keep winning football games. I mean, it is possible to win football games and also have a good culture, too. You know, like it's, it's just like the Penn State thing. Right. Like, dude, yeah. I know Joe Paterno has won a lot of games, but if you knew that was happening in your building, and you didn't do anything about it. I'm sorry, man. That's when you have the conversation now about Joe Paterno, you you have to have that the Jerry Sandusky conversation too. Yeah, you're right. That's part of the story, man. That's part of the story, and it should be. Uh, the head coach is always going to be held accountable for what goes on with its program, but when you have as much evidence as we do with Art Bryles and with Joe Paterno about how much those guys knew about what was going on, then – uh, they absolutely should be uh, held accountable for for what went on. So that, that's why that's why part of me is uh, I'm I'm pleased with the way the death of Bob Knight was covered mm. because people could have just not touched the you know all the controversial stuff that Bob Knight said and you know some of that went in our group text and we're like I'm like where I I dropped one I'm like yeah he actually said that at one point in time um, but like people are like well, what's Bob Knight's legacy. Yeah, people talked about the the national championships and you know the the pro players he turned out and the Hall of Famers, but to whether it's Jeff Goodman or anybody else, like it's complicated because you have to talk about the coach and the genius that he was, whether it's how he coached defense or the motion offense or whatever. But you also have to talk about the guy that headbutted players and, and allegedly choked a player and was a bully and and all the other stuff. So it's it's a complicated legacy, just like it's going to be for. Anybody, and, and that's how that's how it should be covered. And it's it, it's it sucks if you were a player at Baylor that did not partake in that, that just thought you were going to Baylor to play for a, a good coach and win football games. Yeah, I mean, most people who played at Baylor were not involved in that at all. Yeah. And forget not just not being involved, most. Players who went through Baylor during that time probably had no idea this stuff was going on. Yeah. Right. And I they mean, just, just like all kind of held accountable for it. And they're all just associated with it forever because they were there at that time. Right. Glenn, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was not the exact Tom Herman quote, but that's uh, I'll give you, I'll give you an A for effort. Uh, <laughs> Winning and having morals is hard. Yeah. Uh, for some, for some, apparently it is, but you know, it's just like not, you know, not everybody you know, back in the day during the death penalty, not everybody at SMU took money, you know, right. Mo right. Mo now, most guys did, but not everybody did, you know? So it's, I don't know, man, it's the, mm. it's just, it's just sad. No, no, there are no winners, man. There are no there there nobody nobody saved face in this Baylor thing. Nobody came out quote unquote better for it. It 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 hurt a lot of people. It ruined lives. It ruined careers. And the fact that nobody stood up and been accountable for it is is pretty disgusting. Yeah, still to this day. So I heard you and Rodney talking about the um, 
odds for who's going to be Jimbo Fisher's replacement at Texas A&M. Uh, Art Bryles is not on the list. Urban no. Meyer is, is on that list, though. I'll, I'll pull this up right now. I don't know if you guys already did this or you've seen no, it. No, I've, I've seen it, but we didn't pull it up. Yeah, that's uh... – yeah, Urban Meyer's on there at 20 to 1. There are a bunch of names ahead of him on this list. Lane Kiffin is the current Vegas favorite to be Jimbo's replacement in Aggie Land. But uh, it's just, it, it's a question of how desperate Texas AM is, right? Like, are, are I, they desperate enough to go down the Urban Meyer well this time? I want. I want Lane Kiffin to get that job just because I need the Texas Texas A and M rivalry to come back, and I need it to be Sark versus Joey Freshwater. I just I need I need that college football needs that BK. We all need Aww. that. Aren't those guys kind of friends too? They all they're great friends, yeah. but I just you know there's like if you're if you're Texas A and M people. People people dislike A and M for different reasons than they dislike Texas. Like people dislike Texas because people are like, oh, it's it's the arrogance, it's it's whatever you know, whatever you want to accuse Texas of being, it's the elitist attitude. But people don't like A and M because it's like, dude, you don't belong. You're a mediocre mediocre program, and you act like you know you belong. Dude, if A and M if A and M just wants to get behind a coach assistant to help them go full heel turn and give a middle finger to college football. Dude, who better to hire than Joey Freshwater? There's nobody better. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. It might be time for him to find a new crop of co-eds, too. You know, he's probably ran through enough of them in Oxford. Now he's got to try the hey. college station girls, you know? See, like a dude like James Franklin, like, you know, yeah. I love me some James Franklin, but dude, James Franklin at this point, he's uh James Franklin is Mark Richt. I go back and look at Mark Rick's tenure at Georgia. Yeah. Mark Rick wasn't terrible by any stretch, but he Mark Rick wasn't elite. That's a great I think, comp. I think, great that's comp. James, I think that's what James Franklin is, man. James Franklin's a good coach. I like him personally. He's just not elite, man. Yeah, Rick couldn't get over the Florida hump for a while. And then once Alabama kind of got it going with Nick Saban, Rick couldn't beat them. And yeah. he had some good teams, had some good players, uh, sent a bunch of dudes off to the NFL and – you know, Georgia was fine. It's not like they were like doing what AM has done in recent years, They're five and seven, but uh, yeah, just couldn't win the big games. And look, I think Penn State would love for AM to hire James Franklin. Dude, right now. Be before I, me? yeah, before I go, BK, yeah. if I'm looking at this list, like I know Jeff Trailer is, is a name, like Trailer makes sense. Uh, we talked about Mike Elko makes sense, Dan Lanning with his ties to the South, Kiffin, just because I want to, I just want to see what that looks like. If AM just wants to go hire the best football coach they can, dude, they'll they'll give Kalen DeBoer the moon. Cause that dude, that dude produced winning football when he was the OC at Indiana. Mm -hmm. That dude won at Fresno. That dude's got Washington in the CFP mix. Kalen DeBoer is a winning, damn good football coach. Yep. He would scare and, me. Yeah. He would scare me. But yeah. again, like we said. Whatever you think the conventional right decision is that AM is going to make, whatever the opposite of that is, that's what they're probably going to end up doing. Yeah. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Yeah. Kalen DeBoer's done a tremendous, tremendous job. Like, I kind of envy programs that can turn things around as quickly as Washington has, you know? And obviously, getting a really good transfer in Michael Penix Jr. helps expedite that process. And hell, you can talk about Dan Lanning at Oregon, and it's kind of the same thing. But Washington, I mean, what a mess that Kalen DeBoer walked into, right? Like they thought they had their guy in Jimmy Lake, you know, to replace Chris Peterson. And ah, uh, he's just going to pick up exactly where they left off. And Washington's going to continue to be really, really good. I mean, Jimmy Lake is, you know, all sorts of bad stories about him and what he's doing to his players. And the team completely fell apart and he yeah. got fired after one year. And all of a sudden Kalen DeBoer gets there. And in year one, they went 11 games. I mean, Texas, like, you know, Sark is maybe going to win 11. We hope he wins 11 in year three. That'd be awesome. But, I mean, Charlie could never get there, and Tom could never get there in, in multiple years. And then Washington wins 11 in year one. They obviously beat Texas in the Alamo Bowl, and now they're a top-five team in the country. They're undefeated with a shot to make the CFP in year two. Like, that. that's good coaching right there. And, damn, it's hard not to be a little jealous if you're a Texas fan watching something like that happen somewhere else. Yeah, I, I think if you're a Texas fan, you're looking at one of the, you know, the coach, the the – elite coaches right now in college football and it remains to be seen if he's an elite coach but he's got an elite team this year 
the Texas climb under Sark is pretty similar to what Mike Norvell's done at Florida State. Yeah. You know, where dude after after Jimbo, the end of Jimbo, and dude, I said it earlier, like Florida State people were trying to tell AM, like, man, I don't think you're hiring the guy that you think you're hiring, because look at what look at how quickly it fell off in Tallahassee. And then you had the Willie Taggart disaster. Oh. And then you hire Mike Norvell. So you still had you still had some bottom to hit before you could bounce up. But dude, Mike Norvell's got Florida State where in my lifetime, BK, in my football consciousness, this is where I expect Florida State to be. Yeah. And so has got Texas where you expect them to be. It's just you had to, man, you had to go through that 12 day period of, you know, getting blown out in Ames and Bo Davis cussing the people on a bus and a monkey allegedly biting a kid or whatever and <laughs> losing to Kansas. Like sometimes stuff like that. Sometimes primates have to get out of control bk for you to hit rock bottom God. and bounce your way back up as a program yep and and we had that happen a couple of times well only one primate incident i think but a few, hopefully none of those go yeah forward. a few rock bottoms at least what felt like rock bottoms but yeah here we are now it's uh it's a good feeling man it is a a good feeling you got a boogie yeah, but you know what? It's going to be awesome watching the CFP rankings get unveiled tonight between mm -hmm. the Champions Classic, which, by the way, I know you're all over the Champions Classic, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, is, it, is it Sparty for Kansas this year? I forget. What's no, that? it's uh, it's Duke-Michigan State. That's the first game. Oh, you, it's it, the, the, the Jayhawks get the Kentucky leg of that this year. Yeah, and it's KU versus UK as your, uh, your night game. And obviously, in between there, you've got the – Unveiling of the CFP rankings, which does any does anyone care? Is it going to be the same top seven for the third straight hey man, week? I, as, I just like seeing Texas in that top ten and knowing that it matters at this oh, point. You know, I mean, I I really want to see Texas in the top six. Of course, I want to see them in the top four at the end of the year. But like that that first page, you know, because they do the countdown from twenty five to seven, and then they've got the separate graphic for one through six. We've never been there. No, nope. we've never been in that shit. All I want to do is be in there. And I know we won't tonight because nobody ahead of Texas lost. Right. And Texas didn't play all that well. There's no way the Longhorns are jumping anybody after the Fort Worth win. But uh, yeah, like one of these days, I just I want to see Texas in there and hopefully it happens this By year. By the way, we started talking about Art Bryles and, you know, morals and college football and, you know, winning, winning the right way. What better game to showcase the morals and the virtues and the values of college athletics than Bill Self going head to head with John Calipari tonight. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, Calipari's a cheater, but Bill Self has done everything the right way from, from on that one. on that note. <laughs> <laughs> no evidence. He's clean. Uh, see, I see everybody. Hey, just remember, it's only an hour. I'll be back at eleven tomorrow. Looking forward to it. You're the man, Jeff. Thanks for see sticking you, around. All right, there he goes, Jeff Howe, Horns 24-7. Now you people are stuck with me for the next 40 minutes or so. Chip and Zay, of course, coming your way from 1 to 3. And then Kevin Dunn will be with C.J. Vogel from the Football Brainiacs this afternoon from 3 to 5. So keep it locked in right here to Texas Sports Unfiltered all day long. Please like this video if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't yet. Please subscribe to this channel if you haven't yet. And, uh, of course, if you're listening on the app, be sure to hit us up on the CODA text line, 512-222-9328. If you've got comments, if you've got questions, I am here for you. Uh, going to get into the Inside Texas report from earlier today. They reported that uh, Quinn Ewers is very likely to return to Texas for at least one more season. I think a lot of Longhorn fans assumed that uh, Quinn Ewers was going to be here at Texas for one more year and then off to the NFL after this season concluded. But uh, some reports and one out there from inside Texas saying there's a 90% chance that Ewers will return for the Longhorns in 2024. So we'll talk about that. Obviously, we'd love to get y'all's thoughts on that news. Nothing official yet from Quinn Ewers. Nothing official yet from the University of Texas. If I'm being perfectly honest, I don't think a decision has been made just yet. But obviously, some insiders starting to drop some breadcrumbs about what could be happening with Quinn Ewers once we get to the off season. Uh, Columbus says, who's better at game management, James Franklin or Steve Sarkeesian? Uh, it's Sark. It's got to be Sark, right? Like Steve Sarkeesian went into Tuscaloosa and beat Alabama. James Franklin never beats good teams. And he's got one win against a top five team in his coaching career. I think he's like one in 11 against top five teams in his coaching career. Most of those games have come against Michigan and Ohio State, and he just can't beat either of them. 
And he had chances this year. A lot of people thought this was Penn State's best chance to win the Big Ten, to beat Ohio State, and to beat Michigan. And hell, he got to play Michigan without Jim Harbaugh at home last weekend and couldn't get it done. So, uh, look, Sark's not the best game management coach in the world. I think we know that. But I would take him over James Franklin any day of the week. Uh, Daryl with a good question. Yeah, where does Murphy transfer if yours returns? I mean, you, you have to assume that if Quinn does come back, somebody is leaving the Texas quarterback room. And I don't think it's going to be Arch. Um, and hell, even if Quinn was leaving for the NFL after this year, I would have felt like there was a good chance Malik Murphy was going to transfer either in the offseason or at the end of spring football, right? I, I kind of assumed, maybe foolishly, and maybe we'll never know. But my thought process has always been, like, if Quinn Ewers is gone after this year, then Arch Manning is going to be the guy who starts next year, and Malik would obviously love to keep him around here as a backup, but Malik would probably transfer. We know he got interest last year in the offseason, obviously after the spring game and all of the spring performances that he had. Uh, there were a number of teams, including high major teams from around the country, who were reaching out to Malik's people to see if they could get him to enter the transfer portal. Ultimately, Malik decided to stay at Texas, and we're thankful for that. I mean, if Texas does go on to win the Big 12, uh, you got to give some love to Malik Murphy. Was he great in either of the two games that he started? No. But did Texas win the two games that he started? Yeah. And you won't be able to tell the story of 2023 Texas football without talking about what Malik Murphy did against BYU and against Kansas State. So uh, he's meant a lot to this program and would love to have him stick around. But uh, yeah, no, if Quinn Ewers is back, for sure, one of those guys transfers. Um, and if Quinn Ewers leaves, I, I guess there would still be a chance that one of those guys decides to leave. Where does he go? I don't know. I don't know if Malik Murphy's stock is higher or lower than it was coming out of the spring, right? Like th there might be some teams. I think Florida was a team that was rumored to have been interested in Malik Murphy after the spring. I, I don't know if Florida is more or less interested in Murphy now after the two games he played for Texas. You know, uh, there will be some teams who need a quarterback. Hell, there are teams that I'm sure would love Malik Murphy right now. If there was some sort of in-season transfer portal. There are some teams who would love to trade their guy for Malik. But uh, obviously, that's not possible. He's going to get some looks from somewhere. I don't know what his stock is once again, but uh, there will be a Power 5 school. Hell, there will be multiple Power 5 schools who I think offer Malik Murphy if he decides to enter the portal. Obviously, if Arch decides to enter the portal, you know, a number of teams are going to come after him. But I, I feel like Arch is in this thing for the long haul. Um I don't know if he anticipated waiting two years. We know he and his family were cool with him waiting one year. Hell, he, they preferred for Arch to not play this year. Uh, we'll see if they're okay with him potentially sitting on the bench for two seasons before finally getting the opportunity to play. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you're Texas, you absolutely take Quinn Ewers back, right? You have to. I mean, Quinn Ewers is a very, very good college quarterback. He's not Vince Young. He's not Colt McCoy. Uh, you know, and he's not Caleb Williams or – Michael Penix Jr., if you want to use more present-day comparisons, but he's still very good. If he comes back next year, it'll be his third year as the starter, and to have a three-year returning starter going into the SEC, that's very ideal if you're Texas. He knows the offense, he knows the system, uh, and he's won a number of games for the University of Texas, and he's clearly better this year than he was last year. So you'd like to think with another offseason here in Austin, he'd be even better in 2024 than he is in 2023. So, uh, yeah, I would absolutely love Quinn Ewers to come back. Reasons to believe that he will. You know, this is a loaded quarterback draft class, right? There, there are a lot of good quarterbacks coming out of college going into the 2024 NFL draft, and uh, it's competitive. And with the year Quinn Ewers has had and the fact that he's been injured a couple of times over the course of his college career, I don't know if he's a first-round pick right now. Matter of fact, I don't think he would be a first-round pick. Now, hey, things could change. And here's why I don't think Quinn Ewers has made up his mind just yet. If Quinn Ewers, you know, balls out over the next five games, and I say five because, well, Texas could be playing five, two more in the regular season, a Big 12 championship, and two playoff games. That's obviously best-case scenario, but there's an opportunity for Quinn to play five more games this season. If he plays extremely well and Texas wins at least four of those games, then, yeah, he might re-enter the conversation as a first-round pick in April. But 
as of this very moment on November 14th at about 12.28 p.m. Central Time, uh, Quinn Ewers is not a first-round pick. So come back for another year, bolster your draft status, then you become a first-round pick in the, uh, the 2025 draft. That's where Quinn probably should be leaning right now. I don't know exactly where he is, but once again, there's no way, there's no way a final decision has been made with Quinn Ewers at this point. It would be it would be silly. And yeah, I agree with you, CB. I mean, Texas could be a preseason top five or top 10 team if Quinn Ewers does return. A lot of the offensive line will be back next year as well. You would think Jonathan Brooks is now coming back as well. Got some receivers to replace, of course. Uh, Xavier Worthy's probably gone. Adonai Mitchell's probably gone. Jordan Whittington's gone. You've got some guys to replace. You're going to lose some talent on defense, of course. Happens every year. Uh, but, man, you get a, a third-year quarterback, and you get uh, the offensive line and a lot of other really talented players for this Texas team coming back. And with the way Steve Sarkeesian has been able to recruit these last couple of years, yeah, the Longhorns would, uh, would very much be in the mix to be a preseason top five or top ten team at minimum going into uh, into 2024. But yeah, it would absolutely take uh, Quinn. And look, coming in next year, you've got Ryan Wingo. Hopefully, Jontae Cook sticks around. Hopefully, he actually gets to play next season as well. Maybe Texas hits the transfer portal for a receiver. I've seen a couple of folks talk about Evan Stewart, right? The super talented wideout, the former five-star who's at AM right now. Yeah, oh man, you know, you know. Coaches from all over the country are reaching out to AM players, or at least they're having their people reach out to the people of these AM players to try to get some of those Aggies to enter the portal, right? Because, and Jimbo, for all of his flaws, he did recruit very, very well. Uh, the reasons why, well, NIL, I'm sure, helps with that, but uh, Jimbo was able to bring in a ton of talent, and recruiting was not the issue in Aggie land. So there is a lot of talent on that current AM roster that other schools would love to poach. Love to poach. Yeah, if Texas can go get Evan Stewart, my God, that would be that would be incredible. That would be absolutely incredible. But I'm sure there are a couple of other wide receivers in the portal that uh, Texas will be looking out for. Uh, maybe Isaiah Nao. <laughs> nah, Isaiah Nao is not going to play. Why would, why would we assume that that guy's going to play for Texas? Come on, man. I was really excited about Isaiah Nao this season, too. That was foolish of me. And I wonder what he would have been last year if he didn't get hurt. And, you know, maybe he's still dealing with some of the after effects from the injury he suffered last fall during camp. And that might not be why. That might be why he's not playing that much uh, at the University of Texas. But they'll, uh, they'll figure some things out. Um, all right, guys, we'll keep your thoughts or keep your thoughts coming. 512-222-9328. A couple of y'all asking where Trey is. Trey is in Vegas right now. He's out for the next few days. Um, he is, I know, cashing that Rangers ticket at some point while he's out there. And uh, he's out there for a birthday party, I think. So he'll be gone for the next few days. He'll be back with us on Friday, and uh, we'll have some co-hosts. I won't go solo all three of these next few days, but got a lot of moving parts right now, so figured I'd, uh, I'd hold it down. Obviously, Jeff was nice enough to hang with me for the first 20 minutes today, and uh, we'll have some other folks chiming in throughout the course of the week. But, hey, ask me anything. Whatever you guys want to talk about right now, Texas football-related, Cowboys, Texans, Texas basketball, shoot, whatever you guys have, I'm here for y'all. And I keep thinking about, uh, I don't think I brought this up yesterday. I was meaning to bring this up with Bucky, and I didn't. Then I was meaning to bring it up with Rodney, and I didn't. And then I was meaning to bring it up with Trey, and I didn't. Um, I, I was amazed. Like I, I, I'm kind of amazed with this fan base. Some Texas fans crack me up. And obviously, everybody's not like this. Uh, maybe some of you are like this. Maybe none of you are like this. But I got four different texts from four different people over the weekend asking me if I thought Steve Sarkeesian was the right guy at Texas. Four different people either asked me if Sark was the right guy or basically indicated that they did not believe that Sark was the right guy at Texas. And I just, I, I can't believe how many people are unhappy with this team right now. Like, I feel like I need to remind people that Texas is having its best season since 2009. This team is 9-1. and one. They're in sole possession of first place in the Big 12. They're still in the college football playoff hunt. They control their own destiny to win the conference title for the first time since 2009. Like, anybody out there 
that wouldn't have signed up for this at the start of the season? Seriously, is there any single person who would not have signed up for these first 10 games if you're a Texas fan? I mean, of course, you'd rather be 10-0 and than 9-1, and but come on, 9-1? and First place in the conference, still in the playoff mix, recruiting at a high level. Like, I, I can't figure out why so many people are so mad. 2009! 2000, think about what you were doing in 2009. Think about how long it's been since then. I was 15 years old. I couldn't drive a car the last time Texas was this good at football. You're allowed to be critical. Don't get me wrong. I'm critical. We're all critical. It's part of the gig. It's part of what we do. But my God, like this thing, how quickly have we forgotten about the last 13 years when people are asking if the coach knows what he's doing? When you're having your best year in 14 years? When you're in the playoff mix? When you're the favorites to win your conference championship? When you're top 10 in the country? When you're recruiting top 10 classes year in and year out? Like, I had someone text me that they were done with Sark after Saturday. Done? Done? Look at what's happening at Texas A&M right now. You could be them. Hell, we have been them. I couldn't believe some of the stuff I was hearing and some of the stuff I've been seeing on social media over the last few days. Like, of course, I would have rather have won 26 to 6 instead of 29 to 26. Like, I'm frustrated by the fact that Texas has blown three 20 point leads in the second half of games here in the second half of the season. But hey, Texas is 3 and 0 in those games. And they're 9 and 1 on the season. Like, how quick are we to forget what what has gone on around here for such a long time? I already given up on Sark. Man. Like, do I think Sark is one of the best coaches in college football right now? No, but do I think he knows what he's doing? Yeah. Do I think he deserves some credit for the way this team has played? Absolutely. Do I think he deserves credit for the culture that we saw? Everybody's talking about culture play, right? The the Jordan Whittington Xavier Worthy play, where you were through the interception, and then Whittington and Worthy, who are 40 yards down the field came back and made a play. Whittington forces the fumble. Xavier Worthy recovers the fumble. Like, I think Sark deserves credit for that. He deserves credit for the way this roster has been built. He deserves credit for the way Texas has been recruiting, both high school kids and in the portal. Uh, uh, He knows what he's doing, man. This guy has done a tremendous, tremendous job. Is he perfect? No. Is this Texas program perfect? No. But they are clearly in a better spot than they've been in a long time, and they are clearly taking steps in the right direction. You might not think this is a top four team in college football right now. Well, the fact that we're even having conversations about whether or not they are is pretty damn cool for me, at least. Once again, I was in high school. I couldn't drink. I couldn't drive. I couldn't vote. Couldn't smoke. Couldn't do shit the last time I got to have these types of conversations about Texas football. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm pretty okay with where this thing is, man. I feel great. This was such a big year for Texas for so many different reasons. People keep asking me, and I'm sure people asked all of you, if you're a Texas fan, you heard it in the offseason, you heard it last year, you've heard it for a while. Are are, are you worried about Texas going to the SEC? How many times have y'all been asked that question? I've been asked a million times. My answer to that right now is no. Like once Texas, I felt pretty good about things once Texas played Alabama last year at DKR, even though Texas lost that game. It's like, okay, like that's, that's Alabama. They've been the creme de la creme in college football for a decade and a half now. And Hey, we just hung with them. We're not there yet. Fine. We're, we're getting close. If we can hang with them, then we've got a shot to hang with some SEC teams. I felt okay about things last year, but this year. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an obvious. Yes. How do you feel about going to the SEC? Yeah, I feel great. We just went on the road and beat Alabama by double digits. Nobody's done that in 20 years. Nobody's beaten the Nick Saban team by double digits in his house in 20 years. You got to go back to when he was coaching at LSU the last time that happened. Do I feel good about this? Yeah. So this was such a big year for Texas to just prove to people, and I think prove to itself, right? The guys in the locker room, I think, needed to have it proven to them. Uh, and obviously this fan base, I think, needed to have it proven to them. And uh, folks around the college football landscape needed to see it as well. This was a big year for Texas to prove that they are ready to make the move to the best conference in the sport. And well, Texas being 9-1, and one, ranked in the top 10, and having a win over a team that's been the best team in the SEC for 15 years now. I know George has caught him, but obviously Alabama has been doing it longer, and they're still really, really good this season. I, I'm super confident. 
about this move to the SEC. I felt great about every other sport, pretty much every other sport that Texas had before this football season. I had some uh, some optimism with Texas football, just hoping Sark would be able to turn things around. But now that we've actually seen it with this team this year, uh, yeah, bring it on, man. Bring it on. I'm excited for uh, for next year. Obviously excited for this year. This year is far from over. Uh, it'd be nice to win these last two games, win the Big 12 championship, and be in the college football playoff. I don't want to be focused too much on 2024 and beyond because there's still some fish to fry here in 2023. But, man, I I feel great about Steve Sarkeesian and, and where this program is right now and also where I think it's headed moving forward. So, seven wins Sark, no moss. No moss. That guy has evolved and developed as a coach. Once again, he's not perfect. None of us are. He will get better. We'll all get better, and this team will get better. But, uh, man, think of where we were in Charlie Strong's third year. Think of where we were in Tom Herman's third year. And now think of where we are right now in Steve Sarkeesian's third year. There's a difference between a guy who knows what he's doing and a guy and two guys who are in over their head here at the University of Texas. So there's my uh, there's my random soapbox right there. Uh, you know, you don't blow 20 point leads when you don't lose the game, Columbus. I think that's important to to note. Texas won all three of those games. So uh, yeah, I don't love blowing 20 or losing 20 point leads, but I do love winning. Uh, Texas was three and eight against TCU since TCU joined the Big 12. I'll take a win over them. Uh, Kansas State was a thorn in Texas' side for a long time. They're a top 25 team. They're really good. I'll take a win over them in overtime with the backup quarterback. That's pretty good. Uh, win over Houston. That one not as exciting, but hey, Texas found a way to win that game at Houston. So, yeah, I'm cool with uh, I'm cool with where Texas is right now. Hopefully you are too. Columbus, uh, looking at your comments, it seems like you are one of those people who would have been texting me over the weekend if you had my number wondering if Steve Sarkeesian is the head coach. And hey, that's you're entitled to your opinion. You're very much entitled to your opinion. Uh, but I just uh, – I, I think of where this Texas team has been through most of my adult life, and I, I'm just pretty freaking happy. You guys know how hard it is for me to be happy. I'm usually one of the more negative slash pessimistic people out there. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling good about where, where this Texas team is right now. So, all right, Jake says some of this defensive coaching staff needs to be evaluated. Yeah, uh, we'll see how these last few games shake out. Um, now, the secondary, I, I think, is the biggest weakness for Texas. I think most Longhorn fans would agree with me there, regardless of how you feel about Steve Sarkeesian and the state of this Texas program. I think you probably are with me and thinking that the secondary has left a lot to be desired this season. Uh, Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon, those are your two secondary coaches right now. You know, they deserve some credit for Texas being nine and one, too, but uh, this secondary has has not been consistently great. They've obviously dealt with some injuries, but still there's there's too much talent. There's too much experience back there for this group to be having the same issues pop up over and over again. Uh, and for PK, like I, I I was critical of PK for this yesterday, and I think you can be too. Like most defensive coordinators would do what PK did on Saturday once Texas jumped out to that 26 to 6 halftime lead. They would drop extra guys in coverage to try to avoid giving up big plays, right? You try to keep TCU in front of you. Uh, you feel like, hey, we've got a big enough lead. We can kind of play a little prevent style defense. We don't need to be as aggressive up front. And we should be able to do enough on the back end to make sure that this lead doesn't slip away. Most coaches think like that. And most teams are able to do that. But because Texas is secondary, whether it's coaching or talent or a combination of both, it probably is a combination of both. Texas doesn't have that luxury right now. Like they've got to be aggressive on defense for all four quarters because if they drop extra guys in coverage, that means the opposing quarterback has more time to throw the football. And that's bad news for this Longhorn defense right now. A common sense tells you if you want to cover better, put more guys in coverage. That, that ain't applying for Texas right now. If this Texas team wants to be better in the secondary, they've got to bring more blitzers to get pressure on opposing quarterbacks. They were doing that in the first half against Josh Hoover. He threw for less than 100 yards. He threw that awful interception in the second quarter right before halftime, and TCU's offense scored six points. They didn't get into the end zone. Texas played more of a prevent-style defense, not that they were you know, doing the prevent play you see in Madden or NCAA football where everybody was just, 50 yards down the field in some deep zone, but they just weren't nearly as aggressive and credit TCU. Like they did a good job 
holding up against Texas's four-man front. The Longhorns have been able to get a lot of pressure by just rushing four this season. Uh, TCU, for a large part of the second half, did a good job of preventing Texas's defensive line from getting after the quarterback, and they were able to make some plays down the field. But, yeah, for Texas, you've got to be aggressive, man. People are tired of the all-gas, no-breaks bit. For PK, that might not be bad advice for this defense. You have got to do things to mitigate your weakness in the secondary. And the best way to do that, I think, is to uh, just bring more pressure. Bring more pressure. As simple as that. It's a scary thought, right? Because obviously you bring more blitzers. You're taking guys out of the secondary. And once again, common sense. Uh, get that Thomas Payne guy out here to talk about that one. Uh, that might not always make sense, but for this Texas defense, that's what works. That's what's been working for this team. So, yeah, secondary staff. If any position coaches are getting evaluated or need to be evaluated in this offseason, it's probably them. But once again, we'll we'll see how uh, this season shakes out. Texas makes the playoff this year, guys. I, I don't know if anyone is losing their job on the coaching staff, whether you like it or not. Maybe somebody leaves for a better gig. Uh, maybe PK gets head coaching opportunities. Maybe Kyle Flood gets head coaching opportunities or an opportunity to where he can actually call plays as an offensive coordinator. Maybe a position coach gets the chance to be a coordinator. Who knows? Like there, there could obviously be some turnover on the Texas coaching staff, but man, if Texas wins the next three games and makes it to the playoff, even if they don't make it to the playoff, if they win these next three games and win the big 12 championship and they're sitting at 12 and one going into bowl season, uh, I, I have a tough time thinking someone's getting fired. You can be critical of Sark for that, but that's uh, that's just kind of my prediction right now. Not that I think that's that bold of a prediction to think that that will go down. And Texas has won nine games. Yeah, yeah since 2010, Texas has only won nine games three times. Yeah, and four losses in each of those previous times. If Texas ends the year with four losses, then, then my tone on Steve Sarkeesian might change. If Texas ends this year with four L's, because well, that would be two straight here. Then you don't make the Big 12 championship game. Then you lose your bowl game and end the year nine and four. Yeah, now that's uh then you guys can call me out for being overly optimistic and positive about Steve Sarkeesian. I'll I'll eat my words and I'll question myself and question uh what's going on with this Texas football program if God forbid that happens. But uh, I don't think anybody expects something like that to happen. Uh, Bomb City Blue Jay, appreciate you stopping by today. Am I pessimistic or is there no way we get into the playoffs? Yeah, Kirk Herbstreet, let me see if I can find this. I'll filibuster as I try to uh, screen share Herbie's tweet from either yesterday or Sunday. But he had this hypothetical for the college football playoff. And, you know, un unfortunately, teams ranked ahead of Texas are just not losing right now. And you still have two weeks left of the regular season, and then you have conference championship weekend. So, uh, a lot of chaos could still be coming our way, but it's it's not happening right now, and it's a little frustrating. Like you would hope, hey, Texas just keeps winning. Okay, some of the teams ranked ahead of Texas will start to lose, and then Texas will move up in the rankings. Well, it's not happening. I mean, Texas was ranked number seven in the CFP two weeks ago. They were ranked number seven in the CFP rankings last week, and my guess is they will still be number seven tonight uh, when the – New CFP rankings come out. Why can I not find this, Herbie? God, that guy tweets a lot. Oh, it wasn't Herbie. That's that's why I'm not able to find it. It's uh, Joel Klatt, another big-time college football analyst. Here we go. Let me pull up the share screen here on, uh, on X.com. So here's this hypothetical. I'd love to get y'all's thoughts on this one, too. Let me, let me minimize the comment here. Hypothetical college football playoff scenario. You've got a 13-0 Big Ten champ, so either Ohio State or Michigan. You've got Florida State at 13-0. And, and you'd have two spots for the following. 12-1 Oregon, if they win the Pac-12. 12-1 Texas, if they win the Big 12. 12-1 Alabama, if they win the SEC. 12-1 Georgia, if they lose to Alabama in the SEC title game. 12-1 Washington, if they lose to Oregon in the Pac-12 championship game. Like, this is a scenario that could actually happen. And this is madness. Now, I think Texas gets in in this scenario. Like, the win over Alabama carries a lot of weight, and it should carry a lot of weight. And I know people out there are saying, oh, if the two teams rematched, Alabama would probably – that hogwash. Doesn't matter. Shouldn't matter. Can't matter. 
when you're comparing resumes. That's stupid. That's why we like college football so much. Every week matters. You get one mulligan in this sport. Once the 12 team playoff gets here, you might get two. But right now, you get one mulligan in this sport. You don't get a second one. That's it. Every game matters. And Texas beating Alabama in their house, not by some fluke BS, but by 10 points and in relatively dominant fashion. Uh, Texas is going to get in in this scenario. But man, I mean, I, I don't, you know, does, does Alabama get in? Does Oregon get in? You, you can't put Georgia in, can you? Even though they obviously have won the last two national championships and their only loss would be to a top 10 Alabama team on a neutral field. Like that's, yeah, it's, it's incredible. So this is what we're looking at right now because we haven't had a ton of madness in college football in recent weeks. All sorts of these types of scenarios exist to where like, yeah, resumes matter a lot. So. Yeah, in this situation, I think Texas would get in. Uh, but I understand. I mean, Bomb Bomb City, you're looking at all of these teams around the country right now. Like Texas is number seven. So they've got to uh they've got to jump three of the teams that are ahead of them to get into the top four. And two of those teams haven't lost a game yet. Right? Like Texas fans are a little mad that Oregon's ranked ahead of Texas. And that's fair. I think you have every right to be mad about that. But it's not only us having to jump Oregon. I've got to hope that Washington loses. Got to hope that Florida State loses or Georgia loses. Obviously, one of Ohio State or Michigan will lose because they play each other next weekend. We know that. But uh, yeah, you need you need some madness, man. You need some madness. So I think it will happen. I think some of these teams will lose. Like Oregon State, you got to be a Beaver fan, man. You got to be a Beaver fan. Uh, because Oregon State plays host to Washington this week, and then they play at Oregon next week. If if they win both of those games, like Oregon State already has two losses, so you don't have to worry about them in the playoff. Uh, but if they win both of those games, obviously if they win one, great news. If they take both, Pac-12's done. You ain't got to worry about them anymore. So we're all beavers. We're all beavers here. Uh, if Texas wins were by 20, they'd be higher. They'd be one spot higher. They'd be they'd be ranked ahead of Oregon. They wouldn't be ahead of any of the undefeated teams. So all of this misery that Texas has apparently put us through this year uh, has cost Texas one spot. That's that's where we're at right now. Now, style points matter. I'm not arguing against that. Style points definitely matter. And I would rather win these games by 20 because that would look better on a resume, of course. But they, I'm just letting you know right now, Daryl, they would not be higher than number six even if they had won all these games by 40 because they've got a loss and none of the top five have a loss that's where we're at right now so uh root for chaos man root for chaos chaos is always fun you don't want it happening to your team you hope texas keeps winning the games that they're expected to win and even though jonathan brooks is out for the rest of the year uh, the longhorns are going to be favored and their three remaining games you know, two on the schedule right now, and hopefully the Big 12 championship. Like Texas will be fa- there's Texas could play OU again. And even though we all unfortunately remember what happened in Dallas a month ago, Texas would be favored in a rematch against Oklahoma. I truly believe that. And we know Texas is favored against Iowa State. We know Texas will be favored against Texas Tech. And yeah, there's there's no opponent that Texas could run into at AT&T Stadium on December 2nd that would be favored ahead of Texas. So, hey. Give me the madness, give me the wildness, the craziness, the chaos, whatever you want to call it, outside of Texas, please. We'll uh, just just keep taking care of business here. Just keep taking care of business here. Yeah, as Jake says, style points sure as hell didn't matter for TCU last year. Now, there was uh, more chaos this year. If if we get the chaos we want, style points won't matter. If these teams ranked ahead of Texas start losing, then it won't make a difference that Texas is winning these games by three and not 17 to 20. Um, but right now that's, yeah, it's still a conversation worth having, uh, worth having, having, what the hell is having? It's not a word. That's not a word. I'm sick. I feel like crap. I got to take something after this, probably a nap. Also the water in my apartment complex is turned down, uh, turned down, turned off. They sent an email last night saying the water is going to be off from 10 to 11. At 11.30, the water was still not on, and I got an email saying, oh, it's going to be a few more hours until the water comes on. So that's exciting. I have to, uh, if nature calls, I might have to call nature. 
go outside. But that's a mess right now. That's that's the last thing I need. All right, what else do you guys have? Chip and Zay, of course, coming up from one to three. Let's hear from Sark. This kind of ties into what we've been talking about here. Steve Sarkeesian, I think this was the last question of his Monday presser. He was basically asked about just what's at stake for Texas and kind of the opportunity that the Longhorns have being right here in the thick of things in the Big 12 race with just two weeks left in the regular season. What an awesome time. You know, this is this is the fun part, right? Yeah, to be in to be in the middle of November and be in a championship race. Um, I think that our guys have have handled it well up until this point. Like I said, we've been walking into you know road stadiums and understanding the environments are hostile as as anything. And we, we still have this on our chest. It's still our last year in the Big 12. We understand all that, but now there's championship game implications, uh, and I think that our players have really responded to it. And we showed great poise, great composure. But it's this is exciting. You know, this is why we get to do what we do to to be chasing a chasing a championship. And um, I know that our that our players are looking forward to another opportunity Saturday night. It's exciting, man. It really is. There have been so many years since 2009 where Texas has been nowhere close to the Big 12 championship conversation. And hell, there have been years where like we're two or three games into Big 12 play and Texas is already out of the mix. Now we've got two games left and Texas is in sole possession of first place in the Big 12 and they control their own destiny to uh, win this conference on the way out. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. They've got work to do. Neither of these last two games are going to be easy, especially without Jonathan Brooks. Ames has been uh, a problem place for the Longhorns in recent years. Hell, Iowa State's been a thorn in Texas's side. The Longhorns have lost three of their last four games against Iowa State. Last year was the only win. Texas was a 16-point favorite here in Austin, and the Longhorns had to hold on for dear life to win by three. And if Xavier Hutchinson, who's now with the Houston Texans, was able to haul in a pass deep down the middle of the field in the final minute, then Iowa State at worst kicks a field goal, or at least they have the opportunity to kick a field goal to force overtime. Maybe they score a touchdown there and win the game in regulation. Iowa State's been a problem. Matt Campbell's had Texas, his number. That game's in Ames. It's at night. Not going to be easy. Texas Tech's playing a little bit better as of late. They beat Kansas. Kansas had its third-string quarterback. Go ahead and brag about, man, what a world we live in where people can brag about beating Kansas's third-string quarterback. But uh, I think Kansas is pretty good this year, I guess. Uh, Tech's playing a little bit better. In recent weeks, they've got Baron Morton back. They had that kid, Jake Strong, their third-string quarterback, start for a few weeks, and he uh, was awful. It was in way over his head. He thought Malik Murphy had struggles. Go back and watch what uh, Jake Strong did. My God. Uh, Tech's got Baron Morton back, a guy who started some games for them last year, a guy who started some games for them this year. So, uh, yeah, like that's a rivalry game, and Tech's going to want to beat Texas. Of course they are. Not going to be easy, but... It's cool to be in this spot, man. It is cool to be in this spot. I'm stopping and smelling the roses. Maybe I'm allowed to be a little complacent from time to time. Hopefully the players and coaches aren't doing a whole lot of rose smelling right now, but I'm just thinking of uh, how much my life has changed since 2009 and what I've gone through as a Texas football fan and student for a few of those years. And uh, it's just nice. I've never, like, never gotten to cover a good team like this, and it's kind of cool getting to cover a good team like this. And, hey, Texas Sports Unfiltered, is it a coincidence that the Longhorns are having their best year in 15 years in the first year of Texas Sports Unfiltered's existence? I don't know. Should you guys be thanking us? Maybe you should. Maybe we deserve credit for what's going on with Texas. Kidding. TJ says, my balls just dropped the last time. No, nah, they, they still haven't, so sorry about that. Sorry about that one, DJ. Uh, some love to some sponsors real quick. Got to mention our friends at Covert Bee Cave. Bucky and I will be doing our pregame show this Saturday for Texas and Iowa State. If you're looking for a newer pre-owned car, truck, or SUV, you got to go see our friends at Covert Bee Cave. They've got an unparalleled selection of vehicles out there. The best service that you're going to find and the best prices anywhere. Nobody beats a Covert deal. Not now, not ever. They say that because they mean that. Selection, service, prices, they've got it all. That's what you want when you're buying a car. They give you the best car buying experience that you could possibly find out there at Covert Bee Cave. Go see them and tell them you heard about them right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Shout out to them. Shout out to Olipop. I need me some of that. Maybe that will make me start to feel better. Olipop, great tasting soda that's actually good for you. 
Chip talks about it all the time. Trey's in. Bucky's in. I'm in. Wags is If you're not in, you're missing out. Olipop is a game changer. Once again, soda that tastes like soda, but is actually good for you too. And they found a way to make it happen. And speaking of stuff that tastes great, Altstad beer. That's the only beer that I drink nowadays. Get you some H-E-B Specs, Twin Liquors, Total Wine. Wherever you buy your beer, make sure you're finding Altstad beer. We got to give a shout out. I totally forgot about where we at in society today. No Trey today. He's the guy who usually keeps us in line, which is a scary thought. Hell, actually, I don't, I don't think either of us really keep anything in line when we're on the show together. But here is uh, a word from our friends at Pest Wranglers. Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. What are you doing? I'm making a silly commercial like other companies so people will remember our name. But we're not like other companies. Anyone could see that from our five-star reviews. But how will people remember Pest Wranglers? Well, once they try us, they'll never forget that we are the most effective, reliable, and affordable pest control company. I guess you're right. Pest Wranglers is the best at pest control, wildlife management, termite pest control. Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers, Pest Wranglers. What are you doing? Hey, it couldn't hurt. Pest Wranglers, 512-670-7808 or find us on the web at pestwranglers.com. got to talk to Sark. I think I had myself muted. Sorry about that, guys. You guys can't read lips? What's your problem? You don't have that figured out by now? We should be back by now. My bad. Turned myself off during the spot. I'm glad you guys are paying attention. Zay's here. What's up, Zay? What's good, my guy? How you doing? Uh, I was doing well until I just was talking to myself for the last minute and a half. How are you? (laughs) I'm good, man. I'm good. Just living. First in the fantasy league, got that first week by, you know what I'm saying? Clinched the division. Feeling good, man. Feeling wow. Good. When do the playoffs start? Next week? No, like three weeks. So I might rest my players. That's how good I'm feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone do that in fantasy football? Like, no, man. That'd be so oh. Bush League. That'd be yeah. so whack. You got Yeah, because I guess the, the other teams will start, you know, beating you and that will affect playoffs. I don't know, man. If I'm you, I'm taking bribes. Like, hey, you want me to rest my players so you can get into the playoffs, then I'm open for business, you know? Yeah, man. I'm with you. I'm with you. I mean, I've been doing some serious waiver wire grinding. Picked up Noah Brown last week. He gave me 22 points or CJ Stroud put it on the show and – yeah, man. I don't know. Nine and one. And I'm glad I lost that one game because I went in undefeated. I, you know, just my luck. I'd lose first round and shit. So the fact that I know I can be beat psychologically, that feels like I, you know, have some sort of, I don't know, advantage. If that makes any sense, it doesn't. But I don't mm. give a damn. We're in the playoffs, baby. You know, mm. that's all yeah, that matters. I heard uh, when you lost – that one game, the 1972 Dolphins popped champagne to celebrate. <laughs> Their undefeated record lasted another year. I think that's how that works, right? Yeah, man. Checks Let's out. Go. Checks out. What's uh, what Tuesday? See, I got what Hummer and Hank today. Yeah, sounds okay. about right. Uh, yeah. 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 Hummer yeah. and yeah. Hank. <laughs> The mute, the mute is spreading. I, I muted myself a couple of minutes ago, Chip, so it's some sort of disease that has uh, infiltrated us today, I guess. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're good to go. All right, boys. Well, I'm excited to listen. You guys have a great show. Let's go. Thanks, brother. Let's go. In the immortal words of Judy Brown, happiness is a choice. And we're happy you're spending some time with us, Chip and Zay, rocking and rolling on a Tuesday, breaking it down. Zay, I've had a chance to look at Iowa State a little bit, and uh, I think this is going to be a Sudoku puzzle. Oh, man. A culture Sudoku puzzle for the Longhorns. Let's see if uh, I thought it was uh, a little bit interesting that 
Christian Jones used the term, you know, he brought up the Brees Hall comment from 2020. Five-star culture beat five-star talent. That was the game that sprung Iowa State into the Big 12 title game with Brock Purdy and caused Texas to fall out of the Big 12 title chase. Tom Herman, you idiot for trying a fake punt up 10 in the third quarter. Mm. Um, It did not work, and it ended up giving Iowa State momentum and – The rest is history. But here's the thing. You don't know any players for Iowa State. You don't know any of their receivers. You don't know any of their – maybe you know Jalen Noel. You don't know who their running backs are. Rocco Becht, if you've really been paying attention, you know he's the son of the former tight end Anthony Becht, former first-round draft pick of – played for the New York Jets, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. On defense, they don't have Will McDonald anymore. They don't have the dudes that you're used to, but they've got a team that has bonded together probably because of the gambling situation that, you know, bagged their quarterback. That's still one of the weirdest stories. The Iowa Gaming Commission on its own went and looked at – you know, look through the roles for Iowa and Iowa State athletes who were betting. And they they found Hunter Deckers, and Deckers was betting on freaking Iowa State football games, for God's sake. So he's now facing, like, criminal, you know, charges. Ah, oh, let him play. Come on. Let him play. He's betting on himself. Yeah, Everybody man. Aren't you supposed to do that? Show. Isn't that yeah, the I'm lesson sure. in life? I've heard that my whole life, and now it's wrong to do? Come on. Oh, my God. Right? Some BS, man. All right. Listen, my dog is pounding on the door to get in here. He was too lazy to come up the stairs. Now I got to let him in. So tell the people, are you agreeing with me, disagreeing on the Iowa State Cyclones? About them being scary as hell? Yeah. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you. Like, what, three out of the last four times the Horns have been to Ames, they've lost? Yeah, not feeling too good about this game, especially with the second-half woes that the Horns are bringing back up that we saw way too often in 2022. I mean, we've been talking about it ever since the game in Fort Worth from Houston to Kansas State to TCU. They just keep blowing leads, and it seems like their luck is going to run out eventually, and now you got Jonathan Brooks out. Hell, yeah, I'm nervous. You know, like it's Matt Campbell team. That dude, he loves Ames. You got to give it to him. He had opportunities to go elsewhere and take some big time money. And he said, no, I want to stay here in Ames, Iowa and build my program the way I want to build it and have the freedom that I want to have here. And hey, all of his teams are tough. They might not be talent wise comparable to Texas, but a lot of the times over the years, they've been tougher than Texas. And I hope that's not the case this Saturday, but a lot of crazy shit happens in that part of Iowa. So yeah, well, man, the, cool, the cool thing for Matt Campbell is he's been able to hang on to John Haycock, his defensive coordinator the whole time. Yeah. Like Haycock should have gotten lower level D one jobs by now, you know, whether it's, like a Mac job or something, but, and Matt Campbell has young kids and he coaches their baseball team, you know, I mean, and he wanted to be in a place like Iowa state. Cause everyone's like, Oh man, he missed the window last year. He went four and eight. And for Matt Campbell, it it's not about, I mean, now his agent will probably say there's a job out there that he would say yes to, but he really wants to raise his kids and be present in their lives. It's kind of a, Oh, isn't that sweet (laughs) story, but I believe him. And, and so Iowa state has benefited from this guy wanting to raise his kids there and, and Ames. And he's got a great athletic director and Jamie Pollard who works his ass off to come up with the means to, you know, get them what he needs. And 
it's, you know, a credit to Campbell and Haycock that that defense, it doesn't matter who's playing. They just keep making it miserable for people. They're going to squeeze you. They're going to, they're going to drag this thing out. It's a, the equivalent of a four corners basketball offense, Zay. They want to drag you into a low possession game. Instead of 70 to 80 plays, you're going to run 50. Now, um, I need to look and see how many plays OU ran because we know OU uh, likes to go up tempo and they ran, OU ran, and OU won 50 to 20 over Iowa State in Norman. Um, they had 41. Okay, so they ran seven, they ran 80 plays. So Oklahoma was able to go up tempo, speed up Iowa State, and get them to play their, you know, their game. And and Iowa State, you know, let's take their, uh, you know, let's say against Baylor, it was 66 plays. So, you know, typically – if you're playing a game and it's Iowa State dictating, the plays you're playing are like you're getting 50-something, 60-something total plays instead of 70 or 80. And this is the challenge now without Jonathan Brooks. And can you keep Quinn Ewers protected? No sacks last week. He threw a lot of balls away. He does not want to take a hit on that shoulder. I wouldn't either because it's painful and he's going to have to manage that pain the rest of the year. That's not going to go away until he stops playing football. So this is, you know, when we talk about Jonathan Brooks, not playing in this game, my biggest concern is blitz pickup. You know, CJ Baxter picked up the blitz on the third and 12 completion to AD Mitchell to end the TCU game. That's great. Can he do it? Play in play out because something tells me Zay that Quinn is going to have to win this game with his arm. And that in itself makes you a little bit reaching for the Tums. Yeah, definitely makes you a little nervous, especially since Quinn Ewers probably still isn't a hundred percent. And we could get to all the rumors going around social media about if he's going to stay or leave because that's something in itself. But yeah, for this game specifically, with no Jonathan Brooks, it seems like that Quinn Ewers is going to have to make some big time throws. And you talk about the pace. I think that plays in the Texas favor. I think when the defense for the Horns, when offenses could go up tempo and keep, you know, guys on the field, they could get a little fatigued. And you kind of seen it this year, especially when offensive teams start throwing the ball at a high rate. And Texas secondary, they could get confused back there. I mean, Derek Williams, as good as he is, he could lose track of just certain communication with guys and so can Terrence Brooks like we've kind of seen it up and down all year long and again the fact that these guys are nine and one is amazing with just kind of all the mishaps that they've had so if they play I I mean when they play Iowa State and if Iowa State wants to slow the game down and allow Texas to catch their breath and you know have their assignments all intact then again I think that plays into the horns hands I think Trevondre Sweat and Vernon Broughton and Byron Murphy. And now you got Trill Carter getting sacks and getting in the mix, along with Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke and those guys. Like they can make life hell for Rocco Beck, you know, who's still a freshman and will still throw the ball up there, even though he's gotten better since that Oklahoma game in late September. You can still get to him. He's a lot like Josh Hoover due to his inexperience, and he wants to make plays, you know, so he's going to give defenses opportunities to do that. So, yeah, you know, you talk about picking up, you know, pass protection for Jaden Blue and for um, C.J. Baxter. That's going to be huge, but Sark's got to put those guys in situations to make life easy for them. And I think if Jaden Blue, if his pass protection is on point, I think this could be a breakout game for him. I really do. I think he's just been itching at the bit to get out there and showcase his stuff, and it's been hard to because Jonathan Brooks and C.J. Baxter begin majority of the reps, but don't forget about Jaden Blue's run 
run, you know, a few games ago. Like, that dude, he has big-time explosiveness. It just needs to be, you know, thrown out there. He needs to be given the opportunity to make big plays when the Horns need him. And I think Iowa State this week is going to be a grand opportunity for him. So I, I hope, you know, especially playing this 3-3-5 defense, you heard Sark talk about, you know, them being the pioneers of it. And you mentioned Haycock and him have probably having opportunities at lower G5 schools to go to because he's such a defense savant. Well, you got to take what the defense gives you, Sark. You know, though that those deep shots that you saw to Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Wordy and TCU, that might not be there this week. You want it to be there, but that might not be there due to Jonathan Brooks not being available and them playing, you know, a little tighter and knowing that you're going to have to put the ball in the air. So Quinn Ewers, those intermediate routes, Jordan Winnington, JT Sanders, this should be y'all's game. As good as Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Wordy have been all year long, JT Sanders and Jordan Winnington, this should be the game where y'all go crazy because all the focus is going to be on one and five. And I think 13 and zero can really muck stuff up for that Iowa State defense. So uh, the Sark, you got to be patient, man. You got us. There might be some long, methodical 10 play, eight minute drive. So be it. You can't get you know greedy and go for those deep shots that aren't there just because it's fun. Like, you know, I've seen too much of that during Sark's tenure where it's like, dude, dang, there's three other jerseys over there. Why the hell are we throwing it? I don't want to see any of those. You know, obviously you got to test them every once in a while, but let's limit those and let's make sure the intermediate stuff in between 10 and 20 yards, that's on point all week long. And if it is, then the Horns should leave Ames with a dub. Yeah, special teams has got to be on point. Um Ryan Sanborn had a rare, poor game. Oh, he was awful. He couldn't even catch the ball on snaps for the field goals. We, yeah, Ryan, we remember that too, bro. We remember that. Just, your punting wasn't bad either. You couldn't even catch the ball for Burt Auburn. Who's Get been you bullying the special teams guy. What you mean? You brought him up. I wouldn't even said that if you I didn't know, bring him you- up. You you got your boxing gloves on already. You were ready I'm to just say it. Yo, that stuff is big. Not holding the ball. Come on, man. No, no, it's big. It, it's big. It, it, bam, it's hold big. that thing. He was it's juggling big. it. Tony Romo, that thing. Come on, man. We can't have that. And you're no. not putting the ball right. Right. Come on, man. 36 yard punt. We can't have that. You've been Terrible. booming them all week all year. Don't, don't, don't fade now, is what I'm saying. For Special real. teams, don't fade now. Here's what's probably going to happen, Zay. You ready? This is probably going to be a back-and-forth game. It's not going to be a game where Texas races out to a 20-point lead and then relaxes. They're going to have to fight every step of the way, and that's probably a good thing, as crazy as that sounds. As crazy as that sounds. Remember when they were 10-10 with Wyoming going into the fourth quarter? Wow. And when they put it on them, I think it's going to be, I don't know that they're going to put them on, put it on them, but I think this is going to be more of a, a back and forth game and Texas has got to take care of the football. So if, if CJ Baxter, Jaden blue, if there's one thing you have to do, you have to protect the football because We saw the one time Jonathan Brooks gave it up was the worst possible time. It it had come right after 14 points and the momentum was shifting and K-State scored 20 points in two and a half minutes. And that's how you get back into a game. And that's, you know, Sark said it. TCU was able to get back into the game because they were, Capitalizing on Texas mistakes, stupid penalty out of bounds, extends a punt return into deep into Texas territory, and whip, whap, whoop, TCU scoring quick. So this is, to me, the ultimate test of the culture that Steve Sarkeesian has built for this team going up against the program that prides itself for having five-star culture. Let's see if Texas's culture can take down the Iowa State culture. 
And look, Kansas won in Ames at night two weeks ago. They got a little help from Rocco Becht, who threw him a pick six. Rocco Becht threw a pick six to open the game at OU. Those are the two losses that Iowa State has in conference. <clears throat> and he he ain't seen a defense like Texas. Nope. He ain't seen a pass rush like Texas. And Baron Sorrell, Ethan Burke, Byron Murphy, Tavondre Sweat, and whatever Pekwakowski dials up, you got to get this kid rattled. And you got to get him thinking, get me out of here. And, and get him to throw it up a couple times because – um, the defense is going to have to play a role in this game, might even need to score, but has to win the turnover battle, in my opinion. I don't think Texas wins the game if they don't win the turnover battle. So, Yeah, yeah, I agree. And Rocco Beck, he's pretty athletic. You know, they'll use some, you know, direct runs with him in it. He does a good job of escaping the pocket when pressure comes. And you saw with Josh Hoover, once Josh Hoover started escaping that pocket and kept his eyes up the field, he was able to make some big-time throws. And those TCU receivers like Savion Williams and Richardson and Jared Wiley, they were able to get open. You know, that's one of the hardest things for secondary players to do is when a guy starts scrambling, you sticking on your guy. And then once those wide receivers start improvising, like, OK, you got the you got the one route covered. But if there's a guy back there just scrambling around and keeping the play alive and stuff, that's tough to cover. And we saw Josh Hoover make some big time throws, you know, utilizing his legs this past Saturday. So Rocco Beck, I, he has that in him. You know, I'm going back and watching that BYU game. He has a lot of that in him. And it's it could be scary. It could be problematic for the Horns if they don't get that guy down and if the secondary is just still giving up big plays like they have been prone to do all year long. So, yeah, obviously turning the Cyclones over, that would be huge. But, man, when – it's time to run the ball for Texas. Will they be able to? Does Steve Sarkeesian have confidence in C.J. Baxter, Jaden Blue? What's the word on Keelan Robinson? We're getting on our um, code of text line, which appreciate y'all uh, hitting up 512-222-9328. Somebody asked where K-Rob's at. Uh, he missed the last game. Any word on him, Chip? Yeah, I think I think he's going to be back for this game. Um, I think he had a – uh, he got dinged in the noggin um, in, in practice. They took his helmet away for that game. Um, but I think he'll be back for Iowa State. And, I mean, we'll see, obviously. Um, I'll, I'll check on that. I usually have a better read on that after uh, Wednesday's practice. But um, this is, this is going to be – and all hands on deck, and they need to make plays in every phase of the game. Um, I, it's, I think it's going to be, you know, fun and exciting. Now, here's the thing about Iowa State at night, because, um, you know, everyone's like, oh, Iowa State at night. Iowa State at night is eight and six under Matt Campbell. They are seven and three in their last ten at home at night, but they are only one in three in their last four. So last year they lost both of their home night games against K-State and Texas Tech when they had their off bad season. Uh, they went four and eight last year. That was a disappointment. And then they've split their night games this year. They beat um, TCU. At home at night, they lost to Kansas at home at night. So there's the one and three in their last four. But seven and three in their last ten, it's not, um, you know, it's it's not like going into the Coliseum with a bunch of lions. But you got to be sharp. You got to be on point. And let's let's see. Let's see if the Texas culture is 
is wired in from from the jump. And even if if it is a a slow four corners fist fight, then everyone's intensity should stay on high. It's when this team gets up 20 and they start playing a little bit more zone and keeping stuff and stop. And Sark said that yesterday. Sark said that we need to be tighter in our coverage. Finally, he said it. And so I'm expecting to see it. Don't, you know, don't dance around it. You, you get what you demand. You get what you coach. And so you got to stay aggressive. And this, this defense got to stay aggressive. That's, that's who they are. That's, that's what they want. So don't, don't try to teach them. I mean, I, I know, I know you can't, can't play man on every play and they've got man beaters and all that, but this team, this defense plays great when they're swarming the football and playing aggressively. And that's how they need to play. Don't, don't back it up. Yeah. If you go back and just look at all the time that the horns have been beat deep on defense, it's not very often, you know, I'm thinking about Burton, for Alabama, he beat them over the top once in the Kansas game where John A. Barron and Keaton Crawford, when those guys got confused, they got beat over the top. Other than that, everything's been yards after catch type shit. You know, like guys having it in their hands where like Savion Williams catching that just quick comeback route and then absolutely just leaping over Derrick Williams to get extra yards. Like those things can't happen. You know, when you see Ryan Watts and Michael Tav get absolutely juked against Kansas State, like missing tackles when they're just playing that soft coverage, you know, it's it does look preventish, CB. Like, it's weird. It's weird that they play tight at certain points in the game, and then when they get up, they just kind of, you know, take the foot off the gas, no pun intended. And it's like, guys, like, keep it up. Y'all aren't getting beat deep. You know, like, so how about we don't allow the little short stuff, the little crossing stuff, you know, the quick stuff, anything yards after catch and make the tackle. Like, let's stay closer to guys so we can make the tackle easier. Once it gets in their hands, boom, you're making the hit. Not once it gets in their hands, catch it. And then we're 10 yards away. So we have to run and go get the guy. Now he has momentum to do all types of shifts and, you know, just breaking tackle ability like that's that's what's weird. You know, when you get up by 20 and then the defense just gets a little just soft, just flat out soft. Like that's that's been just a weird thing with Pete Kukowski and this defense, knowing how many studs they got back there. I mean, you've got Jade Barrett, Jalen Ford, Javondre Sweat, and, you know, the other guys are stepping up. So believe in that. Like when you got those type of studs, you should be able to play a more aggressive defense for the whole game. You know, like just because you're up doesn't mean that you need to stop playing what got you up in the first place. That shit don't make no sense. Like you keep that up, make them adjust to you. And once they adjust to you, then you can make those adjustments and maybe start playing off a little bit. But till then, they got to prove it. The offense has to prove that they can move the ball when you're playing high and tight. And until they do that, then don't make no adjustments. But yeah, that's been up from U of H to Kansas State to TCU, obviously Oklahoma. That's been a serious issue, and I don't understand why because I think they got like – I believe in Malik Muhammad. I believe in Gavin Holmes. I believe in Derek Williams. Like, yes, they're going to make mistakes. They're human. But overall, they're, they've been solid all year long. So this coaching staff, they got to trust that for four straight quarters. Right, and you're starting to see them question themselves, and that's yeah. – that's what is the most concerning because the sign of a well-coached team is week-to-week improvement. Like, everybody needs to be playing better than they were at the Red River Shootout. And we're not seeing that in all instances. And so, you know, they got to get on the same page. Pete Kwiatkowski, uh, Terrence, Joseph. That's right. Call him by his government name, Chip. That's what I'm talking about. Blake. Blaketh. Gideon. Blaketh. 
come on, Blake. Your position is the one that's leaking oil the most. Let's yeah. let's get it right. So get that's these another guys. Thing. What's, what's um Jay and Callon looking like? I think he's I think he's gonna play. I think he's gonna play this week. Um, like I said, I'll know more after Wednesday's practice, but um I think he's I think he's gonna play. I think he's gonna try and give it a go. And that's that helps because you know he's a he's a veteran, he knows what he's looking at, and he can communicate. That's the best part about Jalen Catalan is he's an effective communicator. He doesn't need Johnny Barron to tell him what's going on. He can see it and communicate it. So that's uh and he's not foolproof. I mean, he got he got he kind of got suckered on the Dylan Gabriel uh QB draw. They hadn't shown a lot of that against you know, OU hadn't shown a lot of the quarterback run game that they ended up using in that game. But don't think for one second that Iowa State won't use some of that with Rocco Becht. There, I would fully expect some quarterback draw and some, you know, QB power and waggle and stuff where they're going to get him out and give him run pass options. So, you know, this is a... This is just, I'm expecting to see a Texas team with electricity Saturday night. You're two games away from playing for the championship. If you come out sluggish, I don't even know what's going on. They've been, they've been really good. They've been a, for the most part, they've been a fast starting team. Let's, uh, let's bring in our man, Chris Hummer. Hummer, we are so thankful that you're uh, taking some time for us because what a week. I mean, Jimbo Fisher out at AM. Everybody's, you know, trying to project what Quinn Ewers is going to do next year. I, I wrote in my insider or in the insider a week ago that it was 50 50. And, and then, you know, everybody else is like, hey, he's coming back, blah, blah, blah. I do think that the NFL evaluation will will be considered. But um, we got a lot to talk about, my friend. Yeah, slow slow week and slow time in college football, y'all. Uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing at all. Yeah, I saw all the Quinn Ewers stuff this morning, which was interesting. Chip, I know you've been all over that, as you said, so uh, – yeah, never well, boring in college football, and it's only going to get more hectic here over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, let's let's start with uh, Jimbo because this just looks like a mess. Um, you know, AM fires him after a 51-10 win because they don't want him to beat Abilene Christian and, God forbid, beat LSU and be on a three-game winning streak when they dump him. Um, your thoughts on Jimbo? Um, su not surprised. I will say, um, I've heard for a while now that a &M has been gathering the money to fire Jimbo Fisher. Um, surprised by the timing. Certainly I, I've been hearing kind of back and forth things on Jimbo, including the idea that if he beat LSU, there was enough of a roster intact. There was a quarterback that's been hurt most of the year on the roster that could really help elevate it, that you give him through 2024 and you give him that shot. But I don't, I mean, the AM fan base, much like the Texas fan base, is not a patient one. Um, we all know that. And I think there's just such a dissatisfaction with seven and five, eight and four, again, being the standard at Texas AM, that they felt like they had to make a move to get out in front of it. And like, I don't think it should be lost on anybody that Texas and Oklahoma are joining the SEC next year. And that doesn't seem like it's relevant, but I don't think there's a more important game for Texas A&M than that game they'll play against Texas and College Station next year. And I think Texas A&M wants to be in the best position to potentially win that game, but also to be in the best position to deal with Texas and Oklahoma coming into the SEC at a time when they're supposed to be elevating. 
Um, so I think all of this is motivated by that. I think all of this is motivated by a need around the administration for a change. And I just felt like they think it was the right time. I, I don't necessarily know if I agree, but um, they were willing to eat $75 million. And I definitely uh, definitely can't uh, fault somebody for taking a swing that big. Yeah. So, Amr, who wants that job? Because it sounds pretty toxic right now with just all the pressure with Texas coming in to the SEC. And they literally just paid the guy off $76 million to not coach. So what coach wants to jump into that? Like, who makes sense? We heard about Dan Lanning talking about he has unfinished business in Eugene still. And, you know, you hear Lane Kiffin's name being thrown around and Dion and just what what really makes sense for the next a and hire? Well, I, I will say, like, a and is a hornet's nest, but it's also a hornet's nest where they were willing to pay $75 million to get rid of somebody. So, like, you're not going to lack for resources. That makes a and an extremely enticing job. And while a and is no longer the only team in Texas in the SEC, like, a and has proven they can recruit an elite level um, thanks to their combination of location and, um, frankly, NIL dollars. Um, so this is a school capable of recruiting a number one overall recruiting class. And you can't say that for many places. I think it's probably seven or eight schools, period, that are capable of recruiting a number one overall class. And AM is one of them. So it's a really appealing job. It's just kind of an interesting cycle. I don't know if there's a slam dunk candidate. I think Dan Lanning would have been that guy. Um, and... I mean, I never trust a coach when he says something about a coaching rumor because they lie all the time. So I wouldn't. Yeah, he said zero out. chance, right? Yeah, I think I don't know what his exact words were, but yeah, he said he's not leaving Oregon. But I believe Bobby Petrino pretty famously said he was never leaving the Falcons, and then he was in Arkansas the next day. I remember Nick Saban saying a very similar thing about the Dolphins, and you go on and on and on. I'm right? not going so like, to Alabama. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and it, it happens all the time. Um, but I think the two most likely candidates for this job and the two names I've heard the most are Mike Elko, the for Duke's head coach, former a and defensive coordinator under Jimbo Fisher, and then Jeff Trailer, name we're all familiar with in Texas, uh, UTSA's head coach, um, state championship winning high school coach, former assistant at Texas, SMU, Arkansas, among other places, won two conference USA championships back to back. And now has UTSA at 6-0 and in the American in his first year there. Um, so those are the two guys I've heard the most. And I, I mean, along with Lane Kiffin, but uh, Lane Kiffin finds his way into every head coaching job. Um, he's got a hell of an agent over there. Um, and I think he works that the best he can. So those would be the four main names on the radar for me, at least right now. Yeah, and the the, the tricky part, the part that no one talks about at AM because they're so – aligned and they don't talk bad about themselves is John Sharp, the AM system chancellor, who's they're looking for their fifth president since 2020. I mean, they've been through three athletic directors since 2016. Um, I think if you talked to the presidents who've been at AM, they'll tell you they're not the president. Sharp is. If you Talk to Eric Hyman, who was the athletic director at AM when they renovated Kyle Field. He'd tell you, I wasn't the athletic director. John Sharp was. John Sharp just needs to put himself in as president and athletic director and run the whole damn thing because he is the Wizard of Oz over there. And he takes all the credit. I mean, he stupidly was the one who gave Jimbo the plaque that's, you know, national championship plaque and said, you fill in the date. He takes credit for all the, you know, he was out front on the stadium renovation. He was out front on SEC move. He never wanted Texas there because he wakes up every day trying to figure out how to, you know, push Aggie land ahead of the 40 acres. I just, it just doesn't feel, I mean, the roster looks great. The facilities look great. I just don't know if it's a good place to work, Hummer. I mean, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything you just said. Um, and I really wonder what's going to get engraved on that plaque. Like, I think like fifth place in the college football playoff might be like the best they can do <laughs> after that, uh, after that run. So I'll be curious, but I mean, you could really say the same thing about Texas at times. Like I'm not, it was, yeah, 
from I'm not Thursday. trying to hit a hornet's nest in Austin by like comparing Texas to Texas A&M, but like if you had talked to somebody at the end of the Steve Patterson era or in the middle of it, people would have been saying a lot of the same things about how um, the 40 acres is run. And I mean, frankly, I'm sure Tom Herman would probably tell you the same things about how the 40 acres was run at the end of his run too, um, because of everything that went around that. And I think winning cures everything in college football. Um, and if you can win at AM, which the reason why it's so appealing, as we talked about earlier, was all the resources, like it's the place that you could stay for a very long time. And I think coaches like are always going to take that chance because what's the worst that can happen, right? Like the worst that can happen is you get millions and millions of dollars to get told to go away. So like, there's no real bad outcome for a coach other than like a little embarrassment, but like you can embarrass me all you want. If you're going to hand me a $75 million check, you know what I mean? Unreal. Like, so yeah, I think, I think AM is still an appealing job because AM is one of probably like, 12 jobs in the country you can win a national championship realistically and i think most coaches if they can get one of those jobs would crawl to it yeah chris where do you think it completely went wrong for jimbo i mean we knew his offense was dated which is why he had to bring in by petrino we knew that you know just with all those five-star guys there's just been a lot of distractions guys racing in parking lots and stuff and you hear rumors about them smoking weed in locker rooms just a lot of bullshit over there at college station and i don't know it just seems like certain other guys like a hardball or Dabo, they got more time to make their team a championship qualifying team. And you could say that Jimbo did not. Yeah. I mean, shout out to a hundred mile an hour parking lot joyride, um, parking garage joyride, by the way. Parking garage, that's you're, it. You're correct about that parking garage, a uh, legendary moment in uh, social media history. But um I think it didn't work for a lot of reasons. I think Chip laid out some of them earlier. Um, it's kind of, I wouldn't say a dysfunctional administration, but it's an administration that has a lot working against it. But I don't think Jimbo Fisher did himself any favors. Um, I think the coaching staff he put together was pretty combustible. Um, a lot of really big personalities. Um, brought in DJ Durkin, Steve Adazio. Um, the people made fun of Bobby Petrino this year, but I think that's actually worked out decently well. But like, he has some big, big personalities on the staff that certainly clashed at times. And I think more than anything, it comes down to stubbornness for Jimbo Fisher. Um, he was really unwilling his entire tenure to give the reins of the offense to somebody else. And his offense, which is a West Coast system um, that has been really effective at times, obviously. Like the 2013 Florida State team is one of the best teams in college football history, and it ran that exact same system with a quarterback named Jameis Winston. But when you don't have somebody as talented as Jameis Winston running your system, you got to make some adjustments. Um, even like the best year Jimbo Fisher had was in 2020 with Kellen Mond. And even then, like Jimbo Fisher was unwilling to let Kellen Mond do a lot of the stuff that Kellen Mond does really well, which is frankly running the football. It's a strength for him. And I think Jimbo's unwillingness to bend and his rigidity and how he operates a system was outdated. And I think it ultimately cost him the job because with the athletes AM had on its roster, there are just so many ways you could um, attack that with modern football. And I don't know if Jimbo Fisher was always willing to do that. Well, Hummer, we got to get your take on Texas. They had another nail biter after holding a 20 point lead. Now Jonathan Brooks is done for the year with the ACL tear. Um, and they head off to Ames for a night game uh, with Quinn Ewers playing, you know, with a AC joint sprain. It's not gone. It's going to be a problem for the rest of the season, right? Regular season for sure. Um, your thoughts on the Longhorns and and what state they're in? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Um, I think if you were if you were on the outside of like the Austin area and you were looking inward at Texas, you'd probably think that this is um, a football team that's taken a step and it has in a lot of ways um, just because of the Alabama result and running on like mostly unscathed so far in the big 12. But there's some like really big problems that are starting to bubble to the surface a little bit. Um, I think the secondary continues to be a major cause for concern. Um, I think the 
offense without Jonathan Brooks is going to struggle. I think at times when Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell aren't bailing out the offense um, on the pass game, the pass game has struggled. I think Texas struggles to generate pressure outside of the two beasts they have in the interior. Um, but at the end of the day, like Texas is in the Big 12, and the Big 12 is the most gettable league in the country right now, at least in terms of the Power Five. And while Ames, Iowa is a really difficult place for Texas to play, I believe they've lost three of the last four there. Um, Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, they're playing a team in Iowa State that, lost probably like three of their seven best players in the preseason to gambling issues. Um, and in a week they're playing a Texas tech team that um, lost a starting quarterback in the air is really banged up and is sitting at, I think five and five. So it's not exactly a rigorous schedule, um, but I think Texas will like, I mean, pardon the pun with injuries, Texas is going to have to limp through the finish line this year, but, I still don't really see a reason why with the way the schedule sets up, Texas shouldn't at least be in the conversation for the college football playoff. Um, when the final rankings are released, like they should be favored in every single one of these games down the stretch. And it's up to Texas to continue to find a way to figure out to finish games. Yeah. A lot of Texas fans were hoping that Oregon and Washington went down to Southern Cal and Utah and that did not happen. Hummer, what did you see in Oregon's dub and Washington's dub in those games? Well, Washington just continues to be a team that squeaks by. Um, I mean, Texas and Washington in that way and really Florida state have that in common. Like um, obviously Texas has a loss and the other two programs don't, but they're playing a ton of close games and, I don't think, I mean, in the Texas case, you can tell because they've blown three 20 point leads in the last four weeks, but the other two teams, like they end up winning by bigger margins than the game would actually show. Um, Washington's defense is a real problem. Um, they're kind of like a, uh, like a luxury brand USC in a way, right? Like nicer reputation, but the same issue, elite offense with a problematic defense. Um, and Michael Penix isn't playing quite as well as he was early in the year. Um, and I think if you're looking for one of those five undefeated teams to lose this week, Washington is by far the most likely on the road against Oregon State. Um, as for Oregon, I think Oregon's just really freaking good. Like, it wouldn't have shocked me at all if Oregon ran the table, finished with one loss, and beats Washington in the Pac-12 championship game. I think Oregon is legit. And I would be surprised if Oregon didn't win that game if those two teams played again. Ooh. So when you look at uh, this this week's schedule, um, Georgia at Tennessee, Missouri kind of took uh, some of the sting out of the possibility of Tennessee doing something in this game. But um, your thoughts on on Georgia and if they are on any kind of upset alert this week? I don't, I don't think so. I think what we saw yesterday or Saturday was Georgia finally having Ladd McConkey and Brock Bowers healthy together in the same starting lineup. And that makes a huge difference. Um, Georgia also obviously has other weapons, but Ladd McConkey and Ladd McConkey, I'm going to pronounce that wrong. And Brock Bowers are two of the most dynamic slot and interior threats in the country. And when you put the outside receivers, they have Donovan Lovett, um, Ra Ra Thomas, and quite a few others um, on the field together at the same time. Like Georgia is really difficult to deal with. And that Georgia defense that wasn't really playing up to Georgia's standards earlier in the year is quietly playing a lot better um, the last couple of weeks. And I think all of that is a really bad combination for Tennessee. Tennessee struggles to run the ball consistently against good competition. That's a problem against Georgia. Tennessee has a quarterback that is inconsistent and throws a lot of picks. That's a bad idea against Georgia and Tennessee's defense, which is really good against the run can be exposed deep, which is also a problem against Georgia. I think if you combine all of those things together, I think Tennessee's going to have a really tough time this week. All right, Hummer, Kyle asks hypothetical question. You'll answer them, Hummer, even though Steve Sarkeesian doesn't answer hypothetical questions. He said that after the TCU game on Saturday. But what if Texas wins out and Bama beats Georgia handedly? I think it depends on what everything, what everybody else does nationally. Um, let's, I guess if we're just going to play the scenario out, let's say the Big Ten has an undefeated team 
uh, Florida State runs the table, they're very likely to do so. And then you have a one loss Pac-12 champion. So you would have a one loss Pac-12 champion and let's say Oregon, a one loss Pac-12 or one loss SEC champion and Bama and a one loss S or Big 12 champion in Texas. I think Oregon gets in. Um, maybe Oregon gets left out, but I think Oregon, the way it's playing, gets let in in that case. And then it's Texas versus Bama. Um, I don't see how you could leave Texas out. I think head-to-head -head results matter, but I've seen the committee um, ignore head-to-head -head before in some cases. I, I wish I had a perfect answer for you there. I think I would pick Oregon and Texas to make the playoff and the SEC gets left out in general, but that's never happened before. So it's probably a stupid prediction, but I would think and I would hope the committee would honor a head to head win, especially a head to head win on the road in Texas in this case. So, what is Texas, what is Longhorn Nation cheering for, Hummer? The, the ideal way that the regular season finishes, the conference championship games finish. What are they putting on their Christmas wish list? I mean, I think more than anything, you would love Florida to beat Florida State here in a couple of weeks. That would make things a lot easier on Texas. Um, or Louisville beats Florida State in the ACC championship game. If that's the case, then I think Texas is more than likely to end with one loss no matter what. Um, I think it would be great for Texas if one of the two Big Ten teams dropped a game this weekend. Uh, Michigan has Maryland. Ohio State has Minnesota. I don't see that happening. Uh, which is potentially problematic for Texas because I can see a scenario where Michigan and Ohio State play a close game and the loser of that game sitting at 11 and one has a strong argument to get in the playoff over a one loss Texas or a one loss Pac-12 champion. Um, and I mean, if we're being frank, like I think Texas more than anything would also love for the Pac-12 to start catching some losses. Um, I think a one loss Washington is really unappealing. Um, given the way they've had to win close games this year. Um, if Oregon lost Oregon State here in two weeks, that would be a really big deal for Texas too. So if I was a Texas fan, I'd be rooting for pretty much everybody to take an L except Alabama. Yeah. How impressed were you, Michigan, going to Happy Valley and beating Penn State? I mean, running the ball the whole time in the second quarter. I know they had a pass interference call, but other than that, they just pounded those uh, nifty lions just down their throat. It was brutal, and you have coaches crying and shit. Pretty dramatic, if you ask me, but whatever. They got the dub. Their CFP hopes are still intact. How impressive was that Wolverine dub, Hummer? Yeah, man. Just also Sharon Moore just cursing live on Fox. <laughs> man. This is a children's show over here with college football. I'm just kidding. No, it was, it was great. Um, I think Michigan showed a medal that championship teams have. Um, it felt like really old school football. I think they ran the ball 32 straight times to end the game. And just sitting there on the couch, I was like, it wouldn't hurt you to throw a play action pass every once in a while, but it really – it really felt like Michigan just wanted to prove a point by running the ball down their throats the whole time. And I think Michigan showed a toughness that championship teams seem to have. I think Michigan showed a uh, ability to knock out, block out the noise that championship teams have. And I think Michigan showed that they're one of the two best teams in the country besides Georgia. I felt that way all year. I still feel like I would pick Michigan in a neutral site game against Georgia. Um, and I think Michigan in two weeks against Ohio State is going to show a similar medal. I would pick Michigan in that game, too. I think Michigan's really embraced um, internally that Michigan versus the world mindset. I know you see that on T-shirts and stuff, but like they really feel that way inside that building. And I think Michigan is really motivated. And that Penn State game exemplified that. Although if there was like one thing coming out of that game that you want to be if you're concerned with about Michigan, it's that. Uh, those offensive tackles for Michigan, especially um, the right tackle, really struggled against the speed rush. And Ohio State has plenty of edge guys that can get after the passer pretty quick. So I'll be I'll be watching that certainly. But I was pretty impressed by Michigan. Hummer with two weeks left in the regular season. This is when the Heisman Trophy voters tend to really start to narrow down their list. Who who would be your top three? I think Jaden Daniels is number one, LSU's quarterback. Um, if you look at his numbers, they're very comparable, actually better in a lot of ways to Robert Griffin in 2011 
and Lamar Jackson in 2016. Both of those quarterbacks won the Heisman, um, leading three lost teams. And I think Jaden's is playing at a level as a quarterback that no other quarterback nationally is. Um, he's carrying LSU, and I don't really think you should punish him uh, for losing three games where his defense gave up an average of 47 points a game. Um, and then I think it's Michael Penix and Bo Nix, two and three, at least, at least to me, those three quarterbacks would be at the top of, uh, top of my ballot. Yeah. yeah and it's going to be, be interesting. I mean, these last couple games are going to have a big influence on, on how things turn out. So we don't have a runaway candidate this year. It's kind of cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's wide open. And I think. Had J.J. McCarthy not only gotten to throw the ball eight times on Saturday, he would be much more <laughs> in the conversation um, because I think J.J. McCarthy was going to be given a stage here um, in two weeks against Ohio State where he would have been swept up in that. But when you combine that lack of throwing, ability, throwing opportunity and the Michigan scandal, I don't see J.J. McCarthy winning it. And I think you could probably say the same thing about Carson Beck. I think uh, the Georgia talent around him um, – turns a lot of voters off. So I think there are other places where voters can go and it, it does feel more wide open than it has in a long time. Yeah. All right, Hummer, does Oregon state have any chance to take down the Huskies this week? As Rio 1492 says, those angry beavers are dangerous. Angry beavers definitely are dangerous. Um, I, one time my dad hit a beaver in Iowa um, on the road. Um, that was, it was like 80 pounds, like oh. made it down in the car. Beaver was definitely angry. Wouldn't have messed with that thing. So <laughs> anyway, not an important story, but just something I always remember about beavers. Um, and I think Oregon state is pretty well set up to potentially win this game. The game's at home in Corvallis, which is huge. I think Oregon state has the run game to slow the game down against Oregon or against Washington. I think Oregon state has a defense, a top 30 unit nationally, that's at least good enough to slow down Michael Penix. To me, it really comes down to how well DJ Uyongalele plays. Um, if he plays well, um, doesn't turn over the ball, I think Oregon State has an excellent chance of pulling this upset. Um, I think you could even make an argument Oregon State should be favored at home. Um, yeah, Vegas has really him as a two and a half point favorite, has Ooh. Oregon State. Wow. Okay. So there you go. I didn't realize Vegas had him favored. I haven't looked through the lines yet this week. So yeah, I mean, I think Oregon State's perfectly capable of it. Washington, I believe, has won like four or five straight games by a possession or less. Like after a while, that catches up to you unless you're TC last year, I suppose. Um, and I think there's definitely a chance Oregon State's on, or Washington is on upset alert this week. All right, Hummer. Texas. Minus seven and a half at Iowa State. Your thoughts? Weird stuff happens in Ames. Like I don't, I don't know if I have any thoughts. Like Texas should win this game. Like, but if Texas keeps coughing up the ball the way it has, if Texas keeps um, struggling to hold leads like it has, like I could pretty easily see an upset. Um, night game in Ames is just a scary proposition. I think it's going to be like what thirty degrees on Saturday night. Ooh. Like. Not a not a good environment uh, for a bunch of Southern kids um, and Southerners. Um, thankfully, I'm not making that road trip like I'm sure Chip is. Um, that's weather's not for me. Um, I would still pick Texas. I just don't. I just don't think Iowa State has the horses to pull this upset. Um, this isn't even like last year's team where they had a pretty elite receiver that made things difficult for Texas in that game. Like this Iowa State team is winning because of a solid defense, good coaching and a really strong run game. Um, and it's really hard to run against Texas. I think that is the thing that has been most consistent about Texas all year. It's very hard to run against them. And while the Jonathan Brooks injury news really does hurt, um, I still think Texas is going to be able to run against that 3-3-5 John Heacock front. Um, I don't know if I picked Texas to cover, but I do think Texas wins on Saturday. Yeah, I'm intrigued to see Jaden Blue a little bit. You know, that kid seems to have a, uh... You know, pretty good sized chip on his shoulder. He's trying to show everybody he can he can do it. I know I don't know how much they trust him in blitz pickup and with Quinn Ewers in the state that he's in. I I told Zay my biggest concern at running back is blitz pickup because you've got to protect Quinn Ewers. Absolutely. Um, and with an AC joint, not an injury of ever experience, but if you jostle that thing the wrong way, it could be a really long 
long evening for Quinn Ewers. And um, I, the thing I, I wouldn't wonder about Quinn is like um, if he gets hit a couple times, like, does he start getting happy feet again? Like we've seen much more consistency out of Quinn Ewers this year, but um, an injury last year really caused that. And that's when the turnovers really started to pile up. And um, if Texas can avoid turning over the football and keep Quinn Ewers clean, like I think they win this game pretty handily, but uh, that's not been the easiest thing for Texas all season. Yeah. Hummer, you're the man. What, uh, just uh, your gut instinct, do you think Quinn Ewers is back next season? Um, I don't know if I have a gut instinct on that one, Chip. Um, yeah. I think it's closer to 50-50 than 90-10, um, like you reported. I will say that. I think a lot of it, um, it's it's an interesting QB class. Like, obviously, Caleb Williams and Drake May are at the top of it. But and then you got guys like Michael Penix, Bo Nix. But I think Quinn Ewers, like, if he can put a couple more good weeks on tape, will still be viewed on a different level of um, talent and priority for teams than some of those, like, six-year seniors. Like, it's just a different conversation with Quinn compared to some of those guys. So, I think it just kind of depends on what the feedback in the draft is um, and how the Ewers family feels about it. Because at the end of the day, like he's has a good rest. If he finishes strong the rest of the season, he's probably going to be a first rounder. It's just like, are they comfortable with potentially being a back half of the first round quarterback or do they want to roll the dice and try to come back next year and try to be a top 10 quarterback? Um, yeah. And I don't have a crystal ball on that one, at least right now. Yeah. Last one for me, Homer, before we let you go. How surprised are you that CJ Stroud is already taking over the league his rookie season? Moderately surprised. I mean, this is a this was a quarterback in college who didn't run. Um, I thought he was a system product in a lot of ways. I thought he was being carried by his uh, elite wide receivers, and I was very wrong about that. Um, I mean, CJ Stroud's making music happen with guys like Tank Dell. I'm like, no offense to Tank Dell, but like. He's just playing lights out. Um, he was the best quarterback, one of the best quarterbacks I've ever seen in person in terms of seven on seven setting. I remember him lighting up the 2019 opening. He was so freaking good that weekend. And uh, yeah, um, he sees the field really well. He processes. And uh, I'm a little jealous as a Dallas Cowboys fan, to be honest. <laughs> Hummer, you're the best, man. We look forward to it every week. Thanks so much. Absolutely, y'all. Thanks so much. Thanks, Hummer. Right. Appreciate you. Chris Hummer national college football writer for 24 seven sports. He's a winner just like Apple leasing is a winner. And here's the thing. Some of you are like, I can't afford a new car. I can't afford a new car. I can't. Afford. Okay. Hold on a minute. Let's talk about Apple leasing because Apple leasing is going to get you into a better car than you thought you could afford. Cause you're not paying for the future trade in value of that car. And you're getting into a brand new car. You're picking everything, the interior, the exterior, any make or model of car. And that is where the magic happens. They don't care what car you pick. They just want you to be happy. They're going to ask you questions to make sure that you're getting the car that is going to make you happy. They'll, they'll talk it out with you, you know, in terms of what your needs are. You hauling kids around, you hauling stuff around for work. Um, you know, and then you're going to get into a car it's brand new. It's under warranty. You're loving it. And if in a couple of years you decide, you know what? I really want to change make and model of car. No problem. The easy lease. That's what Apple leasing has. The easy lease. If you lease from a dealership, they're not going to let you out of their, of, of the lease agreement because they want you to stay in their car. Apple leasing does not care about what car you want to drive. They're just going to go get it for you. And that's what it, that's where the magic happens. So take it from me. I've been a client for 15 years. Give them a call. 346-9977. Appleleasing.com. Whether you want your payments in the $400 range or a Range Rover, they're going to get it for you. Appleleasing.com. All right, Zay. A um, lot, of, lot of stuff going on. And... You know, the uh, there's there's a tricky element to the Quinn Ewers, you know, is Quinn Ewers staying or going story. And that is, you know, Quinn may feel one way, his family may, his dad may feel another. And that's where you have to give yourself some wiggle room because 
I've said previously, I don't think it was totally Quinn Ewer's idea to leave early to go to Ohio State and take NIL money. And I do think Quinn wants control of the decision making now. And if you asked him right now with a busted up AC joint in his shoulder, yeah, he's going to say, I'm probably coming back. Um, but there's he has not he has not gotten his evaluation from the NFL, um, which he will get, and that's going to have a big influence because they're going to tell him if he's a first or second round pick. If you're not a first or second round pick, they tell you to go back to school. So that will have a lot to do with it, and I think you know when I reported a week ago 50-50, I feel like that's still where we are. There's a lot that has to play out. And so I think, um, you know, I get, uh, I get the reports flying around. One report came out saying he was, you know, 90% going to come back to Texas. He might end up coming back to Texas, but there's still a lot of stuff that is going to play out here. So, um, you know, when you really stop and consider the fact that A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, J.T. Sanders are probably all moving on to the NFL. Um, he's starting over at skill, talent, that kind of thing, going into the SEC. Um, you know, this, this will play out. So I think uh, stay tuned is what I would say to everyone who's curious about this. Yeah, there's a lot of football to play. I mean, if it works out in Texas's favor, like everybody wants it to, then Texas makes the college football playoff. And if Quinn Ewers lights up the college football playoff, whether that's they play two games or one in the CFP, then I think his decision should be based on that. I don't think he could go out and say right now with a lot of season left to play that he's coming back or going to the league. You know, I don't, I don't believe that one bit until I hear Quinn Ewers on the press conference say something that, and I ain't going to really believe much. And I think he's not focused on that right now. He's focused on this season and potentially getting the horns, a big 12 championship, something that hasn't been done in a very long while and go from there. You know, I mean, from, with the AC joint and all these things, you know, he's been injury prone. We know the hernia situation that he dealt with in high school, like Quinn Ewers, it's been a while since he's played a full year of healthy football. You know, and if I'm an NFL scout, I'm wondering, man, if he's getting hurt on the high school and college level, then what happens when Aaron Donald sits on his ass? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's a Didn't whole win. different ball game. That's a whole different ball game. They might let them know, like, hey, bro, I know you cut back on the Chick-fil-A, but you want to get to the next level. You might want to start eating it again. You know what I'm saying? You might need some cane protein from yeah, our yeah. man John Brown. Exactly. That cane protein, which Amon Ra had himself another big-time game. Shout out to your Lions getting that three-point dub against the Chargers. But I think I digress a little bit. Quinn yours, yeah, I – Again, he has all the potential in the world. I still think that he has some struggles in the college game of just, you know, processing things. And sometimes some of these passes are like, what the hell are you doing? What the hell are you looking at? Kind of like the interception that he threw where we're not talking about it very much because we were talking about Jordan Whittington and Xavier Worthy. Yeah, Jordan Whittington and Worthy tracking down that uh, interception and forcing the fumble. So that you don't really see uh, the damage or, you know, there wasn't damage. I think there was an exchange of about three yards on that play from where they started to where they finished. But yeah, he hung it up there and the safety got over and picked it off. Yeah. And then he went back to it and he threw a little tighter, you know, a little more of a rope and worthy, perfect pass, worthy caught it. Um, that should have been a touchdown. How did he fall? What happened there? Like, come he said on, he was still, he said he was still tired from having just raced to recover the fumble. That's fair. That's fair. He don't come out the game much, so I get it. 
Yeah. Like and he said he was winded because he, when he recovered the fumble, I think he got the air knocked out of him a little bit because he went flying, you know, on some Eddie Guerrero frog splash type shit, WWE stuff. And yeah, I get it. Again, Zay ain't, a, you know, what, a buck 60 soaking wet, 65? Yeah, they you know, list 165. Me at 162. Ooh. Yeah, that's light. That's light. So that's why I'm so impressed with how aggressive he's been with the ball in his hands, man. Like, he will stiff arm you. He will juke you. He'll lower his shoulder to get extra yardage. He knows he's not going to run over anybody. But to get an extra few yards for your team, that says a lot to me. That says how much you wanted and, you know, how tough you are. Because his toughness was questioned, especially last year. The dude had a broken freaking hand, which we only found out towards the end of the year year or after the season excuse me and everybody longhorn faithful they were like what the hell what is he doing out there this and that and like well the dude's tough you can't help him being tough if he says that he could play then with all the option that you had last year throw him out there and let it roll do i think quinn ewers could have threw it to other guys more like jordan winnington and jt sanders yeah but if what we're seeing now of Xavier Wordy, if that could have happened last year, you definitely would have taken that, Horns fans. It just didn't. And now Xavier Wordy is really showing his ass, 10 catches, 137 yards in Fort Worth. Like, And the, the, uh, uh, the game plan is to stop him and to slow him down. He gets back bracket coverage all the time. Like he had the number one corner for TSU on him, shadowing him the whole game. Like that's real old school, uh, Chip. Like, they had him following Xavier Worthy, Josh Newton, all game long. Guys don't really do that. They kind of get away from that because they don't want to mess up everybody else's assignments. Like, Sonny Dykes was like, hell no. We're going to put our best guy on their best guy because he's that dangerous. And that should be a salute to Xavier Worthy and how good he is. Yeah, and he he uh, drew two penalties from Josh Newton in the first half and yep. and on third down. I mean, people forget TCU committed three third down penalties in in that game to extend drives for Texas. And um, that that's rare. That's rare when a team commits three third down penalties to extend drives. So that helped Texas build that 26 to six lead. It wasn't remember, Texas went two of eight on third and three or shorter. That's scary. That, yeah. And the worst call of all was that third and one bubble screen, but we've, we've beaten that horse until it's lifeless. Um, oh, that horse still alive. Yeah. Don't ever do that again. Sorry, we, I'm still caller. beating that damn horse. That horse still alive, man. And we're probably making some of some amount of in eating that thing. That's how bad it was. Like I get it. John Tay cook. You want to give him some reps, but we could do it at better time. Sark read the room, read the game. Jonathan Brooks just had a nine yard run. Let's give it to him again. You know what I'm saying? Like that's just well, and yours still he's still not seeing the field completely because he had a third down play to Worthy where he was double covered. And Jordan Whittington, you know, it, he was just short of the sticks, but there was no one around him. Like if you'd had thrown it to Whittington, he turns up field, he gets the first down, and that that part still bothers me. It's like, it's like yours has, and, and, and you know, he threw it 10 times to him in the OU game. I get that, but there are times where Whittington is just wide open underneath and they don't see him. And so that, that part of yours game needs to, maybe it'll improve now with the injury. Maybe he's more aware. I don't know, but that he's got to know where his security blankets are, know where his bailouts are and, and not try to, you know, make those hero throws. Uh, I get it. Where these electric. So is AD Mitchell, but sometimes you just got to take what the defense has given you. And that's usually Jordan Whittington on a crosser. So um or an outright yeah, yeah that that play that you bring up it wasn't like xavier worthy wasn't open he just lofted it 
and made it right. a jump ball between Xavier Wordy and Josh Newton. And then he allowed the safety to come over and be a part of it too. Like that was a weird ball, which, yeah, you're right. It should have went to Jordan with a 10, but Xavier Wordy was open. He just didn't throw it the right, right way. Like it should have been, it should have had a lot more heat on it to where Xavier Wordy could catch it in stride going towards the sideline, but he had to stop and jump for it. And yeah, that was just a bad play and going to Ames, like you got to make that throw or you got to take the easy stuff. Like Jordan Winnington and Jatavion Sanders, they should be huge in this game. They should be. Like if you're sending Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy up the field 20 yards and they're going to get all the attention, then those guys underneath who are on one on one coverage, they should be able to beat their man. And when they have the ball in their hands, make something happen. They're capable. Jordan Winnington showed you that in the OU game. Like, he is capable of having a big-time game when those other two wide receivers I just named, five and one, when those guys were getting all the attention. So can J.T. Sanders. Like, J.T. Sanders bailed Quinn Ewers out a couple of times in Fort Worth with some passes that worked the best. But J.T. Sanders is just such a physical specimen. He caught those things and it was allowed and allowed this Texas offense to keep on moving the chain. So, you know, while that's on Sark and A.J. Milwey, letting Quinn know, like A.J. Milwey, that's why you're on the field now and not in the booth, to let Quinn know, hey, bro, I know that you were looking at this, but how about you look at J.T.? How about you look at Jordan Winnington? Those guys are open. Maybe even C.J. Baxter on check down stuff. You know, like that, those things, they got to happen more. And sometimes, you know, even with Quinn, like which who had a terrific game, you know, not being 100 percent, 23 for 33, as good as he was, there are a couple of throws out there that I know that he wish he would have gotten back. Yeah. And the, the amazing thing, when you watch the game Saturday night, Iowa State plays there, you'll see four guys cross behind the three down linemen and they're about four yards behind the three down linemen, and then you've got the three safeties and the middle safety is the leading tackler on the team. He's the guy who usually comes down. If you've got worthy and AD Mitchell taking those, you know, corners and safeties a little further back, the middle of the field should be there for Jordan Whittington and on out routes usually, but crossers, it's up to Quinn yours to read how they're playing, you know, which safety is going to drop down. And, and so Quinn saw this defense last year. It was a struggle, but he's seen it a lot. I mean, he, he's seen it a lot now because K state and TCU also play that three high safety look. So um, this, this is a game where Quinn yours experience should, should come in big. All right, let's, uh, let me remind you as we head into the holiday season about Great Blue Heron Furniture um, and just go to greatblueheronfurniture.com and see what we're talking about. This is high end furniture, leather furniture, you know, the different shades of leather, the bar stools, the couches, the, the love seats, the recliner. And don't forget to use the promo code HOOKEM. That is the Texas Sports Unfiltered promo code. You're going to get 15% off. Um, your purchase. So make sure that you're using the promo code HOOKEM. And when you're sitting on your great blue hair and furniture, you need to be watching your big screen from audiovisual consultations, AV consultations, real simple. They bring everything to you. Don't go shopping around for TVs or surround sound. Let Tom and his crew bring everything to you. All you need to do is call 255-8678. Tom has been putting audio visual equipment into your favorite restaurants in Austin for 20 years. Um, let him do it for you. He's done it for me in three different houses. Uh, it's the best audio visual consultations, two, five, five, eight, six, seven, eight. All right, let's, uh, let's bring in our man, Hank South of horns 24 seven. We always like to get Hank's take on, the news of the day before we get into recruiting, although the news of the day has a lot of impact on recruiting because obviously Jimbo Fisher getting canned at AM. Um, Hank, with Jimbo out at AM, um, have you been able to kind of quantify like how many kids 
who were seriously considering Texas before they maybe committed to A and M uh, are in play here. Yeah, it, it's you know a handful at least. Um, when the news broke on Sunday morning, you know we kind of broke down um, you know where Texas was you know most in play, and we kind of narrowed it down to about five names in terms of Texas A and M's commitment list, and they were. Um, uh, Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker from Jasper, Dominic McKinley, the defensive lineman from Louisiana. These are all Texas A&M commits. Uh, Miles Davis, the safety from Converse, Texas. Um, Blake Ivey, the offensive la- tackle from League City. And then uh, I have the, the last one's escaping me. Oh, Terry Bussey, the five-star athlete from uh, Timpson. Um, and so as we kind of dug deeper into those, you know, we, we saw Sunday, you know, there was all sorts of Twitter reaction. We saw, you know, the, the recruits getting on Twitter, you know, cry face emojis or, you know, thinking emojis, that kind of stuff. You know, you kind of have to navigate that, you know, at your own risk. But um, some of the guys have come out, Dominic McKinley, the four-star defensive lineman, he came out and said he was behind Elijah Robinson, the defensive line coach, so associate head coach. That's now the interim head coach in College Station. Um, said he's 100% with them. You know, is the next coach going to retain Elijah Robinson? I think it would be very wise to do so <laughs> if you want to hang on to some of these guys. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I think that will be dependent upon that. Uh, Miles Davis came out, said the same thing. You know, he was locked in. He was all for Coach Robinson, um, said the same thing in his Twitter or his tweet. Uh, Miles Davis is expected to be at the Texas Tech game next Friday. So that's when we've been watching Jimbo Fisher as head coach or not. You know, he's still been talking to Texas. So that's something we're going to keep an eye on. I think the most interesting one, and, and Jordan Scruggs on Horns 24-7 has been all over this um, since Sunday, is Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker. Um, obviously Texas doesn't have a linebacker committed um, in this 2024 class. The plan has been to take at least one um, and, and, you know, contact has remained with him, um, Justin Williams, the Georgia commit. But I think with this Jimbo Fisher news, I think that really opens the door for Texas to potentially get it done here with Ty Anthony Smith and flip him into their class. So, you know, I think he is going to wait to see who Texas uh, A&M names as their next head coach. I would imagine, you know, that's going to be pre December, you know, they're going to have to have a guy lined up for these, you know, contact period visits, in-home visits in the month of December. Otherwise, this class, the transfer portal, I mean, it's, they're just going to get eaten alive if they don't, in, in my opinion. Um, and that's why I think we saw the news with Fisher on Sunday. So, um, yeah, so I, I think Ty Anthony Smith, best shot there. Blake Ivey, Terry Bussey, we'll see. Um, I think those are a little bit more outside shots. Um, but, yeah, those three. And then, you know, we'll see how it impacts, obviously, Texas A&M's roster, guys looking elsewhere that Texas has recruited in the past um, beyond that. So, yeah, definitely a lot of news to cover and unpack there. Yeah, Hank, how surprising is the firing to you? Because you could easily look at the situation. And if I'm Jimbo, I'm saying, hey, I'm finally getting those five star guys. NIL is working like give me some extra time so I can flip it into something positive. And obviously they were like, hell no, you've had your time. But you saw the recruiting class of 2022, all the guys that you just named, like Texas A&M's never had the number one recruiting class beating out Alabama and beating the Georgias of the world. And they finally have. And instead of building on that, they got rid of the guy. For 75 mil, like it seemed pretty drastic if you ask me for a guy that was, yeah, it's not, you know, obviously the expectations are a little unrealistic, but again, he's bringing guys in. He just hasn't been able to develop those five stars that he's brought in yet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you look at their classes, they weren't struggling. Like you said, they weren't landing. I mean, they have landed the top class before, but um, you know, he's recruited well since he's been, been the head coach there. You know, they, ha- they haven't had any trouble bringing in elite talent. It just hasn't panned out. They've been so inconsistent. You know, I am surprised, you know, I, I thought they'd probably give him at least one more year, especially, you know, with the changes coming to the SEC, you know, you probably want a little bit of sub- stability um, going into that situation. Obviously you're hosting Texas next year, big changes on the horizon. So I was thinking, you know, keep this class together, see what they can do in the portal. You got Wagman back next year, uh, you know, see what happens, but obviously, you know, that they want to go in a different direction. And it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I don't know who they hire that's, like a a huge splash, you know, outside of maybe Dan Lanning, who's already said he's committed to Oregon, you know, he's not going anywhere, obviously saying and doing is one thing. He sounds like he's staying at Oregon, Um, but the other, you know, candidates, you kind of look at, it's like, okay, you know, but yeah, I I was surprised it happened, especially when it happened. But again, I think Sark mentioned it too, you know, they, they, I think the timing here was to, you know, get ahead of this early signing period and, you know, try to, you know, keep this class together and, uh, and, you know, see what they can do in the portal, kind of maybe similar to what, um, you know, Deion Sanders did at Colorado last year when he was able to come in 
and get some really big names in that, you know, three week window um, once he got to Boulder. Hank uh, Ike says Evan Stewart will look great as a long <laughs> You think there's any uh, A&M uh, kids on the roster who might end up uh, looking elsewhere, possibly Evan Stewart? Yeah, I think that's that's the one name I, I would mention, you know, on Texas A&M's roster. Um, and I think we're, you know, we're going to wear out his name in the next, you know, two months. It'd be funny to look at like Evan Stewart, Texas Longhorn, like how much that's being Googled right now or something, you know, the the surge population, all that stuff. But no, I mean, obviously he was committed to Texas once. Um, you know, he's going to be he's going to be fielding some phone calls, I'm sure, once this transfer portal window. I mean, it already is open for A&M. You know, they, they can already be actively recruited. So. Um, you know, I'm sure his camp is busy, you know, we'll see, I, I know, again, I think a lot of these, these kids are going to wait to see who they hire. Cause you know, if they hire a coach that, you know, throws the ball a lot, um, that might be looked like a good spot for him. So, you know, you, you just got to kind of wait and see, see what they're going to do. But no, I mean, I, I would totally imagine, I think wide receivers of spot Texas definitely wants to dip into the portal potentially for, you know, you got Ryan Wingo, obviously that's a huge pickup. But again, you're going to be losing guys like Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, most likely, probably Jatavian Sanders. We'll see. Jordan Whittington. You're losing your top guys there. Um, so certainly, you know, you want veteran experience if you can get that. And, you know, with a guy like Evan Stewart, that's not just like veteran experience. That's like elite caliber wide receiver one experience. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. But um, I, 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 I'm not sure if Texas has reached out yet, um, but I, I would definitely think they'd test the waters with Evan Stewart for sure. Is there if if it ends up being a guy like Jeff Trailer or Mike Elko, um, you know, just on the surface from a recruiting standpoint, what you know what comes to your mind? Yeah, I honestly I was looking like if they hire Jeff Trailer, you know, I, th I think like outsider fans that don't really pay attention to the recruiting landscape and whatnot, they'd be like, oh, the UTSA head coach, Jeff Trailer. I mean, that would be a home run hire for Texas A and M. That guy is so embedded into the Texas high school football culture. I've never met a person that doesn't love Jeff trailer. I think Longhorn fans would probably be a little conflicted if he was the head coach at Texas A&M because everyone loves him. Um, and so, you know, I, I think from a recruiting standpoint, and then Elko obviously has ties to A&M. Um, he's done wonders at Duke with, you know, what, what they're able to do in terms of recruiting and, and who they can get in and, you know, the conference they play in. So I, I think both of those, either, either of those guys, I think would be, a great hire. Um, it would, you know, be stability, proven head coaches, guys that can recruit, particularly trailer, I think in the state of Texas, you know, I, I think they could really probably hold this class together um, and, and, and be a lucrative spot for, for the transfer portal as well. So I think either of those guys would be a massive, uh, massive win um, in turn, you know, if you're comparing it to like, uh, I'm trying to think who else was on the, the, like Dan Quinn or like Dan Campbell or, you know, even Lane Kiffin, you know, I'm not, I don't, it doesn't, I don't know if Lane Kiffin would, would work at A&M. So, you know, but who knows? Yeah. He could have his weird dog and Reveille do the nasty <laughs> and on the field. That'd be something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Hank. Waddell Mack, cornerback, just flipped from Florida. Now he's going to Texas. That's big time for Sark, getting the four-star guy. And we know Sark. We've talked about it before when you came on Chip and Zay here on Texas Sports Unfiltered about Sark, loving those six-foot cornerbacks, you know, those Ryan Watts type guys. And, yeah, this is a big time flip. Tell us a little something about Mac. Yeah, it was kind of – it was really refreshing. It was like as a recruiting reporter when, like, you talk about somebody for so long and you're like, hey – you know, we, we've been reporting in um, on the Stampede on Horns 24-7, you know, at least five times throughout the fall. You know, there's optimism about Wardell Mack. You know, he's committed to Florida. He's still docking to Florida State. You know, LSU wants to keep him home. But there's optimism around Texas that they can eventually flip him. And, you know, I, I had my crystal ball in Texas when he originally committed to Florida. So I took the early L there, but obviously can't change it after he's committed. So it's, it's refreshing to see that eventually pan out from your reporting, but no, a huge win. Um, you know, that that's been the area of need that, you know, Texas to close out this class, you know, I think defensive line and in uh, the secondary, you know, Kobe Black's still out there, but Wardell Mack was probably in that top five, if not higher, um, you know, priority targets remaining at the high school level. And so, you know, to, to get him on board um, now, huge win. Um, 
you know, his scouting report, uh, like you were just saying, you know, Sark loves those guys. He, especially kids from Louisiana, like, are always really good football players. You know, regardless of what classification they play in, even if they're three star, Wardle Max, a top two, four, seven kid. But, you know, I, I think about Melvin Hills now, the defensive lineman that's committed to Texas. Like, they're always just, they're just ballers. Like, they, they can just play football. Um, and and I, I think, you know, Wardle Mack, that's his, the first thing on his scouting report on the 24 7 page is flat out, I wrote it down, flat out uh, football player. You know, he plays quarterback, he plays wide receiver, defensive back. He returns kicks. He can do everything. He's a three-year starter at a pretty big-time program in the New Orleans metro area. And, uh, you know, all these staffs are pushing for him. You know, a guy like Corey Raymond, who had been at LSU, um, knew about him, went to Florida, got him in the class. You know, that says a lot about him, obviously, with the development he's been able to have with defensive backs um, at the next level. Um, I, I think it just kind of, that's just another indicator of, you know, how highly thought of Wardle Mack was for a lot of college coaching staff. So I know Texas is thrilled to get him. Um, it was a big win for Terry Joseph. You know, he obviously has ties to the state of Louisiana. And uh, I think those play a big role in, in, uh, in Mack feeling comfortable and, and uh, changing his mind on and, and committing to Texas. You mentioned Kobe Black. I know he was playing the emoji game um, after the, the Jimbo news yeah. or, I, I think, I guess, but what, uh, what's your read on uh, your latest read on Kobe black and especially with the Wardell Mac news? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, everyone was wondering, you know, is, is that he, he tweeted, it was like, mm, like a bunch of M's and the thought like, tw like Twitter or Twitter, Twitter deciphering is like the hardest thing to do sometimes. And you kind of just have to, you know, Hey, they said this, you know, take it for what you will. But um, no, I don't think it hurts. You know, I think those two guys were, have been the biggest priority defensive back targets. You know, Kobe black knows he's, he's wanted in Austin and, and we've talked about it. He's likely going to probably end up playing safety if he does commit to Texas. So, you know, they're two different positions. Um, and obviously there's going to be competition in that area um, going forward. So, you know, Kobe black, you know, I, I still like where Texas stands for him. Um, you know, we'll see. I, I know there's been a lot of buzz and people report, you know, if you're, if you're going to commit to a school, you probably should do it before the transfer portal window opens because you just don't know who's going to be available, what spots are going to fill up. I'm not saying Kobe Black is never going to not going to have a spot in this Texas class, but I, I think, you know, you'll probably see kids start to make decisions and maybe feed off of that and decide to, to set commitment dates. But he's told us several times he's not just going to spur of the moment commit. He's going to call a, uh, you know, a commitment ceremony at his high school. So, we should be there when it happens, um, and, and we'll have more details on that. But um, I still like Texas for Kobe Black. And interestingly enough, Kobe Black's team is playing um, Tang Anthony Smith's team this weekend in the playoffs. So Jordan Scruggs is going to be there and should have some good uh, good intel coming out of that game. Yeah. Hank, with Texas barely squeaking out another dub against TCU, now we all know they're going to be without Jonathan Brooks for the rest of the season. How confident are you in freshman C.J. Baxter just picking up the slack and, you know, helping the Horns get to a Big 12 title? Yeah, it's hard to, you know, just say, you know, he can come in and, and pick up the slack because, you know, how impactful Jonathan Brooks was, not just as a, you know, a football player. I think, you know, he's just a locker room guy too. I think guys feed off his energy and, you know, passion he brings so that that's a it's a huge hole to fill but again you know you look back to you know september cj baxter was the starter like i mean he he can play and so now that obviously he's 100 percent healthy um maybe we can see them really let him loose you know obviously they have a full week of game prep um to you know him as the him as the guy um and you know plays they can draw up things they can do to get him into space you know we'll we'll see so i, I think he can certainly fill in you know having quinn ewers back is obviously helpful i think I think it, uh, you know, Brooks's impact, you know, in that two game stretch with Malik Murphy as the starter was, was huge just to have that guy back there with you. That's almost like a quarterback kind of in the, in the offense, just with what, what he can do and the pressure he can kind of take off you. So, you know, I, I think Baxter can certainly fill in. Um, I'm excited to see Jaden blue. You know, I think he can, you know, give the offense some more spark. Uh, obviously Keelan Robinson, maybe we'll see play. Um, but no, I, I think they can, you know, again, you know, they, they have time to prepare for this. Obviously it's not the most ideal time going into a very hostile environment like Ames, Iowa at nighttime, but, uh, you know, in a situation where, you know, you, you kind of want to have a strong running game to rely on if, if, uh, you know, the passes aren't connecting for yours, but, um, they both have enough experience. I think Baxter, you know, can definitely fill in. Well, I, I don't think he's gonna have as big of an impact as Brooks, but I think he can, uh, you know, I think he can keep this thing going. Hank, you're the man. Yeah. One more so, for me, yeah. Hank. One more for me, Hank. Trey Johnson. Can yeah. he sign tomorrow? What's going on? Basketball, baby. Man, I checked with some sources. You know, they're 
I've, you know, I, I saw a prediction on another site, you know, they, they projected him to Texas. Um, you know, we've been writing, I think the positive buzz is for Texas. I just don't know he's going to sign. I, I feel like he's going to, you know, he has until I guess tomorrow at midnight, I think, you know, the, there's the one week window with this regular signing period. I know, uh, you know one source text told me he's not done yet. Um, so, you know, they're still fighting tooth and nail with Baylor. Um, they both want to get him, but I, I think Texas has a, has a good shot here. Is he going to commit for tomorrow? I couldn't say. I, I lean towards yes, but um, you know we'll we'll see. But I like Texas's chances right now. Yeah. You know what's underrated, Hank, is the fact that he's not going to have to play his pops alma mater next season, going to the SEC. Yeah, that, like that. I think that's huge. If they were still in the Big Twelve, I'd be a little worried. But going to the SEC, he can make his own name. He ain't got to yeah. worry about his pops' legacy and all that with Baylor. I, I think that's a big deal. Really yeah, no, it. absolutely. That can certainly be something they're they're talking about. Yeah. Even more reason to get over to Horns 24-7 and keep up with all the latest recruiting from our man Hank South, Jordan Scruggs. Hank, thanks so much, man. No problem. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Hank. Appreciate yeah. you. Yep. What a week this has been. Yo, I want Trey Johnson bad, Chip. I, that dude, I love his game. Smooth. Reminds me just that, like Bradley Bill when he was coming out of St. Louis and went to Florida to play for Billy Donovan. Just a smooth jumper. He will play D, so you don't got to worry about that, Coach Terry. And, yeah, I think he wants to play college too. I think he wants to embrace that because you saw what happened to A.J. Johnson going to play in Australia and Ron Holland, who had 11 turnovers in his first G League game, just saying, I know, Ron, you're getting that 500000 That's cool and all, but that speed of the G League game, yeah, man, you're going to have to get used to that. So, Ron Holland, 11 turnovers in your first game, getting beat by 40, not a good look. But, hey, hey, he that's what he chose. He got to live with it. He chose that, didn't want to come to UT, which he could have been a big help this season. Oh, well, whatever. That's in the past. But, yeah, uh, Trey Johnson, that would be a huge get for Rodney Terry to go along with the rest of that 2024 class that he has coming in. You know what else would be a huge get? A huge get would be going to Salt Traders Coastal cooking for happy hour tonight, 6, 3.30 to 6.30. And you're eating off the beginnings menu. Five dollars off the beginnings menu. And let me tell you something: that beginnings menu, you can eat family style, like a king and queen. You're getting the the uh, New Orleans barbecued shrimp. You're getting the grilled oysters. You're getting the chowder fries. You are loving it. So, you want a great date night place to go? Why don't you uh, surprise your significant with a trip to Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. Um, happy hour every night from 3.30 to 6.30. All night happy hour on Monday night when you can kind of work the date night and Monday night football. You know what I'm saying? But this is our man, Jack Gilmore, who uh, gave you Jack Allen's Kitchen. This is his seafood restaurant. Got location in Zilker. And in Round Rock, Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. Um, and real quick, Brain Vault. For all you, you know, sports-minded parents, team managers, Brain Vault is the best mouth guard to protect your, your child, whether, the, whether it's cheerleading, lacrosse, basketball, um, patented, proven to reduce the effects of concussion, and fits like you cannot believe. Take it from me. I have my own Brain Vault mouth guard. And it fits so well, you almost don't even want to take it out. Um, it's the best. And it's from our man, Dr. Greg Eckert, right here in Austin, Texas. It's the choice of Bijan Robinson. Um, it needs to be the choice of your kids, your team. They do group fittings. They will come to you. All you have to do is set up an appointment at brainvault.com. All right, Zay. Um, chip shot today is this, this five-star culture thing. That Iowa State is the champion of the five-star culture, and now 
Texas and its culture are going to be tested. And let's see. It's been so good. The culture has has been so good all year. Um, they've rallied around each other. They've answered the call. Um, they, you know, lost that game to Oklahoma after having a lead, taking the lead with a minute 17 left. You almost still can't believe it, but it's, it's football. So you've had injuries, you've had to endure, you've had to survive. You're trying to get to the finish line and you may be limping, but if everybody pulls together and continues to rely on this culture and playing for each other and trying to get to the championship and, you know, guys like Jordan Whittington, who Steve Sarkeesian, I thought, put it really eloquently yesterday. He said, Jordan Whittington came back to win a championship. He wants to leave here a champion. And all of the dirty work that he's doing that goes unnoticed in the stat box is getting noticed in the NFL. Like Jordan Whittington has New England Patriots written all over him. For his sake, I hope he goes someplace better, you know, like my Detroit Lions, you know. So all right, all right. <laughs> I'm just saying the culture has been on. You wanted to have him benched, by the way. Um, hey. Me, you wanted to have him benched. And I just Cook. wanted a couple of that. reps. Okay, all right. Don't, now you want him on the Lions? You go from him to on the Lions? How does Don't that work? Don't use the B word. I didn't use the B word. I just <laughs> said, can I get a couple reps? For my man, Jonte Cook, because at one point, Jonte had a 26-yard catch and a 50-yard catch in, like, back-to-back -back games. It's been so right. long since he's had a catch. I can't even remember what Jonte Cook looks like. Xavier Worthy almost got him killed the other night. So, <laughs> can I can I get Jonte Cook on something other than a bubble screen where pencil-thin, yeah. wispy Worthy's got a block of strong safety? Yeah, man. Um, but – right. This is it. This is it. This is everything you've been working for. Don't let doubt come into the room. Just trust it. And and Sark has usually means what he says and says what he means. And if he's pissed off and tired of watching his team's pass defense and they need to play more aggressively, then do it. Don't say it. Do it. Don't, you know, be it. So... I'm expecting that. I'm expecting that Saturday night. I think it's going to be a, a knife fight in Ames. But, look, your culture was called out by this team. And Christian Jones says we now have the five-star culture to go with the five-star talent. Okay. Then bring it. Let's see that on full display. I don't care if it's a 13-10 win. I don't care if it's a 10-7 win. Just – Show us that culture, show us that determination, show us that like the Wyoming game, 10-10 go in the fourth quarter, no problem. You kicked it into gear and you took care of business. That's what I'm looking for Saturday night. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna focus on the negatives. I'm not gonna because it's been different reasons, different things that have have caused these 20 point leads to disappear, but Last week, Sarkeesian not running the football in the third quarter ended up costing his defense in the fourth quarter. And bottom line is intensity. Sarkeesian, the play caller, needs to be dialed in. Quinn Ewers has to be protected. And the culture needs to carry them through. Yeah. I'm right there with you, man. And shout out to the offensive line being nominated for the Joe Moore Award, being the semifinalist. You heard Christian Jones talk about that before the season. That was a huge goal for him and this offensive line. And Christian Jones coming off of that injury where he missed the Kansas State game. He was a little rusty. He was, had a few false starts, and I want to say he had a hold in a big time or, or yeah, uh, just yeah. a big false start in the clutch time. I want to say it was fourth and one. And he had that false start late in the second half. And it's like, all right, Christian Jones, you're doing stuff that you did when Tom Herman was around. Let's clean it up. But overall, the offensive line, they've been steady. And they might have to have their best game. 
you know, with no Jonathan Brooks, Jonathan Brooks made a life a lot easier for you. So now you got to make some bigger holes for CJ Baxter, who has a lot of potential, but he's not 24. And Jaden Blue, who also has a lot of potential, but he's also not 24. So offensive line, they got to be on point. They got to move guys and you don't want it to come to Quinn Ewers having to make throws against this type of defense that three, three, five, it could be very just stingy. And if you're being very arrogant, trying to go against it, with just trying to throw the deep ball and not taking the inter intermediate stuff, then it could really cost you. So yeah, you're right, Chip. Sark's play calling, that has to be on point. This has to be one of Sark's best games when it comes to orchestrating his offense. And I think if you use JT Sanders and Jordan Winnington as much as possible, then that's going to benefit everybody. I mean, you can't focus on everything. There's just too many weapons for this Texas team. And I feel like sometimes they get caught up in just trying to be too cute or just trying to, you know, give it to Xavier Worthy too much and stuff, letting everybody eat. It's about to be Thanksgiving, man. Everybody eats this time of year. So let that happen for your football team, Sark. Let Jordan Winnington get a little sample. Let JT Sanders get a little sample. Let Keelan Robinson get a little sample. And obviously, Adonai Mitchell, especially when you're in the red zone, number five should be your focal point. Once you get inside the 20, 10 touchdowns this year, basically. Like, that dude, he's been a monster in the red zone. And he was open on a pass. Quinn Ewers just didn't hit him. That should have been a touchdown. So, yeah, like you got to use your best this time of the year because Jonathan Brooks, he's not walking through that door anytime soon. And as unfortunate as it is, you still got everything in front of you. And, yeah, it's going to be a test, man. It's, it's definitely going to be a test. And I'm very nervous. But at the end of the day, this Texas team, if they take that mindset, like Christian Jones said, five-star mentality or five-star players are starting to go with a five-star mentality, then they should be able to get the job done. And you got Can I tell you something left. that is funny because Larry pointed it out here too? The Christian Jones false start came on fourth and one from the TCU nine. Texas was going for it, but the false start moved them back and they kicked the field goal and they made it. Larry says, hey, Christian Jones, that was the best play. And I had buddies text me saying, Christian Jones needs to jump false start every time they're in <laughs> Short in the red zone to force Sark to kick the field goal. Damn, man. I mean, hey, I get it. I get it. Like, all the troubles that they've had this year, that's a dark logic, but it makes sense. It ironically does, but hey, yeah. Let's, we'll uh, let's get to the right call. Let's get to the right call with my man Zay Collier. Yeah, man. And before we get to the right call, shout out to Covert B Cave, the Covert Auto Group, family owned automotive dealerships that's been serving the greater Austin area for over a hundred years. They've been taking care of folks trying to take in their hoopties and just all their beat up buckets. Nah, man, quit driving those. Get to Covert B Cave and get something so much better. Seven terrific brands to choose from. You're going to find something you like, whether that's a Buick SUV or a GMC car, a Cadillac, the Escalades, they'll still go hard, man. You get a Chrysler, a Dodge, you know, they probably even find you some type of Hellcat, even though they don't make them no more. It's Covert BK, man. Ram, Jeep, anything you want, they got it. Those seven terrific brands, you will get hooked up at Covert BK. And if you're saying, Zay, man, I need to see it myself. Okay, well, you could go to the beautiful 42 acres or you could go to CovertBK.com and you'll see all the latest specials and inventory they got. So nobody beats a covert deal. Not now, not ever. All right, Chip. Oh, more family, yeah. more family getting in the way of business, man. You know, just family members can't help themselves. We had to talk about Tad Prescott with his brother last week because he was a little salty that Dallas Mavericks forward Grant Williams was rocking a throwback Jason Kelsey Philadelphia Eagles shirt. And Tad said, no, bro, you play for Dallas now. You're going to have everybody hate you and this and that. And Grant was like, dude, I'm going to support who I want to support. 
I appreciate your brother and what he does, but I'm an Eagles fan. It is what he, it is. And then Grant Williams was very petty by posting uh, Michael Parsons wearing a Philadelphia 76ers jersey. So, yeah, it goes both ways. But if you saw last night, Monday Night Football, the Buffalo Bills lose a brutal game against the Denver Broncos, which I won that one, Chip. I, I won that one. The Broncos, I had a feeling my man Sean Payton, he's ripping those balls, getting as high as he can, and that playbook is as open as Pam Anderson's legs and that Tommy Lee video. So I'm just saying, my man Sean Payton, he's as high as we ever. Him and Russell, they're out here doing their thing. But with that loss for the Buffalo Bills, Trayvon Diggs, younger brother of Stefan Diggs, who didn't play that well, and neither did Josh Allen. I want to say they had four turnovers total, and Josh Allen was throwing picks like I don't know what. He went on Twitter and said, man, 14, got to get up out of there, about his brother and Buffalo. He also went on to say, let's not forget he, he as in Josh Allen, didn't start going off till bro got there, which is absolutely true too. Josh Allen's stats and just the credit that he gets is a lot different before and when Tra uh, when uh, Stefan Diggs is there. And I, as right as Trayvon Diggs is, bro, you're literally sitting home with a broken leg, torn ACL, just talking shit just making life rough for your brother. Like, your brother don't need this. And remember, Chip, Stefan Diggs, he's pretty petty himself. Like, you remember when they lost last year to the Bengals in, uh, uh, in the playoffs? He was out before Coach could even make his goodbye speech, end of the season speech. Somebody had to bring Stefan Diggs back and be like, yo, bro, we're a team, man. Like, you got, you got to be a part of this. And Stefan was like, no, I can't take this losing much longer. Like, I'm tired of this shit. So, yeah, he's a little of a prima donna. You know, he's a wide receiver. He can't help himself. But it, the 5-5 five and five Buffalo Bills, they're not looking good right now. And Josh Allen, he's really struggling. I don't know if it's going to be a coaching change anytime soon, but – all that talent in Buffalo to be losing the games that they're losing while Cincinnati, they're getting better. And you always got to worry about the Chiefs and, you know, the Texans. Just, the Texans, exactly. The Texans are now something. With Jacksonville getting blown out by the 49ers, the Texans, which – I can't yeah, wait to ask the Bills. Yeah, man. I can't wait to ask John McClain what's good with the Texans because he guaranteed a loss, basically. He, he said, Yo, they ain't gonna beat the Bengals. I don't see it happening. And she CJ Stroud was like, All right, hold my drink. The 22-year-old went and got it done. So yeah, Buffalo, while a lot of teams are on the uprise, Buffalo's on the decline. And I don't like Tr Trayvon Dick saying this, even though he might be right. I don't stay out your brother's business, man. Let him, you know what I'm saying? Just let him go through that because now he has to deal with all the questions in Western New York about, yo, your brother said this. How do you feel about it? You know, like that's – and you know they talking. Like, come on. That's family. Stefan and Trayvon know everything about the Cowboys and what's going on with Buffalo. That's what they do. Cause that's how they relate. Like, hey, what's going on with Dak? Yo, what's Jerry doing? Yo, what's going on with Josh Allen? You know, you have, have y'all figured out the running back situation with Cook and Murray and stuff like they're gonna be chatting. So, yeah. And again, if you're a Cowboys fan, maybe it's a manipulation type thing for Trayvon Diggs trying to get Stefan to the Cowboys. I don't know if that could happen. I feel like Stefan is worth some big money and CD Lamb, he's definitely a wide receiver one. But you know, you never know. You never know. It is the NFL, Jerry Jones. I'm sure he would love more help, but yeah, bro. Come on, little bro. Just kind of stay in your lane, man. Just ice that leg. You know, have that good life that you got in Dallas, which he's probably losing his mind because he's in the house with his badass kid. You know, Trayvon Diggs, badass kid that they always show in Hard Knocks and in the stands and stuff. Like, yeah, he's probably losing his mind having to watch that little baby kid every day. But still, like, it's a, he didn't have to say 14 needs to get up out of there. That's a little, 
that's a little much, little bro. That's all I'm saying. No, that's listen. We count on Perse Hilton to bring us the latest in red hot gossip and intel and family fuggling and all that. <laughs> it's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful that Perse Hilton is on top of all this to bring it to us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, I'm just telling you. This uh, this Texans story, and I'm sitting here looking at the schedule this week. Arizona is at Houston, and Houston is, you know, going to be favored to win that game. Kyler's back. Yeah, Kyler's running around. Yeah, him with the legs. Him and the legs. Um, Dude, and, fast, then, and then it's Texans Jaguars for in a first place showdown in Houston Thanksgiving week. And remember, um, Houston beat the Jags in Jacksonville, pounded them. It's kind of where this whole thing got started. Yeah. You kidding me? I know, man. Cowboys fans are wondering how the hell, how the hell did Noah Brown look like that on Sunday against the Bengals? Because that dude, 175 yards, seven receptions, like CJ Stroud, that good. Dad couldn't do that with Noah Brown. You know what I'm saying? Like, how is CJ Stroud doing that? With all well, those and, guys, man, like Tank Dell, I know he's good and stuff, but wow, they got a lot of coming out party guys over there in Houston, man. And they're riding Devin Singletary. I mean, he had 30 carries for 150 yards, and you're like, okay. Yeah. I mean, they stuck with it. And I just like how they're all – they seem like they're on the same page. They're getting, they're talking about doing more with less. It's impressive, man. Yeah. It's impressive. You go to Cincinnati and win, but Zay, you, you got that right. You said Broncos plus seven, baby. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. playing some good football right now, man. Russell Wilson, he's looking like Seattle. Russell Wilson, he's moving in the pocket. They're letting him scramble a little bit. You know, he's still corny as hell, but, hey, you can't deny that dude ain't going to Canton. <laughs> like, that's a Hall of Fame quarterback right there. I don't give a damn what he was like last year. Like, he can still play a little bit under the right, you know, system and scheme. And, man, they made some big plays yesterday. I mean, Jerry Judy, that dude, I know people talk about him being overrated and he had that little – you know, odd situation with Steve Smith or Steve Smith just called him just the guy and stuff. And that was pretty dramatic. And Cortland Sutton had one of the best catches of the year last night with that toe tapper in the side of the end zone. Like that was a hell of a catch. So Cortland Sutton, SMU. SMU. Yeah. That's a new guy. So they got underrated pieces there, man. They do like they got underrated pieces and their defense a little stingy too, like Patrick the second. Like he's one of the best young corners in the league, and yeah, yeah, very impressive win to go into that part of New York and get that dub. And it's just, what's wrong with the Bills now? That's kind of the question that a lot of people are asking. Because looks like they were supposed to win the AFC East once again, and seems like Miami is going to end up taking that. I think you're. I think your right call is symptomatic of what's wrong in Buffalo. Well, yeah. I mean, Stefan Diggs, he is like every other prima hey, donna. Rogers. You remember you remember Brian Robinson going around to everyone in the Minnesota locker room asking every player who's one guy you wouldn't want anywhere near your sister. And every player for the Vikings said Stefan Diggs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but that shouldn't be, you know, 
That might he might just be a ladies man. They might just see him. You know, I'm just saying. Hey, I love this. Ike says, look at the Texans schedule and tell me they can't win out. It's crazy. And you look at the Texans schedule. I mentioned they got Arizona, then they get Jacksonville at home, then they get your Denver Broncos in Houston, three straight home games. Then they go on the road to the Jets, on the road to the Titans, who look like a mess with Will Levis. One week after Levis looked like a world beater. Then they get the Cleveland Browns and Tennessee Titans in Houston before going to Indianapolis. Listen, they're not going undefeated, but they're in the mix. I mean, they're five and four. Yeah, I need to see that Browns game. Shout out to the Browns. 31-17 came back and ended up winning that game. That's huge. Baltimore, all they know how to do is give up leads. Like Baltimore, at times they look like the best team in the league. And then at times you're like, what the hell are you doing? It doesn't make any sense. And yeah, Deshaun Watson, AFC North, best division in football. I mean, Mike Tomlin and the Steelers, you know, they're going to be a tough out. Joe Burrow, even though Texans beat them, it seems like he's getting his rhythm back. And those teams I just said, Cleveland and Baltimore, they've been really tough. So, yeah, it's hard to win in that AFC North. And whoever wins that division definitely deserves it. Rookie of the year, C.J. Stroud, baby. She maybe MVP could be. He keeps this rolling, right? Come on. And to what Chris Hummer said, like I had that feeling about him too, just because that Ohio State PTSD with quarterbacks going to the NFL. Like, is he right? He had Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave. I mean, Jackson Smith and Jigba, like stars, right? (laughs) He had stars, man. You know, so how good is he really? And they never, I don't, did he ever beat Michigan? I don't think he ever beat Michigan during this time. Because Justin Fields, I think, beat him. But C.J. Stroud, I don't think he ever did. So nobody was giving them credit for that. But we should have known with that CFP game and how he did against Georgia and all those NFL players that they had on that team last year. You should have known, like, okay, maybe this guy is different. Maybe this guy is, you know, worth every penny. And I know Panthers fans right now are kicking themselves in the butt for, you know, picking up Bryce Young. But give Bryce Young some time, especially if they get Marvin Harrison Jr. in the 2024 draft. Give him some time. Give him some time. All right. Well, speaking of time, our time is up. And I actually have to run and pick up my daughter. So, KD and CJ, come on in, fellas. Go get your daughter, Chip. Great show, guys, as always. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate it, fellas. Y'all rock it. Have a good show. We will. Welcome to – we still got Zay. Welcome to uh, Longhorn Misfits, man. Trey's not here, but I cannot be more pumped about our (laughs) co-hosts for the day. And – CJ Vogel. CJ, what's going on, brother? You're rocking the Rangers hat, man. Congratulations. Well, thank you. I'm still still rocking that high from the, the World Series, you know. I feel like I got this for another couple months than me. But, but man, I'm, I'm really excited to be here, JD. appreciate you having me on. It's be a good yeah, time. No, it's great having you. If you don't know CJ, he's a college football insider, analyst. I don't know if I can remember it all. Um, but I know you from the Football Brainiacs. I also know you from doing charity work with Tyler Campbell. So, um, I, you know, yeah, so you do a lot of different things, a lot of good things, but your coverage is awesome. You can go to uh, at TFB underscore uh, Texas, right? And then also the OU version. Absolutely. And, you know, having this being the Texas side, you know, I've just stick here, stick here. Stick here. You're also, uh, what is it, High Four Star Podcast? The very one. It's 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 rolling. No, it is rolling. It's good stuff, too. And then I know you do some stuff at Action Network, which uh, I've been following for a little while. So congratulations on everything, and, and we're glad to have you here. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And, I mean, y'all have been killing it over here, and I'm excited to be a part of it for two hours. So should be a good time. We are, too. Um, there's so much stuff. We were laughing before the show, just kind of going over what to talk about. There's so much stuff right now. 
that it's almost an embarrassment of riches for content if you're looking for content. Football alone, we could do Jim Harbaugh, we could do Jimbo Fisher, we could do Texas, we could do Quinn Ewers, we could do Jonathan Brooks, we could do college football playoff, we could do Dan Lanning. I mean, there, there's a ton. And then I thought we had a great NFL Sunday that was with five games that ended on kicks and some really, really fun football games. And we've got, I don't know, I probably missed like 10 things. So we've got we've got a whole bevy to hit, man. man I, I tell you, you, everything you just mentioned, you could spin it on a wheel and whichever one you end up with, I mean, it's a, a 20, 30-minute conversation about any of them. What a loaded weekend of sports, and especially, you know, down here, everything that happened with Texas football over the weekend and moving forward, it was – it's loaded. Can, can we start with a guy who – I want to give a lot of love to, though, as a Texas fan, Texas grad, born and raised Austinite, somebody just bled orange coming out of the womb. Um, I, I don't remember a year where you lost so much at one position and one guy stepped up the way he did on and off the field. And the fact that Jonathan Brooks is a torn ACL and is done, you know, I think I've gotten probably crusty following sports for so long where it still bothers me, but it doesn't bother me on Wednesday. Well, it's Tuesday right now and it's still really bothering me. And I got a feeling next Tuesday it will too. Like that, that kid was everything you could want for a guy on and off the field. If you look at the rush blocking numbers, run blocking numbers are actually not run blocking as well as you would think considering how good he was. I mean, this is a big blow CJ, but just as a Texas fan, it sucks. It does. I mean, injuries anytime suck and injuries suck even more whenever you're you're watching a guy step into a role who was behind, you know, two NFL caliber running backs for the last two years, finally gets a shot, is in, you know, the top 10 conversation for rushing leaders in the entire country, is entering the conversation for being the number one overall running back in the draft coming up next next uh, spring. And you see that cut short, you know, that's it just adds to how unfortunate of an injury it was, especially when you consider just how well he had been running, how much of a focal point he had been for the Texas offense this year. And just in, in, in general, how much that offense relied on him when things weren't necessarily moving, you know, effectively through the air. And so yeah. it, it sucks. It really does suck. And, you know, luckily Texas has, you know, a talented freshman coming in, uh, you know, who has experience running the ball on the big stage against, you know, notable teams uh, in conference play already. But you're not going to get the same production that you're going to have with a third-year Jonathan Brooks, who had been, again, running the ball as well as anybody in the country right now. So it is it is very unfortunate. It's a big blow for Texas. It is, man. I mean, Jaden Blue is another guy. I think it was in Waco when they clocked him at one of the fastest times in college football this year. I mean, it does feel like that room is so stacked. That and maybe I'm, you know, it's three guys in a row, like you mentioned. You've got Bijan, who's an all timer, Roshan, who's an all or an all conference player who starts anywhere. And clearly, right. the Bears kind of knew what all of us did when he was taken that highly as a backup running back. And then Jonathan Brooks steps in, but CJ Baxter can go. It looks like he's finally healthy now. Like his giddy up and his acceleration seems to be back to where it was, but. What can you tell us about Jaden Blue? I mean, who, who may be getting some with Savion Red, some 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 more snaps here. Yeah, and before getting there, I mean, back to the point about Jonathan uh, uh, Jonathan Brooks, you know, kind of replacing Bijan and Roshan. The two things that those two guys did tremendously well was break tackles, extend plays, and really fall forward for extra yards. That's the most underrated part about Jonathan Brooks' game, and it's something that I think Texas Agreed. is going to struggle with moving forward just a little bit with the – not necessarily – because of who they have behind, uh, you know, Quinn Ewers now, but just kind of the build that each of these running backs have, you know, they're a little slender. Uh, You're so was, right about that though, CJ, like he, he had a, the great ones and I'm not saying he's Ricky or, but Jamal, but they, they, they will cut and get an, a yard and a half or two extra yards and then wiggle and fall. And all of a sudden it's three it's and a half yards, you know, it happens <laughs> every time. It was remarkable. I was going through the, the charting of the TCU game, and Texas didn't have a single negative rushing attempt the entire game. Only one of them extended for more than 10 yards, 
But at that time, if you're getting two to three to four yards per rush, I mean, that's going to build up over time. And I think we saw that. Um, and so credit to Jonathan Brooks. That's going to be tough to follow for, you know, Jaden Blue, you know, Savion Red, you know, some of these guys, Keelan Robinson, a couple of these guys who just don't have that type of body build at the moment. But back to Blue, I'm excited for him. You know, he's had limited touches this year. And I think that's a result of fumbling early in the season against Wyoming, you know, I think to charge choice, Steve Sarkeesian, they wanted to give him the opportunity to go out and secure a little bit of that pie chunk uh, in terms of volume share. And I, I think whenever he fumbled in late in that game and kind of prevented that offense from, you know, extending the lead late in that game, it, it was more, more, is he ready to really be in the mix to get meaningful carries early in the game and extend that for 10 to 15 carries per game? And I don't think that the staff was ready for that to happen yet. But but on the contrary, you see Jonathan or uh, Jaden Blue, excuse me. Seemingly every time he touches the ball late in the game is he's going for a twenty-five to thirty yard touchdown. Yeah, you know whatever it is, he's breaking tackles. He's getting to the How edge. Jonathan Brooks did when he got backup carries, right? Remember Jonathan right. Brooks was that guy, you know? Exactly. And, and we, I mean, just as we talked about it, we saw how that worked out. So it, you see the glimpses of what could be another great running back. But is the consistency going to be there enough to be relied upon, you know, for consistent drive after drive after drive? I'm not sure yet, but I think, you know, as we've seen Keelan Robinson kind of step in every now and then for a play or two, a little what we call the gadget plays, Jaden Blue should be more than capable to do that at this point in his career at Texas, this part into the season right now. I feel like we know who this team is at 9-1, and one, and let's also rejoice their 9-1. and one. And yeah, there's been some luck there. I do think Sark is right. I do think there's a culture change where they don't win a lot of these games in the previous however many years. Um, right. But so, I mean, I, there's a combination of that. There's some luck and there was some bad luck last year, too. And if you said that, you were just being a homer and like not, you know, dealing with <laughs> reality. And it's like, well, no, I've watched football long enough. There's some I know when we have a lucky year and an unlucky year. And it's been a Absolutely. lucky year for Texas. Right. Um, no, but 100%. I do think there's been a change, but I think we kind of know who they are, especially offensively. It's a, If you look at any of the metrics, PFF or any other, or use your eyeball, they're a good pass protecting team. Um, they're not necessarily a good run blocking team, even though rushing wise, they've been pretty good. And I think a lot of that gets back to your Jonathan Brooks point. They run a ton of inside zone. They're a better zone blocking team. They don't deal with leads very well. They don't have a closer mentality. Um, I think Quinn's still growing and still learning how to really see the whole field and not yeah. get off options and maybe go back to him or maybe get off of him too quickly. Um, but he's gotten better. Defensively, they've been weird because they cover at times, don't cover at other times. Their run defense has been great all year. Yeah, um, absolutely. absolutely. Their tackling's been a little iffy. But we kind of know who they are. And you you sent out a tweet, and I was, and I've said it on this podcast, and I totally agree with you. They just haven't felt like a CFP team all year. And I get that the CFP is different this year than most other years, but we're watching them every minute and thinking it's not a CFP team. I love where they're going. Trajectory is great. It's we're going up like this, but they're not that team. It's kind of hard to reconcile that watching this team and also knowing what the opportunities are, and they're pretty real in front of them. No, a hundred percent. And you know, it's never easy whenever a team is nine and one like Texas is. You haven't been in this position for as long as it's been for Texas, and then to go out and say, you know, this team isn't worthy of being a top four team in the country. And I, you know, when I sent that out. You know, I knew what was going to happen with the return from Texas fans and some of the well, other things. You got blistered, and you should have. <laughs> I mean, but I can't sit here and watch Texas squander 20-point leads three weeks out of four against teams that, again, they should be blowing out. They should be blowing out Houston. They should be blowing out a bad TCU team that was really bullied by Texas Tech the week before in the trip. And the problem, CJ, is they were blowing them out. That's what worries exactly. me even more. <laughs> and that, that's the most frustrating part about watching this Texas team, and it – you know, it's it's frustrating because you see that you see the first two quarters, you see the first half, and you're like, yeah, we're up twenty. <laughs> we might get to see Arch. We might to get get to see Malik in there for extended drives, get him some reps, see what he can do to 
further his progression and development early, ahead of schedule. And that's really how you know good teams get great, is they get these guys on the field very early in their career, and you're able to build off what their experience is, whether it's in garbage time or not. Texas has not been able to do that because for whatever the reason is, come three minutes left in the third quarter, that flip just switches again, and now it's a ball game. Now it's a tight game. Fans are puckered everywhere that they're sitting in the in the stands thinking, what's happening? You know, why, why is this so drastically different than what we saw in the first half? And it's just something that college football playoff teams do not do. And I, I can't sit here right now and, you know, see the kind of – top five, top six in the country and, and say, you know, Oregon's not losing big leads like this. Washington's undefeated. Florida State's undefeated. Obviously, we have to see what Michigan and Ohio State are doing right now. But, man, these teams aren't losing leads like this. And if they are, it's not a recurring thing. So i got to tap the brakes. But, again, Texas is 9-1. and one. There's a lot to be happy about. And, again, I can only imagine that the future is going to be brighter than what it is currently because we've seen the upward trajectory, as you mentioned earlier. So it's encouraging, but at the same time, let's not get over our skis right now. Yeah, I, I'm 100% with you. I mean, mo- most progress in life sports is not linear. I right. mean, it is kind of – and we're seeing it with quarterbacks now, whether it's Josh Allen or – and it's kind of right. funny to see it, and you don't know if that's going to go like that or back <laughs> up. Um, but this has been pretty linear uh, yeah. with Sark. And and if they if they end up going eleven and two this year, that's a hell of a year, man. A hundred percent. Like I mean, so I'm trying to balance that with also knowing it's also a special year in college football where it is pretty open, and at least to get in. And the Big Twelve, it's the worst Big Twelve I've ever seen. And I remember the first yeah. year like it was yesterday. I've watched a ton, of, as probably as many Big Twelve games as most people. And it's the worst Big 12 year ever. And it, so that's wide open. So I think it's frustrating. Another thing I didn't mention that's an obvious is in short yarded situations or red zone, Texas is not good. And I think some of that's play calling. I think some of that is the grades I was talking about in our eyeballs saying that man-to-man blocking, real short yardage, leverage, getting low, anchoring guys and grounding them out is not the strength of this team right now. Correct. Or offensive line, which Correct. has gotten a lot better. I mean, it's much better than it was two years ago, three years ago, and there's a little bit of depth. But I, I wonder, you know, Sark kind of mentioned it in the press conference. I saw only a little bit <clears throat> that maybe we should just continue to throw. Why not get up 48 to three, <laughs> CJ, with that let's go, go, go mentality? Reminds me of Jimmy Johnson when Frank Reich and Maryland came back against them, and Johnson then ends up blowing out all these people and throwing in the third and fourth quarter with the Canes in the, you know, 86, 87, and 88. Yeah. And he said, Hey, you know, we were up 35 3 at one point, and I just ran the football and we got beat. So I told myself at that point, we're throwing until it's there's no way they're coming back. What would you do if you're Sark right now? knowing what you are in those situations. Yeah, in a way, you almost wish the BCS was still in play for Texas because I think <laughs> that same mindset would apply to Sarkeesian in the Texas offense that right. you know, we need to run it up in terms of, you know, score differential and points because that, that is – That is a hilarious and great point, dude. But, I mean, it, it's so wild to think about, but yeah. that would absolutely change how the games would be played right now. Um I, I really wish I remember who tweeted it so I could give credit, but they quoted Bobby Bowden when he first got to Florida State. Yeah. And it's – at first you lose big. Yeah. You know, then, then you lose small. Close. Yeah. Then you start to win, and then you win big. Yeah. And right now, where are we right now with Texas? You're starting to win. Yeah. And that's big. You know, yeah. you're not winning big, but it is big to see that wins are now starting to fall in place in, in which years before now – Texas probably wouldn't have hold on to any of those leads. Yeah. You know, Texas probably wouldn't have been in a position to have 20 point leads. Yeah. And so they're starting to figure out how to win. And that's how good programs start, you know, their their reign, if you will. I'm not yet ready to say Texas is going to have a, a dynasty level run here, but they're setting things up talent wise on the roster and, you know, culturally to be in a position to compete at the highest level. And I think that's really where Texas fans want to be 
you know, from where they were, you know, from the the 05s to 08s to 09s, you want to be in a position to compete at the end of the year. And like Sarkeesian mentioned earlier uh, on Monday in his press conference, that's where we are right now in the middle of November. Texas is in a position to compete every single week for a Big 12 championship berth, title, and eventual college football, you know, consideration. So I understand it. I see the frustrations all over the place, but again, you have to look at a big picture. And I I love that quote so much because you look at 2021, you lose big, you walk into Fayetteville and you get stomped and you start to lose small. You host Alabama, the number one team in the country at Austin. You lose by one point, last second field goal. Then you start to win. Texas is nine and one. When Texas starts to win big and you know, that might not necessarily be the, the smoothest transition. Once Texas gets into the sec, but again, if you follow that path, you have to be encouraging or encouraged by where things are headed, where things are going, and you know just what's going to be on the roster when it arrives. Some great points, man. And um, yeah, I mean, I, so I mean, I'm at the age, I'm definitely older than you. I don't even know how old you are because every time I talk to you, I feel like you're my age, but 26. I know you're younger. Twenty six, huh? which is crazy. Um, hey, I'm catching I mean, back. That, I mean, that is a compliment, not that you're some curmudgeon, but I mean, like, you, <laughs> you talk to like guys in their mid 40s, like you're in your mid 40s. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's a little bit of the country aspect in you, which that always helps out a little bit, you know. Could it could a little bit? Um, I hope it does, but yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's just weird, you know, there are a couple things that, that are weird in terms of this year, but. I understand Texas fans being frustrated. I don't think they would be as much. They still would be if there weren't these weird opportunities that are once in a decade, once in every 15 years, where it feels like the path is set up. You know, if there was another right. year where Bama, Georgia, Michigan, there were like five teams you knew would beat you on any Saturday, then I think it would be it'd be a little easier to be like, hey, let's go to the, you know, Sugar Bowl or Orange Bowl, whatever the January 6th bowl, the tie up. Let's get to the Big 12 championship game. Oklahoma is one of those teams. We probably lose to them. But everything's opened up with Lincoln going. You know what I mean? To where it it's, just feels like it's hard to it's hard to balance those two things for Texas fans. And I get that. No, I, I agree 100 percent. I think a lot of fans, obviously, nine and one is great. You know, at this point in the year, if you said you're nine and one, you either lose to Alabama or you lose to Oklahoma. Texas lost right. to Oklahoma. So you're probably happy with that coming into the year. But coming into the year, you also realize, you know, Georgia's without a quarterback. Ohio State's without a quarterback. Clemson's been down. You know, there's all sorts of opportunity for things to really piece together right now for Texas to make a run with a very talented roster, a second-year Quinn Ewers, and really a a defense that you can build upon a 20-point-per-game showing last year and say, you know, we returned just about everybody aside from Overshone. You know, a Deshaun Jameson. But, you know, I, I, I get it. But also coming into the year, you see the big picture is wide open. You know, you, you you understand that there's an opportunity for Texas to really take reins of the control of college football right now. And again, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because you're continuing to win, but you're not winning by the levels that you want to be to be in that conversation just yet. And I think that's just how the, the season progresses. You truly never know what's going to happen in college football. Uh, I, I think this year, as we said, the Big 12 is as down as I've ever seen it. Like, you're 100% correct on that. Other conferences, not so much, you know, for whatever reason, you know, aside the from the 12 East, last year, how funny is that? How outrageous is it? I mean, all I mean, of a sudden, you know, like it, you may it, not believe in God, but if you don't believe in football gods after that, then you're it's I crazy. Give up. <laughs> it, the the, the Pac 12 championship is more likely than not going to decide who wins the Heisman. Right. It's unreal how this is, you know, kind of developed. So in their last year, CJ, when they broke up because financially and there was, you know, they're so bad and there's no future. And and also the Fox did not want to give them money. How funny is that? They're running the the, the college football landscape right now. It's outrageous. And but back to that point, I mean, there's not been a Purdue, you know, sort of speak that has walked into Columbus or or Michigan and upset a team like that so far, you know, Florida state still winning somehow, some way I thought that they were going to lose last week. They can't do it. There's not yet been, and you know, these last two weeks are going to be big. 
but there's not yet been those those big upsets that we've seen that have kind of derailed these college football playoff teams hopes and dreams uh, like we've seen in past years so anything could happen in these last two weeks but it, it's been you know kind of chalky if you will well, getting back to your age, you you always come off as older, and I mean that as a compliment. You look your age, but um, but I remember following the whole. I mean, I I'm at an age where we followed the whole Bowden ascent, you know, right? And it was it was really. I mean, they're also we loved them. I grew up in Austin, Texas, and Texas didn't even feel like a serious <laughs> D1 team, right? Because the Southwest Conference had gotten to a point where I would watch all college football, and it felt different than almost my. Juco football, I watch. And that, right. that's unfair. It wasn't Juco, but it was not at that level. Sure. Certainly, Texas wasn't. But Florida State built that, and it was like that. And I remember games where, I mean, heck, not only wins like this year, but, you know, we talk about Miami could have had, Miami probably should have won it in 86, 87, and 88. I think Notre Dame was better in 89, but they flipped mm-hmm. that. Um, Florida State, Bobby Bowden could have had six. Man, and I mean, on field goals alone, it felt like with Miami. So it was really tight stuff. That getting back to the unlucky, it just they weren't they didn't get to that level. But I saw it build to where those close losses became close wins. Then they just beat the shit out of everyone for like ten Everyone. Years. And I'm not, and I'm on with you. I'm not saying Sark's going to do that. That's once in a lifetime. But that is how you build it usually. That, right. that is the ascent usually. No, 100 percent. And I mean, it's only going to help and, you know, kind of accelerate that that timeline, you know, should number three return for 2024, which is kind of being, you know, tossed around right now. I've, you know, certainly heard more today than I've heard in past days that, you know, it it's starting to bubble up a little bit more than people probably would have anticipated coming into this season. So last week, Trey and I. So, by the way, Trey's in Las Vegas. With an escort. Yeah, with an escort. So, Justine, hopefully you're not one. <laughs> uh, they're out there. Dre's actually an incredible family guy, despite <laughs> what you hear on this uh, podcast. But um, they're out there. So, he's going to be gone Tuesday and Thursday. So, we got CJ Vogel here. And you have to get to TFB underscore Texas. Also, TFB underscore Sooners, which I went to. Your action network. Um <laughs> And you and I, like I said, I mean, I met you, I think, originally at Tyler's charity event, right? Yeah, I, th- I think that's where I, I know we had followed and, and maybe DM yeah. on Twitter or over the phone or something like that beforehand. Right. That's absolutely where Flavors well, of Austin. Yeah, that said a lot to me right away when you were part of that. I'm like, all right, I already like this guy, but I definitely, definitely like him now. So Trey is gone. So CJ is hanging out. Um so I said uh, last week that he was asking about Ewers, and I said, well, I go, what is Ewers, a third-round pick? And that's not a shot at Quinn Ewers. Quinn Ewers has played about a, a little a little bit more than a full season of college football. Like, because he's been – he was injured last year. He didn't play at Ohio right. State. You know, it's a little bit more than that. And so he's still growing. It makes sense for him to come back, especially with a loaded quarterback class this year and a lighter one seemingly next year. And you're getting a million plus for NIL and you like Austin and you're growing and maturing, which you've shown in the year, do another year of that. Like it makes total sense, right? You get another year being the quarterback of your dream school as well. Right. But I also, Trey was like, you think he's a third round pick? I go, maybe a second round pick. I mean, you never know with quarterbacks. They maybe a late first round. Or maybe someone says, you know what? We like the potential and we, we can have him sit for a year or two. Yeah. But there's no reason to go in with this class and do that. So I got to, you know, not heat, but people were just kind of asking, hey, you know, why do you really think that? And it's funny how this is kind of evolved in the last week that it almost seems like the Ewers and their people are getting the same information. I'm not plugged in on that anymore. You are. I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but tell us what you can tell us on this podcast about where that is and Quinn Ewers returning. Yeah. So before, before that, I, I want to uh, echo and agree everything you just said, you know, Ewers is very young still, you know, this should technically still be his true sophomore season. I know he's draft eligible, but people forget, you know, skips a senior season at South Lake Carroll. 
He's only 196 pounds. He's had injury history in two straight seasons. This is yeah. a loaded draft class. And this is not to knock Quinn Ewers and the quarterback that he is or the quarterback that he will become, because again, this was the number one ready quarterback you know, of all time, you know, coming out of Southlake. He has all the potential in the world to get to where he want to be, but quarterbacks don't skip years and continue to be that guy. You know, I think we saw it a little bit last year with Caleb Williams as a sophomore. You're like, yeah, that guy is going to be the undisputed number one quarterback. What's happened this year? He's kind of regressed. You know, he's not been that Superman guy that we thought he was going to be in his third year. You know, and that's with a, a loaded bunch of, of weapons at USC with Lincoln Riley. You know, it quarterbacks are not that predictable, believe it or not. So I think, you know, and I kind of had this thought process, you know, especially after he got hurt against Houston, you know, where would his draft stock be? You know, and I, I kind of said, I think the best overall, you know, best case scenario would be, you know, that back end of the first round, which is not where he wanted to be coming into the season. Right. And certainly not where Texas fans wanted him to be. And that's best case scenario. Someone's got someone already there. They don't need help at linebacker because they're in Super Bowl contention drafting 27th. I said the 49ers. Right, exactly. But it's probably more mid, late second round, early third, right? Absolutely. And I I said the 49ers, you know, using pick 31 or 32 because that team is going to go to the Super Bowl this year. Uh, they have Brock Purdy. He's on a rookie contract. He's not getting paid anything. You can run him out of that rookie contract. And you can bring in, you know, Quinn Ewers after a year or two, and he can be right. that guy with two years in the NFL program, strength, whatever, get ready, fill in. But I'm with you. I don't think he's played necessarily like a first-round talent. I think he's shown glimpses of a first-round talent. Yeah. But I don't think he's had the overall consistency that you've seen right now from, from a Penix, from a Knicks, uh, from a Drake May, from a Caleb Williams. I think there's a little bit of a of a different level that these guys are tapped into right now. And again, that is completely okay because Quinn's 20 years old and he's 195 pounds. That will happen. He will get to that point with another 12 games under his belt against SEC defenses. But right now, I, I think that sentiment, and I've heard it today, I heard it this morning. I, I put up a piece on TFB this morning. You know, I the conversation is starting to get a little bit louder. And after I put it up, I started hearing even more. I was you know, all of a sudden, folks inside of Moncrief are kind of expecting Quinn Ewers to return. And that's not where I thought things would have progressed this quickly to. But it makes sense. If you kind of line everything up again, he's the quarterback of his dream school. He has a Longhorn tatted on his thigh. If he gets one more year in the city of Austin, living out his dream of playing for the Texas Longhorns in the SEC in the biggest stages, why would he not? He's going to be financially suited. You know, everything's going to be in place for him to make a run to being the QB one of the 2025 NFL draft. And, you know, that's exactly where he should have been coming out of high school. And, you know, it's and no longer ahead or behind schedule. You're going to be right on it. So I think that makes a whole lot of sense. And I think it makes, you know, uh, it, it certainly is encouraging. And, you know, you have to be optimistic if you're a Texas fan thinking we might get another year of Quinn Ewers behind center. I think it's also one of the few positions right now in 2023, maybe outside of punter, um, starting pitcher uh, in MLB, maybe DH, but even then they're worried about bat speed. One of the few positions where you don't have to really worry about age and starting the clock too quickly. You right. Know, especially with NIL now, because we've got guys that are playing until they're 40 at quarterback. Right. And we've, got guys, we've got guys in college that are still 25. I mean, right. I mean, so so you don't have to really start that if you're making a million plus and you know that the other thing I'd be worried about, the one thing we do see in the NFL and we see it a lot, it's funny seeing Geno Smith now. I mean, I never thought Geno Smith was going to be as good as where he was drafted, but I also didn't shit on him and throw him out like, you know, in a river after a year or two in a bad organization. You know, I thought, you know, maybe this guy needs time. Yeah, he's kind of yeah. turned into what a lot of us thought he would be, which is a pretty functional starter with a good yeah. team around him and can win yeah. some games. One, he's not once you get Brady, but he gets no the jaw in check. You know, everything's all right. right. He's got the whole thing. Uh, we'll say after he was hitting, who is that? Stedman Bailey and Tavon Austin in that one game. And I mean, throwing dimes on slants 
and corners in the back of the end zone and fades. I thought, dude, this guy, if he if he would if he ever looked like that again, he would be Tom Brady. Oh, a hundred percent. And I mean, it's hard to find a, a, a more fun duo, or I guess trio than the three of them and what they were able to do and what was it 2012, 2013? 2012, yeah. God, that was crazy. That, that, Unreal. I will, say, I will say this. I've always said that 90 Houston was the best atmosphere I've ever seen at then Memorial Stadium, the DKR Memorial Stadium. That one got close, dude. <laughs> like that, that, that was a raucous atmosphere. I can imagine. Even it before was, they closed out the south end zone, too. It was bumping. Yeah, no, it was totally bumping. But I think kind of the bigger point CJ and I are saying that obviously if you're a Texas fan, you know, be happy with where you're at, but also kind of know – who you are. We'll get into some Iowa State stuff later. I do want to pick your brain on this. So the whole Jimbo thing is is not surprising for most of us who college football, who fo- follow college football, but also whether you're a Texas fan or not. I mean, I've got good Aggie buddies of mine, and we'll have fun with each other. And when they hired them, they're you know, I said this is not a home run hire. You think it is? I go, it may work out, but like. Any of us following college football knew that Florida State was falling apart. And the whole question was, is it because they don't give any resources at all and you have no facilities and there's not a lot of money at that school, really. The alums aren't old enough, haven't been around long enough to really have the Texas, Texas a and money, different exactly. geography, too. But really, the answer was that no Jimbo had been slipping. And yes. it's funny to see where Florida State is, but. With them, I, you know, I said, I, I'm just being honest. Like, I've told y'all when y'all are great, when I don't think you're great, I'm not being a T-sip here, right? But kind of seeing their reaction now to it and seeing how much they're going to pay, what, $77 million, I did read something that the four assistants, and I know a lot of people I know really want to get from A&M that are recruiting gold, they had signed them to extensions like a month ago. Is A&M just going all in and keeping – Keeping the gravy train guys going to add a coach to go with that? Yeah, I wish it was that easy. And for AM's sake, they probably wish it was that easy too. Because when you watch AM play this year, what's the most frustrating thing? It's kind of similar to what Texas is doing. It's been the play calling, it's been the office offense, and it's been basically everything that Jimbo can control as a head coach. If you could just plug and replace him, things would be a whole lot easier. Uh Again, it's so it was so easy to look back and, and see just where Florida State was when they had Jameis Winston in that title run to how hard they fell to being below 500, seeing guys, you know, basically mass exodus the program. It was, you know, that doesn't happen to college football coaches who get $75 million paychecks. And – I and it was it was right. in front of all of us, CJ. People like you and I that cover it covered it nationally, not just our you know cover Texas too. I mean, everyone. It, it, and if you talk to anyone who covered Florida State, they told you, yeah, they're like, no, yeah, was, there is a resources problem, and they need to build that. But this is Jimbo, man. It was no secret, and we kind of saw the same issues a little bit spur over into his initial time at Texas A and M. Obviously, you know, he gets the greatest. You know, the highest ranked uh, recruiting class of all time. And then there's issues with some of those freshmen, you know, getting suspended in the locker room, getting suspended for games, transferring out before they even see the field. You know, that doesn't normally happen for programs with, you know, the aspirations to become national contenders. Freshmen don't transfer out before seeing the field. And that happened a lot at Texas A&M very early in his tenure. And so I think a lot of, you know, the, the issues – that we saw Florida State carried over, you know, almost immediately to Texas A&M. And also, I, I posed the question last week on Twitter, but it's always fun to discuss. And I'd love to hear what you think here, because there's two coaches that I, I would say are close to home that I think are very high on this list. And it is which head coaches have benefited the most from their entire career because of one quarterback. You know, it's, you know, that generational kind of, my team is great. My program is great because I've had this guy for three years and he's really hidden every other flaw that I've had. And Jimbo Fisher's number one on that list for me right now. What he did with that Florida State team who did not have really any other NFL talent on it 
you know, mainstay NFL talent on it other than maybe Kel- Kelvin, Kelvin Benjamin? Maybe? Kelvin Benjamin, yeah. I mean, but yeah, I mean, it was not defensively. They had a couple guys. Was Duran on that team? I think he was after. Okay. But um, there was not, you know, for a national title team, there was not a no. lot of NFL talent. And I think a lot of that is because of what Jameis Winston was able to do as the Heisman winner. And that propelled what we then thought of Jimbo Fisher to be as the offensive guy. The other guy that was close to home that I wanted to bring up was what Charlie Strong did with Teddy Bridgewater. And that's a little bit of the, you know, kind Great of call. flip side of it because Chuck was the defensive coach. You know, he's defensive minded. Teddy comes out and he's all world quarterback at Louisville, lands him the Texas job. And, you know, what, what have we seen from Charlie Strong since then? It's not a whole lot, but that always a fun question to, to, to think about. And I, I'd love to hear if you have anybody that comes straight to mind from there. That is great. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I thought you may have gone Kevin Sumlin when you said, you know, a quarterback, it may have been multiple ones. I don't know if you're talking about Mac with Vince and Colt, you know, but I think those guys at least did enough stuff. I think the two guys you mentioned are right. Got to remember too, Louisville was in the AAC, I believe at that point. Right. And ended up beating the shit out of a Florida team in the orange bowl who was having their own issues. So real time, you go, they're beating up Florida. They yeah. won two championships the last couple of years. They've had big recruiting classes. Programs falling apart, trust me. <laughs> um, you know, but you don't necessarily know that real time. So you look back on it and go, ah, that wasn't as impressive as a win as I thought. But yeah. It is always fun to see programs that are going down. And you you realize afterward, you know, what were the writing on the wall signs that you right. know, this was going to happen? And, you know, with that Florida team is very evident, obviously, after the national t- championships, how quickly that was going to happen. And we saw it again in Florida State. I mean, even, you know, Texas a few times had that as well. But uh, brighter, brighter futures, brighter past. Brighter futures. You're, you're young, but you'll get that in relationships, man, <clears throat> where you're, oh, man. you'll start to date different people and be like, oh, I remember that. She did that when I was 24. It's like, oh, that's a warning sign, you know. Yep. Then it's, I, so, I mean, it, it is kind of trying to figure that out. And a has been trying to do that my whole life. I mean, a and is, uh, you know, to be totally fair and objective about this, it is a really, really damn good job. Yes. Mainly because of talent around you and really give a fuck, to be honest. Yeah, they absolutely. care so much. They will pay money with, you know, they'll make sure they give you the resources to do your job. But, I mean, R.C. Slocum, you could say Jackie, but R.C.'s been the best coach in my lifetime. And then they were so conservative and so, like Texas was in the early 80s, you could say late 70s too, <clears throat> not ahead of the game offensively and played such a conservative brand of football that when they got into those games that w- with – like talent they would end up getting beat but it it really is a good job there are some downsides too like any job texas may be the best job in the country there are downsides there um any of the jobs there are the cool thing about a&m though is if you do win the national championship there like you realize since 39 cj like you are in the whole aggie world which is there's a lot of them in connections I mean, you're you're probably getting three hundred million dollar oil deals that you're getting cut in. Yeah, on, you know, you're gonna brass statue on campus before the yes, final buzzer, far. like immediately. And to your point, there's a lot of you know Texas fans probably don't want to admit how good of a job that is. But like you said, I have no issue putting that in the top ten of college football jobs yeah. in the country. Probably Infinite the bottom. Reason. Probably the bottom, but it's but it could be five. I don't know. I mean, if you really yeah, look at right. money, maybe it is. You know, I. Listen, I wouldn't go higher than five, but in that range, it's absolutely yeah. there because, like you said, they have infinite resources. They have an unwilling, passionate fan base that will do literally anything that it takes. They're, they're paying this man $75 million cash. <laughs> they, they they flaunted the check. I'm sure you saw at halftime of that game of that $160 crazy, million. They, they, they flaunted the buyout check right in front of them, basically. It's unreal how I mean it's impressive. Well, I think a lot more too, CJ, because I think it was 150 or 160 million that they raised. Yeah. So yeah. like, dude, the, the 77 and the assistants and whoever <laughs> we're gonna hire, get out of here. They literally just walked down and said, you know, that with this check, you know, changes are gonna be made. 
And I, I don't think we've ever seen anything like that. I, I know that's not what it was intended to be, but it's what it is going what to end up being. Is. Yeah. So, but yes, Texas A&M, again, plays in the elite conference, a recruiting hotbed, infinite resources, you know, unbelievably passionate, you know, culty fan base, which is exactly kind of what you want if you're a head coach, because you're going to have that unwavering passion if things are going great. And in the early stages of a new head coach's tenure, that honeymoon phase is going to last pretty long. We saw it last five years for Jimbo Fisher almost. You know, you get one great recruiting class and it almost resets the clock on just how long you have of a leash. So I, I have to imagine they're going to have a pretty ample pick of who they want to, to go after. Um, I've personally not heard anybody behind the scenes that, you know, has a an edge in that regard, but – you know, there, there's going to be a, a long list of names that are going to be applying for that 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 head coaching position. And, you know, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be, an, again, another thorn in the side of Texas. It will always be a thorn in the side of Texas recruiting wise. Uh, and when that game comes back, it's only going to be, you know, amplified. You said thorn, uh, you know, in the side. And I agree with that. I think both are to each other. Um, yep. But. So let's say you're a Texas fan, you're looking at this, and I had a conversation with coworkers today, um, this morning. Of course, you know, typical, we got some time at work. So, you know, hey, I'm on online, right? You know, one of them was on one of the websites, was like, you know, Dan Lanning's not coming. And I'm like, you know, which I was pretty happy about. I think Dan Lanning could be yes. a young superstar. <laughs> yes. If you see what he's doing in the trenches at Oregon right now, you want him as far from College Station as possible. I think Dan Lanning's a tremendous coach. Yeah, and he knows the SEC with Bama and Georgia connections. So thought, all right, that's good. And, you know, I guess we keep on hearing a lot about Jeff Trailer, Mike Elko, who's a DC there. I think Elko's a good DC. If you're a Texas fan, which one would you want to be there? Meaning not what AM's looking at. Who would be the least, least one you're worried about? I like what Trailer's done. I think Trailer is a tremendous X's and O's coach. The minute he gets talent, you know, that's equal to what he's able to compete against, it's going to be very tough to derail any program that he's able to build consistently. I think Trailer, especially with what he has in terms of relationships with the Texas High School Coaching Association, would be a big problem for Texas. And I know that Fisher and, you know, Really, Texas and Texas A&M have moved more nationally in terms of recruiting on a year-in and year-out basis. Those in-state recruiting battles that have kind of dwindled as the years have progressed will be picked up once again, and it's going to be tough with as fond as Texas high, high school coaches are of Trailer to be victorious of over A&M there. I think uh, Trailer poses a big threat in-state recruiting-wise. I know Elko has the history at Texas A&M. I know that Elko has recruited this area, but I have to imagine that the best in-state prospects are going to look more towards a Jeff Trailer program, more so being guided to by their their coaches. I mean, you know, Man. giving out swag bags. I mean, gee, state I mean, these guys are these guys title. are popular guys within that whole whole world. No, it's it's a credit to them. I mean, McGuire yeah. at Cedar Hill and what he's able to do. Uh, trailer at Gilmer. I mean, Gilmer. I I, I can't. Off the cuff, remember which Texas stud? I think it was the Boyd brothers, maybe. Uh, at Gilmer, I mean, just built them into a an East Texas powerhouse, and that's, I mean, folks, Kurt, catch on. Curtis, Curtis Brown was there too, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know there was a few guys from from Gilmer that made their way down to Texas, but that's all Jeff Trailer. And you've seen how quickly he's ascended up the ranks. And the minute you give him the reins to a program like Texas A and M, I think it is going to pose a pretty big issue for Texas. Any shot, anyone else? I mean, whether it's uh, DeBoer or uh, who I think is an offensive wizard right now. And he's 21-2 yes. at Washington. Like, I, I would – I'd be worried about him. I don't know how great of a program builder would be there. But once again, it gets back to if I'm A&M, and I thought about this when Texas, when they hired, yeah, recruiting is obviously important. I mean, half – a lot of my life, Texas wasn't recruiting well. So I know it can, <laughs> even at Texas, you can not recruit, right? Um, or not evaluate well or identify and certainly not develop. But I would get a guy, 
try and get a good football coach, no matter where he's from. Like you guys have the money. And as long as NIL's around, you're going to get guys in there. You have to develop and then put them in good situations to make football plays. Right. Correct. Correct. I, I think DeBoer would do very well. I, I think DeBoer is on that same path of what we've seen from offensive geniuses of Lincoln Riley. I mean, I would toss Lane Kiffin into that mix as well. He's doing it and he's winning games because of his offense. And I think Washington is in an, recruiting area up there right now that he doesn't need to leave to win a national championship. I think he can dominate that Pacific Northwest area. You know, they get a lot of Samoan guys up there. They dominate. If you look oh, back yeah. at Danny Shelton, Vita Vea, these guys who were under PK, but in that area, they dominate the trenches defensively. And I think that can, you know, sus- who would they, they, they wouldn't even, they wouldn't even take Save as Bryant, Sammy Watkins. He is a clone of the three that have just walked through the door and made you a ton of money, Dabo. It would have made, it would have made a lot more sense for Texas to not take a call and say, you know what? We, we feel we got John T. Cook to go with AD Mitchell. Now we brought in, we got Xavier Worthy. We got Jordan Whittington. Uh, you know, we love your talent, but it's just probably, we're not going to get enough footballs, you know? I- I couldn't believe that. Hearing that, that they didn't even pick up the phone is crazy. He's right. I mean, uh, the, you know, they, they definitely have their issues. But, yeah, it'll be funny how all that works out. At some point, I mean, I've had to convince myself this because, you know, a had won two games in Omaha my whole life. And now, they're, <laughs> now I think they're at four or five, so I'm not too worried. But, like, at some point, that money's going to win out, and you're going to find the right guy. And I just hope it's – what do they say? Sooner rather than later, later rather than sooner. <laughs> right. No, it, it's weird because you know, my whole life, you know, I'm much younger and have seen, you know, much less of the Texas A&M program's history than I'm sure a lot of the people that are watching this program is, but for forever. And I've only seen half of my life include that Texas and Texas A&M game. You know, that was right. What was it 2011? Whenever the, that was the last game. 2011. Yeah. I was 14. At that That's time, crazy. at that time that, you know, Texas A&M made that leap. I was, you know, in the middle of my high school career, and I had a ton of Texas A&M fans. They're friends from the Dallas area. They're excited. They're going to the SEC. They have a Heisman winning champion or Heisman winning quarterback. They have the pieces in place to be that next team, and it just never happened. You know, they have that one COVID season where they finished top five. What happens since they fall off the cliff? If it isn't going to happen – in that stretch before Texas gets into the SEC, why am I to believe the minute that Texas and Oklahoma get back into recruiting their hotbeds of this region on a level playing field with Texas A&M, that it's ever going to happen, you know? And so you can point to the resources, you can point to the, the money and how it's all going to work out and get and attract all these top prospects, but they've had top prospects for 10 years. And they still can't yet get to that next step. If it does happen, it will be with this next head coaching hire. And, you know, I'm all for seeing who they go out and see because it's either going to make life a whole lot easier for Texas recruiting right now in the state of uh, in the state and really dominate kind of the agendas of the SEC move. Or it's going to make things a whole lot more interesting and really a lot more enjoyable for a college football fan. So I'm for it. I'm, I'm eager to see just where things go from here. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it, the older you get, it's just more fun reality TV for you. you yeah, know, you obviously, you obviously have a dog in the fight, but it doesn't it doesn't crush you as much. It's more right. it's just kind of fun because you've seen the characters for so long now. So even the characters you hated as a kid, I mean, like I hated Miami in the eighties. I loved them in the early two thousands. Yeah, no, they were a blast then. Looking back, it's like, it's like the bad guy had turned into a good guy for me. <laughs> or maybe I had turned into liking, you know, Hulk Hogan as a bad guy, whatever. I mean, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting, but they've been that team. I mean, but the Red Sox were that team for 86 right. years. The Cubs were that team for 108 years. Um, you could maybe say they got closer, but the Rangers, what, 53 years since, since the Senators got there? Was it 60? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you can be that team and fl- and turn it around, but you have to get the right stuff in place. And I do think that Texas and Texas A&M have suffered from everything that's great about the job is also a negative. So you talked about yeah. a cult. Well, a cult's not good when you're not doing well because yeah. they chase you around with torches and you got to flee town. You know, 
Now, you're eating free foie gras and getting like an Eddie Murphy type bath and coming to America when you're winning, you know, national championships. Right. Have you seen coming? Have you seen coming to America? I have. I have. Okay. Seen that. All right. I didn't know if you got the reference, but um, but yeah, I mean, life is great with a cult when you're doing well, but it can also I remember Rick Barnes and I talking about this when I asked him why he never went to Carolina or took that job. And he said, I got a great life here. I love my life. My family loves it. I love UT. We take basketball seriously. But if UT went on a two game regular season losing streak, it wasn't like Chapel Hill, you know? <laughs> yes, also true. And, and not that AM, so the funny thing is, UNC is a top five basketball program all time. AM is not a top 10 football program all time in terms of winning probably, on the field. Probably not where they are. Pro, Right. I mean, they may be 22 23, which would really bury their ass, but, and, <laughs> and that would be a sore spot, but we just go through it. But they've got the resources to be a top 10 or top five one, like we talked about. And so I almost feel like there's more pressure there than there is anywhere else, you know, that you've got to get this done now. We hired you, CJ, and within a month, I need production right away. Right. No, it's the, as fast as they'll build a bronze statue for you on campus, they'll have the, the stake and, and, and everything set up for you to, to hit the road again. Like they'll right. pack your bags for you. I think we saw that really last year after, you know, Jimbo kind of squandered that last season. Uh, they were ready for him to go. And I'm surprised he made it this far, seeing how kind of downhill that program and vibes and really the whole status around that program had gone. But again, as you said, there's probably no program in the country that's going to have higher expectations and and really a desire to win for a team that's never won before than what Texas A&M is going to have. And it's only amplified again by the Texas move to the SEC because they can no longer hold the SEC kind of logo and title. And, you know, we're playing this much higher level of football than you are over their heads now that, the one, the rivalry is back, and two, everything's back on a level playing field. If Texas is to make it to a college football playoff this year and then strolls into the SEC next year, that first year head coach at Texas A&M is going to be under immense pressure to win immediately. And I don't think that's going to be stated enough in the national media. I don't think you're going to hear enough about that, but behind the scenes, there's going to be a lot of pressure for him to win immediately. And yeah. they cannot afford Texas to step into the SEC and dominate right away because it's just going to put them back into the back seat in the car seat where little brother goes and big brother sits up front with mom and dad. So it's, it's going to be tough for them, for that coach year one to win right away. They're going to have the pieces. They're going to have the resources, but the pressure is going to be crazy. It's also why I brought up the four assistants. They apparently signed to extensions not too long ago. I I wanted to comment on that. Have you heard that? I did. It, it happened, what, two months ago? They just extended everybody? Right. Who coached with them, right? Huh? Jeff, Who, Jeff Trailer. No, I think it's Elko. Is it really? Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah, 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 because Elko would have been there. Yeah. I, I I forgot to mention that earlier. It, we talk about writing on the wall when programs are going bad. Writing might be on the wall right now to look at Mike Elko and say, you know, here's your staff from when you were here. Step in. You know, come lead the ship. Come be that guy that you have proven to, to be, I guess, uh, at Duke. So – it would make sense for him to step in right away and say, you know, I already got my assistants. I can poach whoever I want from Duke again. I'm sure that buyout's not going to be too crazy for an assistant at Duke. Bring him back over and, and, and get that gang back together from when Texas A&M had a really good defense. Yeah. No, that 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 is a great point. I hadn't thought about that. But it kind of goes to show you that, I mean, clearly they're thinking – kind of along your lines that, man, this is something we have to do and we can't delay anything. Right. We've got to get, we got to get running right away. This recruiting class has to be great. This team needs to be really good next year. And yeah. I, you know, I, I thought Wegman was pretty good. I mean, he, he impressed me as the year went on. If you look at rankings too, he's, you know, by most, most metrics, he's a top 10 quarterback who played this year. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I thought Wegman was, I thought he was on, on pace to be a very good quarterback. I remember watching him a few weeks uh, into the season, just thinking, you know what, that kid's going to be a problem. 
Uh, and obviously, unfortunately, like we said, you know, injuries aren't fun for anybody, even if it's for a rival, even if it's for a team that you despise heavily. Yeah, Wagman, you was on pace. Wagman was on pace to, to be a, a top quarterback in the SEC. He was you know, right there with Jalen Daniels in terms of one, two in that conference. Uh, and, you know, we've seen it for everybody on that roster. The minute you lose a guy of his status, things fall off a cliff. I was looking at it this morning. Uh, Evan Stewart's stat line production with Wegman, he went for 158 and 114 in two games with a fully healthy Wegman. Since then, he's gone for 50-50, uh, 56, 48, and 52. So very consistent, but no, not a high ceiling at all. And it affects everything, wins, losses, production, everything. Uh, especially the outlook of your team on a national perspective even. So unfortunate, and I think that was really the undoing of the last hope that Jimbo had uh, for for really staying alive at Texas A&M. Yeah, no, it's um, the quarterbacks ended up being his undoing, and it gets back to your point earlier um, about the one quarterback he had who probably built that rep. And I don't know, he had a couple. You can go to Jamarcus Russell and what he did at LSU. I was never – for as good of his rep was in the early 2000s as, as an offensive mind, I was never as blown away maybe right. as other people. Um, and he would have proved me wrong there for a little bit too. But I think at the end of the day, he kind of – he was what he was, and he can walk away and be really, really damn happy. Hey, I want to ask you too about – so Texas got a four-star cornerback decommit from LSU to commit. And I saw another kid from Florida who's like one of the top cornerbacks in the country decommitted from LSU. Is Brian Kelly just turning that into, I don't know, like UCF from a couple of years ago where we can get offensive talent, but no defenders want to go there? Because LSU, the funny thing about them my whole life, they've been, they were average half my life. But even when they were average in the 80s and, and 90s, they always had just, southeastern studs on defense yeah they had once again getting back to it like most teams a backwards offense that was 20 years behind and should have been 20 years ahead and they would have won a couple in the 90s maybe but defensively i, I don't remember them being this bad a recruit seeing that and saying i ain't going there i think that's part of it and i think part of what we're seeing right now is ryan kelly took everything that he did very well at notre dame and he left it there Great defense, great running the football. Unless you can't run the football, but they air it out better than everybody else, but they can't stop you and I running offense. Isn't that funny? You're totally right. It's it's bizarre. Yeah. And I think at first when Brian Kelly first got there, there was a little bit of a disconnect between Ryan Kelly, who had been in Indiana, South Bend, you know, Notre Dame, the the prestigious Catholic institution of, of America, basically. Right. And then steps into the swamp where, you know, there's a, a, a big culture change. And I think yep. there's a disconnect there between what he wanted to do at LSU and fitting in with the culture of LSU and the prospects that lived in this, you know, the state of Louisiana. And, you know, I, I remember talking to a prospect in the 2023 class, diehard LSU fan, had 50 offers, had the opportunity to commit and play for LSU. Their head, wide receivers coach wanted him. Uh, the offense coordinator wanted him. Everything wanted him to be for LSU. Talk to the dad. Dad just goes, Brian Kelly's not an LSU guy. Brian Kelly is not what we envision being, you know, playing for LSU to be like. And when you kind of think about it two years in, the swag and kind of the prestige of playing for LSU and – you know, walking out of the tunnel and going out like that and getting hearing the band play neck. Everything about LSU is cool and swag and, and hip. It's not Brian Kelly. You know, you don't have the Tyron Matthews, the Pat Pete, you know, these guys that really put LSU on the map and, you know, stapled in what it was like to be an LSU defensive back wanting to go play for LSU. That DBU title that Texas had, you know, kind of a claim to way back in the day and then, you know, fell apart as, you know, the Charlie Strong and Tom Herman era's a progress that's going to happen again with LSU for the biggest reason is because they let Corey Raymond walk from, uh, from LSU to Florida. God, I, wa I wanted Sark to hire him so bad. So badly. And I think at the time of Sarkeesian's hiring, you know, there were the rumors of, you know, Corey Raymond, you know, we got a spot for you on this staff, whatever. Hold on. Raymond's at Florida. 
He's at Florida. We got another shot at her, CJ. Yep. <laughs> you didn't treat her well on that first date. Let's go ahead and, and take her out to Uchiko and do this up this time, right? Wouldn't that be something, though? Because Raymond originally, and to, to, to bring back up Wardell Mack, who just flipped from Florida to Texas, what won out that recruitment from Texas's drafts, really from in the, the summer official visit time, was his relationship with Corey Raymond. What he was able to see from the development that he was able to do at LSU to the time of getting guys into the league, and now he's kind of doing it again at Florida. Just Florida's issues are different in the trenches and that yeah. quarterback, right? And you know that I don't think that that coaching staff has a long life left ahead of them right now in the swamp. So no, that that's my point with Corey Raymond is that you know he may be on the market again quicker yeah. than, than than he probably should be. And at that point, I would go all in. I also think we talked about Texas earlier, and they're moving in the right direction. It's linear progress. And But getting back to your Bowden quote, the way to get from winning close games and not going back to losing close games and getting to that more we're blowing people out routinely is to really evaluate at this point in the offseason. Don't think you figured it out after three years. No. <laughs> maybe we knew need a new edge guy. Maybe we need a new DB guy. Uh, maybe we need to work, like we talked about, on just straight man-run blocking and power schemes and counter right. schemes. And why, why aren't we getting better at that? Um, and I think all those things, if you really do that, then if Sark does that, then Texas will be in good shape. But some of that's going to be maybe – I know he wants, he's talked about a continuity and I get that, but continuity just for continuity's sake, you know, it's great to be married for 14 years, but if it's not working out, then maybe you should look at other stuff. Right. Right. And it's, I'm with you. It's never an easy conversation to have. It's never a conversation that you really want to have, but if your, you know, desire and intent at a program is to win national championships it's always looking yourself in the mirror and yep. saying, just how can I get better? I, I, I remember, I think it was Nick Saban two years ago, fired the defensive coordinator after making it to the college football playoff. You know, there's room to improve. There's, there's the minute you get complacent, I don't think this will happen for Sarkeesian because I think the minute that complacency starts to creep in, he's going to hear about it from the Texas media all the time. You know, there there won't be another Matt Brown kind of level of complacency that we saw after that second national championship appearance that we'll see from Sarkeesian and his staff as a result of, you know, Texas fans have been down this road before. Those kind of chirps and and groans and, and, and you know, kind of just uneasiness levels will rise and will get very loud very quickly because they've seen how quickly you can fall from being up top to being in the depths because of the – inability to adjust and to really get better on a day in and day out basis as a head coach. So uh, I'm with you. I think that there's something to really kind of just be on the, the whereabout or kind of just at the forefront of your brain. Just, just know that, you know, Texas is winning football games, but there are a lot of spots on this team right now that can certainly improve. Yeah. And a lot of those issues right now are in the back end. Yep. Totally agree. Jude Barrett's been great, but they they've got and they've got talent back there too, young talent that can get better. That's where developing can really help out. They've got to um, they've got to get deeper. I mean, they, they kind of remind me of a, the my pro team I follow, the Niners, where <laughs> man they they can look really damn good if they lose a couple guys. <laughs> like yeah. there's not not a lot of depth there, and they get exposed right. really quickly. And we saw that, and we've seen that as they get healthier, which is why I hope outside of obviously Jonathan Brooks getting back to that, that's awful news, that they can get to a point where where they're as healthy as possible. But that's got to be the next step. And some of that's just more time and recruiting and developing. I think they're doing it in identifying, which I think is the most underrated thing of recruiting. Yes. You know, identifying and developing are more important than getting five stars. Now, four and five stars – usually are part of that identifying, but getting the right ones for how you can develop them. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a lot of that as well as utilizing the transfer portal. I think, you know, going out and getting 
you know, a guy like Gavin Holmes, who may not have been, you know, the top corner on the market, but a guy who can step in and play three series yeah. a game and not give up, you know, 80 yard plays all the time. I know he hasn't been great this year. He hasn't been you know, out of this world, but he's been serviceable. And I think serviceable yeah. is good when you're still trying to build. And that's a great point. Pieces together in a, a, a you know, a program, uh, even Trill Carter in his limited snaps that we've seen so far this year, he got into the backfield last uh, last week against TCU and forced a fumble. You know, yeah. him and Burton Broughton, the two of them combined for a forced fumble. TCU recovered, but you see the little bit of contribution from guys that weren't on the roster before it and may not be, you know, ne- household names in Texas uh, fan bases, but they're finding ways to to contribute and build depth to a roster that is still getting to where it wants to be from a depth perspective. I think you're right. In fairness to Trill, he's at, he's at by far the deepest spot for this team. And it Correct. may be the deepest spot. It's the only thing that UT could say, we may have the deepest position group in America here. Yeah. And, I mean, you've got Tavondra and Byron, who are one and two in PFF and have been pretty much all year long. And Byron is one of the most unheralded guys out there. He's getting better against the run, great pass rusher. Devondre's done everything. Devondre should win. What's that, Nagurski? Like he yep. right now, if that's tomorrow, he should win that. Objective. He's my, he's my vote for big Big Twelve Defense Player of the Year. I think he's been otherworldly in the in the interior. He's been incredible. Yeah. And what a smart business move. Talk about Quinn earlier. He was getting third round projections. You know, maybe late second. You know, who knows how that works out? And you end up going early fourth, but. Yeah. Like right now, he it wouldn't shock me if he's a top 15, top 20 pick. No, certainly not a first round pick. I mean, he certainly looks like a first round pick right now. I, I would agree. And I I have to imagine teams are looking at what Kwiatkowski defensive tackles have done in the pros to seeing yeah. what he's doing right now in college and saying, you know, this guy could stick around for 10 years. Yeah. And us reaching on him right now in the first half, first round would not bite us in the rear because we've seen this happen before from defensive tackles in this system before. And also we're watching the tape and we're saying, yeah, this lines up with what our, the numbers are telling us uh, statistically. So I don't think there's a more important player on this Texas team right now than what Devondre Sweat's been to this team. I totally agree. He's an MVP. He's been throwing people around like ragdolls, run, pass, doesn't matter. Byron's been great. But Vernon Broughton, and I'll also give this name because I know he's taking a lot of heat considering what his star ranking was in projection, Alfred Collins is going to play in the NFL. And I wasn't totally sure about that until this year. Now, will he be a backup? Look, we didn't think Hassan Ridgeway was going to do much in the NFL. P.J. Locke was a huge loss. There are there's some guys you see throughout their career that yeah. we get so into it, we look at them almost every day, and you can get hypercritical, understanding that they're young kids and they're developing – um, both those guys have been good. So I'll give Trill some love, man. You could not have picked a deeper unit to go join, you know? Yeah. And it, it, he was probably com- looking at it at the complete opposite coming into the year. You lose right. Laura Ojimon, you lose Keandre Coburn. And you're thinking, yeah, that, that this spot's wide open for me to go compete and, and really find a way to get on the field often. And it's been anything but that. So uh, another guy I wanted to, to, or I guess go back to was Byron Murphy. Byron's in a favorite. sense, he's been a dog. He's been a dog his entire career, dating back to his time at DeSoto. But in a sense, he's always been that number two guy on a defensive line, everywhere he's been. And I think that's why we're seeing him play as well and develop as quickly as he has. It's because he's he's had a chip on his shoulder since his freshman year of high school. He was in the same recruiting class on the same defensive line as Shamar Turner uh, back in – 2019 2020 Shamar Turner was a five-star ends up at Texas A&M is you know all-american level uh, prospect right now he can play he's Texas was in at Shamar Turner they wanted Shamar Turner they didn't get him they got uh, Byron Murphy to commit and from you know kind of the the Twitter worlds the message boards that was looked at as a consolation prize right you know, there's a five-star on the defensive line you're you're left with this guy well now he, he comes to Texas he's behind Ojimo and he's behind Coburn he finally gets his 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 run as a starter, as a as a true every down guy, and it's all sweat. You know, 
He's Sweat's been that guy and deservedly so. But I don't think Texas fans should overlook the fact that, hey, this Byron Murphy guy's been pretty damn good. And he's been damn good the entire year. I think that's a great point. I totally agree. It also, that's why I love talking with you that we, we'll get these stream of consciousness like this. We're already 4.15 in or an hour at 15 in. Um, wow. I, yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? It's been fun, man. Hopefully people are yeah. enjoying it. Uh, I'm gonna let I'm gonna turn my AC down after this. I'm gonna let you for 30 seconds just mention, you know, kind of what you're doing because I want people to follow you. And I've been following CJ for a long time. So if you like me, I think you're gonna like CJ probably more. But um the I think the biggest thing that we have to remember as you build that program that I've seen too, and that's why I love that Bowden quote you put out early on, is that you can't get away from your ethos and what you really believe in, in terms of the identifying too much. It, it's great that the job now gives you $3 million a year and you and your family can go do whatever, yeah. but you could also be douchebags about that vacation or house you buy, or you know what I mean? Like still be true to who you are. And that's where Clemson, certainly Nebraska back in the day, but when they're in their heyday, hell, even Miami. Now, they had to because of scholarship restrictions with the 2000 team that first really Butch Davis class in the late 90s, but Ed Reed was a two-star. Like, they had to identify well. So still make sure that even though you can get this many five-stars, and I think Alabama and Georgia have done a good job with this too, Georgia's had some Lad McConkeys of the world. And some Alabama Stetson had Josh Jacobs of the world, right? They've had some walk-ons or some two stars and three stars. They developed, you know, you, you, and maybe that's where a and fell off a little bit. You've got to make sure that's still part of the structure of your program outside of going and getting Shamar or Evan Turner or whoever, or Evan Stewart, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a big part of that is when you do get these guys, the buy-in that they have to have to – strength and conditioning, the summer workouts, and really just being a part of the team rather than being, I was, you know, the number 12 player in the country. I was the five star. I deserve to be on the field because that was who I have always been told I am supposed to be. That is where you really start to see the continuance of a team winning year in and year out. You know, that talent is great. That talent's not great when that talent doesn't care about what happens in the win loss column. You right. know? So it, it's always funny because for years, the Alabama running backs, you know, you hear all about them. You know, this guy's running for 1,200 yards, 1,400 yards. He's going to get drafted in the second round. Where the hell was he last year? Oh, yeah, he yeah. was behind this other guy, and he's finally getting his crack. Now we're starting to see that now the Texas running back position, and that's obviously a more glamorous position and and one that you're more easily able to see uh, the year in and year out turnouts of production going to different guys and all that as well. But that's going to trickle over into, you know, who's going to be your offensive line when guys depart? Is it going to be that third year junior that you've developed since he's arrived on campus, or are you going to toss in a you know a four or five star freshman? that may not have the buy-in, that may not have the, that, that overall body build and, and, and really experience of running a college program, uh, how is that going to sustain as the years progress? Um, and we've seen it, again, Georgia and Alabama are the two teams right now that you can point to and say, you know, very rarely do you see a guy that steps in and plays right away a lot as a freshman. That, that just doesn't happen. And, and I, I think Texas fell victim to that very often in the Tom Herman era of yeah. thinking, oh, we got this brand new recruiting class. They're going to fix the issues that we have and have had when really the minute that you throw them into a, a, another game, like, you know, meaningful game, they're going to commit the same issues because they don't have it mentally and they don't have the experience that these other guys have had who have been in a college system for three or four years. I think Mac was like that early on, actually. I mean, when you got the the 99 class and, and it just took time. It takes time to actually build. A lot of these guys don't have time now. All right, CJ, I'm going to turn my uh, AC down because it's gotten – apparently it's gotten warmer out there because, like, this morning when I went out, like, I had a fleece on. Outside today, huh? Yeah. Have you been outside? <laughs> no, no. I've not seen the sun today, I, I will admit. God. All right. Uh, so, hey, uh, give me 30 seconds. You talk about kind of what you're doing – um, not only at, at Football Brainiacs, but with Action Network and maybe some of the stuff you're working on. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, good deal. I, I really appreciate everybody tuning in. This has been a blast with KDM. I'm glad that he, I, I got the call this this morning, late last night, to come out and, and chat. You know, every now and then. Uh, if you're all enjoying this, enjoy what I put out on Twitter, everything like that. Make sure to go follow us on Twitter at TFB underscore Texas. Uh, follow me, CJ Vogel underscore TFB, uh, and subscribe to the Football Brain X. We have a great community over there, a lot of great intel. Uh, obviously, former Texas Longhorn Darius Terrell is on there uh, providing great intel on what he's seeing from a week-in, week-out basis in terms of Texas football, recruiting, team news, insider, all that stuff is great over there as well. So, a lot of good stuff going on at TFB, and if you want to come join the community, you're going to join a, a great, great, you know, back and forth between me and DT and all the guys that we have going on over there. So, uh, uh, and of course, I'm a big gambling man. I actually have the, you know, the Yannick Center and Djokovic game or match on in the background right now. So, if you enjoy that as well, I toss out a couple picks on Action Network every week uh, for the college football fans and and degenerates out there as well so good stuff all around and again katie thanks again for having me on this has been a blast it's been a blast we're definitely gonna have you on again uh i think you've done a great job and uh do you ever talk to who's a patrick um maher at action network i don't think so uh, okay i know maher and sweetelson the, those are funny guys but 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 they do a great job over there and yeah action's maher. great yeah, no. And then the um, you did mention the high four star podcast, right? I did not, but yes, that as well. If if a, a lot of you know what we've talked about here is covered over there, it's, and and again, uh, I, I have to tip my cap to DT. He's been incredible providing his insight and intel on having been a player for Texas, gone through recruiting, now a high school coach. Great guy there. Uh, love what we're able to do at, at the high four star podcast. Pretty awesome stuff, man. Uh, all right, some college football. Alabama continues to look really good. It's funny how that win, people won't give Texas credit for, but, you know, that offensive line's continued to get better. Bill Rose continued to get better. I didn't think he would get this good this year. He still has intermediate issues, but a lot of that's Tommy Reese actually being smart and playing to what their talent is. They've got good defense speed. The offensive line's gotten better. The defense is good. But Alabama looks like they're rolling. They look like they're set up to probably play Georgia. And, man, the, you know, Carson Beck's gotten a lot better too. But Georgia doesn't have the same dogs on the defensive line that they did. They're still really damn good yes. overall defensively. They still have a ton of talent. But Jalen Carters don't come around all the time. And so I'll be curious to see kind of that matchup if we get there. Yeah, that – I, I, I'm right there with you on the Alabama talk. I mean, I, I, I think it's more just a testament to Texas playing their A-plus game to even start the conversation of <laughs> the Alabama dynasty is over. This is not the Alabama of old. They don't have a right. quarterback. They don't have the pieces. They don't have the talent. Coming into the year, we were looking at an Alabama team that was incredibly talented. You know, they might not have had a, the, the star power of a Waddle, a Smith, or – or rugs even, but they had a lot of talent in the trenches. They had a lot of talent on that defense. And the the conversation has completely flipped to Texas just ruined the Alabama dynasty. They've ended it. Nick Saban's done to all of a sudden, oh, man, Alabama's going to do it again. They're going to find a way in, and they're going to win it all this year. You know, and <laughs> week two is almost looked at like it never happened. And that's right. unfortunate for Texas because that's the biggest mark that they have on their resume right now. And really – to talk about the CFP, the more one-loss t- teams that there are in the country, the better there is for Texas because no other team, aside from maybe a Washington, if they fall a game, has, that has a win like this. Yeah. You know, it's incredible. Right. It, it counteracts the, the Big 12 being so down. Yes. Like, I mean, it couldn't have been – we all always – we laugh. We really, the year before the SEC, have to go to Bama. No, it's the best thing ever. Because they yeah. won, and Bama's still Bama, and that win, you're right. I mean, people can go, well, you played the Big 12 schedule. Yeah, but they went to Tuscaloosa and won by 10. So, yeah. Uh, no. And I, it also counteracts what we've seen the last couple of weeks with Texas. Kind yeah, of not only won by 10, we watched it objectively nationally, and they actually should have won by three touchdowns. <laughs> <laughs> but that's I'm, Texas, so. 
It, exactly. And it, what's the craziest thing about all of this is, I mean, the, 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 the folks that are looking at Texas and saying, you know, they should not be in the, in the college football playoff. And I, I'm one of these right now because of what we've, or what Texas has, has done yeah. on the field the last couple of weeks, winning by margins in which that should be right. magnified by 10. Or and and I agree with you, but we're talking about right now. And it is right now, Texas should not be in. Correct. But at the end of the day, when you compare the resumes, and I'm kind of playing devil's advocate to my own point from earlier, if everybody, you know, if there's two spots left in that college football playoff that has that, that is open to one loss teams, it's hard to look at the resumes and say Texas sh- shouldn't be here. You know, if, if they win the conference, they yeah. have a win over Alabama on the road, a true road game. Right. It's hard to say that they should not be in the college football playoff, but that again has to that is the the uh, the result of events that have yet have yet to happen, and as a result, it's hard to say that they should be a top four team in the country right now. Man, I was hoping Miami would give Florida. I mean, they gave Florida State something, but like you got to get Florida State a loss. You Have really to. need, yeah, you really need Washington or Oregon. You know, Oregon gets one more loss, and you really want the Pac-12 champion champion to have two losses because th- they're going to have the best conference, at least by rankings and, and thought, because because yep. they went in, they went in that way to conference play. So you may beat each other up, but you're beating each other up and you beat up other teams, including the SEC for the first time in a long time. Yeah. Texas uh, needs to be the biggest DJ Uyagle fans. Yes. Right? Oregon state yeah. plays both of these teams the next yes. two weeks. Let's that, go. Let's go Beavers. Right. My roommate's got an Oregon State shirt from betting on them from a few years ago. I might have to put that on the next two Saturdays. Yeah. I didn't know if it was like one of your college roommates who had a Let's Go Beaver shirt. I'm like, uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure that was a Oregon State shirt. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's the other funny thing. You've got Michigan. I mean, so if I had to look at them right now and, and there's no one, there, there's, there's I don't care who wins it this year. Me as a college football nerd who loves to act historian and talk about stuff and bullshit with other college football fans, no one's going to be an all-time team, period. I said the same thing for Alabama and Texas played no nine. And Greg McElroy threw for, what, 48 yards, and they won the championship. So I stand by it, you know. And Texas had an offensive line that we knew at the time was not national championship level. And that got showed shown with the option left. If, um, but I don't think any of those teams, maybe Georgia, if they really just continue to explode, but maybe maybe they will be. But at that point, it'd be more knows the third of a three-peat, which we hadn't seen. And I'd probably take team number two, maybe team number one. But it, it is, you know, it is pretty open. But Georgia and Michigan would be, for me, the two right now that I look at. I don't know what order. But the Michigan stuff is so um, – it's compelling. I don't like manufactured drama. This is real drama. Yeah. And this is Ohio State maybe with Day's brother investigating them and going after it, Big Ten coaches being pissed, threatening stuff to the commissioner, the Michigan AD apparently telling him to go fuck off. Then Harbaugh doesn't even get notified, but finds out on Twitter or a text that he can't coach. CJ, this is some pretty high-level stuff or just dramatic stuff. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that, but also kind of where you see Michigan in this whole world right now. I mean, it's a never-ending saga. I'm not a big soap opera guy, and I think that's the reason – I mean, I don't watch any soap operas during the day, but I love following the chapter book of – right. Yeah. You know, the domino effect of all of this. And I think that's why I like the NBA so much, because that happens much more in the NBA than every other league. No, you're right. It does. And so we're finally getting a glimpse of that right now and and with Michigan. And unfortunately, it is, you know, for cheating and breaking the rules. But there are so many layers that have gone into or I guess come out of this story that it's almost the gift that keeps on giving. You know, it's it's almost incredible just how deep it is. And, and really just how extensive it was for these teams or for, for Michigan to really have achieved it in a way. I think it's interesting. I, there's two points I want to, I want to kind of touch on. Uh, the first is I sat at dinner a few weeks ago with a couple of big 12 coaches and you know, the, the, 
the conversation arose of Michigan and, you know, there was a kind of the question of, do you think Harbaugh knew? And before the question even was finished, both looked at me and were just like, <laughs> yes, of course. He did. Absolutely. He knew. <laughs> it's not one of those things where a staffer that is under you is flying out to game after game after game across the yeah. country, scouting those specific plays and then standing next to your offensive or defensive coordinator on the sideline during the game and presenting to them what is about to occur from the opposing team. If Jim Harbaugh never knew, he's the most oblivious man on the face of the earth. And we know Harbaugh is, you were a quarter inch off as a left guard pulling and really hitting this guy in the right shoulder with the right angle and right leverage. You were two degrees off of really pulling this block off. And I didn't know this guy was doing this. That That's where these coaches that are so hardcore and it's inch to inch, second to second, schedule to schedule. You know, uh, you're it's one crazy. inch off, man. Don't tell me you don't know this is going on. There is a video, too. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, after a big win, Harbaugh hugs Aiden Hutchinson, and then right behind him is this cat, and he points at him. It was like, oh, wow. Yeah, so the Big 12 coaches knew. I hope one of them was Dana. I'm not sure how you got up the next morning, but if it was, you had a good time. No, no. Unfortunately, it wasn't Dana. Um, I'm <laughs> sure that would have been a blast. But but no, uh, it it I, I have to think that this is a more prevalent thing that we've seen yes, in no college doubt. football. No I have doubt. to think, and I would – like to think that you know sign stealing is occurring in the programs that your team is a, or that you're a fan of. You it want is. to be, you know, you want to be a leg up. You don't want to be the guy that's getting your sign stolen. And I think one of the things that was really interesting was I think it was the Clemson LSU. Maybe it was the national championship game. Uh, I, I can't remember, but it was when Venables was still at LSU or at Clemson. Clemson, yeah. And, They played LSU, and LSU goes into a huddle, almost a a fake huddle scenario. They, you know, the team comes in, they they get the play, they sprint out to their position. They're still going fast enough, but it's to the point where there's no signals coming in from the sideline. Yep. And they did that, and and I think, you know, whatever, it was Coach O maybe or, or Joe Brady, they came out and they said, you know, we're aware of what they do at Clemson right now. And that was the sense of they're picking off what you're, signaling in and then they're giving the you know the play call to the defense following what is being signaled in after and venables for his entire time at clemson was a a guy who signaled in the defense after the offense got set and that's yeah. not by that's not by mistake right it's you know, by design 100 percent. i'm looking at what the formation is and i'm looking across trying to decipher what kind of play call might come and then i'm giving my defense you know, instructions afterward. I think it's brilliant, but teams have caught on to that. And I think teams are well aware of it now, whether it be for Michigan or just your average conference opponent, the minute that a team has played five conference games, they're going to know what more of these signals are than not, I would say. Uh, And so, (laughs) but with Michigan, the extent that they went to obtain these signals, whether it be sitting on, the 40 yard line across from an opponent with a handheld, uh, you know, iPhone or whatever recording all day. I think it's, it's interesting. And unfortunately I think some of the players are going to get, I I would say kind of screwed out of the individual recognitions that they should be getting this season as a result. Yeah. And we'll see if with CFP is kind of getting back to my point earlier with Texas, we'll see how it affects them. But yeah, I mean, you know, look, I grew up in the Notre Dame household, a Notre Dame and UT household. My mom's all UT. My dad went to Notre Dame. My dad liked UT, though, and there was there was never any beef there. Um, right. I mean, mainly because they won in, in 78, probably. Um, <laughs> and, and the 69 game, and 70, actually. But 69, you know, my dad was in college and, and came back, and they didn't know UT was that good. And all the players were like, oh, yeah, they're legit. They're national yeah. champions. Um, so there was never any beef there, but I grew up in that household. So Michigan was not a favorite. I remember Jim Harbaugh in 86 coming off the bus for, I believe, a CBS Brent Musburger game to play Notre Dame. Like, I mean, I, I remember Harbaugh as a college player. 
never was a Michigan fan, but I never was a hater like a lot of Notre Dame people are. They claim they're not, but they are. But I enjoyed this kind of reclamation project, and I, I wanted to believe in it. I still do because I also don't think that everything's 100% or absolute in one thing. Like, they didn't rebuild this just with sign stealing. It helped, and they were doing it for a reason. It's almost like the whole – steroid deal and once again i don't know what the percentages are but you know you could do all the steroids and lift like barry bonds i see dudes like that at gold's gym they ain't hitting the ball 480 feet you know and they're um, still to screw up a 98 mile per hour fastball like yeah there's just be hand-eye coordination and incredible vision and timing and athleticism and fast twitch a lot of stuff that goes into it but i do wonder how much of this since they've kind of gotten over it Goes, goes back to it. I also know it's been going on forever, which is why I think the parallels with the Astros, and funny you as a Rangers fan, but the parallel with the Astros is probably pretty close that a lot of teams have been doing this percentage-wise. There's only 30 teams in baseball, but percentage-wise, and a lot of teams at the top have been doing this. Okay, how far did you go? Right? Because yeah. yeah. Clemson had that rep throughout the whole run, CJ. Yeah, Absolutely. And again, it's one of those things where if you're a fan of a college football program and they're not doing this, you're kind of sitting back thinking, what are we doing? Right. Why are we not looking to get every single advantage that we can get? But I think there's boundaries there in the in the way that, you know, I don't want to call it gamesmanship because in a way it is still stealing signs or whatever. But that's exactly what it is. You know, it is. To the point where if you want to signal in a play for your team and I can tell right away what that play is going to be, I'm going to adjust. You know, right. but I think that's exactly what it is. It needs to be a sideline to sideline thing, not a, hey, let me go get 40 hours of film from games in which my team's not playing on a sideline in which I'm not a, a staffer of. And then let me see how I can how far I can take this. And, and where do you draw the line? So I feel like we're past this. And I've said it on radio before, so heck, I'll say it again. But I know when Major was coaching with – remember Greg Robinson, the Syracuse coach and was the Chiefs coach and was a D.C. Yep. here, did a pretty good job um, after what Chiswick probably left, after the national championship. Well, they're playing tech, and Major walks by his, his office during the week, and it was just blaring. Major's like, what the hell's going on? So he knocks on the door, opens it up, says, Greg, what are you doing? And Greg was right next to a – Tape that would have been on TV and had good mics near the field and the tech, he was getting all the tech audibles. Well, that's not illegal, is it? No. I I mean, it's a no. Tuesday. He's in his Austin office. He got the tape from the TV version and was just listening. And Texas had a couple zone blitzes for picks, including Armand Mitchell in that game. <laughs> They, they knew what was coming. <laughs> it's uh, But it's that's funny. not illegal, right? I mean, that's that line we're talking about. If I drop my hands too low and the team can see it and they relay, that that's really not. Now you get the trash cans and video, but the Robinson thing's video too. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be like aloof or, or you know, about this, but I also not going to try and be hardcore when I really don't know what the line or answer is. Michigan yeah, sounds like it's too far. I'll say that. It's it's funny. It's funny. I don't know if you watched the Cowboys game this weekend, but Greg Olson actually mentioned it. You know, he, he did. Yeah, he, he was talking about Dak Prescotts, and for whatever reason, that was the clearest quarterback audibling I've ever heard since they mic'd up uh, Peyton Manning to say Omaha a hundred times. Right. Everything that you wanted to hear from Dak Prescott at the line of scrimmage, you heard it crystal clear. And for whatever you know, kills or. or audibles that he was able to do at the line of scrimmage, Greg Olson was out there predicting it. And as a result, he's, he comes out and he goes, yeah, I think they had to switch something up because we predicted it last week. We're able to do it again this week. <laughs> I think we know their signs better than everybody else. And right. at that point, it's up to the coaching staff. It's up to the offense, you know, coordinator, the play caller, the head or the quarterback to say, you know, if we're going to continue to adjust and make changes at the line of scrimmage, our key words have to change. Yeah. You know, I, and here's the deal with the sign stealing. It is so hard 
to implement a brand new system of signals and signs on a week to week basis. It's almost I, I was, impossible. Great point. I was just going to say that. And when you wonder why the wide receiver jumped or didn't get off a, or the, the guard didn't get off on a, a quick block like he usually does. You switch all that shit up, and it had been muscle memory for eight months, CJ? Yep. Like, this is a timing, get-off-the-ball type game. Yeah, yeah. No, and I and – I, listen, I only played in high school, but I remember we had, you know, the multiple signals guys on the sideline, and we had pretty intricate signs, you know, whether it be a formation, whether it be a, a motion, whatever the play was in general. We – there was a lot going into it. And I remember thinking as a high schooler, I was like, you know, it's, it's easy to look at one guy and know what, exactly what it is. But when you have 100 plays, and I'm assuming a college playbook is much more extensive than what I ran in high school, right? those play calls differ by the matter of a hand signal, a hand sign. Like where, where the, that hand sign is being given even, it's so nuanced in the sense that any little minute detail cannot be changed on a week-to-week-to-week basis. And so the, the fact that, you know, people are sitting there thinking, you know, if, if people knew they had their signs, why didn't you change it? <laughs> they got a hundred, a hundred question test that you right. got to memorize every single weekend and get a hundred percent right. Otherwise you're yeah. putting out your, your team in a detrimental spot immediately. And I think it's impossible. That is a great point. No, I mean, you are all over it. Um, but I also think that Michigan's a really good football team. And I'll say this, like the Astros or like the Patriots after Spygate, they were obviously cheating. They deserve to get hammered. But the biggest thing they can do is that you create this edge for a team that's already at the top of, fuck you, nobody likes this. Michigan's already doing that. Harbaugh's doing it well. The basketball team came out with Michigan versus everyone versus everyone. Like, no, so, dude, they're – and so, Jawan, like, they're they're all playing it well. And Michigan's never been that program. Michigan's been like Texas. They've been the powder puff, really good yeah. academic state school that has tradition and has money and is the type of place that if you grew up anywhere near that area and your kid went there, you'd tell everyone they're going to the University of Michigan. You know? It's a lot, a lot like Texas. They're going to do it and do it the right way, you know, exactly. in the sense- Right. They're not going to cut the corners. They're going to find a way to get to where they want to be, but they're going to do it legally by the book and make sure that they cannot have a smudge on their name in any instance. Yep. And it, I'm glad you brought up the Michigan versus everybody thing, because what we saw Saturday against Penn state was outrageous. First, I, I hate, you know, kind of talking down on broadcast, but the amount of times that it made it sound like, that Michigan was the victim in this. It's outrageous. <laughs> it's outrageous. And then uh, the, the Michigan versus everybody beanie on Blake Corum. The I Astros guess. didn't do it as bad, but there was one time when it was like Correa who came out, who's like a super well-spoken, sharp, crisp dude, man. Yep. And came out and he started to get in there a little bit. Altuve was great. Altuve was like, man, we deserve everything we're getting. And even though I wasn't the one who was doing it much, but. Um, but Michigan felt like it really took on that level. Like Brady kind of did that, didn't he? Uh, yeah. I mean, game. Yeah. Yes. Even deflate gate. He's like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah, what I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Deflate gates. What I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's unreal to know that you're going past the lines that are normally regulated, getting punished and then thinking, why is this happening to me? Yeah. Why? Why is everybody out to get us? Why are people? Right. Why are folks in my mentions saying I'm a cheater? Yeah, you cheated. Right. I mean, it's unreal. I don't. I don't get it. And then uh, the interim coach that coached that game, the tears. Oh, the post game stuff was great, wasn't it? That's outrageous. Harbaugh's still living. He's in the hotel. Got his feet up. Probably got a beer in his hand. Well, glass and bill, but yeah, probably yeah. My- I would have had a beard, but yeah, but we yes. all would. But um, I think it's unreal the levels that Michigan and their fans have gone to say we're now the victim in this, and I think a lot of that goes to the Ryan Day brother kind of personal investigation from Ohio State. Say so yeah, it came from them. That's why this is happening. It's not the consequences of my own actions. It's because they're saying I did it. Well, you still did it. 
I will say this: there are fan bases that have that my whole life have been pretty objective. I think Texas fan base, for the most part, has been that. There are, of course, homers. There are, of course, people drinking Kool Aid. Sure. There are, of course, and, and I'm talking about to a to a base basic level, not yeah. you know a Texas fan who said we're going to go nine and three and they go seven and five. No, I don't mean that. I mean you're going to go one and eleven. You think you're going thirteen and zero. Um, and Michigan's been that for the most part. But the amount of Michigan people I know, like. Really good people. I mean, just good human beings, good dads, good husbands, good co-workers, you know, good people, good church people. And that have not been able to be real about this when we have conversations about it has blown my mind. Like fandom just is what it is, CJ. This is why I don't tweet about sports very often. I don't have the time or the patience or or the willpower to get through it like you do. Um like it, it's it, it's kind of blown my mind that Michigan has been the Michigan fans at least have been like every other fan base that we're protecting our own man you know it's like you know you know I don't want to put it to this level but it's like a criminal's mom being in court and I mean right. you know where and it can be at a high level and it's like look, look Mrs Bundy I know that you know you love Theodore but he's not the boy you thought he was okay. <laughs> My, my baby didn't do anything. Free him. It's, it's my baby. Yeah, your baby took away 19 other babies for people. So let's get real about it. And so just at some point, own it. You know, I, my guess is Michigan fans will do what Astros fans did, which is what Deflategate Patriots fans did, what any fan does. What you get caught cheating, you get everyone's doing it. I got pulled over. And, yeah, I got that too. And I got pulled over. In a 70 going 76, there were assholes going 81 around me. And I get right. pulled over. You know, that'll probably be the take is my guess. And, it, it, I mean, it's only going to be magnified even more from, you know, that fan base. Should Michigan make the college football playoff, win the Big, Tw- Big Ten, or even the college football playoff? Right. I mean, let's not forget they're a very good team. We watched them bully that Penn State team running the football for 30 straight plays in that second half and yeah. still was able to move the, the ball down the field the entire game. So it's it's one of those things where, you know, we talked about it with the Astros back in the day, the worst case scenario is for them to go win another tr- championship. And they right. did. Yeah. That would be the worst case right now, especially in – I know Texas is a little disconnected right now from Michigan having not been, you know, uh, an incredible rival. But imagine if Oklahoma or A&M had done this. And then they go out and they make the cultural playoff and win a title. It would be nightmare. It'd be hell. Oh, you'd be you know? livid. And there's nothing that they can do because, again, they can point at the end of the day to the banner that's hanging up in their their stadium and say, yeah, that's going to be there forever. And every time that you come to play at our house, you're going to have to stare at that. And every time that we talk about the 2023 season and how we won a national championship, you're going to be reminded of it. And it's going to be because we cheated. You know, so it's, it's one of those things where, you know, if – if you don't like Michigan, the worst case scenario for you right now is that they find a way to make it into the cultural playoff and win it all. You're right. No, you're right. And the funny, because they've got 90 days to respond to the NCAA. So the Big Ten was the only one that could do anything. And that's a, a funny soap opera drama fight of its own. Here's a funny thing, though, CJ, that as much shit, and you probably know this because just after the fact, but, you know, the Fab Four or Fab Five, you know, Michigan took a lot of crap for that. And the reality was, I mean, those guys were just getting some money on the side, which they were making a ton of money for Nike and Michigan and that whole brand that now we look at, and I think even back then, but now we'd look at legally and say, yeah, they deserve that. They're making that money. It's NIL money. Then they got so much crap for that. This is actually more playing with the fairness of of the actual game now people back then would say well yeah they wouldn't have gotten those recruits without that <laughs> that's a fair argument um but nowadays that is legal and we don't you shouldn't bitch about it because it's part of the process but if you go and went that far to steal signs i guess my question is how far does it go and we're gonna figure it all out but there's just a lot of drama going man a lot of like i said real drama i'm like you i've never watched soap operas i don't watch many reality shows the only ones I'll watch are like real, 
you know, to some degree where it's like they're bidding on a house for real estate. I'm like, they can only act so much with this. There are real feelings coming out here, you know. Well, I was going to ask, is Jersey Shore real enough? I mean. No. Oh, no. <laughs> As somebody who's been on that, trust me, no. No. Hey, we, we got about 10 minutes. We can go a little after if you can. But uh, one of the things I want to talk about, too, I know you're a Cowboys fan, right? Sure am. Okay. It's funny. Like, they seem to be – maybe they're a lot like Texas where we just kind of know who they are. And, Mm -hmm. you know, outside of one close loss to Philly, which I think they should have won that game at Philly. They they were that close on a couple occasions, but they get blown out by the Niners. The 12 point loss to Arizona without Kyler is still baffling, but they are six wins. They're beating the crap out of people. Are they just a team that'll beat the crap out of, three quarters of the league and the other quarter they're going to have some issues with, or more importantly, maybe the top five they're going to have issues with. I mean, it's certainly starting to feel that way. I mean, every, every week is either building to that same, you know, kind of perspective of they're going to beat all the bad teams by a hundred and they're going to lose to the good teams. And in a way, when I, when I watch Cowboys games, I see very similar struggles to what Texas has, you know, And it's, it's strange because the Cowboys continue to win these games big, whereas Texas gets up and, you know, obviously we talked about it, opposing teams inch their way back somehow, some way, and it's a close game in the fourth. But the Cowboys do the opposite, where they keep the pedal in the middle and they blow teams out, but they have the similar kind of issues. Red zone efficiency on both sides of the ball are very similar. Cowboys can't score in the red zone, neither can Texas. Defensively, both teams are elite. And – it's weird because that game in Philadelphia, I, I, I'll, preface, I'll preface it with this. I think Philadelphia has taken a step back a little bit this year. I don't think Jalen Hurts has been as good of a passer this year as he was last year. I agree. I also don't think he's as healthy, but passing too. Correct. I think that he had a knee issue a few weeks ago that I think has flared up again two weeks ago, I think, it, what, what it was. Yep. Um, I'm to the point now where I look at that Eagles game and it feels like it's been a long time since the Cowboys were one competitive in Philadelphia and two, one in Philadelphia. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but it feels like Philadelphia has had the Cowboys number for quite a while now. Losing that game as a matter of inches on multiple plays kind of gives me a little bit more optimism that, Hey, this team's not as far as I thought they were. I, I, Totally agree. Especially after what we saw against San Francisco. I totally agree. I, and I'm not a Cowboys fan. I've lived here long enough, though, and I'll get into it with the Texans. I end up, I want the Texas teams to be good because I watch so much sports that they're on here more than anyone else. <laughs> and so then I end up, you end up getting a team like the Rangers where I kind of fell in love with because I watched yeah. them so much. And I'm like, these are likable guys. This is a fun <laughs> team, you know. And we'll get to the Texans with that because they're kind of there. The Cowboys have been there for me with that. Even though I like the Niners more, they don't they only play in the playoffs and we know what happens then. Yeah. They are um you know, I think Dak's likable, but 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 just kind of what they've done, you think they're at that spot where they should be better than they have been and that was the first time I've seen them probably the last couple of years where I thought you're right there. You are right there, and there's not much separation in the NFC. We saw the Niners on a three-game losing streak. They've got to be completely healthy. I do think it'll be matchup-based with coaching staffs and personnel, and that's where maybe the Niners, if they're playing the Cowboys, they've got a big edge, and playing the Eagles, maybe they don't, right? Yeah, um, come playoff-wise, and the Cowboys won't have a home field for what I would assume the entire playoff. You know, they're going to – I would assume be the first or second wild card. So maybe, maybe, but I don't think that's how that works. And I forget how they changed it. Um, I think it's playoff, playoff, or road wild card versus divisional winners each way. Yes. Um, so they'll be on the road. And that scares me because I think the Cowboys are a little bit, or a much different team at home than on the road. Uh, that Eagles game in Philadelphia is probably the best road game that we've seen from them in quite a while in terms of playing a competent you know, good opponent. But like you said, when you look at the bit, uh, the NFL, the NFC's playoff picture right now, who's going to be in that, that mix? Could the Vikings potentially make a run? Maybe the Lions are going to win the North. Uh, you're looking at, you know, the Niners out of the, out of the West Eagles out of the East, 
the South is probably where the Cowboys are going to go. Yeah. And the last time that the Cowboys played a divisional winner out of the South is the Buccaneers and they retired Tom Brady. So, and I don't think there's a team there like that this year. So (laughs) I'm right there with you. And I mean, the Panthers are out of it and you're either going to a dome in new Orleans or Atlanta, or you're going to play Baker Mayfield in Tampa Bay. Right. New Orleans is five. I would rather get New Orleans. They're five and five. I think Dennis Allen is done. You look at their schedule, they should be seven and three. They're the opposite of Pittsburgh to me, who's six and three and shouldn't be <laughs> six and three. Like Dennis Allen is just not the right guy. You look at his two stops as a head coach, man. If you look at his overall record, it's disgusting. And I don't I'm, have I'm, it in front of me. I mean, it's 1940, 19 and 43 type shit, where it's yeah. like, bro, like, you know, you're a good DC. That's it. Now, I remember coming into the season, I, I remember thinking fantasy-wise, I was like, Saints have a good defense. Look at their schedule. You're you're thinking, you know, the best quarterback that they play the entire year is Trevor Lawrence. They play right. him once. They played 10 rookies. And sitting here at 5-5, five and five, you're thinking, how is this possible with that defense? You know, a, a quarterback that you thought was going to be an upgrade with that Derek Carr, and all of a sudden you're sitting here at 5-5 five and five thinking, you know, this team has no hope. I want to see the Saints in the playoffs – get to the you know next round of the playoffs and then everything goes out the window. If the Cowboys play the Niners at all, <laughs> pack it up, see you in Cancun. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that there's a path to beat everybody else. You know, I, I don't think it's easy to play teams three times in a row and have a definitive or three times in a season and have a definitive edge over either team basically. Yeah. I like how the Cowboys line up against the uh, the Dolphins. So or sorry the uh, the Lions. So I, I think if that's the place that you go to on the road in the second round of the playoffs, you have a solid chance anywhere but San Francisco if you're a Cowboy fan. Yeah. And then you hope you get another shot maybe at Philly. Um, I think it's a better matchup for him, depending on who's there. I mean, obviously you hope it's someone else and that there's a huge upset. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just don't think there's, I think in both college and pro football this year, and it's been like that in pro football really since the salary cap was instituted, this is the brightest thing they ever did. Basketball, yeah. basketball was as popular. It felt like football is probably more popular. Baseball was already on its way down, but those sports were as popular either in the eighties with baseball or the nineties with basketball as football. And they instituted the salary cap and really made it like a real salary cap. And so instead of having six cities pumped up for the next five years, you have 32 cities pumped up every year. Because yep. now, now you're tanking for someone and you're pumped up. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I think that's the craziest part about it now is, I mean, fans are happy that they're losing because they have the opportunity, you know, even the chance to go get a quarterback in the next draft. I think it's right. Well, speaking of getting a quarterback in the next draft, um, and like I said earlier, I want the Astros, the Rangers, I want all the teams. I mean, I've been, watched the Spurs a couple of times and I'm, I'm, you know, I used to watch NBA preseason and now I'm a typical old guy, like get me after Christmas and we'll go. Right. Yeah. Let me get through all my other stuff. Um, but I've watched them. I mean, just because if you have a freak or something to really watch, I want to watch it. And so I'm always rooting for the Texas teams to at least be good. And the Texans, even when they were really good outside of the Sean in a couple of those years, when they actually weren't as good as they should have been probably, but they were fun to watch. Right. Even with Matt Schaub, they're winning divisions, and I'm not going to watch them if there's another game on or I have red zone. or. And they're 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 fun to watch now, man. C.J. Stroud, that was a hell of a hell of a game. The NFL was su- – Sunday was as good as I remember. I mean, you had five games decided by a field goal or, or on the last field goal. You had some fun comebacks, and Houston was right up there with Cincy. Yeah, it was impressive. Um, I could not have been more wrong about CJ Stroud than maybe anybody that has a Twitter right now. Really? That's I, funny. I, that surprises me. What'd you, what'd you say about him? What'd you think? I don't think I actually ever voiced it on Twitter, which I'm very glad about, but my high school okay. group chats, you know, some of the chats back here, you know, I did not see CJ Stroud being a great quarterback. I think okay. that there was times at Ohio state where it was a lot like what we saw with Mac Jones at Alabama, where it was, you know, just, find a way to get it to the wide open receiver. That's going to be a first rounder and play in the NFL for 12 years. Right. And I think that was kind of 
where I fell out of love with him. You know, you, you watch him. He doesn't make a lot of contested passes at Ohio State. And you think, you know, surely his receivers are not going to be this open in the NFL. Right. And yet somehow, you know, he stepped in and there's a strong case for him to be the MVP right now as a rookie. Yeah. I mean, he's definitely rookie of the year. But also getting back to your point, one of the tough things about trying to analyze guys and really predict is that it wasn't just that he had three receivers that are much better than the DBs and that he'll ever have in the NFL in terms of a separation. Right. He had, he had an offensive line that's never going to be that much better than the defensive line. And, I mean – A running back who's never going to be that good compared to the defense they're facing. You know, everything was in front of them. And a system and a scheme that works. A system and scheme that's only – repeatedly broken the big 10 record for passing and yards and offense right like five times in the last decade so uh, I, I i fell out of love and i think it was a little bit of the ohio state quarterback hangover where i was just like you know what like surely not yeah we've seen it time and time and time again where these guys are you know pumped up to be who they're supposed to be and they get to the league and they just fall short i was um I was wrong on CJ Stroud pretty pretty quickly, and he's yeah, doing it for that. admitting it. I was I was wrong on Jalen Hurts, way wrong, and I'll, I'll keep on admitting it. Like, it, yeah, as long as they're good guys, and I've met Stroud, Stroud is, and I've heard nothing but great things about Hurts. I'm not going to root against someone. I've got no problem being wrong. I'm going to I'm going to be wrong a bunch more after this. So yeah. get used to it, right? <laughs> no, and the 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 thing that's most impressive with what CJ Stroud's doing is. First is you're looking at these comebacks, two straight weeks where he's had to drive down the field late in the game to put his team in a position to win a football game. Uh, I, I think it was two weeks ago against the Buccaneers. He did. He went 75 yards with, I think, 48 seconds left to beat the Bucs. It was incredible. I mean, every pass is on the money. There's no time to waste. There's no – what he's doing is looking like he's a multi-time MVP winner running these – two minute drills at the end of games to get guys to set up, get the routes right and put the ball in position to make a play and extend drives. It's incredible. I, I, I was so wrong. And again, he's doing it with a bunch of receivers that are yes, talented, but like you said, they're not com talented comparatively to what he's had and what he's been working with. When you talk about a tank Dell and Noah Brown, like these guys weren't, I mean, obviously tank Dell's a rookie, but Noah Brown's been around the league for a while. Hadn't put up numbers anywhere near what he's doing the last two weeks. So it's been incredibly impressive. And I mean, it's hard to not look at him and say, you know, this guy is worthy of an MVP vote right now. Yeah. No, it's, it's why we love sports, man. You and I obviously do is that like, it, it's fun, you know, you're already there. So I'll give you credit at 26, but it takes time usually for people to actually enjoy being wrong because it's part of, it's part of why we love it because it's not scripted and you yeah. don't know what's going to happen and you can try and predict it's like the economy. You can try and predict everything with trends and and analytics, and yeah, it just doesn't go know that way because human beings are involved. You know, absolutely. One of, one of the very cool things. Hey, let me give a shout out to Apple Leasing, who is one of our new sponsors. We have a lot of great sponsors, and I do want to give actually all of them shout outs. So, audio, visual, community TV, call Tom. They're the best. Brain Vault. If you have a kid that, or just you maybe, that needs a mouth guard, they're at the top of the line. New technology. And there are doctors all over the country now that are advising kids to get brain ball because the numbers show you're not going to get, uh, not going to have anywhere near the chance of getting the concussion. Covert B caves, all stat. I think y'all know all the great people. Relax the back, 7 Eleven, Pest Wranglers, Cooter, I'm giving you a call. Last stand hats. You guys see me wearing those all the time. Um, Top Gun. But also, I want to give Apple a little bit of love here. And Scott Crossit, they just joined us. I've known them for going on 20 years. I've leased with them a lot. If you don't find a car you want to buy right now and you want to wait at, wait it out a little bit, Apple Leasing is a great spot to go. Give them a price, and they'll give you what you can drive. That's where most people start, man. I got a budget. What can I drive for that? Um, if you want to end up buying that car, you can do that a lot of money off obviously so you're not getting that driving off a lot 50 percent off that whole thing or 50 percent depreciated um or if you know what you want you could at that point just say hey i'm looking for a family tahoe here used what can i get it for and so they'll help you out 512-346-9977 512-346-9977 or apple leasing 
Com. Tell them we told you to go. CJ, anything else, man? This was an absolute ball. We got to do this again and have you on again if you're cool with it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was awesome, Katie. Anytime, anytime. My, my, you got my number. Hit me up, and I'm I'm willing to come talk any sport. Cool. Let's go get that beer at some point. All right, man. I'm in. All right, bye, guys. We appreciate everyone. Hook them. We'll be back tomorrow at 8 a.m. I'll be back on Thursday at 3 p.m. And CJ will be back soon because he was that good. Y'all have a good one. Take care. Thank you.